CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. At the gray close of his life, a very wise man remarked, nine times out of ten, there is no truth to be discovered. There is only error to be exposed. Remarkable, isn't it? What an aged philosopher learns at the end is precisely what a private investigator senses at the beginning. I have something of great importance to tell you. Well, I, 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 I'm busy now. Can it wait? Not too long. Who are you? As I have told you, I am a person with something of great importance to divulge. I could see you now. Well, I told you I'm busy. How about tomorrow? Tomorrow will be too late. Why? Because the world will come to an end tonight. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Queen of Palmyra, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Fred Gwynn. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. certain beliefs that seem to be beyond dispute. For instance, most people believe that one day the world will come to an end. There may be differences of opinion concerning the how, the when, the why. Some foretell the death of the sun and the subsequent icing of the planets. Others insist that man, heedless, careless man himself, will simply blow the whole business to smithereens once and for all. In any event, most of us seem fairly well resigned to our fate. Most of us go about our own important, if mundane, affairs as if the world will last forever. That is, most of us, but not all of us. You uh, wanted to see me, Uncle Dudley? Sit down. Yes, sir. Have a drink. Uh, a drink? Yes, a drink of water. Uh, well, well, thank you, sir. I'm uh, not thirsty. <laughs> if it were whiskey or some other depraved form of liquid poison, you'd fling it down your obese gullet quickly enough. Yes, sir. This, ah, this is pure elixir of life. I don't doubt that, sir. I despair of teaching you anything, fatso. Sir, may I say something? Only if it makes sense, fatso. That's just it. I don't like to be called Fatso. That isn't true. You adore that name. Oh, no. Oh, yes. If you didn't enjoy being called Fatso, you could change it soon enough. You could stop stuffing that bottomless pit that masquerades as your stomach. Now, tomorrow, make a note of this. Yes, Uncle Dudley. I want you to transfer all my holdings to gold. Uh, I, I, I don't understand. What don't you understand? What you just said. I want you to transfer all my holdings to gold. Isn't that what I said? Well, well y yes, sir. E everything? 
Isn't that what I just said? The, 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 the stocks, ever... bonds, real estate, everything. Into gold? I want everything I own in this world to be transformed into one single solid chunk of gold. And that'll be all. <laughs> What may I do for you, Mr. Uh, McElhaney, is it? Uh, yes, that's right, McElhaney. Hubert Ivor McElhaney. You see, Mr. Carswell, I have come to you because I would like to engage the services of a, a private eye. Uh, then I'm afraid you come to the wrong place. But the name on the door says... The name on the door says, Private Detective. Oh. So, therefore, I am not a private eye. Nor am I a gumshoe, a hawkshaw, a Sherlock, or a shamus. Well, now that you say so... I'm that's a licensed a... private investigator. A member in good standing of a reputable and highly supervised profession. Yes, I, I appreciate how you feel. After all, my own name is Hubert Ivor McElhenney, but everyone calls me Fatso. Huh? Well, the fact is, you are rather plump. Well, I can't help it. I do everything humanly possible to lose weight. Uh, why don't you try a diet? That's impossible. I have neither the willpower nor the strength of character. Uh, why have you come to see me? B because something must be done. About your weight? No, about my uncle. Uncle? Mr. Dudley K. McElhenney. I trust you've heard of him? No. But you should know him quite well. Why? He happens to be your landlord. Oh. My uncle is about to sell the building. He's getting rid of all of his property. What do you think of that? I'm not sure I have an opinion. Well, it's unusual. Most, most unusual. Is that why you come to see me? Yes. I want you to stop him. Stop him from doing what? What, what we've just been talking about, disposing of his property. I, I was hoping we could have him de declared insane. Uh, in that case, you should go to see a psychiatrist. I... I'm not sure I understand how I can be of service. Well, it, 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 it's a complicated situation, to be sure. It's also rather simple. Really? The fact is, my uncle is insane. Why do you say that? He's convinced the world will come to an end. <laughs> For that matter, so am I. Next month? Uh, well, why does he think it will happen next month? Because she told him... She? Yeah, this person who calls herself Zenobia. Zenobia? Zenobia, the Queen of Palmyra. And, and, and who exactly is she? A swindler, a shopper, a confidence operator. You, are you sure? What else can she be? She looks like one, she sounds like one. H have you any proof? That's why I have come to you. You have to be careful about these accusations. What else can she be if not a thief? She has convinced my uncle to turn all of his holdings into gold. Yes? And hand the gold over to her. In return for what? Salvation. I want you to stop her. Oh. Uh, what is it, Mr. McElhaney? Is uh, something wrong? Uh, this terrible pain. Uh, do you want me to get you a doctor? Uh, what do I want with a doctor? It's a hunger pain. Come on, let's go get some lunch. L lunch? It's... It's hardly ten o'clock. It's been over an hour since I've eaten anything. Uh, I'm sorry I don't go out to lunch. I eat at my desk. No. Uh, now, I want to know everything you can tell me about this uh, Zenobia. You bring lunch from home? Zenobia, Queen of Palmyra, did you say? That means you have some food here in the office. I want you to describe her. Uh, do you suppose I might have a little... Uh, what? Well, just half a sandwich. Mr. McElhenney, if you're not serious about this matter... I'm just as serious as I can be. All right, then, let's concentrate. I can't. I'm hungry. All right, all right, all right. Here. Thank you, thank you. Now, you can charge me whatever you like for it. Just tack it onto the bill. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just help yourself to whatever's in the bag, and let's get on with it. Now, how old is this woman? What is this? A, a cheese sandwich and three prunes? They're rather large prunes. Well, how do you keep body and soul together? Uh, Mr. McElhenney, I'm not running a restaurant now. Uh, you suspect this woman of being a confidence operator, right? Well, I know it for a fact. Oh, this is such... 
absolutely tasteless bread. What you want me to do, then, is to discover evidence of any of a criminal record and present it to your uncle. Thus, she will be exposed. Exactly. Do you have her address? A, a, a description, perhaps? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Here's her photograph. She gave it to my uncle, and her address is uh, written on the back. Yeah. My fee is $75 a day, plus expenses. $75 a day? How can you hope to eat decently on that? No wonder you're starving. The problem with my business, by and large, is the type of people you run into. Not as adversaries, but as clients. Well, too much brilliance was not required for my next move. I went down to police headquarters. I showed the picture of Zenobia, Queen of Palmyra, to several of my friends. And, sure enough, there she was in the files. Her name was not Zenobia, Queen of Palmyra, either. You must forgive me. At first, I did not hear you ring. You see, I was deep, deep in meditation. How may I serve you? Uh, may I come in? Of course. This is the recandescent temple of Palmyra. All who seek the truth are welcome. Enter. Uh, thank you. Uh, nice looking place. Uh, very neat. We assemble to communicate with the oneness of the universe. There must be no distracting decor. Uh, things must be moving along these days. Blanche. Blanche. Are you addressing me? Uh, Blanche. Blanche Brady. Angel Blanche. Uh, isn't that right? I'm sure you have me confused with someone else. <laughs> That's what they all say. You did three to five for forgery, Angel, and fraud on the West Coast back in... Sir, what are you saying? I took this picture down to police headquarters. I compared it with the mug shot. There are many likenesses in the world, as indeed there should be. Uh, how about fingerprints? Uh, would yours happen to match those of Angel Blanche Brady? They might. <laughs> now we're getting someplace. And I shall tell you something else, Mr. Carswell. Wait a minute. How did you know my name was Carswell? I divined it. The gift of prophecy and the power of second sight. Occasionally these flash before my eyes. Yeah, is that a fact? Uh, uh, tell me more, Blanche. Blanche. Uh, Angel Blanche Brady, did you say? Yes, ma'am. It is entirely possible that I may have been this Angel Blanche, as you called her. No, no, uh, no, 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 no. As you called her, that was the name you gave yourself. I may have been Angel Blanche Brady. Huh? I may have led that existence briefly. All of us leave our true selves from time to time. Yeah, we do. Oh, yes. The violent climate of the world shakes us loose from our identity... And some of us never recover. Yeah, well, anyhow, Blanche, the game's over. The game? You'll have to leave town. I know. I'll make a deal. Leave quickly and quietly, and uh, because you're being such a good girl about it, I won't say anything to the local cops about your being in town. All of us are going to leave. Huh? What? We are? Yes. You see, 21 days from now, on Friday the 14th of next month, the world shall come to an end. Oh, uh, in that case, I'd better keep the date open on my calendar. Huh? You don't believe a word I'm saying, do uh, you? You're saying the world will end on the 14th? Yes. Uh, just because you told that to Mr. Dudley McElhenney, uh, you can also tell it to me. Is that what you think? <laughs> That's what I know. My dear sir, I didn't tell Mr. Dudley McElhenney the world would come to an end on the 14th. You didn't? No. He told me. Did our Uncle Dudley say that? Our straight-from-the-shoulder, no-nonsense Uncle Dudley? Is it possible? Why do you even ask? Don't you know by now that in our stories anything is possible? This thing requires further development, which it will surely receive when I return shortly with Act Two.
comes to an end for each of us. Fortunately, for the continuity of things, it doesn't end for all of us at the same time. However, the way things seem to be going, nothing is really beyond the realm of possibility. There are those who seem to be making their preparations even now. But how do you prepare for something like that? You're saying that according to Mr. Dudley McElhaney, the world will end on the 14th? Precisely. And uh, just what makes him say that? He has been in touch. In touch? Uh, in touch with what? In touch with things. Uh, what sort of things? The things that are all about us. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, oh, where, do, where do you fit into this picture, Blanche? Blanche? You keep calling me Blanche. Yeah, that, because that's who you are, Angel Blanche Brady. Oh, that's quite possible. I may have wandered off into another existence where I was known as Angel Blanche Brady. Uh, what sort of person was I? Uh, I'm afraid you are not a good person, Blanche. Truly? Uh, truly. You were a thief. A thief? Oh. Uh, you signed other people's names to checks? That was not a virtuous thing to do. And you sold things to people that weren't yours? That wasn't right. The police don't think so either. Oh, I am sincerely sorry. Uh, what's this bill of goods you sold to Dudley McElhaney? Oh, I have sold him nothing. I have revealed the truth. Uh, and, and does he know you are also Angel Blanche Brady? Have you told him that? How could I have told him? I don't even know that myself. Uh, tell me, Mr. Carswell, do you know who you are? I think so. You think you are Charles Carswell. Are you sure? I got a driver's license to prove it. You may have been snared by his identity. Snared? You see, the universe is filled with identities that have no corporeal state. Do you follow this? Uh, where's it going? Identities hunger for bodies, and therefore there is a constant struggle. Struggle? Yes. You see, there are so few bodies in the world. There are billions. But there are trillions of identities. Uh, about the struggle. A homeless identity is always seeking a body. And when you are unsure of yourself or depressed or lacking in the faith, it can become you. Is that a fact? Oh, yes. That is how I was taken over by Angel Blanche. Uh, how did you uh, uh, shake her uh, and, and get back to Zenobia? Oh, hidden deep within me was the source of conviction. And at the proper time, it shone forth. And I re-emerged as Zenobia. Uh, all right, if, uh, if it convinces the suckers, why not? How do you know you have not been snared by a consciousness that calls itself Charles Carswell? Break free and become your true self once again. And, and, and what or who is my true self? It will be revealed to you when you are free. Uh, who do you suppose I am? That noble brow, those deep searching eyes. You could be the Egyptian pharaoh. You could be the Roman poet, Terence. You could be the philosopher, Plato. Uh, no, I, I don't think so. And if I were you, Angel, I'd leave town. I had to get out of there. I was beginning to get the funny feeling that if I stayed around much longer, she might get to me. <laughs> Can you imagine, to me... Charles Fleetwood Carswell. I've spent half my life catching assorted thieves. I know every trick. But she had that jet black hair and those cold black eyes. There's nothing wrong with blue-eyed blondes, but it's the black-eyed brunettes, mostly, who have ruled the world. You could check on it. <laughs> if I'd stayed there another five minutes, she might have had me believing she was Zenobia, Queen of Palmyra. I asked my client to come to my office. You have news for me, Mr. Carswell? I have exactly what you want. Oh, marvelous. What is it? Evidence that Zenobia, Queen of Palmyra, is, in truth, Angel Blanche Brady. Oh, uh, oh. Uh... And she has a criminal record. 
Oh, it gets better. She's been put away for forgery. And what else? It's what you wanted, isn't it? Uh, a criminal record is a criminal record. No matter how you slice it, it's still the same old salami. Salami? Uh, b- b- do you have any in the office? A, a little yeah. snack would be just the yeah, right uh, thing right now. Here's the full now. report. You'll find all the details spelled out. And now, Mr. McElhaney, I shall send you a bill and we may consider the case closed. Uh, b- uh, not quite. No? Uh, I would like you to present the facts to my uncle. Me? Uh, yes. You see, it's... It's bad news, and nobody likes that kind of messenger. I'll pay you for the extra day's work. The real reason I agreed was because I was curious. What kind of a person was this Dudley McElhaney? (laughs) How could he be taken in by an angel Blanche Brady? He couldn't amass his considerable fortune if he fell for every hustler who rang his doorbell. Or could he? I was expecting you, Mr. Coswell. Me? Well, someone in your category. You were? My nephew, Fatso, the stomach that walks like a man, he's sure I'm being swindled. And uh, what do you think? I, Mr. Coswell, have seen the light. Uh, uh, Have you seen this? A report on the Queen of Palmyra's activities when she was known as Angel Blanche Brady. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I know about that. You do? Mr. Coswell, whatever I may be, I am not a fool. When I meet someone, anyone, with whom I intend to have a relationship of any kind, I have them thoroughly investigated. Yeah, as indeed you should, and uh, so you must be aware that she served time for forgery. She didn't. Angel Blanche Brady did. (laughs) Oh, we're back to the predatory identities gambit. I don't consider it a gambit. (laughs) I wonder who you are. I told you my name. No, no. Who you are in truth. In truth. I am Charles Fleetwood Carswell. You're positive. Uh, Beyond the shadow of a doubt. Hmm. Have a drink, sir. Water. Pure spring water. The true elixir of life. It clears the brain. I think mine's reasonably clear now, thank you. What do you make of me, Mr. Carswell? What do you mean? Well, you know what I mean. Surely Fatso has told you of my plans. Yes. What do you make of them? This sharp, shrewd, cold-hearted businessman suddenly making a 180-degree turn, getting rid of all my possessions. What do you make of it? Why are you concerned with my opinion? I like you, Mr. Carswell. Uh, Why? You remind me of what I used to be. Cold, impersonal, dedicated to ideas, involved with mundane things. Uh, I, I really haven't given much thought. Well, that's not true. You've thought about nothing else. Now relax, Mr. Carswell, and tell me the truth. Oh, I'll, I'll pay you for your time. Not that money will have any value to any of us three weeks from now. Oh, why do you say that? First, answer my question. Well, there's an obvious answer. What is that? It happens to many people who've spent their lives amassing wealth to the exclusion of other things. They begin to look for higher meanings, greater values. And quite frankly, they become suckers for the clever hustle. Hmm. You believe that's what's happened to me? Basically, yes. Mr. Carswell, would you like to work for me? In what capacity? Oh, in your usual investigative capacity. I believe her. I believe her with all my heart and with all my soul. Yes. Uh, Don't don't interrupt. It's very difficult for a man like me to to say these things. A heart, soul, and so forth. Uh, This is not my kind of language. I understand. You believe her with your heart and soul. However, you do not quite believe her with your brain. Have I stated the problem? Uh, Well... Yes. What more is there I can do? I I have here evidence of a criminal record. What other proof do you require? Mr. Carswell, convince me somehow that the changes that have taken place within me are not real. Uh, you, uh, you say changes? Changes in the way I, I think, feel, see, hear, believe. No, I don't understand. I accept those changes. I believe them. 
but, but some small, slight, even fragile vestige of the self that was called Dudley McElhaney still persists, still torments me with tiny doubts. The self that was called Dudley McElhaney. Is that what you just said? Yes. Then I must assume you no longer consider yourself to be Dudley McElhaney. Well, I'm not. No. Ninety-nine percent of me says I'm not. It's that lonely but persistent one percent that keeps whispering to me, you are, you are Dudley McElhaney. Uh, let's analyze the majority vote. Uh, what does the ninety-nine percent say? It says that I'm Aurelian. Aurelian? Lucius Domitius Aurelian, Emperor of Rome. <laughs> Lucius Domitius Aurelian, born in the year 212, made emperor in 270, assassinated in 275. That should have been the end of him, wouldn't you think? However, here we have Dudley McElhenney who says, no, I am Aurelian. On the face of it, we could say Dudley is mad. But how many times in our history have the madmen been right? Which is not to say they weren't also mad, if you know what I mean. We'll meet again shortly for Act Three. Old soldiers, as they used to sing in the British Army, never die. Well, perhaps we can say the same about old Roman emperors and old Syrian queens... They seem to be turning up and attracting the attention of our private investigator, Mr. Charles Fleetwood Carswell, who is, even now, talking to one of them. Lucius Domitius Aurelian. Uh, it has a nice ring to it. And uh, she has made you believe that's who you are. Yes. Yes, it goes against every principle I used to hold, against every way I had of thinking and seeing. But I believe it. How can either of you prove that you are Aurelian? I have the feeling. <laughs> Feelings don't count. What are the facts? When did it begin? About a month ago. She came into my office. And I'll never forget what she said. I've come here to save you. Who are you? Have you forgotten? Uh, madam, are you saying we know each other? Oh, very well. I've never seen you before in my life. Not in this life, perhaps. Um, yes. Look, I'm very busy, so if you'll excuse me... You were uh, also too busy last time. Last time? I sent you a warning. What are you talking about? You paid no attention. Now, really, I, I don't know how you got in here. A month later, you were assassinated. Who was assassinated? You were. You, Lucius Domitius Aurelian, Emperor of Rome. Oh, I, I see. And I was the Emperor of Rome, eh? You still are. <laughs> well, that's, that's something. And, and who are you, if I may ask? Zenobia, Queen of Palmyra. <laughs> well, it's <clears throat> nice running into you again after all these years. Once again, your life is in danger. Oh, well, I understand that's par for the course for us Roman emperors. This world, this world we live in, must come to an end very shortly. Well, I shall see you again very soon. Then she just walked out of the office. I thought I could forget about it, but it just kept sticking in my mind. Aurelian. Lucius Domitius Aurelian. <laughs> I kept saying that name over and over again. Why? But I don't know. I just did, that's all. And soon, I came to know all about him. How? I don't know how, but I knew everything. How he was born, how he grew up, the things he did and said and believed, how I became emperor. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you just started by saying he, and now you just said I. Because I am convinced that I'm Aurelian. I even speak Latin. Did you study it in school? 
I only studied subjects that pertain to the making of money. But now things seem to be coming back to me. Non libet, my favorite expression. I always used to say, it does not please me. Palman ki meruit ferat. Let him who has won the palm wear it. I hated imposters. There can be only one explanation. You went to the library, you looked it up, you read it. No. You may be unaware of this. Oh, for goodness sakes, what is that odor? Fatso! Fatso, are you home? Come in here. You called me, Uncle Dudley? What's that dreadful emanation? I'm having a salami sandwich in the dining room. Well, get rid of it and shut the door. Uh, no doubt you recognize Mr. Carswell. Uh, he, uh, yes, sir. I had employed Mr. Carswell to uh, secure some information that I'm sure is enlightening. You wasted your money. Yeah, but, Uncle... Uh, that will be all. Well, I'm only trying to help... Non libet. It does not please me. Leave us. Yes, Uncle Dudley. And close the door. My own flesh and blood... But an obese moron. Uh, you may be a bit hard on him. Well, then, she called on me again. And what does she have to say this time? What kind of game are we playing here? The game of life and death. The game that the immortal gods have always played with us here below. But now, they tire of it. What are you talking about? They have decided to end it, end this farce, this tragedy, and to return us all to the universal oneness. Once again, there will be destruction. The 14th of February. Why did you say that? Well, I, I don't know. That was the day of the destruction of Palmyra. See, you remember, you remember. Uh, but I... And I... that is the day the world shall end. Cleanse yourself. How? How? The 14th of February approaches. Shall you be ready? Oh, what am I supposed Turn to... Turn all the irrelevance into gold. The irrelevance? All that is not you. The gold represents the vain strivings, the foolish pride, the false satisfaction. Oh, but I don't... Bring it to the immortal gods as a sacrifice. A sacrifice? You shall bring it to a place that I will tell you about. And you shall exchange the gold for your salvation. And you bought this? Well, I, I know what it must sound like to a hard-headed, practical... But when you look into those deep black eyes, you believe it. And you're turning everything into gold? Yes. It'll come to almost half a ton, over two million dollars. And I'm going to load it on a truck and bring it to this cave. Oh, that, I know what it sounds like, but I believe it. If you believe it, you believe it. But I know I shouldn't believe it. <laughs> so, what do you want me to tell you? Would you believe it? No. Well, don't answer so quickly. Go to her. Talk to her. What if she's right? <laughs> What if she's right? Well, it was an assignment. In effect, he was saying, the world is coming to an end on February 14th. See if I'm really Lucius Domitius Aurelian, Emperor of Rome, and find out if she is Zenobia, Queen of Palmyra. <laughs> Crazy? <laughs> well, that's the nature of the business. Ah, oh, Mr. Carswell. Or shall I call you Terence? Terence? A Roman slave. Your master set you free. You took his name, Publius Terentius. Terence, a remarkable poet. Uh, continue. See, you don't know quite what to say. Shall you laugh at me? It was such an outrageous sounding statement, wasn't it? Uh, absolutely. Then laugh at me and leave. Leave? Am I not a fraud? Am I not Angel Blanche Brady? Is it not my intention to swindle Dudley McElhenney out of every nickel he has in the world? Uh, that's what I'm here to find out. To find out? But I had supposed it was a foregone conclusion. Do you mean 
There's a possibility that I could be Zenobia, Queen of Palmyra, that he could be Lucius Domitius Aurelian, Emperor of Rome, and that you could be Terence, the ancient Roman poet. I don't think I could be Terence. Why not? I never heard of him. Then why do you talk like him? Uh, what, have, what, have, what have I said? Listen. Uh, to whom? Uh, 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 to what? To what you said, oh, so many years ago. You asked the question. Uh, what question? Ask it. Ask it again. I, I don't know what you're talking about. But I did know. Somewhere, something in my brain was beginning to form. An idea, a, 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 a conscious thought was taking shape. And words, words. Uh, it, at first they were strange and foreign, but only for a moment. Words, words. Homo sum humani, nil a me alienum puto. Oh. Those were your most famous words. I am a man. Nothing human is alien to me. You are Terence, the poet, the playwright, the philosopher. You have been captured by the identity of Charles Fleetwood Carswell. Free yourself. Join us. I'm, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Listen. Listen to what you are talking about. Nothing is said that has not been said before. <sighs> That is what you said almost 2,000 years ago. It is true. You are now saying nothing that you have not said before. You are Publius Tereshius, the poet Terence. It sounds crazy to you, huh? <laughs> but you weren't sitting there in the room. The room with the slightly sweetest smell of incense and the faintest tinkling of silvery bells. And you weren't looking into those eyes. Those black eyes. I, eyes so deep, so dark, that it seemed there must be all the mysteries of the universe inside them. Come with me. Be saved. Join us. Realize the oneness, the completeness. What do I have to do? Change your earthly burdens into gold. Uh, there won't be an awful lot. It doesn't matter. We shall all sacrifice together on the 14th of February when we shall leave this world, this poor doomed world, and we shall dwell. We, the fortunate few, shall live forever. Well, Mr. Carswell, what do you think? I think I am Terence, the Roman poet. That tells me everything. Are we crazy? How, how can we fall for this? It's true. We believe it. I believe her without reservation. I'm ready. Are you? I... 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 I, I guess so. It was happening. Huh. How could it be happening? Here I was on the night of February 14th. A calm, cool, peaceful evening. I was driving a small truck. Inside was a half a ton of gold in neatly stacked bricks. Up front with me were Dudley, or should I say Aurelian, and Queen Zenobia. Uh, I, I, I was crazy. It, it, it was a swindle. It was, it was just a hustle to steal our money. But it didn't matter. I didn't care. Besides, that wasn't true. It was real. She was telling the truth. We turned off the highway. We drove along a narrow, deserted country road. And then we stopped at what seemed to be the mouth of a cave. We shall bring the gold inside the cave. And there we shall make the sacrifice. Sacrifice? Uh, how? The gold shall be piled high as an altar... We shall call upon the immortal gods to take it. We took the bricks of gold inside the cave. Little one-pound bricks, but well over a thousand of them. Most were his, of course. But it didn't matter. Uh, we piled them high and they gleamed in the rays of the moon that made their way inside the cave. And, and finally it was done. 
and the altar was complete. And then she said, Believe. Believe with me. Do you believe, O Lucius Domitius Aurelian? I believe. Do you believe, Publius Terentius, that you are freed finally from the false identity of Charles Fleetwood Carswell? Do you believe? I I believe. At that precise moment, I... I believed. I, I felt as if I were bathed in light. I trembled at the edge of overwhelming truth. When... When there seemed to be something... Something out of place. What What was it? Uh, it, it? It was a smell. The... <laughs> the unmistakable smell of salami. I turned around quickly. There was Fatso, pulling back the hammer of a large forty-five caliber revolver. But before he could... Look out! <coughs> what... What is this? This, I guess, is a swindle. He and Angel Blanche plan to get you up here and kill you. All right, I won't believe it. I, I, I can't believe it. Zenobia, where is she? I, I, I guess she's gone. Uh, Fatso should be out for a bit. I'm sorry I had to hit him so hard. It's impossible. I don't believe it. Don't believe she... The two of them arranged it. To make it look even better, <laughs> they decided to turn a private detective, me, loose on the scheme. Just to make it look good. I should have tumbled when she knew my name. Who could have told her? Then the world isn't coming to an end. Uh, no, uh, not tonight. And I'm not the Emperor Aurelian? Uh, it uh, doesn't look that way. How, how did she do it? Hypnosis. Auto-suggestion. But it can't be a lie. It, it can't be... I am the Emperor Aurelian. I know it. I am the Emperor. To this day, he believes it. And to show you human nature, he was so angry with me for bursting that little bubble, he refused to pay me my fee. Oh, well, if you think he was a nut... You should see some of my other clients. <laughs> and maybe he will one day. Certainly, if they're anything like Mr. Dudley McElhenney, they're worth an hour of our time. Well, this has been a story that proves the old adage. What old adage? If you want to sell a crazy harebrained scheme, your best customers will prove to be practical, hard-headed people. I expect all my customers to meet me here in just a few moments. All the people who've lived and died, is that the end? Is everyone born into the world someone brand new? If a human being is a spirit that animates a corporal entity, does not that spirit live on when the perishable flesh disappears? Therefore, although we may have a fair idea of who we are, is there any way of knowing who we were? Our cast included Fred Gwynn, Bryna Rayburn, Jack Grimes, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall... For those of us who grew up listening to the chug-chug of steam and the lure of that mournful whistle in the night, the romance of the railroad will never die. Nowadays, of course, trains are different. Yet the clickety-clack of the wheels remains the same. And the whistle still speaks of strange and faraway places. I hope the romance still lingers. Long enough for me to bring you this story. The whole point was, you see, that it didn't matter where they thought they were going, because they were really all dead. <laughs> that ain't true about us, Mrs. Winsome. I can assure you, we're all very much alive. You know, Mr. Conductor, you're the very last one in the world I would trust to tell me the whole truth. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Journey to Somewhere, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Norman Rose and Carol Titel. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Why are so many people buying Buick's new century? Well, it depends on who you ask. Mrs. Marsha Resnick? It holds the road and it drives really smooth. It's nice. And Mrs. Phil Jackson. I like it because it's roomy. And Mr. Jackson, he can't even begin to tell you all the reasons why he likes their new Buick Century. <laughs> I really wouldn't know where to start. But then that says a lot about Buick's new Century and why it's drawing a crowd at your Buick dealers. A little magic, a little On a certain day, in a certain year, not so very long ago, a certain train pulled out of a terminal in one of our major cities and headed north. It was traveling what was little better than a spur track. There were few stops along this line to Skeffington Junction, and just as well. For weeks, this part of the country had lain gasping in the clutch of one of the most bitter winters in weather department history. For the record... The locomotive was number 711. A cosmic joke, considering all the bad luck this train carried with it and was heading into it. Sounds almost like a ghost train, doesn't it? I beg pardon. Maybe I should beg yours. A silly sort of remark, I guess. What I meant was all this snow, it uh, muffles the sound, sort of a dreamlike quality. I was thinking the same thing, looking out the window... A world smothered in white silence, swallowing up, absorbing the sound. <laughs> it is a ghost train. <laughs> a sad opening gambit for a conversation. Uh, forgive me, my, my name is Henry Thorpe. Uh, how are you, Mr. Thorpe? <laughs> I'm Julie Conrad. I suppose I should say was. Oh, now, don't tell me that you're a disembodied spirit. It isn't something I can joke about. Not after 23 years of marriage. Oh, I'm sorry, uh... You're widowed. No. No, it hurts a lot worse than that. Divorce? That's the polite name for it. It can be a dirty business, Mr. Thorpe. Just for your information, if you've never been through it. I haven't. My, my wife died. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Well, it's some time ago. Do we... Does one make adjustments? Well, I guess it's up to the individual. I have not been roaringly successful... Or I suppose I wouldn't be on this train. Nor I suppose would I. It might be interesting to pursue just what that means. I beg your pardon, sir. But could the lady please take care of my patient? And could you help me? Oh, get the conductor. Oh, dear lady, what is it? My patient is in the seat just across the aisle. A few seats back. She's not ill, just just elderly. Her name is Mrs. Winsome. Mr. Thorpe, help this woman... I'll go and take care of Mrs. Winsome. Yes, of course. Uh, now, what can I do for you, uh, nurse? Oh, we'll need the conductor. Would you get me to a hospital? I'm having, I believe, an acute 
Appendicitis attack. All right, all right. Now, now take it easy, nurse. Mrs. Winston? Oh. Yes. Now, how did you know my name? Well, I, I'm sitting a few seats in front of you. Your nurse told me your name. Did she? Oh, but what happened to her? Well, I'm afraid she's not feeling too well. Oh, dear me. That's rather strange. Why? Of course, she's supposed to be in charge of me. Well, you aren't well? Of course I am. Just the way they feel. They? My daughter and that dreadful husband. They just wanted to get rid of me. So they stuck little Miss Brown with cutting me off to be incarcerated. To be what? Locked up in a nice, safe nursing home. Mrs. Winsome, could we talk about you a little later? Of course. Everyone always wants to talk about me a little later. But somehow, the time never comes around. Who did you want to talk about? Oh, just for the moment. Your nurse. So what's the matter with her? Well, she thinks she may be having an appendix attack. Oh, dear. Then we must stop the train immediately. Well, I think they're discussing it. I mean, um, I, I see uh, Mr. Thorpe is talking with the conductor. Now, what are we going to do? Well, it ain't but a few miles to Lambert up ahead. Uh, I'm going front to tell the engineer we'll be making an emergency stop. Well, do they have a hospital in Lambert? Oh, Doc Prouty has a clinic I reckon I'll have to do. We'll, uh, we'll phone on ahead and alert him. Uh, I'll uh, be right back. He said there is a doctor. Yes, that's right, nurse. Well, I hope that solves me. Now, what am I going to do about my patient? Well, surely we can find accommodations for her, too. No, you don't understand. She can't manage alone. And besides... Oh, oh, oh. She should be gotten to the sanitarium as soon as possible. But where is the sanitarium? It's Skeffington Junction. It's about six or seven minutes from the station. Do you know the town? Well, I was born there, but I left a long time ago. D do you remember Little Falls Ridge? With the big Indian teepee on top of oh, it? Oh, bless you. That blew down years ago. Oh, I, they've got the sanitarium there instead. If only... No, oh. you, you just try to rest. And don't worry. Oh. I'll get your patient there for you, okay? That is a load off my mind. Now, if you go by my, my purse, there's a big envelope beside it with all the papers. Now, would you bring it, please? Well, I don't like to leave you alone. No, no, no. I'll be all right. I want to check and make sure you have everything. Oh, I think we must be coming into Lambert now. Won't be a second. Uh, oh, miss, miss. Yes, sir? Uh, this, uh, this lady isn't feeling well. Would oh. you mind keeping an eye on her for just a minute? Well, I don't know if I can... Please, it's an emergency. Oh, okay, sir, I'll do my best. I'll be right back. Uh, ma'am, uh, excuse me, but, uh, this man asked me, could I help you? Is, is there anything I can do? Oh, 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 oh I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, you heard oh. If you just tell me how I could help you. Ma'am, uh, lady, lady, wake up. Please. Oh, no. Oh, mister. Oh, where did he go? Hey, watch it, watch it, lady. Don't, don't fall off the seat. Hey, hey you. Me? Yeah, you. Come here, will you please help me? Uh, help well, me. Well, well, what's the matter? Your mother passed no, out or something? No, no, she's not my mother. She's just a woman that's sick. Now, here, help me get her back on the seat, will you? Well, why not? Uh, 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 give me, give me a lift right yeah. here, okay? Okay. Oh, there, she's all right. Hey, that's a big idea, the train coming to a sudden stop like this. It's coming into a station, I guess. Yeah, I don't see nothing out there but snow and snow banks. Hey, where'd that conductor go? Oh, search me. He, what's eating you, whoever you are? Nothing. I just don't like... I, I mean, well, why should we be stopping here? I've... What's the matter? You act like you had cops on your tail. Hey, I never said that. Okay, miss. Uh, and you, son. Uh, thanks for helping out. I'll oh, take over now. Hey, uh, you know why we're stopping here, mister? Yes, to get this lady to a hospital. Uh, what's happened to her? Well, I... I think she just sort of passed out, Mr... Uh, Thorpe, Henry Thorpe. Oh, yeah. uh, no, let me see. Oh, uh, she's, uh... Well, she's breathing all right. Oh, Maybe it's a blessing she won't feel the pain. All right, thanks again. The conductor and I will handle the rest. Yes, yes, sir. Hey, uh... Where are you sitting? Oh, right over here. You mind if I sit with you? Well, I don't know. I want to ask you something. What? How come you thought I might be, uh... Taking off from the cops? Maybe it takes one to know one. What does that mean? It means bug off. I'd rather be alone. Okay, suit yourself, sister, if that's the way you want it. That's the way I want it. 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've uh, made an emergency stop. There'll be no one boarding the train, and with the exception of the lady we have to get to the hospital, no one will leave it. Uh, there's a bad storm out there, and we'll be pulling out first chance we get, because we're running late. How long do you think we're going to have to hang on this whistle stop? I don't know, until they get the nurse day into a hospital, I guess. Hmm. What's going to happen to the old lady she was taking care of? Oh, Mr. Thorpe said he'd look after her. Who's Thorpe? Well, that guy who came over when you were helping to get the nurse back on the seat. The one who got off with the conductor and the guys with the stretcher? Yeah. Yeah. Suitcase Sam. No, I think I think he said his name was Hen... What do you mean, Suitcase Sam? Oh, it's just a name I gave him in my mind, like. Why? Hey, wait a minute. Who asked you to sit down? Me, myself? Uh, my name's Duke. What's yours? Linda Sn- Now, what's it to you? Well, does it hurt to know your name? Linda what? Goes both ways. Duke what? <laughs> okay, so, Linda Duke. Hmm. How come you call Mr. Thorpe Suitcase Sam? Oh, that. You ever notice the way he hangs on to his briefcase? Ever since he got on the train, no matter what he does, he never lets go. Helps out the old lady, lugs the briefcase. Goes off the train, it still goes along like, um, like it was chained to him. How come? Boy, he has important papers in it. Money, I don't know. Why? This crummy old train. Headed for practically nowhere. Five of us in this coach, now that the nurse is gone. Ever stop to figure what brings us all here? No, I got my own problems. Sure. We got problems, all of us. Hey, who are you? I told you, Duke. A student of life. Well, what are you trying to say? There are five of us right here, and we've got one thing in common. We're all on the lamb, running like hell from something or other. Okay, everyone, uh, uh, we're uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, you'll be glad to know that the lady who is sick is in good hands. Uh, uh, by now, in spite of the weather, she's at the clinic, uh, about to have her appendix removed and in A1 condition. So... We'll uh, be getting rolling again. Did you uh, hear what the conductor said, Mrs. Winsome? Oh, yes. In spite of my age, my hearing is quite unimpaired. Tell me, is Nurse Brown all right? Well, I believe so. Hey, excuse me, Mr. Thorpe, just uh, collecting tickets. Uh, thought excitement for clean slipped my mind. Oh, sure, conductor. Uh, here's mine. Uh, the other lady... Uh... Uh, oh, I got the two young people and her. Uh, just Mrs. Winsome's and the nurse left. Miss Brown put them right there on the back of the seat. That's right. Let's see. Huh. One way for you, I reckon. Return ticket for her. Should have gotten that to her. How do you know the return isn't for me? Well... Or for I... Mr. Thorpe? Is it? Well, no. The uh, return trip was Miss Brown's, the, the nurse. Cozy, isn't it? Five of us left on the journey. All one-way tickets. They are, aren't they, Conductor? Why, uh, yes. Ah, <gasps> what a night. I'd see anything out of this window. For all we know, we could be plunging straight into a void. Well, I doubt it. As long as the train stays on the tracks, they do lead somewhere, you know. Do I? Do you? I wonder where. Skeffington Junction. That's where I'm headed. Are you sure? I don't quite understand. I saw a play once about some people on an ocean liner traveling in a fog. And none of them really knew where they were going. Oh, yes. Outward bound. Oh, that's right. The whole point, you see, was that it didn't matter where they thought they were going. Because they were really all dead. <laughs> well, that ain't true about us, Mrs. Winsome. I can assure you, we're all very much alive. And there was a steward on the ship just like you. Do you know, Mr. Conductor, in this circumstance, that you are the very last one I would trust to tell me the whole truth? <laughs> We shouldn't pay too much attention to the vagaries of an old lady who is on the way to being institutionalized. Or should we? The passengers are an odd assortment of lost, unhappy people. What urges them towards Skeffington Junction? What is there for them, if indeed they ever reach it? And if they don't, what will be their ultimate destination? I shall return shortly with Act Two. This year, give Mom a gift she can appreciate long after Mother's Day is over. Like a name-brand kitchen appliance from True Value Hardware Stores. 
pie. Pat Summerall to suggest you give her a Presto Fry Baby deep fryer. It deep fries one to two servings of fish, shrimp, chicken, or other fried foods in just minutes and just two cups of cooking oil. And the lid snaps on to store the oil for the next use. Or give Mom the Bun Drip Coffee Maker from True Badger Hardware Stores. It brews up to 48 ounces of coffee in under three minutes and heats water for soup, tea, or cocoa. And the Bun Drip Coffee Maker comes in white with an exclusive fruit cluster design available only on True Badger Hardware Store's collection of name-brand kitchen appliances. This Mother's Day, give Mom a name-brand kitchen appliance like the Presto Fry Baby Deep Fryer or the Bun Drip Coffee Maker from participating True Value Hardware Stores. And remember that True Value is more than just a name. It's our way of doing business. The night is a blur of swirling snowflakes. The searchlights from the locomotive bombard the gloom. The rails gleam bright, leading the train surely towards its destination. Inside the first coach, our passengers are as we left them. But from the cold, wild night outside, phantoms have penetrated the interior warmth. And an old lady's voice has stirred in all our travelers the dead ashes of loss and desertion. Only Gus, the conductor, is left unaffected. We must be running very late, Conductor. Mm, lost pretty near an hour. Hmm. Can you estimate what time we might be getting into Skeffington Junction? Uh, pretty hard to say, the way the weather's shaping up. Uh, you want me to go up forward and check? Yeah, I wish you would. Yeah, I'll do that little thing. Mrs. Winsom? Yes? Uh, I just thought I'd like to kind of point out if, if we really had a, well, like you say, a date with destiny, it, it sure wouldn't be hit or miss like this, would it? I wouldn't have thought so before. But now that you mention it, perhaps this is just the way it should be. Uh, well, I'll uh, get up on forward and talk to the engineer. That man is hiding something. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, hiding what? The truth. About what? I can't answer that. Oh, never mind. Am I to understand that you have taken over as my nurse? Oh, no, no, not at all. I just told Miss Brown, since she was sick, that uh, I would help you to get where you're going. To the funny farm. I beg pardon? Oh, don't try to be polite. That's the common term for it. Well, I don't buy the term or the qualification. You are on your way to a sanitarium. Highly qualified and recommended. All right, if you like it so much, do you want to take my place? Me? Why, why would I want to... Now, don't try to pull the wool over my eyes. You think I don't know of the signs of a man who wants to run from life? Hmm. You do, don't you? Hmm, perhaps. But that has nothing to do with you. Now, don't be too sure. Oh, I may come on strong, but maybe I'm just as ready to run as you. The only thing is, never mind what you run from... Where is it you want to run to? Well, where do you? And it's not very interesting. Try me. All right. I had a wife mm -hmm. who was my whole life. And she died suddenly. The children were gone, long gone, involved in their own lives. And in my case, not interested in extending the line. You know, creating grandchildren, whatever you want to call it. And suddenly I... I don't know. I was up against a blank cliff. End of the road. Now, I did a complete flip-flop. No, you, you, you'll have to explain that for me. Maybe also for myself. You see, I was born poor. We were so poor that when I was eight, I was let out for adoption. I never knew my parents, who died very young. It was only in the last years when I couldn't find roots with my children that I tried to go back and find them with my parents. Did you? No, not really. Just enough to make this last journey. Because I see it as the only place I'm wanted. I think you're very lucky to find any place you're wanted. Some of us are not so lucky. Mind if I sit down for a moment? Hmm? Oh, no, why not? But uh, what about your charge? Mrs. Winston is enjoying the kind of sleep that only the very young or the very old seem to be capable of. You sound a little bitter. I am. Well, I should be the last to criticize. So am I. Oh? What are you bitter about? Life and whatever prolongs it. 
this endless trip? Why do we have to just put put along? A pretty wild storm out there. The train doesn't have to see where it's going. The tracks are laid out. It just has to go. That's why I picked it. To go where? Skeffington Junction? Mainly to anywhere I wasn't. I don't know how to answer that. Who asked you to? Just... Well, just the normal process of give and take between two human beings. Well, haven't we gotten to the time of life where that shouldn't be necessary? If you want to argue cases, why don't you consult them? Consult who? Those two. Those two so-called kids over there. Ask them about the state of the universe. They know it all. They have it all tabbed. Leaving the two of us just two outmoded nothings to cop out. <laughs> The faster, the better. No, wait, wait, just a minute. You... Ah, forget it. (laughs) Ask a foolish question, you get a foolish answer. What's so foolish about my answers? Anytime any of us give up on living, wouldn't you say that it's foolish? No. Anyway, I'd have laid odds you'd be the first to understand. Me? Why? Things you said when you first intruded on my privacy. This whole crazy setup. What's a well-dressed, obviously successful businessman like yourself doing on a flea-bitten train like this to nowhere? I'm going to Skeffington Junction, aren't all of us? I don't know. There aren't any other stops between here and there. Well, then that must be where we're going. (laughs) Don't tell me you have business there. Well, if it happens, I have. Don't you? Not really. This is a pleasure trip? That it is not. Definitely not. Well, then why... Oh, call it a... Call it a stepping-off place? To where? That's a good question. Why don't you ask the others? Except poor little Mrs. Winsome. She knows where she's going. It really is the end of the line for her. It might not be so bad for her. You're an optimist. And you? Since the roof of my world fell in, I expect only the worst. Now, look, Mrs. Conrad. You're a young woman. You lost a husband recently, all right. You'll weather the storm. You'll find a new life. I don't want a new world. I want the one I had. I just wish I was dead, since I might as well be. Well, that is a bit rugged, Mrs. Conrad. Well, that is the way I feel. It takes all kinds of women, I imagine, to make a world. My kind, or <laughs> maybe it's just me. My kind is symbiotic. Symbiotic? <laughs> Forgive me. I once was a biology major. Symbiosis is the living together of two different but mutually interdependent organisms. Take away one of them and the other dies. Well, there couldn't be anything much different than man and woman, could there? But your husband... Oh, he's a survivor. He'll adapt. Not me. Without him, I'm dead. So... You're running away. Or towards... Toward what? Scaffington Junction. It's a miserable, scrubby little town, you know. Except for the hotels. But it's a a jumping-off point for one of the most glorious sights in the world. Those wild, cascading, plunging waters with the spindrift hanging in the air to condense in your hair like diamonds or pearls. <laughs> He said I was wearing a Juliet's cap. <laughs> I was in Fairyland or Camelot or you pick your own heaven on earth. And it never changed till... <sighs> till it changed. I spent my honeymoon in Skeffington Junction. Began my whole life there. So did I. I was born there. Is that why you're going back? More or less. To try to find a new life? No. That isn't possible for me. But it could be for you. Oh, no way. I'm just going there to say goodbye. Mrs. Conrad, forgive me, but I... Look, Mr. Thorpe, if you have an urge to save a life, forget the two you've squandered yourself on so far. The two? Mrs. Winsome and me. Why don't you concentrate on the really lost? I, I, I don't know quite what you mean. Another of my failures was my children. Not so much unlike those two. Why do you suppose they're going to Skeffington Junction? I wouldn't have the least notion. Oh, (laughs) you are a very persuasive man. If you have this missionary urge, go save a couple of souls young enough to maybe make a difference in the eternal balance. Oh, you misunderstand me, Mrs. Conrad. 
I'm the last person to have any missionary urges. In my own way, I'm just as dead as you profess to be. Zonked out, and the briefcase was sitting right beside him. So? So, I checked it. It wasn't locked. I took a peek. What am I supposed to say? Well, don't you want to know what was in it? All right. What? Money. Dough. Wrapped like from a bank. Must be a hundred, two hundred thousand, maybe. I don't know. So? So, it's a lot of bread. That isn't ours. Or anyone's, except, like, uh, who has it. Are you talking about stealing it? Oh, come on, what steal? Nobody owns nothing, it's all up for grabs. I don't get you. I say you do. I think you're just as funky as I am, only you don't want to face up. Oh, I don't get you. Punk, baby, punk, all the way. I don't know what you're talking about. What's punk? I'll lay it out for you. I'm me, and I don't give a damn for nothing, nobody, no way. I am punk. I don't know. Are you all right? Oh, yes, I just hurt my arm a little. It's nothing. You better look at Mrs. Wynn. Mrs. Wisdom, are you all right? Mrs. Wisdom? Uh, against her will, a woman who feels her life is already over, a man who has turned from the living to the dead, a self-confessed punk who cares about nothing but himself, and a young girl whose secret is still locked behind two dark and frightened eyes. What is the best way out for all of these? I shall return shortly with Act Three. Maybe you've got a neighbor who just bought a new Electra, and he's gotten so smug and self-satisfied lately, you can't stand it. Well, look at it this way. If you had just gotten a car with all the luxury and prestige of Electra, and a trim European-like design that makes it easier than you might imagine to park and maneuver in city traffic, wouldn't you be a little insufferable for a while? We thought so. The new Electra, at your Buick dealers now. to dig out the huge engine from the snowdrift into which it had burrowed to an accidental halt. The air in the front coach is growing cold. The two young people are huddled together, sharing his goose-down parka. Henry Thorpe stands, beating his hands across his chest, while Mrs. Conrad snugs into his overcoat. Further back in the car, little Mrs. Winsome is two bright button eyes gleaming out from a mound of stray clothing wound about her. Hey, this is Kenny Kicks, huh? Oh, glad you think so. Freezing to death. Mm. Oh. Cozy enough under a blanket. Now, don't get me ideas. Ah, oh, come on. No. Linda, what's the big cold shoulder? You're wasting your time. I wouldn't trust you any farther than I can throw you. You're not my type. Mm? Who said it takes one to know one? Well, that was different. How different? I just meant you were running out on something. Okay. Okay, suppose I am. Hmm, must be your conscience is troubling you. Hey, don't give me that square talk. How come you, of all people, figure I have to be wrong? Me, of all people? Oh, no luck, Duke, or whatever your name is. First, I don't care what put you on the road, and second, I... Look, it was nothing all that terrible, just everything backed up. 
lucking out in another college, which was stale news. But it meant the usual go-round with my parents, and I'd had it. So I cut out. Got enough bread to see me through to Canada, and then I can move in with the family. Can? Yeah, yeah, it's a, uh, what do you call it, a commune. You? In a commune? Yeah. I don't believe it. Look, it's where you can let everything loose, flow oh. free. Thumb your nose at the establishment. Oh, come on, isn't the family just another kind of commitment? Well, all right, so what if it is? It's one that I picked, not one I was stuck with. Hey, it's a good life. You ought to dig it, too. Doesn't it uh, grab you? I don't know. It's something I never even thought about. Can just anybody join us? If you want to make the commitment. Uh, hey, are you putting me on? No, no why would you think that? Well, I had the notion right off on the first that maybe you were headed for the family, too. No, this is the first I ever heard of that. Well, then where are you headed? You wouldn't want to hear. Try me. Oh, I, I, I don't like to put it into words. Talk to me, Linda. You know you want to talk to somebody. Oh, yeah, somebody. <laughs> Anybody. Well, my father. Well, he died a long time ago. And... Four years ago, my mother married again. I was 14. The guy, I, the man she married didn't want me. I just came along with the deal. Oh, he treats my mom all right. But the guy's a, he's a dog. <laughs> he's let me around plenty when my mother didn't know. Later, she didn't care after she started drinking. <laughs> well, until then, I could take it. But suddenly, I was 18, and... The only way was out. But out where? You got relatives in Skeppington Junction? <laughs> You're going to laugh at this. But, um, have you ever heard about Pen Pal? Uh, oh, you mean like you get a name and address and write and he writes back and all mm-hmm. that? Mm-hmm. No, like that. Sometimes when the walls close in on you, you got to find a new door out or a window to escape. Well, anyway, I wrote this guy nearly two years ago. He's a farmer, and he lives two hours out of Skeffington Junction. He's old enough to be my father, but he never had a wife, so okay, I never had a father. He was the only way out. Well, that's where I'm headed. Hey, that is crazy, throwing yourself away. Are you any better? What do you think you're doing? Well, I uh, sure hope you folks are making out. I ain't got much to report. Uh, we're still waiting for the relief engine that's on its way. We're going to try to keep you as warm as we can till then. But you are going to have to help. Uh, how are you kids doing? Oh, we're, we're making our eyes. Good. Uh, uh, oh, Mr. Thorpe, you look pretty cold. Uh, I'm all right. He isn't, really. He gave me his coat to keep me from freezing. Well, uh, I got an extra coat here. You, you better climb into it, sir. Or well, maybe Mrs. Winsom could use it. I think you need it more. Take it, Henry. I, I could use it for just a moment or two if I could be sure that... Uh, why don't you let me sit with the old lady for a spell? Uh, just come out from the engine room and... Oh, what, what is it? Well, uh, uh, it, 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 it's all right, folks. I just take it easy. No cause for alarm. It's uh, just the new locomotive hooked up with us at last. Mr. Conductor. We're going back, aren't we? We are. Guess in our own ways, none of us here were all that anxious to get to Skeppington Junction this time around. Where will we end up? I don't rightly know. I doubt if it'll be Lambert. The town was all sewed up with this weather when we stopped there a while ago. We might have to chase our tails back to where we began. Oh, dear. That wouldn't really solve anything, would it, Mr. Oh, I am so sorry. I don't know your name. Well, gosh, is pretty near all I ever use. But you must have another name. Mm, never had any real use for it, except uh, in contacts and the like. Uh, summers, it is. <laughs> it's not much of a name in weather like this. <laughs> summers. Oh, I find it a very nice name. And a cheap one. Especially in the condition we all find ourselves. Do you, ma'am? Why? Well, it's better than if you'd been called winter. It might have been better if I had. <laughs> Why? Well, this extra little jaunt, Mrs. Winston. 
You know it as well as me. It's only a... Uh... What do you call it when a fellow that's condemned to die gets word from the governor or the king? Uh, or the... Reprieve. Oh, wait, now that's it. Reprieve. But it ain't gonna last long. I don't quite understand. No. You and me, we're in the same boat, huh? Nobody wants us anymore. I'm 65. The boom falls. I gotta retire. There goes my whole life. Mm. I never had nothing but the railroad. Take that away. I'm only waiting out the years. That is my case entirely. We are both in the same boat. Well, I, oh, uh, Mr. Thorpe, uh, anything I can do? No, no, Gus. Stay where you are. I, uh, just had a sudden urge for a cigar. I'm going out to the platform to indulge it. Oh, how is Mrs. Conway? Well, she's fast asleep. I didn't want to disturb her. I don't think anyone else should. Uh, Gus, when do you think we'll be stopping? Well, not this side of the Guzman Bridge. Mm. How long is that? Well, we should be crossing in another two, three minutes. Oh, fine. Uh, now, if you'll excuse me. Oh, such a pity. Hmm? That nice man without a wife. Lonely. And there's a woman just made to order for him. Big pardon? The lady who is sound asleep. Divorced. Lonely as him. Mm. You'd like to see them together? It would be nice. Uh, but not reasonable, Mrs. Winsome. Or any more reasonable than these two kids who are coming this way. Now, what do you suppose they want? Hey, uh, conductor, uh, uh, it's getting kind of steamy in here. Okay, if we go out on the platform for a breath of air? I hope you don't mind. Oh, no, no, of course not. You can have a little visit with Mr. Thorpe. He's out there having a cigar. Oh, cheer up. Neither of us smoke. Uh, we'll leave you some air to breathe. That was sweet. What? Thinking of the non-smokers. Maybe there's some hope for you after all. Like how? Maybe you're not all punk. Uh, you want to get the door? Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, hi, Mr. Thorpe. Uh, you mind if we join you here on the platform? No, not at all. If you don't mind the cigar. Uh, Linda? No, Mama. We've been so cooped up. <laughs> Can we get some real fresh air? Well, we could crack the outside door open just a piece, okay? Oh, solid. Here, let me help. Oh, no problem. There we are. Except, where are we, really? Well, the conductor said we should be crossing the river and... Oh, yeah, I guess we're on the bridge now. It's been a strange trip, hasn't it? Yeah. One I don't care ever to take again. <laughs> or me. I don't know if I can agree. Oh, Hang on for your lives. The bridge gave way. What? Oh. We're hanging on the edge by a thread. I have the door open. Yeah. Jump. Yeah. Jump at your only chance. Yeah. jumped just in time to make the snowbank, then our car got pulled down with the rest. And, and, and the old lady, the conductor, Mrs. whatever her name was. Yeah, gone. Oh, my. Wiped out. Oh, took. I'll tell you, Linda, it, it makes you sit up and take a new look. I, I just sat out. Oh. Oh. Hey, oh. how's Mr. Thorpe? I don't know. Well, he, he, he's alive. Uh, <laughs> sir? Uh, sir, you all right? Something. Something ha happened to my to my back oh. when we jumped. Is, is there anything we can do to help? No, no, no! Don't don't try to move me. Oh. This way, this moment, it doesn't hurt too much. So we've got to get you out of here. Why? You want me as another statistic? Forget it. Oh, you know that's not what we want. I know, Linda, but I'm long past caring what you want from me. It's what I want from you that's important. I want you both as another statistic. Uh, what? Six of us that we know of. Six of us on that train. Four of us ready and com composed. 
supposed to die. Not not you, sir. We won't mention the disease, but it was progressing so fast. I would have been destroyed in weeks. All the others had no real future, like me. Except... Except you two. And that is the miracle. That you are here. I, uh... uh, I... I had a... A briefcase somewhere. Yes. Yeah, it's here. Lucky you always carries it with you, the, the one with the money. Oh, I'm, I'm glad that you that you know what it contains. No, we, we don't want the money. Just tell us where you... Don't say you don't want it. My own children are long ago taken care of. This, uh, this money is from a safe deposit box. No one knows of it but me. What did you mean it for? Well, once I thought... I would build a mausoleum for my parents who were buried in a pauper's grave. You see, that's where I was taking it. To die myself and lie with them. Uh, now, I know that, that that was stupid and I want... No. Yes, I, you want? I want this money to be for the young and for the future. I leave it to you to use as you see. I guess. Who? Well, what about the money? You heard what he said. You mean we take it? We take it and use it for things that he might have wanted it used for. Oh, I doubt if he'd have okayed the punk psychology. Oh, come on. I, I don't mean it like that. Well, then how do we use it? There'll be a way of... As long as it helps some young people, I... I don't guess he'd fault us too much. Us? Hey, I got a date with a man who wants to marry me. You've got a date with a man who wants to use you. We've got a better date. We? Okay. Us. With a hundred thousand bucks and the memory of this trip, of how wrong we could have gone, how can we lose? Are you propositioning me again? I'm trying to make you an offer you can't refuse. In everyone's life, there is a Skettington Junction. That particular private place where, when life becomes too much to bear, you can run and jump off. Or perhaps just bury your head in the sand. Of course, there is no such place in reality. For life itself ordains the pattern we must follow and the end that waits for us. Only the living have that second chance to make changes. So, make them while you can. I'll be back shortly. nothing more to say about our story, except that I hope, as you, the young people made good use of the gift of both money and time. And a quote from an old poem. Tis here, they say, the journey ends, and little doubt it must be so. But, as I tell my bestest friends, I hate to go. Our cast included Norman Rose, Carol Titel, E.V. Juster, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents...
Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Enmeshed in our discontent with the way this world has treated us, we tend to speculate on the possibility of a different sort of world. One, of course, where we expect to be happy and content and treated very well indeed. This world, this realm, this place beyond the stars is commonly called heaven. It is also called the spirit world or the astral world, sometimes the desire world. But the name I like best of all is Summerland. Mr. Bones? Bonesy, where are you? I want to talk to you, Scraggy, so you just get your spindle legs on down here. Oh, there you are, hatchet face. You had not to call me those things. Oh, and why not, skinny? How'd you like it if I called you fatso? Or hippo? Or jumbo? I wouldn't like it, Mr. Bone, so don't you try it. Don't you try it. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Death and Desire, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Maybe you've got a neighbor who just bought a new Electra, and he's gotten so smug and self-satisfied lately you can't stand it. Well, look at it this way. If you had just gotten a car with all the luxury and prestige of Electra and a trim European-like design that makes it easier than you might imagine to park and maneuver in city traffic, wouldn't you be a little insufferable for a while? We thought so. The new Electra at your Buick dealers now. A little giant, a little magic, a little giant. When their curiosity about the space beyond the stars has grown consuming, some people consult spiritualists, sensitives, clairvoyants, those possessing what they call crystal vision, who can bring into sight and hearing the inhabitants of Summerland. Our story is about one of those. Mr. Bones, Bonesy, I'm home and I want to talk to you so you get your spindle legs on down here. What do you want, Melba? Oh, there you are, hatchet face. You had not to call me those things. Oh, and why not? How'd you like it if I called you fatso or hippo or jumbo? I wouldn't like it, so don't you try it. You didn't used to mind when we were with the circus. When we were with Rafter's Traveling Circus, I was billed as Gargantua. It was all part of the act. You're just as fat now. And you're just as skinny. I can't help that. Neither can I help it. That's my glands. It's my glands, too. I don't like being called Mr. Bones or Bonesy or any of those other things. So I'll call you by your name. I'll call you Orville. I wish you would. I'll try. Really, I will. I'd appreciate that. Because I don't want anything to spoil our little arrangement because we get on pretty good. Don't you think so, Orville? Hmm, uh, pretty good. Well, it's five years since we've been together. Three at the circus, two here. Three years as the human skeleton and gargantua. And two years as Madame Melba and, uh... Yeah? What am I, Melba? Well, you're my husband, for one thing. Hardly anybody knows that. I never go out, never meet nobody. I just hang around the house. Well, it's a nice house. It's better than living in a trailer. I liked it in a trailer. Traveling around from place to place. You liked those one-night stands? Uh-huh, uh-huh, I did, I did. I liked sitting up and giving a show and knocking it all down and going on to the next place. In all those hick towns. Oh, I liked them. And, and Mr. Rafferty, I liked him. And the other freaks and the acrobats and the animals. And I liked them all. You liked sitting up there on that platform and letting all them yokels stare at you? Yes, I did. They'd never seen anybody like me, and they were very interested, very friendly. Friendly? Huh? Most of them were. I liked them. 
And sometimes one of them like me. I could tell. Oh, how could you tell? Oh, by the way he looked. Sometimes somebody would smile, not to make fun, a friendly smile. Who, who smiled at you, friendly? Oh, now, Melba, don't start up, please. Just, just a smile now and then. Like in Hoopersville once and, and in uh, Fergus Falls one time. Who smiled at you in Hoopersville? And what went on in Fergus Falls? And then nothing. Nothing went on. Nothing. Uh-huh. Guess maybe you'd like to go back to Rafty's Circus. Maybe I would. Back to Hoopersville. Back to Fergus Falls. It'd be better there than here. Well, I swear... You are living in a nice warm house. I cook you nice warm meals. You got nice warm clothes. You got color TV and stereo and about a million records. And you want to give all that up and go back to bumming around in the back of a trailer. Well, I just made that I Exhibiting yourself. Well, not me, no, sir. Not me, Spindle Shanks. I am Madam Melba. Madam Melba. Sensitive, sublime. Yes, sir, I've got a reputation, prestige. I've got a public image, and I ain't giving any of it up. All right, all right, Melbourne, I'll take it easy. And you, you are going to go on being Madam Melba's entity. You got that, Mr. Bones? Okay. Okay. Now sit down, and I'll tell you what we got on for tonight. Okay. Because if things work out tonight, we may be on the way to making ourselves a bundle. Okay, Melba. You remember old Mrs. Grant? She came here after her husband died. Oh, yeah. She was here every night for a while, a couple of years ago. Nice lady. Yeah, rich lady, too. Well, I just came from talking to her. I was very interesting. It seems that she has somebody she wants to send to me for a seance. A uh, friend? No, not a friend. That's a point. Well, then... Who would she want to send here if she's got no friends? It's her daughter. She's got a daughter? Didn't I just say so? Well, she never said anything about a daughter. Well, that's because she was all upset over losing her husband. And anyhow, her daughter lived in Paris. But I have been going through the society pages in the local newspaper. And what do I find there? Ho, ho. Madame Pierre Sorel has come to these shores. Madam Sorel. Me, Grant. Well, now, did Mrs. Grant say that this Madame Sorel is her daughter? No, of course not. She doesn't want me to know who it is that's coming to the CNs. Well, then how... how oh, Bonesy, if you'd followed the society pages like I do, plus the obituaries, you would know that Madame Sorel has to be Mrs. Grant's daughter. And you'd know why she is here. Why? Because her son just died. Her ten-year-old son, it took sick and he died. And you think... I don't think, I know. The mother is sending the daughter to me so I can help her make contact with a dead son. It's simple as ABC. What if you're wrong? I'm never wrong. A spiritualist is also telepathic, you know. Anyway, as soon as I lay eyes on her, I'll know for certain. Because if she's about 40 years old, and if there's any resemblance between her and her mother, like maybe those very blue, blue eyes, well, it doesn't matter, because I know I'm right, and you'll see. Now, you can throw your voice to sound like a 10-year-old boy, can't you? Well, no, I've never done that. Well, you can say, Mommy, can't you, can't you? A simple, Mommy. Mommy. Well, that's not bad. Coming from the astral world, you wouldn't expect it to be exactly the same as in life. I'll have to go out and get some more dry ice for the vapor. And you better go check your Hessian costume because you've lost some more weight. Oh, how about the wrappings? Okay. That's good. Now, don't get so thin that you can't do that anymore. Because the wrapping set the tone of the whole thing. Now, she will be here at 9 o'clock, and I want everything ready. I want you ready. 
because this may lead to something very big. Really big. Nine o'clock. And you look a proper Hessian soldier, Bonesy. A regular mercenary from the Revolutionary War. Oh, I love those boots. Now, you were killed at Yorktown, isn't that right? Oh, she's here. Start the music. I'll let her in. Come in, come in. I'm all ready for ya. Madam Melba? It is I. Come on in. I brought my husband. Is that all right? Of course it is, of course. You just follow me into the parlor. Lovely music. It helps, I found. Now, if you will enter. But it's, it's, it's so dark. I can't see a thing. Give me your hands. I will lead you to your chairs. Very yeah, cold, too. It is precisely 62 degrees. We can be seated. Here is a chair for you, sir. Oh, thank you. Now, if you will join hands. Yes. Yes, of course. You'd best be quiet, Pierre. Oh, no, it's all right. You may talk. It won't disturb me. Now, I am about to leave you. Leave us? For the trance state. Oh. In a few seconds, you will start to feel a wind across your hands. Do not be alarmed. The wind will grow cold. I think I... And then we wait for the entity. We... Entity, Madam Mel. The spirit from summer land, the sweet spirit who is my contact with the astral world. We shall hear from him soon, I think. Who is he, Madam Melba? He is a Hessian soldier, slain at your town in the revolution, fighting for the British. He never liked being a mercenary. Taking pay for opposing a righteous cause. Oh, hush, hush now. Listen. I told you we would hear from him. I hear. I hear. Pierre, do you? Yes, yes, I do. It's he. It's my entity. Oh, my dear Gustav. Will you materialize for these good people? They need you, Gustav. You mean we'll be able to see him? Actually see him? If we concentrate, if we believe. Oh, I believe, I do. We should see a vapor rise in now. The wind will grow colder. It is growing colder. And I see the vapor. Oh, I see it, I do. I see it. It is taking shape. Gustav, are you with us? Oh, why, I see his boots. Pierre, look. Where are his boots? Gustav, will you talk to us? His jacket. Will you, Gustav? His help, Gustav, we need you. Good evening. Oh, 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 oh sir. Oh, uh, spirit, sir. What do I call him? Oh, you cannot speak to him at all. Gustav will speak only in answer to my questions. You just fix your thoughts on me, not on him. You send me your thoughts, your desires, your anxieties, and I shall receive them through telepathic communion. And now let me gather my strength. No! You want to know about some... Someone small, it seems to me. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Young. Yes. Yes, yes. A male. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Gustav, by your kindness and your mercy, can you put us in contact with a small male child? You have preference to... To a little boy. Someone who is close to someone here, I think. My son. Gustav. Will you do this for us? I have to try. Oh, please, please. He is here. Oh, he said he's here. My boy is here. Who's tall? Is the boy in good health? Is he well? Very well. Perfect health. Oh, thank God. Who's tall? Is he happy? Everybody is happy in Summerland. Very happy. There is no sorrow in Summerland. No troubles. No sorrows. Just peace and joy. Oh, my 
My darling son. Nobody making fun of anybody. Nobody calling names. Everybody cutting and nice and loving. That, that, that's enough. Everybody smiling, friendly smiling. That, that's enough. Everybody is the same. And nobody, nobody is a freak. Stop, Fred, you stop, Fred. Oh, let him go. No, 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 it's impossible. I'm exhausted. I cannot continue. Oh, but my little boy. No, 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 you must leave now. Oh, no. Things are getting out of control. But wait. You, you must leave. You must get out of my house. You are killing me. I cannot be responsible for what I will do. Just go, go, go. What happens to the dead people who have left us so abruptly without even looking back? Do they think of us? Do they miss us? Do they long for us and remember us with love? Are they troubled as we are? As restless, as filled with recollections and desires, surely Summerland is not a place where all emotion has been purged. For then, it would not be Summerland at all. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. We're going to stick our neck out and tell you something. It's hard to miss with Arrow. And the reason is so simple. America Shirt Maker is Arrow Shirt. America's Shirt Maker has done it again with what is probably the best shirt collar ever made. Arrow's patented custom collar. And only Arrow's got it. It's a whole inch wider at the bottom than the top, just like your neck is. It's adjustable by a full half inch, and it's got a special notch so the neckband doesn't show over your top. America's shirt maker is Arrow Shirt. See why we're sticking our neck out. Stick your neck into an Arrow custom collar. America's shirt maker is Arrow Shirt. If we're not already your shirt maker, we ought to be. the dead who dwell in Summerland have not lost all capacity for emotion, then how do they feel about being called back to this world? To answer questions which to them may seem childish. Of course, we know by now that Madame Melba's communion with the dead is entirely contrived and false. If it were real, might it not be, well, an impertinence? We return you now to our strange story. Come on, Madam Melba, I'll take you home. Oh, thank you, Mr. Rafty. It's so kind of you to attend the funeral. Well, we're playing just 20 miles from here, and I was very fond of Orville. Hated to see him leave the circus. We all did. The others would have come to the funeral, but we're doing three shows a day, you know. Oh, yes, I understand. Um, tell me, Melba, how did it happen? I... I didn't even know that Orville was sick. Well, he wasn't sick. He was in the best of health. Well, then, uh... How... Well, see, we had conducted a seance, just like all the others we'd done. And he acted, oh, what you might call peculiar toward the end of the seance. He just wasn't like himself at all. Uh, in what way? Well, it's, it's hard to explain if you don't know about seances. Well, I'm afraid I don't know anything about them. Well, there is a certain... Routine as a certain uh, continuity, as a scenario, you might call it. And it, it's always more or less the same. There's the cold wind and the vapor rising. I didn't know. And then when I've gone into deep trance, the rappings start. The rappings? Yes, from the spirit world. The, the, the spirits rap? Or the entity raps. Oh, I... I see. The, the, the entity. And then he materializes from the vapor. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, the vapor. Yes. After the entity has materialized from the vapor, then I talk to him. You actually talk to him? You, you really talk? And he talks to me. I ask questions of the entity, and he replies. Well, that's amazing. Well, it isn't so amazing if you have the power. I 
I hated to see him leave the circus. Yes. And you too, Melba. Well, of course, we had to make use of my gift. I suppose you did. It was funny. He was talking about the circus, about how he missed it, just before that last year. He was? Uh-huh. And that night, he became confused and disturbed. And I had to call off the seance before we finished it because I couldn't endure anymore. So I told the clients to leave the house. And then when I had put Orville to bed, he was all hot and feverish. And before I could even call a doctor, he passed out of this life. Oh, that's sad, terribly sad. And well, here's where I live, Mr. Rafter. Thank you so much for seeing me home. I appreciate it. Well, dear lady, I was only too glad. And would you remember to meet all the old friends at the circus? I suppose they're all still there. Uh, most of them. Of course, we had to replace you. And we found a splendid replacement for Orville. Benny, his name is. The finest specimen of a human skeleton is I've ever seen. And a nice chap, too. Well, you like him, do you? Of course, uh, he's not like Orville. Well, you, you said he was a nice chap. Oh, yes, yes. Very nice fella. Oh. How long are you going to be playing in these parts, Mr. Rafter? A few more days. We hit Fergus Falls next Tuesday, then we'll move on to Pennsylvania. Well, maybe I'll, I'll just come over and take in the show. Oh? Well, I'm sure everybody would be happy to see you, Melba. I ought to be in pretty good shape by Tuesday. And it might do me good to see the old crowd again. Mr. Ruffrey? Hmm? Oh, oh uh, Benny. Uh, could I uh, talk to you for a minute? Well, sure. Come on in, Benny. I uh, need some advice. You know Madam Melba? Well, of course I know Madam Melba. Well, you know she was here on Tuesday. Well, I know. You, you met her, I take it. Oh, yeah, yeah. She, uh, we had a long talk. Well, you did? Well, what about? Well, uh... You know, Madame Melba is a famous uh, medium now. Uh, it's like a clairvoyant sort of. Yeah, I know that. She's she's done very well at it, I understand. Yeah, that's what she says. And she, uh... She wants me to leave the circus and come be with her. As what? Be with her as what? Uh, well, she, uh, didn't say exactly. You, uh... You know, her husband just died, don't you? No. I didn't know that. Well, he did. Come down with a fever all of a sudden. He died. Oh, that's too bad. Her husband used to be the human skeleton with his show. Before you, did you know that? No. No, I didn't, I didn't know that. Orville, his name was. Fine chap. I was very fond of him. Sorry to see him go. I always had the feeling he hated to leave us, too. Matter of fact, she told me he was talking about the circus the very day he took sick and died. About coming back? Well, she didn't say just that. But I have a feeling... Now, look, Betty. Why do you think Madame Melba wants you to join her? I don't know. Well, some women have... Uh... Of ample size are often attracted to men of, uh, of your size. <laughs> yeah, I know. And vice versa. Mm -hmm. You think that's it? It crossed my mind. You want to go? Well... I tell you what. We'll be laying off for a week before we follow the circuit of Pennsylvania. Suppose you take the time and see what's cooking... With Madame Melba. Oh, can't you do anything? Well, I, I don't understand exactly what I'm supposed to do. You're supposed to do what I tell you to do. Well, you, well I don't know why I'm doing it. It's for the seance, Benny. I've told you a thousand times. Yeah, but I thought, I thought you were a medium, Melba. A clairvoyant. I am a sensitive... That's the proper term. So, what do you need me for? A sensitive needs a little help here and there. Well, what am I doing? That's your funny costume. That is the uniform of a Hessian soldier. A soldier? A dead soldier. A dead Hessian soldier. 
Oh, it's Hessian. Means German. German? I don't see what this is all about. You are the entity that appears from summer land, from the space beyond the stars. I ask questions and you answer them. Do I know what to say? I tell you what to say beforehand. Yeah, but then it isn't real. Well, not altogether, no. You're not a real sensitive. Oh, not absolutely real, no. Uh, 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 the vapor isn't real either. That's dry ice. None of it's real. It's real, but I have powers, Benny. No, but... I think I want to go back to the circus. So you think the circus is real? Everything in that is real. Even the smiles and the clown's faces. They're painted on and everybody knows they're painted on. They can see the paint. Nobody's trying to fool anybody and nobody's fooled. The animals are real. The high wire is real. The pretending is real. The pretending to be happy, to be gay, to, to be enjoying ourselves. It's pretending, but it's real pretending. All right, Danny, all right. You don't have to be a Hessian soldier. Just forget the whole thing. Just take off the uniform. We'll skip that part. But you will stick around, won't you? And do a couple of harmless little things. Like what? Well, like take the top off the dry eyes when I give you the cue. Well, how will I know when? What's the cue? It'll be word cue. I'll give you one. Like, come, sweet spirit from summer land. Yeah, come, sweet spirit from summer land. And then the vapor appears. And then I go on some more. And then the rapping start. Oh, yeah, well, Melba, I can't do the rappings. I tried and I tried and I can't do them. I can't crack my knuckles. I never could. Orville could crack his knuckles and his knees. Well, I can't. Orville could crack his toe. I am not Orville. I am Benny. And I can't do it. Well, if you try. I have tried. Well, try again, please, sweetie. For me, try again. It's because my bones aren't just the same as Orville's. Sweetheart, I've explained that to you. I went to all the trouble of consulting an orthopedic surgeon. And he says it is not the bones. It is the tendons. Now, remember that. It's not the bones. It's the tendons. Now, try, please. For me, try. All right. Try, my pet. Try for Melba. <laughs> I, I, I can't. It's no use. Orville could do it standing on a pillow. But well, I'm not Orville, and I can't do it. All right, all right, sweet precious. I didn't mean to upset you. Now... Let's try just once more. Never mind your knees or your toes. We'll forget all about the knees and the toes. Just your knuckles now. Try. Try, my darling. I don't think it's like this. Try. Oh, that's it. Oh, my sweet pet, you did it. You did it. Oh, that's it. That's it. You are wonderful. You are superb. You are marvelous. You did it. I... Didn't do anything. Yes, you did, didn't you hear yourself? Melba, listen to me. I didn't do anything. Oh, sweetheart, I heard you. That wasn't me. Oh, of course it was. No, it wasn't. Somebody else is in this room. Somebody else? You know who. Oh. Oh, well... Has to be Orville. Who else? Oh, he's... Oh, Orville's dead. He's come back. Orville, he's real. Not to me, Melba, not oh. to me. I'm going back to the circus. The circus is what's real to me. You're walking out on me? I'm not made for this life, Melba. I'm going back where I belong. No, you can't do that. You can't leave me all alone. Mr. Ravity said I could come back if I wanted to. I... What was that? Did you? I didn't do anything. Then what? Bonesy. 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 You're here! Now you don't know what 
have to believe, do you? Is there really a summer land or isn't there? Can the dead be called back from there, if there is such a place, by living persons whose powers are strong enough, who believe enough? And, as in the case of Melba, can they be summoned even by those who have no power and do not believe at all? Frankly, I haven't the foggiest idea. Do you? I'll be back shortly with Act 3. Man is coagulated smoke and will return to smoke. So said Paracelsus, 16th century physician and philosopher. Not a very elevated description of ourselves, is it? Not sufficient to interpret our restless dreams, our insatiable ambition, our irrational behavior. But who had ever explained those things? Or us, completely? Perhaps that's really all we are. Just coagulated smoke, destined to return to smoke. Moses! You're here! Oh, Bonesy. Oh, oh, who else could it be? Not me. I was on my way out. Well, you can go because I don't need you anymore. Well, I kind of like to stick around. No, you go. And see what happens. No, he won't materialize with you here. Materialize? Materialize? You, you mean? You don't know mean? You, you can't... Oh, me. never mind what I mean. You just get out of here. This is between Mr. Bones and me. Well, if I could see well, him... you can't see him. Talk to no. him. No. You, you mean... You were the only one who can't... That's just what I mean. Now, you go on back to Rafferty's Circus, where you belong. I got to uh, come back sometime, Madam Melba. No. Oh, oh dear. Bonesy, 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 are you really there? I thought you were dead. I mean, gone forever. Bonesy, did you really go to Summerland? And did you come back from there to help me? Oh, Bonesy, if I could believe that. Believe it, Melba. It's true. Uh, I'm here. Oh, oh, Mel. It's been so awful here without you. I know. Has it been awful for you, too? Well, has it? Nothing is awful in Summerland, Melba. You mean it's the way you said it was? That last time at the seance, it's really like that? It's kind and loving, and nobody is afraid. Yes, Melba. It's just like that. Oh, it's so hard to believe that there actually is such a place. You know, I never really believed that there was. Yeah, I know. I never believed anybody went there. I never believed anybody went anywhere. I know. But there is such a place. Because you've been there. And you know. Yes, I. And you came back to help me. Yes. That means, oh, that means I do have the power, doesn't it? I'm not a fake at all. I'm real, and I have the power. Oh, Bones, there, what a marvelous thing to find out after all this long time. Why, I can make a fortune with you to help me. Just, uh, what you have in mind, Melba? Well, there is a lady in this town. She's a baroness, Bonesy. But Elizabeth Baroness Barkarty, Hungarian, or Polish, something like that. Now, yeah, she's been pestering me for a seance for more than a month now. Ever since you, uh, since you went to Summerland. And I've been putting her off. I said I was too shaken up after your passing. Which, of course, I was. Yeah, of course. Besides which, I didn't have anybody to help me. And then, just as I'm about to give up completely and forever, you signaled your presence, those rappings. <sighs> I never heard a sweeter sound in my whole life. Now, listen about this baroness, Elizabeth Barcotti. She, her, her father died and then a mother. Well, maybe I've met them. Oh, I suppose you might have. 
Well, now she's got a husband, a rich American. But she never really got over losing a father and a mother. Poor lady. So I have a phone number, and I said that I'd call her when I was ready. Well, I will tell her that tonight is the night. Is that all right with you? My time is your time. Don't you what form are you going to take when you materialize? Or don't you want to materialize at all? I haven't quite figured all this out. Well, why don't you just leave it all to me, Melba? Well, uh, all right, if you say so. May I present my husband, Madam Melba? I'm so glad. Now, if you follow me into the parlor, follow close behind because the room will be dark. And you may find it a bit chilly. I'll keep it at 62 degrees. The spirits like it better that way. Now, there we are, a chair for you, Baroness, and one for you, sir. You will clasp hands, please. You may talk if you like, but in low conversational tones, if you please. Are we ready? Ready? Oh, this is nonsense, Elizabeth. Now, I am going to leave you. I am going into deep trance. In a few seconds, you will feel the wind across your hands. Do not be alarmed. The wind will grow colder. It is a signal from Summerland that the entity is approaching the sweet spirit who is my contact with the astral world. Oh, yes. We shall hear from him soon, I think. Oh, yes, soon. Oh, 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 was that, was, was that him? I told you we would hear from him. I can, I can hardly believe. Will you speak to us, spirit? Will he? Dear one, will you speak to us? And why not? What did he say? I said, why not? I'm not sure I understand him. You've got wax in your ears, lady. Well, perhaps we, we, we should start again. We seem to have got off on the wrong track somewhere. I say, he sounds like our Janet. I'm afraid we started wrong. Who's the pass? Who calls the pass? I'll close it. Uh, come in, in. Uh, look, look, uh, this isn't the right. I'll play. I'll run, oh. Come in. Merci. Gracias. Thank you, sir. Oh, well, believe me, I didn't know that this... Uh, well, what they can it mean? Well, it isn't what you think. <laughs> no, please, please don't go. Perhaps it would be... No, bad. please, I wish that you wouldn't go. Oh, let them go. Oh, them. Oh. Good business to bad rubbish. That's what I always say. What do you oh. all say? <laughs> Not a Melba. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry, too. Not at all what I expected. Oh. Nothing at all what I expected. No, I... No, I... Oh, did you do this on purpose? In a way. To humiliate me. Spirits don't like to be summoned, Melba. Oh. Or conjured. Oh, you're making fun of me. A little? Millie? Oh, Bill. And she made fun of us, Melba. Pretending we didn't exist? Well, I didn't know that you did. But I know now, oh, Bill. And, and, and I want. To be like you. Just what do you mean by that? I want to be with you in summer land. What? You want to be dead? That's a very wicked thought. But there's nothing for me here. And there's everything for me there. Uh, I'm sorry, Melba. What do you mean you're sorry? It's just not possible. You mean I can't? Go to some life? Mm, someday, maybe. Well, why not now? It just wouldn't fit in. Why? Why wouldn't I? Yeah, not the type. Well, what I have to do to be the type uh, to fit in? You have to lead a better life. Well, what kind of life? I don't know any other kind of life but this. Oh, yes, you do. Well, what? Tell me. Figure it out. And after you've figured it out, do it. And after you've done it, and the time has come, I'll put in a good word for you, Melba. I have a little influence in summer land. Mr. Rafferty, 
What? Why, it's Madam Melba. Come in, come right on in. Not Madam Melba, Mr. Rathke. Well, Melba then. Madam Melba is a little too formal for old friends. Not Melba either, Mr. Rathke. I am gargantua. Gargantua? Yes, Mr. Rathke. If you can see your way clear. Now, you don't mean that... Yes, I do. You want to come back here? Take your old job back? That's what I want. But you've been so successful in the world out there. I've been too successful. I don't understand. I, I really don't. Well, it's a long story. Maybe someday I can tell it to you. Well, I'd like to hear it. Oh, I'd like to tell it to you. If I can. Someday. Well, there's no rush. No rush. Would you... Would you like to take a look around, see some of your old friends? Yes, I would. I'd like that very much. Well, you just go ahead. You know where everybody is, I guess. I think I can remember. They'll all be very glad to see you. I hope so. Oh, my. Isn't it beautiful here? Mara Melba. Mara Melba. What are you doing here? Hello, Benny. I've come to get my old job back. You mean it? If Mr. Raft is willing. Say, uh, what's happened with Orville? Anything happened? Oh, Benny, quite a lot happened with Orville. Quite a lot. He really came back? You talked to him? Mostly. He talked to me. Oh, will he come here, you think? Oh, I don't think so, Benny. He's very happy where he is, you know. You mean you don't think you'll see him again? Oh, I'll see him again. But not for a while. And not here. I'll see him later on. Much later. In summer land. I don't completely understand our story at all. It seems to mean something. It's trying to tell us something. As near as I can make it out, the message is this. The dead, wherever they are, if they are any place, are all right. They are fine. Don't test them. Leave them alone. As I said, I don't really understand that story at all. Why are so many people buying Buick's New Century? Well, it depends on who you ask. Mrs. Marshall Resnick? It holds the road, and it drives really smooth. It's nice. And Mrs. Phil Jackson? I like it because it's roomy. And Mr. Jackson, he can't even begin to tell you all the reasons why he likes their new Buick Century. <laughs> I really wouldn't know where to start. But then that says a lot about Buick's new century and why it's drawing a crowd at your Buick dealer. I sincerely hope you're not confused. I hope you have a certainty that Summerland is where we're all going to wind up someday. Summerland, where all is kindness and goodness and loving one another. I hope you're right. And I hope to meet you there. We'll have a nice long talk, you and I, and reminisce about the story that I didn't understand at all. Our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, Robert Dryden, Joe and Arliss, and Arnold Moss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Mrs. E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Much has been written about fate... Retribution. You get what you give. Those who live by the sword die by the sword, and so forth. But often one starts out in life with what one believes are the best of intentions, only to be dealt a blow from which some of us never recover. This does not mean our lives are preordained, but as Shakespeare has said, the fault, dear Brutus, is in ourselves, not in our stars. In other words, know thyself. You took long enough, Grishka. Eight bells is the time we agreed upon. We were stopped by the cursed Coast Guard. If we are delayed and cannot pull up anchor with the tide, we risk everything. Don't be nervous, Captain. I shall be back in an hour. <laughs> when have I ever failed you? <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Guilt of the Innocent, is adapted from a story by Maxime Gorky, especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis, and stars Fred Gwynn and Bob Caliban. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Let me paint the scene for you. Russia, a seaport town on a hot summer day. The sky blue one hour and the next boiling with black clouds and storms. From morning till night, cargoes from Greece, Turkey, Europe are loaded and unloaded. Sailors, dock workers, customs officials shout and curse one another, a bedlam of perspiring activity. Standing, watching all this with wide eyes is Ivan, a farm boy who has come to the city to find work. I first saw Grisha Chelkas on the waterfront yesterday afternoon. He didn't see me. If I hadn't gone to church, I never would have met him. But that comes later. Can you imagine, Father, what a hungry wolf looks like? Scrawny, clever, shoulders humped, eyes looking everywhere. That's Grishka, a human scavenger. I was on the dock, lying behind a big coiled hawser, enjoying the sun, when I overheard two voices. Hey, Grishka. What do you want? Is this when you come out of your hole? When it's 12 noon and everyone has stopped work to eat? Haven't you anything better to do than spy on me, eh? Grishka, who do you think you're fooling? It's me, Alexei. I've been working these dogs for as many years as you've been stealing from them. Who says I steal? (laughs) My dear comrade, it doesn't bother me. It amuses me. By the way, Grishka, the dog officers have gotten wind of those uh, two cases of goods. Remember? They're on the lookout. What are you talking about, Alexei? Everyone on the waterfront is my friend. The guards, too. Uh, I can't waste any more time talking to you. Just a word of warning, that's all. Uh, hey, 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 wait a bit. Uh, have you seen Leonid? No, not for a week. Uh, you might ask your good friends, the dock guards. Uh, turn around, Grishka. Your good friend, Semyonich, is right behind you. Hey, hey, Semyonich, uh, I didn't see you. Well, I see you, Grishka. You have been ordered not to come near this dock. Now turn around and go before I break your ribs. Samyonich, old friend, you break my heart talking to me like that. Shake my hand, huh? Let go of my uh, hand. Let go, I say. I'm just shaking it out of pure friendship. No, no hard feelings. I love you like a brother. Let go of my hand. Tell me, dear old friend, have you seen Leonid? Leonid? Who's Leonid? I don't know any Leonid. With... You let go of me. The inspector will see you and he won't like this. How can he object to old friends shaking hands, huh? Now, tell me, have you seen Leonid? 
He's been taken to the hospital already three days. He was trying to steal some iron bars and they fell on his foot. The poor man. Crushed his foot. Serves him right. Now, was I asking too much? <laughs> Listen, Samyonich. I hear you've been sneaking off with two cases of goods, old boy. Huh? You devil, you get out of here. You had better watch your step. You'll get caught one of these days. I'll tell you what I'll do. I am that concerned for your soul. I shall go across the road to the church and pray for you. Who knows? Uh, I might even light a candle. It so happened that I too, Ivan Ivanovich, was in that church to pray for my mother and father who are sick. And for Masha, the girl at home I wanted to marry. And to offer a prayer to find work in this city so that I could take enough money home to make my parents well again and be able to marry Masha. As I was leaving by the side door, I felt this Grishka Chelkash behind me. After you. Oh, no, sir, uh, after you. No, 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 no. You were first at this church door. No, I, I insist. P please, sir, politeness is necessary. <laughs> I'm amazed. A youth so well-spoken in this day and age. Uh, we shall walk out at the same time. Arm in arm. Huh? <laughs> uh, my, what a muscular fellow you are. Hey, feel those biceps. <laughs> you certainly are not from the city. You can tell? Oh, broad shoulders and sunburned face. That comes from plowing huh? and planting. Uh, the bag you're carrying, probably with your passport and papers. And your hand scythe. Uh, what use would a scythe be to a city fellow? Eh? <laughs> You've been off mowing, I'll bet. Huh? You have to mow an entire acre and all you get is pennies. It's poor business. I can't save anything and every day I'm getting older and I want to get married. Ah, married. An admirable desire. Would you believe it? Sixty kopecks an acre they paid in Kuban... That's why I left there. Why do people work for so little? If you can't afford a meal, even a crust of bread tastes good. <clears throat> What's your name? Ivan Ivanovich. Huh? Uh, Grishka Cherkash. What are you, a cobbler, a tailor? A, a fisherman. A fisherman? You catch fish? Fish? <laughs> you are a country boy. No, no, no. People here don't only catch fish. They fish for drowned men, old anchors, sunken ships, uh, anything available. Oh, so that's your trade. Uh -huh. You have to be bold to be that kind of fisherman. I'm afraid to be bold. Huh? That means you're afraid to be free. Don't you care for freedom? Oh, yes, yes. Be my own master, go where you please, do as you like. Oh, what a life it would be. Ah, but you don't have the courage for it, hmm? I don't know. I, I'm too mindful of others, I suppose. And of course, I'm mindful of God. God! What were you doing in a church if you don't believe in God? Who says I don't believe in God? I, I never said so. Uh, have you eaten? Not since last night. Mm. I like you. I invite you to eat and drink. Hmm? Come on. Why I went along with Grishka Chelkash that day, Father, I will never know. Curiosity, I suppose. He was such a disreputable-looking man, I thought it was something of a joke. He should invite me to be his guest. <laughs> come, come, come. Ivan boy, finish your glass. Do you want to make Grishka ashamed of his new friend? Huh? It's no use. What can I do? I was born poor. I will die poor. <laughs> Would you like a job tonight with me? A job? What kind of a job? <laughs> Look who's been choosy. A job. We're going fishing. Uh, you row the boat. I don't mind a job, only I don't want to get into trouble. T what trouble? I mean, I heard you talking on the dark. I, I just wouldn't want to do anything 
wrong. You, you, you watch what you're saying unless you'd like to see your nose on the other side of your face. Uh, I'm sorry. I I didn't mean that. I, I, I need work. I, I don't care who I work for, but... Uh, 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 that's more likely. I, I only meant you don't look like a working man or, or a boss the, the way you're dressed. Uh, you just do as I say. Uh... Here, aren't you going to finish your drink? Eh? Uh, huh? Oh, uh, give it to me then. It's a sin to waste vodka. What's keeping you? Huh? Ivan, what's the matter? I can't hold on to the prod. It's robot all night. The all lock doesn't fit. Can I just knock it with the oar? No, 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 no. Not a sound. Push it down with your hand. It'll go in by itself. <coughs> I told you to be quiet. Quiet. <coughs> Ready or not, I'm shoving off. Now, row straight out to that blue light. See? Row oh, quietly. Do you have to make all that noise? You! You are there in that robot! Does he mean us? You and that robot bring it back! You hear me? Bring that robot back. Keep rowing. I thought this was your boat. It is. It is. Of course it is. Who else is? Hey, Robert, yeah. Nobody is giving a boat. Oh, good Lord. What have I gotten into? Stop blubbering, will you? He's not yelling at us. It's someone else making off with the boat. It's not us. I've never done anything like this in my life. Oh, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. Maxime Gorky, the author of this story, lived what he wrote about. He had a miserable childhood. It was hard. He was poor. In fact, the name he wrote under, Gorky, in Russian means the bitter one. Grishka, the dock thief, and Ivan, the country bumpkin, are both pieces of this great writer's own life. How these two are transformed by time and events, we will discover when I return shortly with Act Two. We're in a small rowboat skimming across the dark harbor. At the oars, Ivan, a country boy with a thirst for money and dreams of tomorrow. In the stern... An old, experienced rascal of a thief, Grishka, with no thoughts of the future. Grishka, who lives only for each day, for which he steals by night. Here is Ivan. Why, I am in this boat. What am I doing? Whatever this old robber is engaged in, I'm sure he is up to no good. The night is black as ink. Everywhere there are anchored vessels like... Ominous floating gravestones. I'm terrified. You are rowing well. We shall reach our destination uh, soon. Grishka, I'm frightened. <laughs> what a fool you are, boy. There's nothing dreadful about water. You know, I have always loved the sea. Especially at night. That dark, wide expanse. Boundless. Free. Mighty. Are we near? Uh, soon, 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 soon. A fisherman must be patient. I don't see any tackle in the boat. Where's the tackle? Uh, the tackle in the stern, right under where I'm sitting. What sort of tackle is it? Uh, be quiet, huh? Don't poke your nose into what's not your business. You've been hired to row, and you'd better row. You told me I'd get five rubles. Did you mean it? <laughs> Would I cheat you? If I said five, when you've done your part, you'll get five. Ahoy there, you robo! Oh, who's that? What's that? Such light. Only the Coast Guard. Uh, you do as I say and keep your mouth shut. Ahoy, Coast Guard! Pull up alongside us! Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll row right up to you. Mind what I said. Play dumb. Dumb. 
I'll do the talking. What do they want? They're only looking for smugglers. Don't worry. Uh, to begin with, I would like to know what a rowboat without lights is doing out in these waters this time of night. Uh, what is your name? Uh, Grishka Chelkash. Uh, uh, why, my boy, I'm old enough to be your father. Uh, and a very good job you're doing, p patrolling. I, I've always said so, haven't I, Ivan? It, these coast guards, I've always said, <laughs> I'd hate to be a smuggler trying to get away with any contraband in, in these waters. Uh, uh, haven't I? Who are you, young man? Uh, he's my cousin, uh, Ivan Ivanovich. He's from uh, Kuban. Are you Ivan Ivanovich? Oh, yes. I am Ivan. Uh, we just went out for a little row. And you are just showing him the sights of the harbor, is that it? <laughs> How did you know? Uh, Ivan's never been in a boat before. Oh, is that so? Well, where did you learn to row, Ivan? Who, me? I always knew how to row. <laughs> Isn't he the boastful young liar? Uh, you know that's not true, cousin. You must speak the truth to the Coast Guard. I always speak the truth. As God is my witness. And uh, whose robot is this? I don't know. We just took it. <laughs> he has such a quaint way of putting it. Like, like all country boys. Uh, of course he doesn't know my boat. Uh, he, he just came in from Kuban today. Hmm. Well, I'm letting you go. We haven't found anything in your boat. Oh, why should you? Uh, there isn't anything. Huh? So... So, good. Uh, we'll be on our way. And you'd better get back to shore before you run into trouble. We're stopping all boats without lights. Uh, back to shore, back to shore. We shall, we shall. Uh, come, Ivan. Uh, uh, good night, Captain. I am not the Captain. Ah, uh, well, uh, uh, good night anyway. Ivan, you can thank your lucky star. <sighs> If that Coast Guard officer had been suspicious, they would have clapped us in irons. And I'll tell you once again, and I mean it. When I say play dumb, I mean just that. Now, row to that boat with a little blue light. Let me go, please, for the Lord's sake. Put me on shore somewhere. What, what am I to you? I, I can't go through with this. I'm not used to such things. What are you babbling about. We, we haven't done anything. The wrong things, wrong. I I know what you are up to. Hold your tongue, idiot. <laughs> That's what I get from taking some lout from Kuban. If I didn't need you, you wouldn't be here. So, keep quiet and row. Uh, uh, more to the left, idiot. Or, or, or we'll go right by her. I can tell you... I was never so terrified. This man will kill me. He would use me and kill me. Or if he didn't, the others would. Who they were, who he was in league with, I didn't know. Ah, but I knew something was very wrong. And something was going to happen. I was being punished by God for seeking so much money. Five rubles for a night's rowing. We tied up at the big steamer with the blue light and climbed on board. On deck, I held on to the rail in the dark. I couldn't stop shaking. You took long enough, Grishka. Eight bells is the time we agreed upon. Uh, the cursed Coast Guard stopped us, Captain. Stopped? Uh, nothing happened, Captain. Uh, nothing. I, I told them I was out for an evening's row with a country cousin. If they believed you? With this cousin, uh, hook, line, and sinker. They didn't see which way you went? Of course not. What do, what do you think I am? An, an amateur? Late, late, late of excuses. Not the way I do business. Uh, Lenny is in the hospital with a crushed foot. I, I had to take what I could find. I, I was looking for hours. You should have looked sooner. The way I can in the morning tide. What will you bring? The same as last time. Only the same? It will be worth at least a thousand. At, 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 at least. Are you sure? <laughs> Have I ever told you more when it was less? That, that's not the way I do business. A thousand rubles, guarantee. And you shall have it in the hour. All right, it will do. You expect too much, Captain. One cannot make a killing 
every time. All right, all right. Is that your roar, that creature by the rail, your cousin? That's him. Is he strong enough to go back and return here in an hour? Oh, strong as an ox. Then go, go. One hour from now, I shall expect you. Don't be nervous, Captain. When have I ever failed you? Now I knew for certain I was in trouble. Shady doings. And God is punishing me. I was a lost soul. I rode with the devil behind me to another dock. Further along down the waterfront. Let me go, for heaven's sake. Let me ashore here. I won't say a word. Stop whining. Give over rowing. Now. Push the boat along with your yeah. hands on the wall. Yeah. Quietly, you yeah. idiot. Stop, stop, stop. Give me the oars. Give, give them here. Where's your passport? Huh? Huh? Your paper? Uh, uh, in the bag. Huh? Give me the bag. Uh, Good. Uh, that, my dear fellow, is so that you won't run off. Huh? Without oars, you might have gotten off somehow, but... <laughs> Without a passport and identity papers, you will be afraid to. Hmm? Now, <clears throat> watch what I'm doing. Tying the stern line to this iron ring by the ladder. <clears throat> I'm climbing up that ladder to the dock. And you wait for me. If anyone asks you anything, hold your tongue. If you want to get off alive. One peep out of you. And I'll find you and sink you to the bottom of the sea. In a moment, Grishka was up the ladder and gone. I was alone in the boat in the water. Everywhere I looked, I saw death. On my left was a half-sunken big black hulk without masts, like a huge coffin. Death. I could see storm clouds rolling in. Everything was cold and sinister, like death. I knew I would never see my mother and father and Masha again. Oh, Lord, what have I done? Hey, hey, you, Ivan. Hmm? Are you asleep? Hmm. I'm going to lower this box. You grab it from below. Hmm. Mind you, mind you, it's heavy. Carefully now. Hey. Put it into the middle of the boat. Hey. Carefully now. Hey. Now, here's another one just as heavy. Hey. Hey. Now. Take the oars, one at a time. Good, good. I'm coming down. I want tighter. Now, now, row. Row, I said, row. Back to the boat with the blue light. Come on, come on now. Put your back into it. You've earned good wages, mate. Now we only have to slip by the Coast Guard. And you can take your money and go home to your masha. The Lord knows if I shall ever see her again. <laughs> how, how, how frightened were you? Me? Not at all. <laughs> you needn't work so hard now, <laughs> yours. Huh? Ease off, ease, ease, uh, ease off. Grow more slowly as we uh, pass this breakwater. Uh, uh, softly, softly, softly. There are guards on duty at the end of the stones. They might fire a gun at us if they see us. Holy Mother, pray for us, sinner. Not the hour of our death. Good, 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 good. Amen. Now, now, now. That's good. We're, we're past them now. See, there's our ship up ahead. Nothing to be scared of now. Hey, you've earned a good sum. Uh, how would you like 25 rubles? Huh? No, no, not five. 25. I don't want anything. Only to be on shore. <laughs> You're a fool. You're a fool on shore. What, what kind of a life will you have? A work like this, huh? Fishing. You'll have plenty of rubles in your pocket. Enough to be a gentleman. Don't do like I do and drink it away. Huh? <laughs> here, here. Here's the ship, huh? Easy now. Easy, easy. We'll, we'll go around to the other side to the ladder. They've got ropes to pull up our fish. <laughs> oh, one night and I've made five. Hundred rubles. Mm. Yeah. What do you say to that, huh? Five? Five hundred? 
What's in those crates? <laughs> well worth over a thousand. Two thousand. But I sell cheap. Isn't this better than poverty in a village, huh, Ivan? Business, huh, Ivan? Smart business. Ahoy there, Captain! Five hundred rubles. Oh, if I had all that. Hey, hey, let down the ladder. Hey, up there. Adieu, Grishka. No, no, it's my great grandfather. Hey, lay down the rope ladder. Watch out, Grishka. Hey, hey. When the ladder comes down, Ivan, you tie the boat to it. Huh. They'll let down some ropes. We'll haul up the fish. Yeah. And uh, then we spend the night on board. And tomorrow, cousin, we'll have ourselves a nice row back to shore. Huh. I promise you the sights. I, I want you to take happy memories back to Gubad with you. Huh? And a few rubles. <laughs> Money. It isn't money, as it's sometimes said, that is the root of all evil, but the love of money. To Grishka, it's not the value of what he steals, but the escapade, the joy of outwitting the authorities. But to Ivan, I'm not so sure. Watch him. Rubles dance before his eyes. So I say, be a little wary of sympathizing with this country boy. And don't be surprised what's in store for you when I return shortly with Act Three. If I remember, we were talking about the effect of money. Good, bad, stolen, or borrowed. And to borrow an observation from the great Shakespeare, he said, he that... What money, means, and content is without three good friends. But let's not generalize. Specifically, let's look down on the deck of that ship, the one that buys contraband. In other words, stolen goods. Ivan is sleeping on that deck. Wake up, wake up. Ah, ah good morning, little peasant. Wake up, Ivan. All right. Ah, where am I? You and I spent the night on my good friend's ship. He's about to pull up anchor. The sun is rising, so we must also. Uh, he could have slept more. I'm still tired. Uh, you had better not be. Huh? There's a bit of rowing to do to get us back. Uh, and the water's choppy. That that means a storm. But, Grishka, you haven't left yet. Better get a move on. I'm just going to give the order to weigh anchor. Uh, when will you be back, Captain? One month from today. Look for the light. Uh, that I will. <laughs> Goodbye, Captain. Have a good journey. Make a large profit. And, and come back with an empty hold. <laughs> Grishka, we'll fill it. Will you look at that? Wow, it begins to rain. <laughs> it couldn't have rained last night to hide us. <laughs> When I think of it, I have to laugh. I really do. Uh, oh, Ivan, you should have seen your face last night. Frightened? Uh, frightened. Uh, tell old Grishka now that it's over. How many times were you ready to die? It was my first time on such a thing. I could have ruined my soul for life. <laughs> Would you do it again? I don't know. For how much money, that's the point. Grishka? Oh, he's getting bold enough to say my name, Grishka. Well, 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 you're entitled. You're a full partner now. Grishka, how much did they give you? Look here, in my shirt. Eh? See here, in my trousers. So many ruble notes, I can't even hold them in two hands. Five hundred and forty. I thought you were bragging. What a lot of money. Uh. We'll have us a good time, my friend. There's enough here for that, huh? Food, wine, women. <laughs> now, don't you be worried, Ivan. I'll give you your share. Uh, what would you say to 40 rubles? Huh? Not 25, 40. Hmm? Satisfied? If, if you like, I'll give them to you now. If you don't mind, I wouldn't say no. Ah! 
he, he wouldn't say no. Uh, oh, you one, I beg you to take the money. Please, please, take it. I don't know what to do with such a lot of money. Uh, please, little Ivan, help me. Here, here. I put 40 whole rubles at your feet. Oh, him. No, no. And look at him, look at him. He dropped the oars and look at him grabbing up the money. <laughs> oh, look at him stuffing all those wet notes into his shirt. Ah, Ivan, rubles against your chest. He'll keep you warm, huh? <laughs> I'll wager you never saw 40 rubles before in your whole life. Huh? And there they are, in your shirt. <laughs> you know, little one, you know, you are greedy. It's in your hands, your fingers, your, your eyes. I can see it. That's bad. That's bad. But, but of course, you're a peasant. your oars, lad. We'll let the next wave drive the boat onto the beach. Ah, good, good. That does it. Now, climb out with me before another wave catches it and drags it out again. These waves are strong. Come on, come on. We'll pull it up as far as we can. Up the beach. Pull. Pull. That's it, boy. Pull. It is fine enough. Yeah, yeah. Fine, fine. I, I wouldn't want to lose the boat. Those who own it will come along one day and fetch it. Well, we must say goodbye. It's, uh, I'd say, eight miles from the beach here to town. Uh, what are you going to do? Uh, going back to the town? Hmm? No, I, I don't think so. I, I, I'm not, not right away. Uh, I don't understand you, sir. Standing there with your head down, uh, Ivan is saying goodbye to me, upsetting you. Hmm? Uh, oh, oh, what's wrong? Don't, don't go. Please don't go. What, what is it? I'm getting soaking wet standing here. What's the matter with you? Take your arms off me. No, please. Here, will you? Stop that or I'll give you a good smack across the mouth. Get away from me. Think. Think. Give, give me that money. Give it to me for the Lord's sake. What money? What? My 500. What is it to you? You spend it in one night. All of it. In only one night. 500 rubles. It would last me years. Give it to me, Grishka. What do you care? I give it to me. And I'll pray for you every day. In three churches. For the salvation of your soul. You'll only cast it to the wind in sinful ways. I'll put it into land. Please, give it to me. All of it. What can it mean to you? It didn't cost you so much. One hour, one night. And you're rich. To a deed of mercy, Chris. You stupid, greedy peasant, groveling on your knees. You disgust me. You're not a man. You're not even an animal. No self-respecting dog would crawl like you. Here, take it. Take the money. Take it all. I throw it at you. Look, it's, it's dancing in the wind. Oh, oh, look at it. It's blowing away. If you want it so much, run to the water, Ivan. Pull it out of the sea. Get it, get it. Find it. Find it. Go. Go. Debase yourself. Come. It's a rubber. Come here. I got you. Take one. Another. You you thought you'd hide under that shell. Oh, I got you. Greedy, greedy. To humble oneself for a ruble. Lord, dear friend, the Lord have mercy on you. I'm, I'm a rich man. You, you're a fine man, Grishka, a good man. Never, never, never will I forget you. Never. And my, and my wife and children, I shall bid them to pray for you. You don't know how happy you have made me. Give me, give me your hand. I kiss it. I kiss it. <laughs> 
Ach, I wipe my hands. I, who thought you were so innocent. Your guilt is beyond anyone. Beyond anything. Do you know what I was thinking about when we were rowing back to land? I saw the money in your trousers sticking out of your shirt. I thought, I'll, I'll take the oar. See? See? The oar I, I'm rowing with. I'll give it to him. You, one hard blow. The, the money's mine. All of it. Five hundred and forty rubles. Mine. Then into the sea with you, I thought. Who will miss him? Ivan, my, my little Ivan. The money has made you mad. Why do you look at me like that? Why are you standing so close to me, Gr- Grishka? You have a very short neck, Matt. Dog! Let me go! Let go! My throat! No! Hey, hey, you didn't think, did you, when you were thinking of hitting me with an oar and dropping me overboard? You, you, you didn't think this old man would squeeze, squeeze your neck so hard, did you? Squeeze you, you don't deserve to share the earth with God's creatures. Yeah, you soil my hands. Oh, look at you there on the sand, squirming like a jellyfish out of water. Ivan Ivanovich, you dirty the clean sand. My neck. Your neck is not broken. I should have, but I didn't. I can't. I can my bread. I'm joking. joking. I'll leave you now. And I curse the day that brought us together. He had been my friend. He was now my enemy. He started to turn away. Turn his back on me. I picked up a stone and let it fly. Many a bird in the village I have killed with a stone. The stone hit Grishka in the back of the head. As he fell, his face on the sand, he tried to move a leg. I saw him twitching, tried to lift his head. I saw him quiver like a bowstring. Grishka, Grishka, it's Ivan. I'll, I'll turn you over. Oh, you are heavy. Grishka, so much blood from your head. Get up, and I'll help you. Get away. So much blood, and I'll, I'll stop the blood. Rip my shirt. Make a cloth, a bandage, tie around your head. Get away, buzzard, vulture. Forgive me. It was the devil who tempted me. I, I kiss your hand. For heaven's sake, go away. Go to the devil. No. What more do you want? You, you've done your job. Go away. Grishka, for a man's sake, forgive me. Sniveling idiot. God may have mercy. Mercy on your soul. But I, I, Grishka, Chalkish, I, Grishka, who will not Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. This is my true confession. He's still lying there, Father, on the beach. I came back here to the church where I first met him. This church, Father... I was going to give all the money I had to the poor. Put it in the poor box. But when I stood outside the confessional, Father, I felt my pockets, and there was nothing. Not one ruble. I have no money. 
I have nothing but the sin of blood. I confess it. His blood. Grishkas, can you see? Still on my hands. This is it, Father. I am going now to the police and tell them where to find him. It is all madness. Everything I hoped. Dreamed. All gone. Goodbye, Father. How does the author, Maxim Gorky himself, end this story? He writes, Soon the rain and the sea spray had washed away the red stain of blood where Grishka Chalkesh had lain. Washed away Grishka, washed away the footsteps of the peasant lad, and no trace was left of them on the seashore. The end. I'll be back with a postscript very shortly. a bitterness and a truth in this tale by Maxim Gorky. It was, in fact, the second story he had ever penned to paper. This account of Grishka Chalkash and other stories he wrote were based on his own experiences tramping about Russia. But it was this story of Grishka that brought the author worldwide recognition. Now, having heard it with our own ears, I think we know why. Our cast included Fred Gwynn, Bob Caliban, Earl Hammond, and Jackson Beck. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. In time of war, certain human instincts come to the fore. The aggressive instinct, of course, and also the instinct for survival. That we must all die eventually is inescapable. That some of us must die prematurely is terrifying. So terrifying that in a moment of grave danger, even the most sober and rational of men can appear to regress and clutch at superstitious omens, like our most primitive ancestors. Is this folly? Or does a person in the extreme moment when death is imminent know something we don't? Captain, if I volunteer for this mission, will we get back here by midnight? Well, it shouldn't take you more than three hours. You sure? <laughs> How come you're so skittish all of a sudden? I just want to know that we'll be back here safely by midnight. Why? <laughs> Afraid you might turn into a pumpkin? No, Captain. Something... Something a lot worse than that. Our mystery drama, Time Out of Mind, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Percy Granger and stars Russell Horton. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. 
Maybe you've got a neighbor who just bought a new Electra, and he's gotten so smug and self-satisfied lately, you can't stand it. Well, look at it this way. If you had just gotten a car with all the luxury and prestige of Electra, and a trim European-like design that makes it easier than you might imagine to park and maneuver in city traffic, wouldn't you be a little insufferable for a while? We thought so. The new Electra, at your Buick dealers now. A little science, a little virtue. all experienced that bittersweet longing for the past, known as nostalgia. Most of us have also felt the related sensation of wishing we could return to a specific moment in time to take care of some unfinished business or speak a final word to a loved one. But though this temptation can at times seem unbearable, we should never allow it to become overwhelming. Dad? Dad? Huh? Uh, what, what, Scott? Uh, are you okay? Oh, sure. Sure. Uh, would you like me to drive for a while? Oh, no, 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 I'm fine. Why should you? Well, you look like you were drifting off. No, no, I was just, um, just thinking about something, that's all. I, I'm perfectly wide awake. Okay, okay, I was just offering. Uh, what... What time is it? Uh, nearly midnight. Dad? Dad? What? What? Why do you keep bothering me? Bothering you? All you're doing is driving. But, well, uh, what do you want? You were getting that look in your eye again. What look? Like you're forgetting where you are. Well, I don't like being watched. Hey, Dad, you've been driving since supper. Uh, look, Maybe no, I... believe me. I'm not tired. <laughs> I was on the road ten years from my company. I, I know about driving. Um, what were you thinking about? Hmm? When? Just now. Well, not nothing. Well, you said you were. I don't remember. Dad, let's talk, okay? If nothing else, the conversation will keep us awake. <laughs> I don't know why, Scott. It's uh, usually put us to sleep before. I don't get it. You insisted on driving me all the way back to school. When I asked you why, you said it would be a good chance for us to get to know each other better. Yeah, I, I know, Scott, but... Uh, well, it's late at night now. Well, there's plenty of time to talk tomorrow. Okay. Okay, Dad. I... Well, I'm sorry, son. I, I didn't mean to snap at you. I know we haven't been very close these past few years while you've been drifting about and trying to find yourself. But now that I'm back in graduate school, you think you can relate to me, is that it? Now, you see, even the words you kids use. I mean, relate. But what does that mean? I mean, in my day, it, it meant to tell somebody something. Okay. What? Let's begin with that. Let's uh, tell each other something. Well... Uh, well, why, why don't you tell me about the courses you've taken? I mean, what's on our minds? How we feel about things? Uh, how you feel about me? How I feel about you? Uh, uh, I don't know why you kids today are so obsessed with feeling. I feel like I'm driving across the country with a complete stranger. That's really how you feel, Scott? Yes. I'm not part of your life, Dad. I never have been. I, I never know what's on your mind. Half the time, you you seem like you're somewhere else. My brother, Scotty. What? Well, you asked me what I was thinking about before. It was Scotty. Your uncle, though, the one you're named after. Well, why were you thinking about him now? On January 17th, the day after tomorrow, is the anniversary of his death. He, he was killed in the Second World War. Yeah, at Anzio Beach in 1944. Uh, of course, you've heard the story. You know... Sometimes I really envy him. Why? Because I get the impression he was the only person you were ever close to. Well, why do you say that? You mention his death so much. Well, you asked me to tell you what I was thinking about. I wasn't trying to criticize. All I meant was that other people lost relatives in the war, but that was 30 years ago. His death obviously affected you very much. 
Uh, he was killed by a sniper while he was out on patrol near Enzio. All I know about him is how he died. Well, there's nothing more to tell. You know, you look a lot like Scotty. I do? I don't know. He, he, he was tall, like you. Really? Six, seven? Uh, just about. Hmm. Did he play basketball? No, no, he was a musician. He played the piano. Classical? <laughs> no, no. Rhythm and blues. Swing. He was also a composer. Uh, do you know that Tommy Dorsey heard him once? And he told Scotty to look him up when the war was over. Yeah. He was going to be great. Hmm. I never knew any of this. Why haven't you ever talked about him? And he had a real great sense of humor. A real wise guy. Uh, his death was a turning point in my life. It was right after I heard the news that I asked your mother to marry me. So you were close? No. Well, I, I don't understand. Well, he looked up to me, but... Well, I always made fun of him, you know. Put him down. Now, a lot of older brothers do that. It doesn't mean anything. Well, most brothers have a lifetime to make it up, and we never did. And I never had the chance to tell him how I really felt, and sometimes... Well, sometimes I think I'd be willing to give almost anything to be able to go back and make sure he knew. Well, you can't, Dad. It's over. No, that's just it. It isn't over. Dad, this is 1978. Now, there was a letter. A, a letter? Yes, I... What's that? Mm, sounds like a highway patrol car. Well, he's not after us, is he? Well, I don't know. He's still pretty far back. But... Well, I don't see anybody else on the road. Oh, but that's crazy. Look, look, I'm only going 60. Well, it's still five miles over the limit. Any trooper will spot you five miles. He, uh, I'd slow down anyway. Well, no, he must be answering a call further down the highway. Look, he's signaling for us to pull over. Uh, hand me more wallet, will you? It's in the glove compartment. Good evening. Uh, hello, officer. Can I uh, see your license? Yeah, sure. Just a sec. Uh, Theodore Pittman, that you? Yep. Uh, who's that in there with you? Uh, it's my son. Uh, you live in Pennsylvania? Uh, yes, sir. Harrisburg. My son's studying physics in California, and I'm uh, driving him back to school from winter vacation. You drive all the way from Harrisburg today? Oh, no, from Columbus, officer. Uh, can you tell me uh, what the matter is? Uh, I was only going a few miles over six... Oh, speeding's not the problem. Uh, this interstate can be more treacherous than it looks, Mr. Pittman. And it's flat as a board and straight as an arrow for over a hundred miles through this part of Kansas. A lot of drivers become lulled or hypnotized. Some even fall asleep at the wheel. Well, I'm wide awake. I've been following you for quite a while. Are you aware that a few miles back you were weaving? Well, no. That's a pretty good sign. A driver's either tiring or his mind's wandering. Well, uh, I'm okay now. Uh, does your son drive? Oh, yes, officer, but I'm telling you there's nothing wrong with me. You planning to drive all night? Yes, we're behind schedule. We had some car trouble in Ohio that set us back a day. Well, my son's got to be back in San Francisco in time to register tomorrow the 17th. Uh, that's a long way to go in two days. Well, we'll make it. Mm. Uh, I suggest you stop for some coffee at the next service plaza. There's one about uh, 12 miles up ahead that's got an all-night restaurant. Well, all right, officer. Fair enough. We'll do that. It's for your own protection, Mr. Pittman. I understand. Mm. I also suggest you change drivers there. Yes, sir. Here's your license. Thank you. Oh, that was a close call. Dad, he was only trying to be helpful. Weaving? I don't remember. Weaving? You, uh, started to tell me about a letter? Well, the last time I ever saw my brother Scotty, we had an argument. Over what? Well, uh, I don't remember. It doesn't matter. The point is... That was it. Three weeks later, he was shipped overseas, and I never saw him again. A couple of months after that, I... Well, I began to feel apprehensive. As if you knew something was going to happen? Well, you always think you have a whole life to talk, so you, you keep putting it off. And then... 
Suddenly something happens, and... So you wrote to him. It's amazing what happens when you sit down to do something like that. I mean, feelings you didn't even know you had. Well, everything comes out. Did you mail it? Three weeks before he was killed. Yeah. So he did know. But you see, that's just it. I don't know if the letter ever reached him. It wasn't among his personal effects when they were sent home. Mm, three weeks is a lot of time. He must have gotten it. It took mail anywhere from two to six weeks to reach men who were at the front. Oh. So I never knew. And I never will know. I'm glad you told me all this, Dad. I, I feel like maybe we're a lot closer now. Maybe we'll be... Scotty's death wasn't necessary. What? He never should have been with the infantry in the first place. I mean, he was a big boy. An inch over the height limit. They were supposed to transfer him. Uh, it should have come through. But it didn't. It's over. Hey, let go of it, Dad. It's been over for 30 years. No, it isn't over. As long as I don't know whether or not he got my letter, it... Well, it isn't over. Well, if that's the way you feel, it can't ever be over then, can it? No. Dad. Dad, are you watching what... Dad, look out! It has been said that time heals all wounds. But there are exceptions. Some wounds never heal. And some seem to grow even more painful as time goes on. And the particular event recedes further and further from the grasp. Usually our desires have their consequences only in the present. But is it possible that a wish, if it were strong enough, could affect what is already past. I shall return in a moment with Act Two. A father and son driving across the Kansas prairie late at night. The father reliving an episode from his past he's not been able to forget for 30 years. Then suddenly, and without warning, a mishap. Theo Pittman loses control, and the car careens and crashes. It is said there are no accidents, that everything which happens is ordained. But if this was not an accident, what else could it have been? Scotty. Well, what happened? How do you feel? Mm-mm. My head. Hey, just take it easy. That shell couldn't have landed more than 20 yards from our foxhole. Foxhole? I, I, I was in a car. There was an accident. Shh. Hey, hey, just lie back, pal. <gasps> Who are you? It's Leslie. L Leslie? Les White. What's that outfit you're wearing? Uh, uh, you a soldier? <laughs> hey, that's what they say about you, too. What? Hey, hey what, what are you doing? Just putting some water on your face. Where am I? Field hospital. Where? Near Anzio. Anzio? You, you mean Italy? Yeah, we're about four miles inland from the beach. You don't remember what happened at all? No, I, I don't. Well, I'm not surprised. The medics said you might suffer loss of memory for a while. How did I get here? Oh, a shell hit near our foxhole. I was lighting a cigarette, and I had my head down. You were up top with the binoculars, and the explosion knocked you cold. Foxhole ends in... What year is this? 1944. 19... I must be dreaming. Yeah, tell me, how do you feel? I terrible headache. Well, you ain't dreaming, Scotty. But it's incredible. How, how did I get here? I carried you. No, no, I mean... Well, what did you call me? When? Just now, my name. Well, what did you say? Scotty. Pittman? Yeah. Hey, hey, your memory's coming back. I'm Scotty Pittman? Boy, I don't understand how you weren't killed. What do you mean? Well, there's not even a mark on you. Boy, you must have a charmed life. 
I, uh... I want to try standing up. Hey, wait a few minutes. I want to get up. Okay, okay, but let me give you a hand. Uh, uh, take, take, take it slow. There. How's that? Uh, dizzy, yes. No, uh, don't, don't hold me. You sure? Let go. I, I, I don't believe this. Captain Croft. Captain, Scotty's come too. Well... How do you feel, boy? Uh, okay, I guess. You don't look any the worse for wear. You able to walk? Yeah. How's your vision? Is it blurred at all? No. Les, what's the medic say? Well, he doesn't know how Scotty survived. But he can't find anything wrong with him except for a mild concussion. Okay, check out with him. And get back to your position. All right. That uh, guy doesn't like me, does he? Well, I'm not surprised. You've been trying to get out of this outfit ever since they stuck you here. Because of my size? Yep. Hey, how you feeling now? I really don't know yet. How's your memory? You know what's happening? Yeah, yeah. We're at Anzio. Uh, the Americans and British landed here with 24 battalions. Uh, 21 theirs, three were ours. The objective was, to, um, is to draw the Germans away from Casino and make it possible for the Allies to break through to Rome. Hey, great, you remember. Well, I uh, should. I've heard the story often enough. What? Uh, uh, nothing. Uh, well, uh, what are we doing? I mean, us specifically. Well, our battalion is in the vanguard for the invasion forces. When we landed, we took the Germans by surprise and we were able to push them back this far, but, boy, now their resistance is stiffening. A lot of our armor and men are still being landed on the beach. So we're the front line? Our unit is on the extreme southern wing. The German counterattack, if it comes, is expected to be further north. So we're relatively peaceful here. Yeah, about all we're doing for the moment is going out on daily patrols. Patrols? Yeah, hey, don't look so worried. We got it easy. The only real danger we face is from an occasional German sniper. Sniper? Uh, Les, what's the date? January 16th. This is the day before... Uh, uh, when's the next time we're supposed to go out on patrol? Tomorrow morning. The 17th. Hey, is it beginning to sound familiar? Yeah, you bet. We better get going. I'll find the medic and get you checked out of here. Uh, Les, uh, wait a minute. Uh, have, have we gotten any mail since we landed? Well, yeah. A batch finally caught up with us yesterday. But you haven't forgotten that. Did, did I get something? You got a letter from your brother. Then it came. Oh, yeah, you let me read it. Where, where is it now? Well, gee, I don't know. The last I saw it was tucked in the webbing of your helmet there. Uh, uh, it's not here. Probably got jarred loose and carried off when that shell exploded. Hey, listen. What? Right. The, the German guns have stopped. What did the letter say? What? Well, you said you I let you read it. You, you remember what it said? Don't you? Well, uh, no. Well, you must have read it over 20 times. I, 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 I don't remember. It was a sweet letter. You and he were really close, huh? Um... No. No, we, uh, hadn't been. Uh, well, he must have been making a real effort then to say what he did. <laughs> hey, what are you doing? I have got to try to find that letter. Yeah, but that's my kit. Uh, oh, <laughs> sorry. Anyway, I told you, it's gone. Uh-oh, uh -oh, the captain's coming this way. We better make tracks back to our position. White, Pittman, hold on. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir, we were just on our way no, back. Don't forget that. I need a couple of volunteers. Volunteers? Yes, something's gone wrong. What's happened? The German guns have fallen silent. That's probably the prelude to the counterattack we've been expecting. Yes, sir, to the north? Well, that's just it. Gresham and Hodges and the other outposts are all reporting heavy activity in the hills above their sectors. Down here? Or are we getting support? Well, we still can't get clear radio contact with beach headquarters. The uh, terrain is too rugged. You want Scotty and me to run back on foot? Yep, I do. You find out if the 191st Tank Battalion's come ashore yet. Tell them we could sure use some of it. Yes, sir. Now, we've seen activity on three sides of us. So we're in danger of being cut off. Well, so we could run into German patrols between here and the beach. That's right. Otherwise, with luck, you'll be there and... 
back by tonight. Captain? Yes, Pittman? Uh, Les says we're scheduled for patrol duty tomorrow. If we're not being overrun by the Germans, yeah. Well, if we do volunteer for this trip back to headquarters, will you exempt us from patrol duty for a day? If you volunteer? Scotty. Soldier, you don't understand. You have volunteered. Captain, he's still I little... guarantee no matter what happens, we'll get through to the beach and be back safely by this evening. Oh, well, that shell must have knocked some spunk into you, Pittman. I haven't heard that kind of enthusiasm from you since you came into this outfit. You keep it up and I might even be sorry when your transfer comes through. Okay, if you get through to the beach and back by tonight, tomorrow you get a breather. Thank you, sir. Oh, uh, Les, you know Colonel Gilpin, don't you? Yes, sir. When you get there, report to him. You tell him our situation. Yes, sir. Well, we're ready to go. Well, good luck. What's the matter, Les? Did you hear something? No, don't be so jumpy. It's too quiet. Now, trust me, we've got nothing to worry about today. Well, I'm glad one of us is feeling confident. Hey, Les, is, is that captain the kind of man to keep his word? What, you mean about patrol duty tomorrow? Uh -huh. Yeah, he's not exactly Mr. Personality, but he's good on his word. I, I don't know what difference it makes, though. We'll probably be under attack by then. Uh, just so long as I'm not out on patrol. Hey, what's that? Well, listen. Three o'clock. Hey, we'll make it back in time for supper. All right. That's beautiful, isn't it? What? It's somewhere in the middle of this war. Nested among these hills, there's a little village. And the Germans are on one side of them and the Allies on the other. Any minute, they're going to go at each other. And still, somebody takes the time to toll the hour. Yeah. You know, for a minute, I could have figured I was back in Vermont. Oh, it's going to be real nice, isn't it? When all this is over and we have peace once and for all. Yeah. Uh, come on, we'd, we'd better keep going. Colonel Gilpin? Yeah. What can I do for you? Uh, I'm Private White, and this is Private Pittman. We're reporting from Captain Croft. Croft? Oh, you're down near in a tuna, aren't you? On our southern flank. Yes, sir. We were beginning to wonder what had happened to you. We haven't had any radio contact from you in two days. I know, sir. That's why we're here in person. Uh, we've come to report heavy movement in the hills above our position. Yeah, the enemy counterattack is expected to hit further north. I know, sir, but we're here to request immediate relief. We're in danger of being surrounded and cut off. Yeah, we're just bringing the last of the 191st tank corps ashore now. We should be able to have you fully supported by morning. Thank you, sir. Tell me, did you see any enemy activity between your outpost and here? Nothing, sir. Well, that's good. You two boys want something to eat before heading back? Scotty? Um, no, I, I, I want to get back. Okay, uh, I guess I'd rather travel while it's light anyway. Well, now you tell your captains, eh? Well, get down! Get down, sir! Hey, Scotty! Uh, what was that? Lighten out, will ya? Les, come on, we gotta go. Through this stuff, are you crazy? We'll make it. We've got nothing to worry about. You can if you want. I'm not moving. You two boys, all right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, I think you'd better stay here. Well, with your permission, sir, I I'd like to go back. Be crazy to risk it until the shelling stops. Well, how long will that be? Well, that depends on how much the Germans got. Hey, Scotty, we'll get back in the morning. No, I, I have got to get back before midnight. I'm sorry, son. But you're going to have to stay here until this bombardment stops. And that's an order. taught that recklessness or caution can mean the difference between life and death. But this is all relative. For what would strike less or the colonel as reckless 
to Scott Pittman is nothing more than caution and something that is absolutely necessary if he is not to die. Yet, are his chances for survival really that great? After all, he's fighting for his life against an unusual opponent, history. I shall return in a moment with our final act. Why are so many people buying Buick's new century? Well, it depends on who you ask. Mrs. Marsha Resnick? It holds the road and it drives really smooth. It's, it's nice. And Mrs. Phil Jackson? I like it because it's roomy. And Mr. Jackson, he can't even begin to tell you all the reasons why he likes their new Buick Century. <laughs> I really wouldn't know where to start. But then that says a lot about Buick's new Century and why it's drawing a crowd at your Buick dealers. What is the difference between life and death? That is a question we might well ponder at this point, since we're faced with the unusual situation of a person who may be fighting for a life he no longer possesses. There was an accident. That much seems clear. Yet Scott has certainly had no cause to question the reality of the surroundings in which he finds himself, from Kansas Highway to a battlefield in World War II. Scott Pittman sits hunched over in a trench, listening to the shells whistling about his ears. But louder even than the exploding bombs is the ticking of time. Les, what time is it now? Well, let's see. Uh, 10 p.m.? <sighs> Only two more hours. Isn't this shelling ever going to stop? Why is it so important here to get back to our outpost by midnight? I mean, look, the way I see it, we're a heck of a lot safer here. Hey, what are you doing? I have waited long enough. Wait a minute, are you crazy? L let me go. You wouldn't get a hundred yards out there in the open. I have got nothing to worry about till after midnight. You think so? Yes. Okay. Okay. You think you lead a charmed life just because you survived that one shell? Well, go on. Go on, take off. Yes. I'm dead. What? I am as good as dead. Hey, look, cut it out. Don't talk like that. You've been in combat long enough to know you never talk about it. It's bad luck. This afternoon, you weren't afraid of a thing. What's happened to you? I don't know. I... I don't know. Look. Everything's been happening so fast. I, I I haven't had time to stop and think. Of, of course, this can't be real. It is impossible. Well, if this isn't real, why didn't you leave this foxhole when I let go of you just... I, I... I don't know. Look. Look at the dirt on your face. It's 30 degrees out. Look at the frost on your breath. You think these things aren't real? Les, are we friends? What? I mean, can I talk to you? Of course. I mean, what kind of a question is that? I've got to try and explain what's happening because I, I don't understand it. Hey. Hey, Scott, you, you're trembling. What is it? You're acting like this was your first time under fire. It is. What do you mean? Les, I was driving across country with my father on my way back to graduate school. There was an accident that... I think. It... Well, anyway, I, I woke up here. That's what's got you unnerved? Well, isn't that enough? <laughs> we all have dreams about being back home. No, this wasn't a dream. I, I was on my way back to graduate school in, in San Francisco. We, we, um, we were driving on an interstate. On a what? You see? You see, you don't know what an interstate is, do you? It, it, it was 1978, the year it was. I, I, I mean, is. 1978? Wait, wait a minute. You mean that, that this is like the, well, the Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court? Yeah, well, sort of, except that... I am not Scotty. Well, you look like Scotty to me. No, I am Scotty's nephew. The man who wrote that letter that I was looking for is my father. He was telling me the story of Scotty's death just before the accident. 
Dad? Scotty was killed on January 17th. Well, that's tomorrow. Oh, it's no wonder you've been so jumpy. He was killed by a sniper. That... You see, that's why I've got to get back before midnight. Scotty, it was all just a dream. Look, I am not... You don't believe me, do you? Look, let's just call a halt, okay? D just try to forget about it. Then why do I have a complete memory of my life in 1978 and no memory of, of all this life now? The explosion obviously affected your mind. <laughs> oh, come on, Scotty, relax. <laughs> We'll get you medical attention as soon as this shelling lets up. Don't I look any different to you? I mean, Scotty and I couldn't have looked exactly alike. <laughs> hey, underneath all that dirt, you could be Humphrey Bogart for all I know. Scotty, don't worry. I, I'm not going to let anything happen to you. I even remember my last thought before the crash. If there was some way I could find out whether or not Scotty had received that letter. Well, why don't you write him? Who? Your brother. Tell him that the letter came. Would that work? Well, if you mail it, it will. Why didn't I think of that? Here. Wait a second. Here, I got some paper and a, and a pencil in my kit. Yeah. Uh, maybe this is what it's all about. Maybe maybe this is why I'm here. Uh, here. Here's the pencil. Oh, thanks. Uh, What's the matter? Why... I don't know what to say. Well, tell him that you got the letter. Oh, of course. Dear brother... No, no. Dear Theodore. Your letter arrived safely. I have read it many, many times. It meant more to me than you can possibly imagine. I love you, Scott. Uh, no, I mean, Scotty. Here, here's an envelope. Yeah. Thanks, Les. You have no idea what this is going to mean to him. For 30 years, he's... You, uh, you think I'm crazy, don't you? Just write your brother with your father's address on the envelope. I'm not crazy. I'm really not, Les. I can tell you the day that Berlin is going to fall. I can tell you what happens to Hitler. Uh, uh, did you know that Eisenhower was going to be president? Look, write the address. We'll see it gets mailed. I... What's the matter? Why are you hesitating? I don't know it. You don't know your own brother's address? Well, he's not my... Think, Scotty, think. Um, he worked in Harrisburg during the war at the Alliance plant. Okay. Uh... Then just send it care of the plant. They'll see it gets to him. Are you sure? Oh, come on. They take good care of servicemen's mail. It always gets delivered. Hey. Listen. What? They stopped shelling us. Why? It, it must be a lull. We can go now. Why go back at all? We have to. But if it's tomorrow you're worried about, why don't we just stay here? You think I'm stark raving mad, don't you? And soon as you have the chance, you're going to get a couple of medics over here with a straitjacket. Scotty. And this letter won't ever be mailed, I'll will it? I'll mail it. I'll mail it, I promise you. Thanks anyway, Les, but I am going back. But why, Scotty? I, I, I don't know. Maybe because... Because this is what really happened. Where you go... What are you doing? Well, no matter what, we're buddies, Scotty. And if I can't stop you, at least I'm not letting you go out there alone. Hey, Les, stop. Why, what's the matter? I, I thought I saw something move over there in the trees. See anything? Come on. Let's go a little slower, okay? Like you want to make it back by 12 or not? Look, Les. There's our battalion. Oh, 
just down this hill and over that stream. Yeah. What time is it? Uh, see, it's... Uh, Hey, it's only 11.15. Hey, we made it. Oh, come on. Come on, let's go. Hey, wait, Les. That, it, that can't be right. It, it's got to be later than that. What? Oh, hey. Hey, you're right. My watch has stopped. It, it doesn't matter. We still got time. What's that? Nothing. Come on. No, no. Listen. It's... It's that church bell. The one we heard this afternoon. Les. It's midnight. I didn't make it. Scotty, there's no one out here. Now, come on. We're almost there. I... I can't go any further. But it can't be more than 500 yards. That doesn't matter. I'd never get there. Don't be an idiot. There are no Germans. Not this close to our own line. There are. I know there are. Oh, damn your crazy, stubborn obstinance. Your idiotic stupidity. That was all just a dream. It doesn't mean anything. Oh, why do you insist on taking it seriously? Look, if you weren't so tall, I'd knock you out and carry you the rest of the way myself. Get away from me, Les. Go on. Go on. What are you waiting for? Well, that, that letter... That letter to your... That letter. Well, I'll take it if you want. Would you? Sure. Well, come on. Give it here. I can't. Why not? Because my dad never got it. It was never mailed. If I gave it to you... You understand? Yeah. Yeah, I... I understand. Captain Croft. Yes. Well, you made it back. When we reach Colonel Gilpin, the tanks are ashore. The whole invasion force will be moving inland by morning. Oh, where's Pittman? Well, he's still out there. Where? On the other side of the stream, about 500 yards. Why? He refused to come any further. He's gone crazy, sir. That... That shell yesterday must have blown every ounce of sanity out of his head. He just stopped making sense. He's convinced there's a German sniper out there waiting to kill him. We've got to get him in here right away. Now, you lead the detail out. You find Sergeant Hobbs and... What was that? But you don't suppose he... No. That wasn't one of ours. That was a German field rifle. Are you all right? Hey, Dad, can you hear me? What's happened? Everything's so quiet. Your mind's drifting again. Oh, listen. I got something important to tell you. Scotty got your letter. I know. I was there. I spoke to Les. He he was Scotty's buddy. He said the letter came two days before he died. So he knew how you felt about him. What's that? That's not for us, is it? The highway patrolman again? We're not going over the speed limit. And you're not weaving. You're driving great, Dad. It's almost like we weren't moving at all. I can't even hear the engine. Wake up. Wake up. If they find you asleep at the wheel, they'll take us off to jail. I'll I'll be late for school. Dad. Listen. No matter what they do to us, even if they try to separate us, if maybe we aren't ever going to see each other again, just remember, Scotty got your letter. He knew all along. You don't have to feel badly anymore. I found that out for you. I found out. Ho. 
Holy jumbo. It's a mess, isn't it? The car's completely totaled. We got here as quickly as we could. Yeah, there wasn't any need to rush. They're both dead. Were they killed instantly? Mm. Looks that way. Uh, we'll take the bodies into St. Anne and notify the next to kin. It's a real shame. I'd stopped these folk about 12 miles back. They were going to pull off the road for coffee at the restaurant just over the rise there, not half a mile from here. A real shame. It is said that that which is truly important is ultimately communicated. If not by tongue or pen, then through some other medium. Were Scott and his father killed instantly? Who knows? A lot is said to happen in that final second before death. Perhaps it is best to take our story as a fantasy of wish fulfillment and not question its logic too closely. But there is a more sober note to be sounded as well, which I shall do as soon as I return. This spring, True Value Hardware Stores can help you get off on the right foot when you have a lot of work to do in your yard. Hi, Pat Summerall to tell you they offer lawn and garden equipment to help eliminate a lot of the hard work and give you more time for recreation. Like the distant cordless grass shears. They can cut around a football field on one charge. And they take charge, handling the trimming around trees, bushes, and fences in your yard. The distant cordless grass shears are just eleven forty-four. Power packs sold separately at True Value Hardware Stores. You can quickly and easily eliminate pests in your garden and around your home with the True Value 2-gallon garden sprayer. The special roto spray nozzle adjusts from a light mist to a 15-foot spray, so you can quickly spray insect and weed killer in a large area or adjust the spray to reach smaller spots. And right now, the True Value 2-gallon sprayer is anniversary priced at just $14.99 at participating True Value hardware stores. And remember that True Value is much more than just a name. It's always been our way of doing business. And tell them Pat Summerall sent you. a lesson to be learned from our story, it is that we must never forget we are born to an eternal present. And it is in this present we must stay. Theodore Pittman would have done better to look to the relationship with his son than continuing to regret his lost chance with his brother. Our cast included Russell Horton, Lloyd Batista, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Why do you say that? Because I know precisely the kind of help you need. I'm not sure I know what you mean. I'm not even sure I, I need any help at all. Oh, you need all kinds of help. First, you have to be made aware of your problems. I have a problem. Oh, rest assured you do. Once you become aware of it, you'll need help in finding and uh, following through the solution. I really don't know what you're talking about. Well, that's why I'm so important to you. Believe me, there's one thing that you must do within the next uh, six or eight weeks. Yeah, what's that? Well, that is, we must do it. Yeah. What is it? We must... Uh, Murder your aunt. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Radio Mystery Theater presents Come 
Yes. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Time, said Mr. Thoreau, is but the stream I go a fishing in. Yes, all of us go angling in the stream of time. And for each of us, it's exactly the same body of water. Then, how to account for the fact that some succeed in landing whales, while others can only come up with minnows? Let me say this. I'm an extremely practical person. I'm a scientist. I know that. I believe in the scientific method. Of course. I only accept what can be demonstrated. Please, doctor. You, you call me doctor. You respect my credentials. I do. That little girl is here, playing on the ground. That little girl died last week. Did she? Listen. Childish Laughter was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Alexander Scorby and Laurie March. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The best of men cannot suspend their fate. The good die early, the bad die late. So speaks the poet. The pure flame burns the brightest and is therefore most quickly consumed. So says the chemist. Thus, we have one of those happy, if infrequent, agreements between art and science. It is twilight. The narrow two-lane roadway twists the tortuous trail through some of the loveliest, if loneliest, country in the Northeast. The man driving the car is convinced by now that he is hopelessly lost casts an anxious glance at the gasoline gauge. The needle has been moving inexorably to the left. Already it is brushing the edge of the E. And now suddenly... What the... Look out! Little girl! Look out! He opens his eyes. He takes a deep breath. The car has crashed into a tree. Muttering a silent, heartfelt prayer, he tries to start it. child. The little girl. That, that little girl. What happened to that little girl? I didn't hit her. I, I know I didn't hit her. Could, could I have hit her without knowing it? No, that, that's not possible. Where, where is she? Where, where'd she go? What's a child like that doing out here all by herself? Little girl. Little girl. I want to help you. Where are you? Little girl! Little girl! <laughs> What's that? What was that? What was that? Not. Uh, look, I, I, I know it's wise to be careful of strangers who want to enter your home. I suppose I could be a thief. But I assure you, my plight is genuine. Look, I, I, I don't have to come in if that's what's bothering you. You could telephone for me. The nearest garage and, and the police. That would be impossible. I have no telephone. Oh. oh. This seems to be the first house I've seen for miles. Would there be another nearby up, up ahead? No. Well, how far is it to any sort of town? Quite a distance. Look, it's not just my car. I, I I think there's a little lost child out there. A lost child? Yes, that, that's why I had the accident. She ran across the road, suddenly. She, she appeared from out of nowhere. You saw a child? I'm sure I saw a child. But there are no children anywhere in the vicinity. But still, I know As that... the sun goes down, it casts a fascinating play of light and shadow through the trees. And one sees many things that may not be there. Well, yes, but... Look, but afterward, I heard the little girl. You heard a little girl? Yes, her laughter. A little girl's laughter? Well, it sounded like a little girl laughing. Or it may have been the chirping of a bird. The wind well, in the trees. Sometimes an animal sound. 
I, I suppose you could be right. Were you thinking perhaps of a little girl as you were driving along? Now, why would I be thinking? No, no, not at all. The mind, it plays such games with us sometimes. Yeah, I'm sure it does. But I, I guess I'd better find a phone somewhere. The darkness has already come. Yes, I can see. I wonder, might I prevail on you to spend the night here? Well, yes, thank you. And at first light, Mr. Crenshaw will arrange for repairs to your car. Mr. Crenshaw? My general fact told him. Look, I, I'm probably imposing, but I really would be quite up against it if it weren't for your very kind offer. And then it's settled. Won't you come in, Mr. Montrose? Hugh Montrose, Jr. How do you do, Mr. Montrose? I am Thyra Bordenave. Thank you, Miss Bordenave. Mrs. Bordenave. Oh. It, it's really beautiful country hereabouts, you know? Yes. Although <laughs> it is somewhat desolate. It's private. Of course. I'm sure you and Mr. Bordenave must enjoy the privacy. Mr. Bordenave is dead. Oh, I'm sorry. It's quite all right. Mr. Montrose, why does your face seem so uh, familiar? Uh, you, you know, this is a most impressive place you have here. <laughs> Imagine a massive Victorian mansion in such a remote area. Ah, oh, here is Crenshaw. Where is your car? Well, oh, perhaps a hundred yards or so down the road. Crenshaw, this is Mr. Montrose. Yes, ma'am. Show Mr. Montrose to the Aurora bedroom and then have his things brought from his automobile. The dinner is at 7.30. You should have ample time for a bath and a nap. This way, sir. This thing, it was happening to me. This thing that I'd seen in 15 movies and read in 100 books. The stranger who seeks shelter for the night. The mysterious brooding mansion. The beautiful lady. The menacing manservant. Why did she seem to have such a queer look when I mentioned the little girl? Now this movie thing, this book thing, this fiction thing, it was happening to me. Or was it? Uh, come in. I have your things, Mr. Montrose. Oh, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Crenshaw. I shall lay them out for you. Uh, thank you again. Uh, did you look at the car? I have arranged to have it towed to Morphy's garage in the morning, sir. That's good. Oh, uh, you don't have to unpack everything, Mr. Crenshaw. I'm only staying the night. You never know, sir. <laughs> sir? Did you hear that? Hear what? That. I'm afraid not, sir. But it was... It was just as plain as... Uh, what was? It was a child. A child? Yes, a child laughing. Well, that's impossible. No, but I distinctly heard... There are no children here. There's a little child standing right outside the door. And I'll prove it. Where did she go? Where did who go? There was a child. I heard her laugh. Her? A little girl. It was... It was the same little girl. Sir? Look, just a little while ago, on the road. She suddenly darted across. I had to go off to the side or else hit her. I, well, you saw the car. Yes, I saw the car. And then I heard the little girl. She was laughing. You know, the, the way a child laughs. There are no children in the house. But, Mr. Crenshaw, I... Will you help me? If I can. Look, obviously I'm having a problem. Uh, yes, sir. Look, I, I see... That is, I catch a glimpse of a little girl on the road. I hear her laugh. You follow this? Yes, sir. I cannot imagine what she would be doing out there all by herself. So I'm willing to believe that somehow it's, it's in my imagination. Yes, sir. No, no, no. no. Let, let's not just pass it off like that. Look, Mr. Crenshaw, my imagination is a bottomless pit filled with an infinity of ideas, uh, impressions. A witch's brew of phantoms and fantasy. Anyone may imagine anything at any time for any reason. You follow this? Yes, sir. So then, we may ask ourselves, how can we tell if what we see in here is real or imagined? Do you know how we can tell? I'm waiting for your explanation. But the answer is that we really cannot tell. It's a matter of majority rule. You understand? I believe so. I just heard a little girl laughing. You didn't. Is your hearing impaired in any way, Mr. Crenshaw? No, sir. Then which of us is right? 
The rest of the house shall decide. Will you find out for me if anyone else has heard the child? As you wish, sir. You're not eating, Mr. Montrose. I don't seem to be very hungry. Please, you must show the cook an empty plate. She so rarely has a chance to prepare a meal for company. And tonight, I must say, she outdid herself. Try the fish. It's fresh from our own trout stream. Mrs. Portney. You seem to be troubled. Frankly, yes. I seem to be faced with the loss of my sanity. Oh, come now. When one loses one's perception of reality. Oh, the business of the childish laughter. I find it quite serious. I'm sure you do. And very upsetting. I haven't heard anything. Nor has Crenshaw. Neither has Cook. Have you spoken with the other servants, Crenshaw? Yes, madam. And? Nothing, ma'am. Is there any reason why you should have seen or heard a little girl of three or four? Well, no. Do you have any children? No, I've always been a bachelor. Did you ever have anything to do with children? Why did you ask me that? I thought perhaps that children may have been on your mind. Why would children be on my mind? We all think about children now and then. Yes, perhaps that's one of the problems of our society. We're too child-centered. We seem to be obsessed with children. We make them the center of the universe. We've distorted our entire culture to accommodate the, the transient, destructive demands of childhood. Would you agree, Mrs. Bordenave? Well, I... Other civilizations managed to cope with children. And they did it by placing them in the proper perspective. I dare say. Well, oh, I, I'm sorry. You, you must excuse me. I, re I really don't know why I said those things. Your accident has had a more disturbing effect than you think. A good... No. No. No, I'm not dreaming. I hear it. It's coming from just outside my bedroom window. There she is. Little girl, what are you doing down there? What are you doing down there in the middle of the night? What, don't you belong to anyone? What are you doing all by yourself? Look, I see you. No, you're not a dream. You're a tiny, rose-cheeked little girl. You have long blonde hair. You're wearing a red pinafore. You have a doll in your arms. A doll dressed in a blue sailor suit. Wait for me. Wait, wait. I'm coming downstairs. Wait for me, little girl. Will she wait? Who is this elusive little girl? For that matter, who are all these people? Who is Mrs. Thyra Bordenay, Mr. Crenshaw, and who is Mr. Hugh Montrose? Getting back to our question, will she wait for the answer? You will have to wait until I return with Act Two shortly. Children, they say, should be seen and not heard. However, we do seem to have a situation here concerning a child that is often heard but rarely seen except at certain unexpected moments. A most disturbing and elusive little lady, to be sure. <laughs> now, don't go away, little girl. Don't go away. I'm coming downstairs. Mr. Crenshaw, Mrs. Bortnave, that little girl, she's here. She's downstairs. See for yourselves. <laughs> Well, Mr. Montrose... I tell you, she was here less than a minute ago. Yes? Right here, right underneath my window. She even smiled up at me. But where is she? Well, she couldn't have gone far, Mrs. Borden. A little girl like that, out all by herself. How did she get here? What, what, what's she doing? Whom does she belong to? Mr. Crenshaw. I've been all over the ground, ma'am. Didn't you see anything? Nothing. And no one, sir. But, Mrs. Borden, I know what you're thinking. It's my imagination that I, I, I was dreaming, no? Well, Mr. Montrose... Well, let me say this. I'm an extremely practical person. I'm a scientist. Actually, I'm a chemist. I've been indoctrinated in the scientific method. Proof, facts, evidence. I saw that little girl. Mr. Montrose, you'll feel better in the morning. You don't believe me? I didn't say that. You're, oh, you're trying to humor me, aren't you? I'm not. I... Then help me find that child. Mr. Crenshaw has already searched the grounds. We should search them again. If you like. I only know that I saw that little girl, and she has to be around here somewhere. But she wasn't. 
I looked everywhere. There wasn't a single sign of her. How could she simply disappear? How? And she'd already done it twice. All right, I I could take the easy way out. I could say it all, all in the imagination. I could say I'm under a strain. But it's not true. I saw the child. Good morning, Mr. Montrose. Good morning, Mrs. Bordenay. You slept well, I trust. Yes. Please, help yourself to breakfast. Thank you. Mr. Montrose, do you realize that this is the first time I've seen you in daylight? And you know, you still look familiar. I'm sure we hadn't met. Uh, I certainly would have remembered someone as gracious and charming as you. That's very kind of you, Mr. Montrose. Why does an attractive woman such as you shut herself away in this isolated spot, cut off completely from the world? When my husband died, and I felt that the light had gone out of my life forever. You know, when the first primitive man saw his first sunset, <laughs> he too thought the light had left the world forever. But while we live, there's always hope for a sunrise. Yes, perhaps. Who knows? But I wonder why you should look so familiar. I have the faintest idea. Perhaps I should ask Mr. Crenshaw. Mr. Crenshaw? He has one of those retentive, I suppose you might even say photographic memories. Oh? You're not some movie star hiding out from a voracious public, are you? What makes you think I'm a movie star? You're handsome enough. Thank you. But I happen to be a chemist. Of course. So you said last night. Uh, Crenshaw, we must arrange to have Mr. Montrose's car taken care of. Yes, ma'am. And since we have no telephone, I suppose you'll have to drive to town to tell Mr. Morphy to send us tow truck. At once, ma'am. Oh, I wouldn't like to put you all to that trouble. It's no trouble. Uh, I could drive to town myself and not upset the routine of your household, Mrs. Bordenave. Very well, if you like. Crenshaw, give Mr. Montrose the keys to the blue car. Yes, ma'am. Crenshaw, why do you suppose Mr. Montrose should look so familiar? His picture was in the paper, ma'am. Oh, was it? Have we a celebrity here? What did it say? I don't know, ma'am. I didn't read the article. I merely glanced at the picture. Well, now, Mr. Montrose, why would your picture be in the paper? No, I'm sure it's a mistake. I uh, Look, I, I'd better be getting on to town. Mr. Montrose, yes. I should like to accompany you. Oh? Yes, I don't get out very much. It would be an excursion. Do you mind? Mind? Besides, <laughs> it might be more effective if I were there. Effective? Yes. You see, Mr. Morphy is a highly independent sort. That's a local euphemism for surly. <laughs> he might put you off. I, on the other hand, can exercise a certain amount of leverage. Once again, I must add to the long list of your kindnesses toward me, Mrs. Bortonave. What an attractive woman. I feel drawn to her. Just as I'm sure she's drawn to me. Why couldn't I have met her 20 years ago? 10 years ago? <laughs> what would have been the good? She would have been married to another man with whom she was deeply in love. Oh, but if we'd only known each other, she would have saved me. She wouldn't have allowed me to... No, 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 no. I must not rewrite history. I would have broken her heart. Maybe she can save me now. Maybe she can help me construct an edifice of sanity. And I'll be all right. I'll be all right. Life up here does have its compensations. Yes, I would agree now. Now? Yes. At one time, other things seemed so much more important. What other things? I suppose you could place it all under a single heading. And what would that be? Getting on in the world. Was that an important thing to you? It was the only thing. And when did you decide it no longer mattered? <sighs> Forgive me. It seems I'm crying. No, no, I... Mr. Montrose, you seem so troubled. Well, it's early in the day. I never was much of a morning person. Mr. Montrose, you? Yes? After Edward Bordenay died, I never thought I'd meet another man who... Well, could have even been an interesting person... You must have loved him very much. Too much. That isn't good either. Oh, listen to me. 
We hardly know each other, and here I'm ready to pour out the story of my life. Why am I doing this? Yes, I know, I know. And to make matters worse, you're a fugitive. What are you saying? You're running away. Look, Mrs. Borton, I... Syra. I was acquitted. Uh, oh, perhaps not from the law, but from yourself. None of it was my fault. There was no proof that I'd acted in a criminal or even in a, in a careless manner. It happens. It, it happens all the time. Why are you running away? I don't know. I don't know. Is that the garage? Joseph Morphy? Yes. Well, let's go in and see if he can fix my car. Yes. He can fix your car. But that's all. Hello? Hello, is anybody here? Is that you, Joe? Oh, uh, I'm his brother, Jerry. Oh, it's you, Miss Bartonay. Uh, buddy, you don't come in here. It's full of grease and paint. I'll talk to you in the office. They don't like anyone to come into the shop. After all, that's the scene in the time. <laughs> well, now, Miss Bartonay. What can I do for you? Is Joe here? Joe? Uh, well, no. Do you expect him soon? I have a job which requires his special attention. Well... He, he ain't going to be here today. Uh, maybe not even tomorrow. He, he's in bad shape. He is? Miss Borden, Abe, the funeral was yesterday. The funeral? Whose funeral? Oh, I guess you didn't know. What didn't I know? About Betty Jane? Betty Jane? Yes, Miss Borden, Abe. Uh, she just died, sudden. But she was only three years old. Three and a half, ma'am. But how? Why? What did Dr. Morris say? Well, it was from... I'm, I'm not sure it was from that, that thing they were feeding her. What was that? Well, the doc says... It was in the paper. You, you might have read about it. Some kind of preparation. Uh, supposed to make them healthier, but... Uh, well, it, it got something in it that certain kids just die from. Oh, this is awful. I understand the stuff's been taken off the market. Old Ben Manners at the drugstore, he's so mad he... He took all he had left and burned it. Oh, poor Joe. Yeah. A little girl's all he cared about in the whole world. Yes, I know. Smart as a whip she was, too. Yes. Well, what we came here for originally, it seems so important. Well, I guess you got some work you want us to do, eh? I don't know when we can get to it, the way things are now. I don't know, maybe a week, okay? Yes, I, I suppose so. I tell you... I don't get my hands on that guy that made that stuff. Maybe it wasn't his fault. Yeah? No, no, you have to understand. It was developed in the laboratory. So? Some research chemist was... Uh, well, he was trying to do good. Yeah? There, there's always a risk, you know. Yeah, well, tell that to Joe and Edna Morphy. I was reading in the paper, at least a hundred other kids are dead. If you were reading the paper, you also should have read where the government investigators found no evidence of criminal intent. The man was completely absolved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't absolve him. I hope he burns forever in the hottest fires of hell. Look what he did to just one kid. One innocent little kid. Yeah. Let me show you this little kid. Yeah. Look at this picture. Look at it. Uh, look, I'm only trying to, to explain. Look that, but... at her. She was only three years old. I took this picture on her birthday. See? Her long blonde hair, those big blue eyes. Her mother made her that little red pinafore. And Joe bought her the doll. The doll in a blue sailor suit. The little girl. That's the little girl. Here, g give me that. Hey, what are you... This is the little girl I saw on the road. Just last night. What's he saying, Miss Borden? And later she was underneath the window. Who is this guy? You, you must calm yourself. Calm yourself. What's the matter with him? You're telling me I... I killed her. Is that what you're telling me? I ain't telling you anything. But it's true. It's true. I did. I did kill her. He did. He says so. And therefore, he must be that man who created, invented, however it came about, that certain medicine or preparation. What a remarkably complex society we have. We have all sorts of killers and all sorts of ways to kill people. And so much of it is done unintentionally, impersonally, unconsciously. I shall return shortly with Act Three. 
This is WBBM Chicago. The brand of Cain. How simple it was to assess, to judge mankind's first murder. The smoldering anger, the burst of fury, the raised club, the crushed skull. But as we evolve and become infinitely complex human beings, even killing undergoes a metamorphosis. It is now possible to kill unconsciously, without passion, without even meaning or wanting to, and most often, without even knowing about it. Yes. Yes, I killed her. You, you can't say that. Who is this guy? What's he talking about? This little girl. I killed this little girl. What do we got here, Miss Bordenay? Now, Hugh, everything is going to be all right. No, nothing's going to be all right. Nothing can ever be all right again. Not for me. Miss Bordenay, maybe this fellow needs a doctor. A doctor? My good man, I am a doctor. Well, then, Doc, don't you think? Look, I have a Ph.D. in chemistry. Hugh, perhaps we'd better go. Go. Back home. Home. I was driven from my home. The devils drove me from my home. Come to my home. Everything will be all right. I'm sorry about the little girl. Please believe me. I'm sorry about little Betty Jane Morphy and and all the others. Yes, Hugh, yes. Now we must go home. Is this how it's going to be? Am I going to lose my mind? Shall I preside over the slow disintegration of my sanity? No, I have to fight. I, I, I'm only 42. I can still have a long, productive, useful life. And now that I've met her finally, I can be happy. We can be happy. All I need is a little rest. A little sleep. This is Bob Yes, Crenshaw. I have here a copy of the newspaper. Thank you. Chemist found blameless in infant death. Dr. Montrose, unaware that nutrition had been inadequately and improperly tested. I see you're reading my press notices. Oh. And now you know. Everyone agrees it wasn't your fault. Yes, but the children are dead. Yes. Nutrition was mine, my creation. It was going to make every child healthy, strong. More resistant to infections, fevers. It was going to be a wonder, a miracle drug. Yes, that's what you wanted. And that's what I thought I'd found. But it began a chain reaction, and it destroyed the ability, the, the natural ability of the body to... to... Do, you, do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. And now they're dead. One hundred children that we know about. They're dead. Yes, we know that, and it's tragic. But do you want to die, too? I? Life goes on. You, you're like the captain of a plane that crashes with the loss of every life aboard but your own. You're a commanding officer of a company that has been wiped out. But these were children. Children. It makes it harder, but it must be done. What must be done? You must rebuild your life. I can't think of that now. You must think of that now, before it's too late before you become too deeply enmeshed in remorse and regret. I felt that way. I was driving a car when Edward Bordenave died. Please, I I don't want to hear anything But you must listen. I had too much to drink. I insisted on driving. Need I tell you there was a crash? And he was killed instantly. But I escaped unhurt. I ran away from the world. That's why I'm here. But you can't run away. The world was meant to be lived in. It has too much to offer. That's... That's what I suddenly realized when you knocked on my door. Oh, it's too late. Why? You know what I did? Yes. You tried to do something worthwhile. You tried to make things better. And I made things worse. But that's how it goes in this world. Next time, you'll be successful. Next time? And I'll be successful, too. I'll have a real marriage. I won't be a spoiled, indulged little doll. You, we, we all get another chance. What? Do you really believe that? You do. You told me. What? Didn't you say, while we live, there's always hope for a sunrise? Yes, yes, but... But what? Was it just talk? 
We've only just met. That's right. But we met at exactly the right time, when each of us needed the other. And so maybe our meeting was no accident. What do you say? I don't know what I'm saying. Or maybe I do. Maybe these things are meant to be. Who knows? What brought you to my house at the exact moment in time when... When... I look into her eyes. The deep, dark eyes. And there's a light that shines in them. A soft light that fills me with warmth and hope. What did bring me to her house at this exact moment in time? Was it for this purpose? To be given fresh hope? Courage? I dared to think. I dared to believe it was so. Why not? Why shouldn't I be saved? Hugh, tell me about Nutrison. Nutrison? Tell me the truth about Nutrison. It's all in the newspapers. I don't care what's in the newspapers. I want the truth. Nutrison. I wanted to create a builder of tissue. What went wrong? I wanted to create a wholesome, beneficial thing for children to build stronger bodies, to increase resistance to disease. And what happened? I thought I had. Yes? But it got away from me. I don't understand. They came along. Who? You know, this big company. You read the paper. Yes. And they said, well, you know what they said. You read it. Yes. They said, you've got it. Man, have you got it. We'll take it from here. Now it requires the kind of research and development that we are equipped to do. And so you gave it to them. You gave them nutrition. Yes. Why? Because this is how it's done. You come up with the idea, you come up with the basic formula, the product in its primitive state, and then an outfit with the equipment, the facilities, the money, the manpower, comes and takes it over. And they took it. Well, how was I to know that they'd rush it to the market without... But you, you acted in good faith. Yes. Then what will drive away the devils? But no one believes me. Everyone believes you. The charges against you were dropped, weren't they? They believe me legally. Or they believe me technically. But they don't really believe me. I believe you. Sarah. See, all you need is one person to believe you. Eventually, everyone falls into line. Why didn't I meet you when I was younger? We have so much time to make up for. Let's not waste a single minute. I want to sell this house. And go where? New York. New York? Or Boston or Chicago or San Francisco. But, but... Where the work is, where the fun is. You'll open another laboratory. Do you know what you're saying? Of course. Who would ever trust me? I trust you. What company would ever want anything to do with me? It's going to be difficult. You don't know what you're talking about. Are you afraid? Afraid to fight back? It could take such a long time. But you haven't answered the question. Are you afraid to fight your way back? No. I'm not afraid of anyone or anything. Oh, darling. Darling. What, what was that? Sounded like a shot. A shot? Who would fire a shot? Ah! Uh, I'm sorry, Miss Bugnett. Jerry, Jerry Morphy, what's the meaning of... Your fellow Crenshaw wouldn't let me come in. What, what did he do to Crenshaw? Nothing. I had to put a bullet through the window to convince him I meant business. How dare you force your way in here? I don't have no quarrel with Crenshaw. It's him standing there. He's the one I want. Do you realize Crenshaw is calling the sheriff? I know. I know something else, too. I know it has to take the sheriff at least 20 minutes to get out here. I don't need 20 minutes for what I have to do. What are you saying? Put that gun away. What am I saying? Ask him. He knows what I'm saying. Tell her what I'm saying, Dr. Montrose. You know who I am. You as good as told me back in the shop. Then I remember seeing your picture in the paper. He's going to kill me, Thyra. No! Can't you see it? Can't you see it in his eyes? Jerry, listen. Listen to I'm me. Sorry, Mrs. Bodnave. I gotta do it. Who are you to judge another human being? We're past that kind of argument. You'll spend the rest of your life in jail. That's all right. I have to do it. I have to do it for my brother. Jerry, don't you understand? It was a mistake. We all have to pay for our mistakes. He didn't mean it. He tried. Oh, good Lord, Jerry, he's a man of science and truth. He only wanted to do good. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't? No, no, it wasn't. He had a vision of children who would never be sick. Children who would never suffer. That's why he created nutrition. Yeah. 
Oh, let him tell me that, Miss Norton. Eh? Tell me, Doctor. Tell me you invented the, the thing for the reason she said. Tell me that. Tell him you. Well? The answer is yes. You did it for the kids. You didn't do it for the money. Tell him you did it for the children. Can you tell me that? Yes. Miss Borden, do you have a Bible? A Bible? In, in the drawer. All right, get it. Here. Here. Give it to him. Now, oh, doctor, tell me you didn't do it to get rich. Hold on to that Bible and tell me. I did it because I wanted... <laughs> I wanted... Listen. What is it? Oh, it's stolen. She's here. Who's here? Don't you recognize her laugh? Your niece. What are you trying to put over? Oh, listen, listen. It's, it's Betty James. She's dead. No, oh, she's here. Betty James here. Now I know. Now I know what this place is. This is the place they all come to afterward. They come here to her, to fire a border name. This dear, kind lady. Hugh, what are you saying? That's why I came here. Don't you understand? Now, no, listen to me. Listen. Children, children, listen to me, all of you. I came here to find you. Hugh, you must come. Now, don't you hear them all? There is no death. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Children, children, you must forgive me. I shouldn't have sold the Nucleusin before it was ready. But they gave me money. Children, do you know how much money? And... Why not? I was only doing it for the money. You. But it's the truth. I was tired of being poor. Oh, I was respected. I was distinguished. But I was poor. I just let the idea of the money make me careless. Don't say that. He'll kill you. Let him kill me. <laughs> I hear her laughter. I'll hear it till the day I die. Go ahead, Jerry. Kill me. Kill me. What are you waiting for? I can't kill you. Why not? Because... I hear her laughing, too. Jerry! I'm the one that killed her. I'm the one who said to Joe and Edna, poor kid, so scrawny. Why don't you give her some of that nutrition stuff they advertise? I'm the one who talked them into it. I wanted Joe to, to kill me, too. But he won't. Please, Jerry. I won't kill you, neither. You and me. We're gonna hear this little girl till the day we die. See how the children wait, says the poet. That is true. They wait. They wait for what children have always waited for since the very beginning of time. They wait their turn. They wait for the day when they shall no longer be children. And how do they know when that day arrives? It comes when the lilt of childish laughter has left the voice forever. I'm leaving you, but only for a short while. We read the paper, we hear, we see the news. Every now and then... Something goes wrong with our marvelous mechanized civilization. The plane falls. The machine fails. The building collapses. The beneficial chemical suddenly runs amok and destroys instead of heals. And so, murder. Unintentional, accidental, regrettable murder. But murder, nevertheless, is built into our culture. Does every society require victims? The ancients believed so. That's why they performed sacrifices. Does the heart of the matter ever really change? Our cast included Alexander Scorby, Laurie March, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant
the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... poet wrote that there is nothing in words. Believe what is before your eyes. But what about the mind's eye? In it, dreams and nightmares are real enough. And wide awake, any number of persons have seen apparitions or have had premonitions through extrasensory perception. The world of the macabre, then, is not unreal at all. Sometimes, quite often, in fact, Real life is macabre. It has become so for a young Hollywood actress named Mady Rambeau. What does this note mean? Just what I wrote. You've seen the snapshot. You'll pay, Miss Rambeau. My boss thinks it's worth a hundred grand. Blackmail? Who took the picture? I wonder about that, too. But there it is. You at a private gambling party with your arms around the neck of a known mobster. You, Miss Clean. You'll pay, Miss Rambo. Our mystery drama, Blackmail, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Larry Haynes and Terry Keene. It is sponsored in part by A.R.M., Allergy Relief Medicine, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. There are many ways to earn a living, and every one of them is honorable if it is earned honestly. Aristotle, for one, maintained that Real happiness can be achieved only if you work up to your standard of excellence. That is a viewpoint that means nothing to those who cheat. The kind of person who cuts corners sometimes goes too far. He becomes a thief. Thieves come in many grades, and the lowest is a blackmailer. One of them, the man we're about to meet, is a blackmailer. Eddie Small, who owns Small's Chop House... In West Hollywood. Maxie. Maxie. Huh? What are you staring at? Something wrong? Uh, I don't know. Look at that guy in the booth. The one by himself. Okay, what about him? He looks familiar. Why not? He's been in two or three times. Nice looking. Skip that. <laughs> don't be stupid, Eddie. But thanks all the same. For what? Uh, being jealous after all these years. <laughs> You're still great looking, Maxie. Yeah, and I still ought to be in pictures. Who is he? Who is who? I just keep looking at that guy. I've seen him somewhere before. Not here. And it'll come to me. Well, go ask him. You don't look like some of the pugs and hustlers who come in and nurse this little beer. I'll walk over. Go ahead. I'll be in the back room. Eddie! I got it. You know who that is? Tony Carpo. Hey. The tough boy from New York. Yeah, he shaved his mustache and cut his hair normal, but that's the face. That's what we saw in the newspapers. I think you're right. He's wanted by the New York police for hijacking a booze truck and killing the driver. What do we do? We don't call the cops. But I don't want him around the joint. Got a lot of customers who don't want cops snooping around. Including us. Yeah, right. Ask for his bill and tell him this place is off limits. If he needs a hand out, I'll stake him. Eddie, listen, I'm thinking of something. Maybe you could, uh, help us. No, thank you. He's wanted for murder. I want him out of here. What about Mady Rambo? Huh? You see what I mean? Clean the guy up, buy him some good clothes, let him be our collector. What's he got to lose? You're not only beautiful, Maxie. You're smart. It's an idea. Go have a talk with him and play it close. He's a killer. Hi. How 
you do it. Okay. Good food. Patty serves the best. You've been in before? Twice. No rule against it, is there? Oh, of course not. Come often and stay late. Thank you. Well, I'm finished. Oh, you can pay me. You the boss? Eddie Small owns the place, but I kind of oversee it. Oh, the innkeeper's wife? Yeah, you might say that. I'm Maxine. Glad to meet you. And you? Tony. Corbett. Corbett? That's right. Okay, if you say so. Why? You stick to that? You question all the customers? I like to get to know them. I mean, we draw a strange crowd, racetrack touts, ex-fighters, guys in the numbers, rackets, all kinds. So far, none like you, Mr. Corbett. Meaning what, Maxine? I've seen you before. Oh, I see. In the newspapers, without the long hair and mustache. Yeah, thanks for the tip. Yeah, I like your joint. Sorry, this has to be my last visit. I'll clear up. Well, that was Eddie's idea. I got a different one. Eddie said if you need a handout, you're welcome. Well, that's very nice of him. Why? Is he afraid I'll shoot up the place? Well, you've used a gun before. We don't want any of that around here. It would attract the cops. We don't care for them very much. Mr. Carpo. You said Eddie wants me to clear up. You had a different idea. What is it? You know who Mady Rambo is? The young movie actress? That's the one. Miss Queen. She's going to be big if her image doesn't get spoiled. Public image, I mean. Why should it be? Well, everybody thinks she's a straight arrow. No booze. Everybody's young sweetheart, you know. Mm-hmm. So perfect she don't have to be born again. Okay. What about her? She could mean uh, money to you. I don't get it. Interested. Well... Sure, sure. I could use some real money, but uh, what do I have to do for it? Oh, I leave that to Eddie. He'll explain. Uh, not here. Why not? Someone else might recognize you as Tony Carbo and blow the whistle. You free at five? Sure. I'll give you an address on Mechanic Street. You be there, and Eddie will talk to you. Yeah. What's it all about? You'll find out at five, Tony. <laughs> Right on there, Maxie. Yeah, right on time. Hi. Come in, Tony. Nice place. Eddie, this is Tony Carbo. How are you, Tony? Okay, so far. You know, I like your restaurant. You must do well to live like this. Mm, the restaurant does okay, but it's no gold mine. We uh, do other things. Oh, I see. Is that where I come in? Maxine said something about Lady Rambo. Are you into movies? Mm, in a small way. And you got a proposition for me? Yeah, a pretty good one, I think you'll agree. Tony Carbo is warned by the police. You're safe with me. You ain't safe if you show yourself around Hollywood. Why'd you come here from New York? I'm shipping out. Oh, yeah? How do you manage that? Well, there's a small freighter will take me on. Bound for where? South America. Freighter's got a sideline too, right? Yeah, so they tell me. Who tells you that? Oh, a Jersey pal I've done a few favors for, Joe Hernandez. Runs dope. That the guy? That's the guy. I don't know what he does except what I read in the papers. So you ship out and then what? I do a fade out. Hmm. Guy without a country? Yeah, something like that. Well, that's better than facing a murder charge, right? Yeah, I'd say so. And you ship out when? Well, the boat docks in three days. I'll be gone in five. What's the name of the freighter? I'll keep that to myself. Five days should do it, Eddie. It's been three weeks, babe, and we got nowhere. I don't know. We got nothing to lose. Could you use ten grand? Not if I have to earn it with a gun. No, gun. Nothing like that. Just show him the picture, Maxine. What do you think of that, Tony? Yeah. I get it. Blackmail. That picture's worth a hundred grand. You collect, you get ten percent. You know who the man in the picture is? Big Frank Fatello. 
runs the town. Yeah, I know, I know. I've heard of him, the mobster. Yeah, they call him that, but he's a smooth businessman. And everything that turns a buck. Restaurants, tracks, betting, you name it. And there's Lady Rambo with her arms around his neck. Hollywood's Miss Clean hugging Big Frank. I guess you know what would happen if the picture went public. Um, uh, who's gambling joint? Well, it's private. It's not important. The picture says gambling joint, and that's the last place the public expects to see Mady Rambo. So, so she pays, and she stays Miss Clean. She doesn't. Her career is finished. You got it. I collect the money, and I get ten grand. Is that right? Uh, that's right. And, uh... You've been trying to collect for, uh, how long did you say? Three weeks? Yeah. We sent her a copy of the picture and made our demand. I gave her a month to come up with a dough. Time's just about run out. Uh, how'd you get the picture? She, she liked to know, too. Professional secret, Tony. You have the negative? I know where it is. Well, she won't pay off without getting that. Nobody is that stupid. Well, then give it to her. We'll make a copy. Look, you can't squeeze her forever. What if they track down whoever took the picture? They can't. Take my word for it. Hmm. How do you arrange for the money to be delivered? Uh, we got a drop arranged, a real clever one. Now, the cops know all the tricks. Probably Big Frank does, too. I think you're lucky Mady hasn't come through with the money. Once she does, it'll lead to you. Now you know why you're here, Tony. Mm-hmm. The collector. A ten grand sitting duck. Well, what do you say, Tony? Uh, I can try. What? Well, what's wrong with tonight? Where does she hang out? You're not going to her house. No, no, no. She goes out. What restaurant? Mason's. She got a boyfriend or an escort? She was more of an escort, a hairdresser from the studio. Uh -huh. I'll need some money. Say, a uh, hundred. You got it. Uh, you're you're going to speak to her in the restaurant? Why not? Well, if you're spotted, you're going to be picked up. If you're not, what if she raises her fuss? Before she gets the chance, I say I'm there to help her. How? You're holding the picture over her head. What if I say I know who the blackmailers are? <laughs> you wouldn't do that, would you, Pally? Uh, you know better than that, Eddie. I tell her if she loses her nerve and wants to yell police, I don't carry the picture, but I describe it. She'll listen to me. Now, what about the escort, that hairdresser? Don't worry about him. What's his name? Jody Pearl. Okay, Maxine, will you telephone Masons and ask if Lady Rambo's having dinner there tonight? You know what worries me, Tony? What's that? How you get into Masons without a cop spotting you? You're wanted for murder. They won't spot me. I can make sure they don't. supernatural about what's happened so far. But macabre? I'd say yes. One synonym for that word is grotesque. And that, for me, describes blackmail and those who practice it. In Eddie Small, Maxine, and Tony Carbo, we have a charming trio trying to extract a fortune from a young movie star. How they fare will be unfolded when I return with Act Two. have been destroyed when the public is turned against one of its heroes by learning that he is a human being. Everyone commits indiscretions. They're usually shrugged off. But when a statesman, a famous athlete, or a movie star makes a careless statement or is photographed out of context with his public image, the public turns on him. We are hero worshippers. Knowing this, the blackmailer makes heroes pay for their mistakes. As young Lady Rambo has found out. Don't you dare tell me what to do. Well, I only said... I won't. I won't. But maybe... No. But I'll tell you what I will do. I am going to get whoever did this to me. Swell. Good luck. Don't be sarcastic, Jody. I mean it. Okay, you mean it. How? Have the police got to leave? Frank the teller will find him. Or them. Whoever. You spoke to the teller? The head of the studio did. Mr. The teller did a slow burn... His boys are at work? He phoned and said he was sorry. When he finds the pig... Yeah, sure, sure, but then it'll be too late. You stalled for three weeks. You've got a week left. 
pay the money now and save your career. No, I didn't do anything wrong, and I'm not going to pay. Well, it's your career, it's not mine. What did I do that was wrong? You got your picture taken embracing a notorious mobster. You, every parent's darling, the girl they'd like their daughters to be. I did not embrace him. Take a look at the snapshot. I won a big pot at roulette and I was jumping with excitement. So was Mr. Vitello. I didn't even know who he was. He grinned at me, opened his arms, and I jumped. Right out of the movies. (sighs) If that picture gets printed, you're finished. You've busted your public image. That is not true. I know that, but protect yourself. The police will go on looking for the blackmailer. So will Mr. Vitello. Oh, you've got some funny loyalties. How do you know Vitello didn't set you up for that snapshot? What? Well, think it over. Now get your coat, and we'll head for Mason. You think Mr. Vitello... He's Big Frank, remember? He might... He might have set me up for a blackmail? It's one of his rackets, baby. What's this? A note from some admirer. What else? Jody. He's here. Who? The blackmailer. Let me see that note. Uh, may I speak with you alone? I overheard that you are being victimized. I may be able to help you. I'm in the dark, too. Will you come over to my table? I'm alone, wearing tinted glasses. Look around, and I'll bow my head. Ah, there he is. I'll ask the captain to notify the security guard. No. Yes. You know who that man is? The collector. Not the blackmailer? No, he's from the blackmailers. Just some guy to collect the money. How do you know that? Well, it's the way it works. Let me speak to the guy... Then get the police. No. No, no. It's my career. Maybe the man does want to help me. You just stay here. I'll go over to his table. Good evening, Miss Rambo. Who are you? Tony Corbett. What is the meaning of this note you sent to my table? Someone is trying to extort a fortune from you because of a snapshot of you and Frank Vitello. You said you might be able to help me. How? Can you raise the money? Say I could and say I won't. You won't pay? I did nothing wrong. Now, my friend's all for calling the police because he thinks you're the collector. Who's the friend? Jody Pearl, a hairdresser at the studio. It's well informed. Now, if I give him a signal... You will be escorted to the police, Mr. Corbett. That's a waste of time. I don't know much. You overheard I was being blackmailed. Where? That's a lead. A dead end. What I don't know and what seems to have been overlooked is how this racket works. Now, it's been worked in other studios, but no one's found out how. Now, that's how I might be able to be of help, Miss Rambo. Who took the picture? I have no idea. The snapshot, even the negative and all the copies, they're not as important as discovering the person who had a camera and clicked it. You know, first you sound like a collector, and now you sound like a cop. Why do you care how the racket is working? There's no protection for you, Miss Rambo, unless the person who snapped the picture is caught. Even if you paid the 100000 even if you got a negative in exchange, you'd still be unprotected. Say I paid the money. You'd give it to the blackmailer. I'd find him or he'd find me. How? Through Frank Fratello. He's looking for the blackmailer, isn't he? How do you know that? That's just a guess. He doesn't hurt innocent persons. Uh, An honorable monster. I think so. You, uh... You'd see your meet, Mr. Fratello? Yeah. Jody said I was crazy. You're even crazier. Mr. Vitello might break every bone in your body. And learn nothing. Because I don't know anything. If he doesn't believe me, I'm dead. If he does, and that's my gamble, I can lead him to the blackmailer. Because you can be sure he'll find out I've got the money and he'll come after me. How will the blackmailer know that? Vitello's men let it be known. So the blackmailer goes after you? That's right. I'd rely on Vitello to protect me. And what's in this for you? Ten percent. Ten thousand. What about the other ninety? You'd get it back. 
How can you guarantee that? By catching the man who snapped the picture. What is it that you're saying that I give you the hundred thousand? You break the racket by finding out how it's worked. You keep ten and return the rest. Why? Blackmail's a dirty crime. It was once worked on me. What's to prevent you from taking the hundred thousand and running out? I won't. That's all I can say. Either you believe me or you don't. I'll take the chance. Tell me what to do. Well? Nothing. Who is the guy? Just a nut. Did he know anything? What's his name? Tony Corbett. He overheard my name mentioned. And what's he want? He knows I'm being blackmailed. I'm to give him the money and have Mr. Vitello's boys follow him until the blackmailer goes after him. End of blackmailer. Oh, maybe. I pay him 10000 and he returns the other night. You've lost your little mind. Can't you see through the scheme? He's the collector. I said that before. Pretty clever one, too. He can't walk in and say, give me the money, because the cops would grab him when he walked out. So he comes up with this harebrained scheme. He doesn't know the blackmailer. Maybe not. But he knows who gave him the assignment to collect the money and even where to leave it or send it. The blackmailer stays undercover, and the guy who gives instructions to the collector leaves town. I see. So this guy cleverly gets you to believe he wants to help you. He'll get away with the money or be caught. And if he's caught, you'll get back your money, but you won't find the blackmailer. So what should I do? Wait until you hear from the blackmailer again. He'll describe his collector. Pay only him. There's only a few days left, Jody. You'll get the word. Then pay up. I see you still want peace, Tony. Jamita? It's all set. Should pay up? Yep. Hey, I gotta hand it to you, Tony. My congratulations. Yeah, maybe the hundred had gone down the drain. How'd you work it, Tony? Well, there wasn't much to it after the first few moments. I sent her a note. She came over. I told her I'd overheard she was in trouble, and I wanted to help her. How? By convincing her I didn't know the blackmailer, but if she gave me the money, he'd come after me. Ah. Uh-huh. So instead? I get the money. The fellow's boys and the cops follow me, but they don't stop me. You give me an envelope, a heavy brown one. Address it where you want it to go... Put enough postage on it, and I'll see to it that it gets mailed. Nah, I don't like it, Tony. I want to see the money, all of it. You don't trust me? I wouldn't trust myself with a hundred grand. You deliver the money to me. All right. What's your suggestion? When are you seeing her again? Two nights from now. Have the hairdresser bring her here. Then what? You join him in a booth. She gives you the money. What about the guy? She's told him what you're up to. She goes along with your scheme. He does, too. All right. Now I got the money. What next? She has an envelope with the money in it. You say to me, Eddie, can I leave this in your safe until I ask for it? And I say, sure, Tony. That way I got the money and no one can hold you up for it. You'll go home and hang out waiting for that blackmailer to come after you. I can't hang long. That freighter... You come in the next night and I give you a ten. After that... Vamos. Simple as that. Clear? You're the boss. Don't forget her. You said the cops are tailing a girl. Would you believe I got a couple of boys tailing you? I never doubted that for a minute, Eddie. But, Jody? Yeah? Not Mason's. Um, there's a place called Eddie Small's Chop House in West Hollywood. Oh, that's no place for you, matey. It sounds like a saloon. Oh, I hear it's good. Who said so? That man. He wants me to meet him there, and I don't want to go alone. The con man you talked to a couple of nights ago? That's right. Matey, don't be crazy. I'm going to be. Oh, boy. He'll meet us there. Now, come over around 7, all right? Do I have a choice? Nope. And I'm excited. This could be the end of the trouble, Jody. More like the end of you. Two lousy days. You worried? Where's he been? 
don't the boys know? Yeah, some. But he's given her the slip a couple of times. Then he walks into his rooming house, bold as brass. Don't figure. He's crazy. He's pushing his luck or the cops are asleep. They're not asleep, Eddie. They're waiting. They can arrest him any time. They're waiting to see what he does with Mady Rambo, and that's why I don't like your plan. You got a better one, babe? I just don't like having the cops stake out the chop house. There's the cops and Vitello's thugs. I like that. Tony turns the envelope with the money over to you. You come to the bar and ask me to put it in the safe. I say, okay. Then Tony leaves. And the cops walk in and tell you to open the safe. Okay. Okay. They get the money. Why? Are you dumb or something, Eddie? They get the envelope and the money. We're frozen out and they arrest Tony. What's this, babe? A manila envelope. That's what the cops will find in the safe. It's fat. You sure? It's stuffed with junk from Tony's room. Clippings, little money, insurance policy, junk. When you hand me the envelope with the money in it, I do a sleight of hand behind the bar. A minute later, you come behind the bar and drop the money in the apron. Then, vamos. Go home. Yeah. That could work. But when Tony comes back tomorrow for his ten grand... He won't come back, babe. What remains to be revealed about our trio is how it falls out. Hopefully to the benefit of the young actress. Criminals have no conscience until they are caught. And then it is not a matter of remorse, but one of regret. They are not to be pitied. Their victims are. I will return shortly with Act Three. This is a time of the anti hero. Very few persons in public life, the professions, and business command our respect. Everyone is suspect. That makes us cynical. Such a philosophy encourages a certain kind of mentality to exploit human weakness. Lady Rambo committed an indiscretion, and for it, a blackmailer has leached onto her. It is early evening, and she has just received Jody Pearl. What's this about a chop house in West Hollywood? That's where the man wants me to bring the money. Eddie Small's chop house is a dive. That's where he heard the rumor about me. I'm seen there and word gets back about him and me. Uh-huh. And the blackmailer finds out and goes after him and the police or Vitello's boys go after the blackmailer. He's caught. You've given the man ten grand and get back ninety. You'll also get back the ten, maybe. Why? Uh, I've got a surprise for you, sweetheart. The man... You don't know his name. The man isn't that knight in armor of yours. He's Tony Carbo. I've seen that name somewhere. What? You have if you read the papers. Tony Carbo? He's a killer. And the police want him bad. How do you know he's Tony Carbo? By looking at him. Well, then why haven't the police picked him up? Well, that's been bothering me, too. I don't know. Just luck. Listen, that scares me, Jody. It should. Maybe I better call it off. No. No, go through with it. I think we'll be safe. You hand over the money. I have it here in a manila envelope. Okay. We meet him, have a drink. You hand over the money. He'll leave and the police will pick him up. So I get back the money and the blackmailer still sells the snapshot and goodbye Hollywood. Maybe not. Tony Carbo is horned in on the blackmailer. The blackmailer wants the money. You'll hear from him again, and he'll identify his collector and send him to you. Pay up and forget it. I won't pay up. Well, it's your funeral, baby. You're over a barrel. I would pay the money only if the whole rotten racket is exposed. That means the blackmailer and especially the pig who sneaked the picture. Maybe they're one and the same. I don't think so. Whoever took the picture was at that party. Now, everybody was respectable, and most of them were wealthy. Who could it be? 
How is it done? Did you see a camera, Jody? No. It's a mystery to me. What's the point of meeting the man now? This could be bad publicity. Or it could be good. Tony Carbo tries to extort money from Screen Star. She alerts police, places herself in danger, the police capture him. That's a big story. Maybe. Ready? I guess so. Ah, cheer up. We'll trap this guy and then leave. He said his name was Tony Corbett. Sure. And I'm the king of Siam. Well, then we got to think he's shipped out, pal. Hi, Eddie. That's me. You haven't been in for two days. What you been up to, Tony? Didn't your boys tell you? Oh, some. You'd get around. Why not? I even went out to the studio. Why? Mm. Just snooping around. I don't like that. Will you relax? Your troubles will be over in an hour. She's coming here? With Jody Pearl. Now, how do we handle it? Like I said, you hand me the envelope. No, Eddie. He hands it to me. Yeah, that's right. Maxie gives it to me and says, keep it for you in a safe. Then enjoy your dinner. Yeah. Miss Rambo won't have much appetite for food. Then let him leave. You with him. Uh, what about my money? Tomorrow. Now, there'll be cops watching me. I can't come back. They ain't you the decoy for the blackmailer? Everyone follows you. The cops tail you and wait for the blackmailer to turn up. That's what you set up, right? Ah, uh-huh. But I want to walk out with my money. No can do, baby. Why not? The dough won't be here. I see. You see a lot. For instance, what do you see out of the studio? I looked around. What were you looking for? How your racket works, Eddie. It's simple, but clever. Tell me about it. You work it through someone in the movie company, a bit player, a grip, anyone who wants to pick up a tax-free bundle. Someone who can get close to a star and catch him or her in an off moment. Uh-huh. Maybe even train the person on how to use a miniature camera. We never had a camera in our lives. You've got those spies everywhere. You wait, check pictures. A juicy one means money. For instance, Miss Mady Rambo in Frank Fratello's arms. Must be a pretty good business, Eddie. Too bad you're shipping out, Tony. Yeah, but not before I get my ten grand. Take it out of the hundred she gives you. Then get out. Then get lost. Um, what happens to the negatives of those juicy pictures, Eddie? They're kept in a very safe place. Mm-hmm. And what happens if one of your spies tries to work the blackmail con on his own? I have not taken care of. It's nice. Look at that old wooden bar. I bet the place is 50 years old. Good evening, Miss Rambo. Good evening. Uh, this is Mr. Pearl. He works with me at the studio. Yeah, glad to meet you. Please, sit down. Miss Carbo... I mean, are you really... Tony Carbo? Corbett. Miss Rambo, Corbett. Did you bring the money? Look, mister, before Miss Rambo answers that question, answer one for me... You think that because you've been seen with her twice, the blackmailer is going to surface? He wants the money. I'll have it. He'll show. If you leave here with the money... But I don't leave here with the money. I don't understand. Eddie is a friend of mine. He owns this place. Now, you give me the money. I remove my tin, seal the envelope, and have Eddie place it in his safe. Now, Eddie knows that you, Miss Rambo, will return and claim it. And he'll give it to you. But you said... I mean, Mr. Carbo, I agreed to your scheme because you said you'd find the person who took that picture and he'd expose the blackmailer. Isn't that what you said? Exactly. And you've done that? Yes, Miss Rambo. I don't believe that. How would a thug like you move into Hollywood a week ago? How do you know that, Mr. Pearl? Well, by by what I read in the newspaper. I, I don't know how long you've been here. Make it a month. There's no way you could break this racket. Why not? Because it's been going on for years in all the studios. Yeah, I know. Tell me, who took the picture? Was it the blackmailer? No. I'll tell you when I take you home. You take her home? 
Why won't you tell me now? Because I don't want to disturb the peace. All right, let's get out of here, matey. This guy's a phony. Now, the money, Miss Rambo. Trust me. You'll excuse me, matey. Sitting across from the killer turns my stomach. I hope you get home safely. I've had enough of this charade. Jody! I'll let him go, Miss Rambo. You're not making a fool of me, are you, Mr. Carpo? No, I swear I'm not. Now, here's what happens. Take out the envelope, give me $10,000. Seal the rest of the money in the envelope, and I'll wave to Maxine. All right. This is just crazy. Yeah, it is. But do it. Don't shake. All right, there's your money. I seal the envelope. And here comes Eddie. Yeah, Tony. Eddie, uh, will you do me a favor? Yeah, sure. Need some cash? No, no, no. I wonder if you'd keep uh, this envelope in your safe for me. Sure. I'm shipping out. Uh, yeah. And when I return from South America, I'll call for it. Sure. It'll be safe with me. You know that. Miss Rambo, just watch. Watch carefully. And don't be frightened by the fire. Police. Police. Hey, look, they grabbed Jody. All right. Out the back way, Maxine. Why, Jody? Tony found out. He's got his ten grand. How could he find out? Get out. Hurry. Well, they got nothing on us, Eddie. Let them have the money. They got Jody. Don't you know what that means? I'm a double cross. The police will make Jody talk. Tony must have found out Jody took the picture. How? Get out, Maxine. Take the envelope and get out. I'm shaking like a leaf. I don't blame you. Uh, let me have your coat. Oh, thank you, thank you. I really have to sit down. That's the wildest experience I've ever had. Hmm. Oh, come on in, Mr. Corbett. Uh, make it Tony. We've uh, been through quite a lot. Uh, yes. You'd better tell me all about it. You can't be Tony Carbo. No. There is no Tony Carbo. But the picture's in the newspaper. And the hijacking and the murder charge, all faked. We had good cooperation from the papers. Why? Well, what was it about? Blackmail in the movie studios. You know, you weren't the only victim. I still don't know what happened. Didn't... Didn't the man yell, they got Jody? That's right. The police? Why? I mean, why old Jody? He's my pal. Maybe you're in for a shock. I told you that night at Mason's that the most important aspect of this case wasn't the snapshot, but the person who took the picture. Well, I found the negative. That gave me the person. And here's that uh, deadly little piece of film. That's the original? Yeah, I think so. I don't think there are any copies, but we'll make sure. Where'd you find this? We searched the houses of everyone who was at that gambling party. Now, most of the persons owned cameras, but none owned a half-frame camera, one that is about half the size of a bar of soap. It's inconspicuous and sharp. Even the blow-up's quite sharp. I found quite a few enlarged backstage shots in one person's house. Judy. That's right. Well, that proved nothing. We had to find that negative I just gave you, and we did. Oh, how could he? He was my friend. Yeah, you thought... Why would he do such a rotten thing? Money. He didn't care about you, matey. He cared about himself. He lived in reflected fame. He was a hypocrite. No, I don't think you're the first star he's caught off guard with his camera. And that man at the chop house? Eddie. He was the blackmailer. By now, he's under arrest. And your money. And this. No, that, that's yours, Tony. You earned it. No, 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 no. I'm not allowed to take money, matey. That's my job to track down criminals. You're a cop. Sort of. Here. Here's my identification. Tony Corbett. FBI. For a change, no ghosts, apparitions, but all the same, a tale of the macabre. In our so-called real world, we have the underworld with its large assortment of criminals and their many strange practices. Most of us will never be victims of a blackmailer, but...
public figures live with the danger of making an indiscreet slip and paying for it. I'll return shortly. At one time or another, every person is a hero to someone. Father to son, a classmate who excels, the teacher who inspires, anyone who impresses us with exceptional ability. That's because we're daydreamers. Instinctively, we like to attain excellence. It's popular today to sneer at such an idea. We've become cynical. Let's return to hero worship. Heroes like Tony Corbett inspire ideals. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Robert Dryden, Terry Keene, and Jada Rowland. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The mandrake is a plant with a darkly colorful history. In ancient times, it was used as a narcotic for healing bones and as an anesthetic. It was also considered to form the basis for an excellent love potion. But there was just one problem. When torn from the ground, so folklore has it, it would emit such a piercing scream that any living mortal hearing it went mad or died. What was that? Inspector, we must go to the manor at once. I'm afraid we may be too late. You think someone else has been lured to his death? Yes. That's just an old wives' tale, Inspector. I say those people are being murdered. mystery drama, The Shriek of the Mandrake, was written especially for the mystery theater by Percy Granger and stars Anne Williams. There is no remedy for love but to love more, said Thoreau. It's a pretty sentiment, but hardly helpful to the person who finds himself or herself ensnared in a destructive affair in which the only possible happiness can be escape. But how does one escape from the headstrong and irrational demands of the heart? New relationships? Travel? Work? Our story is about a prominent young woman who would seem to have all these distractions going for her. Good evening. I'm Virginia Stewart. Oh, yes, I recognize you from your films. Come right in. Oh, thank you. You must be Mr. Coombs. <laughs> well, what a lovely, quaint little inn this is. You know, this is my first trip to England. Your room is upstairs. That all the baggage you have? Yes. Well, I never thought a film star would travel so light. All right, follow me. I, uh, 
I suppose the rest of the cast and crew has already arrived. They've gone to dinner in the village, all except that William Boyer, all the women drool over. <laughs> uh, he ain't arrived yet. Well, we drove up together from London. Oh. So where is he then? He's gone to have a look at the old manor where we'll be making the film. By himself? Yes. Oh. If he knows what's good for him, he won't stay there long. Why? Here's your room, the bath's at the end of the hall, and sorry for the inconvenience. Sure, you're not happy we're here, are you? No, I'm not. This was a peaceable place before you and your film crew showed up. Now we'll be overrun by all manner of curiosity seekers. Well, it should be good for business, at least. There's more to life than business. Uh, hello. May I come in? Oh. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to startle you. I'm Detton Norris. Oh, the author of our marvelous script. And the marvelous book from which the marvelous script <laughs> was made. Uh, you'll excuse me. <laughs> He's a charming fellow. Who is he? Mr. Coombs. He runs the inn. <laughs> Aren't you staying here? No, I guard my solitude. I've taken a room in the village. I was just driving about, and I stopped here in hopes of meeting you. Oh, will you forgive me if I unpack? Oh, should I go? I, uh, no, no, no. Please stay. <laughs> I'd rather not be left alone. This English countryside can be pretty gloomy. <laughs> I promise to set my next script on the French Riviera. Oh, um, uh, Mr. Norris, uh... Is there something the matter with the house where we're filming? Wicklow Manor? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Thanks to our director, Jake Weller's grim sense of humor, we are shooting in a house that apparently is possessed. You mean haunted? It seems the original resident at Thomas Foxgrove was jilted by his mistress some four centuries ago. In revenge, he tricked the lady into plucking a mandrake root to make a love potion for her new bow. The mandrake shrieked, as mandrakes are reported to do, and the poor lady went dutifully mad. Thomas Foxgrove, in remorse, threw himself to his death from the tower which is attached to the house. Oh, dear. Anyway, ever since then, it's been claimed that Thomas's ghost haunts the place, enticing poor souls to their deaths in the same grisly manner. And people have actually died? Oh, yes, about half a dozen, all told, I believe. Hmm. And always, so the legend goes, the mandrake's shriek is heard to echo across the moors. If you ask me, I'd say the story's been exploited by persons looking for a convenient way to do in their enemies. <laughs> you were seeing a lot of William Boyer in London, weren't you? What? Oh, oh. oh yes, he, uh, he likes to be on intimate terms with all his leading ladies. Oh, and you? I made it clear to him I'm here to work. The last thing I want now is an emotional attachment. Ah, in that case, you have nothing to fear from the legend of Wicklow Manor. Why? Well, apparently the only people vulnerable to the ghost's suicidal invitation are those unhappy in love. Oh. Something wrong? Oh, uh, I... No, nothing. Oh, but something in your suitcase there, that photograph. It, it, it's only... I didn't know it was there. It's just the sort of thing he would do. That's a handsome man. Well, I'm afraid the photograph doesn't tell the full story. He's your boyfriend? Was. You, uh... <laughs> you don't sound very convinced. <laughs> well, well, Larry is the kind of person one can't easily forget. He was demanding, self-centered, ruthless... But utterly charming. <sighs> yes. <laughs> I think I know the type. Impossible, but irresistible. Worst of all, he was... Impossibly jealous. Oh. <laughs> oh, please, let's talk of something else. Oh, I am so nervous about starting this new film. I've never worked with Jake Weller before. Is he anything like his reputation? Well, if you like to play poker and shoot pool, the two of you will get on just fine. <laughs> oh, Mr. Norris, I think you've written a beautiful script. It's rare even in this day and age to find a story in which the heroine controls her own destiny. Well, thanks. I try to keep up. Well, I'm the, I'm the one who owes you thanks. 
It was your script that finally gave me the courage to confront Larry. I guess I'd known all along it could never work out between us. His kind of is incapable of forming genuine attachments. But he's he's so passionate and and persuasive. Miss Stewart, are you in there? Who's that? <laughs> Sounds like Jake Weller, our director. I'll get it. Hello, Jake. Denton, what are you doing here? Oh, I came by to introduce myself to Miss Stewart. Uh, Inspector, come on up. I've got two of them. Inspector? Jake, what's wrong? It looks like we're going to have a delay in our shooting schedule. Oh, in here, Inspector. This is Denton Norris. He wrote the script, and that's Virginia Stewart. She's an actress. Uh, This is Inspector Havisham. He's the local constabulary. Is is something wrong? Uh, William Boyer is dead. What? What happened? It appears to have been a suicide, Miss Stewart. Suicide? William Boyer? Mm, he was found at the base of Wicklow Tower. He fell? Mm, so it seems. Miss Stewart, Mr. Weller says that you and Mr. Boyer drove up together from London. Yes. You were probably the last person to see him alive. What sort of spirits was he in? Oh, he, he was... Very excited about about starting work tomorrow. Hmm. What about his uh, his personal life? His personal life? Well, anything that might possibly have been a, a source of frustration. Uh, uh, no. I'll tell you exactly what happened, Inspector. He was murdered. An athletic guy like Boyer wouldn't slip. And he was too healthy-minded to take his own life. Murder is, of course, a possibility. Mr. Norris, did you know the deceased? Well, boy, a starred in my last script, but I don't kill people for failing to understand my characters, Inspector. Hmm. Can you account for your whereabouts in the past two hours, uh, Mr. Norris? Well, I've been with Miss Stewart for perhaps 15 minutes. And before that? I was driving about the countryside. Alone? Yes. Did you stop anywhere? Is there anyone who might be able to verify your movements? Why, no, Inspector. There there isn't. Uh, Mr. Weller, is there anyone else connected with your company? No. The rest of the cast and crew were all with me at dinner in the village. Inspector, who found William's body? Mr. Perkins. He's a retired ornithologist. He was in the woods near the manor, making tape recordings of the birds there when he heard a piercing shriek from the direction of Wicklow Manor. Went to investigate and found the body. Well, did Mr. Perkins get a recording of this shriek? He did. He gave it to me here in his uh, tape machine. Could we hear it? Certainly. That's that's the most awful sound I ever heard. Uh, there is, of course, not a possible explanation for Mr. Boyer's death. Well, now, you don't take that legend seriously, do you, Inspector? No, I don't, Mr. Norris. <clears throat> Mr. Weller, if you'd be so kind as to furnish me with a tape of Mr. Boyer's voice, I'll run a voice scan of his voice to compare it to the scream. If the scream came from the deceased's throat, I'll presume suicide. If not, I presume murder. Yeah. Good evening. Oh, it's terrible. Now what are we going to do, Jake? Well, we'll hold a memorial service tomorrow morning and begin shooting in the afternoon. Begin shooting? How can you? Simple. We'll film around Boyer's scenes until we come up with a replacement. I believe you would have preferred James Cadell in the role all along, wouldn't you, Denton? See you in the morning. How can he be so callous? Oh, he's covering Virginia. Jake liked Bill Boyer a lot. He wasn't much of an actor. Oh, forgive my saying so at a time like this. But he was one heck of a man. Jake sometimes gets the two confused. What do you suppose could have happened? I don't know. But I sure am glad the script I wrote only calls for daytime shooting. Cut. 
Finally, we got a take we can print. It's a wrap. I'm sorry, Mr. Weller. I found it very hard to concentrate today. It's okay. It's okay. I understand. Go back to the inn and get a good night's sleep. Well, as a wandering screenwriter, I wonder what local phenomena he's been observing today. Jake? Virginia? I, uh... I've just been to the police station. They ran a test on that tape. It wasn't Boyer's voice. So I was right. He was murdered. Unless you want to believe that legend. Virginia, could, could I speak to you for a moment? I'll see you two later. Virginia, there's something I think you ought to know. What is it? It was publicized that you were seeing a lot of Boyer last week in London, wasn't it? Of course. There are always photographers around. Why? Well, I... I was having lunch today in one of the pubs in the village. I noticed a man talking to the bartender, and I knew at once that I'd seen his face before. Where? In that photograph you found in your suitcase. Larry? If Virginia Stewart had come to England hoping to close the book on the previous chapter of her life it would appear she has not been successful. One of the main characters, it seems, has no intentions of retiring quietly from the scene. Yet Virginia is determined to have him out of her life once and for all. At least, that's what she says. I shall return shortly with Act Two. reputed to have the ultimate persuasive power, that of enticing certain suggestible persons to their deaths. A young woman attempting to put behind her an unhappy love affair, one man dead in the precise manner prescribed by legend, another man fleetingly glimpsed who might be the woman's estranged lover. We enter act two with a number of possibilities. Oh, Mr. Norris, you have to be mistaken. It couldn't have been Larry you saw. Virginia, I don't forget faces. Observing people is second nature to me. But Larry is in California. Besides, you only saw his photograph. Look, be honest with me. Is the photograph a good likeness? Well, yes. And is this the sort of thing he would do, follow you like this? No, he's not the kind to give up easily, Mr. Norris. He's very proud. When I told him our relationship was over, he, he reacted as if I'd insulted him. Then he tried to ply me with doubts. He told me he was in my blood, that I might hate him, but I would never stop loving him. And? I don't know. It was never easy with Larry, but it was never boring either. If he really is here, Mr. Norris, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I never thought he'd go so far as to follow me to England. Would he go so far as to commit murder? You think he might have had something to do with William's death? Virginia, you told me yourself he was insanely possessive. I didn't say insanely. And it was in the society pages of all the London papers that you and Boyer were seeing each well, other. Yes, but there was nothing romantic about but it. Larry wouldn't have had any way of knowing that. I even remember reading an interview you did in the Morning Telegraph in which you stated you thought your working relationship with William Boyer was going to be better than any of your previous male co-stars. Now, what kind of effect would a statement like that have had on Larry? But, but the inspector said it was suicide. The scream on that tape recorder didn't come from Boyer, remember? That means it had to come from someone else. Or something else. Now, you don't believe Thomas Foxgrove's ghost really inhabits that tower, do you? I went up there today. Virginia, Jake gave specific orders that no one was to go into that tower until we had the film. I there. know, but... I couldn't resist. Something seemed to draw me there. There is something up there. I felt it. Well, you were foolish to go. I, I, I stood there in, in front of the French windows where William must have stood just before... I felt my gaze being pulled down. Oh, you were just dizzy, that's all. That tower's five stories high. I kept thinking of the legend. That only those who were unhappy in love were... 
We're vulnerable to the spirit's influence. I see. Part of you is sorry that you left Larry. The man you saw in the pub. But did you speak to him? No. Well, I want to know if it was Larry. Virginia, let's go back to your room and get that photograph. Then I'll drive us into the village and we can show it to that bartender. <laughs> Evening. Oh, good evening. I, um, I wonder if we could have a word with you. Oh, you'll have to make it a quick one, Cub. You can see my trade is heavy tonight. Well, I, uh, I had lunch here this afternoon, and I noticed you talking to a gentleman. He was, he was about my height, but very swarthy. Oh, I talked to a lot of people. Oh, we have his photograph here. You recognize him? Mm-hmm. He was wearing a tweed blazer with a dark turtleneck. Ah, uh, yes, yes, the well-dressed chap. Uh, and on a fancy cologne, too. It was the same man as in the picture? Yeah, yeah I'd say so. <laughs> Not likely to forget those eyes. And do you remember what you were talking about? Well, he just dropped round to thank me. He'd been asking me about places of interest here in the Shire. Oh, this wasn't the first time you'd seen him. Then. Oh, no, no. He'd been in a couple of days ago, making all manner of inquiry. But he's not from these parts. No. I'd say he was an American. Are you certain of that? Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Pisa. Yes, Mr. Pisa. What? What kind of inquiries was he making? Well, mostly about various buildings of interest in the area. The 8th Century Abbey down the road, the Blanchard House. And Wicklow Manor? Oh, yes. Oh, he seemed particularly interested in that one, especially the legend. He quizzed me real close as to the particulars of that bit of superstition. Sure. I say, ain't it awful what happened to that actor? But did he mention his name? A gentleman? No, no, no. Did he um, happen to mention where he was staying? No, I'm afraid not. Uh, should I tell him uh, you're looking for him if he comes in again? Oh, no, no, no. That, that, that's all right. Thanks, Mr. Peter. You've been very helpful. Uh, you'd be surprised how often this happens. Hmm? What's that? Oh, uh, folks traveling abroad and seeing someone they know from back home. And you know, the funny thing is, most of the time you can tell that they'd rather not have run into each other at all. Want me to take you back to the inn? In a minute. I need some air. Oh, it's cold. Virginia, what do you think? Well, did you tell Inspector Havisham about this? No, 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 no. I thought I should tell you first. What do we do now? Well, I think you know the answer to that as well as I do. Turn this photograph over to Inspector Havisham and tell him everything. And just... What is everything? If what you've told me about Larry is true, he has not only the motive, but the temperament to have killed William Boyd. Well, that's a lie. Now, Larry would never do such a thing. Look, Virginia, I know well, it. How can you possibly think you know him on the on the basis of a few words I spoke in anger? It seemed to me you were anything but angry that you weighed your words pretty carefully. Oh, it's my fault we broke up. I should have been willing to give it another chance. Larry knows that. He knows I'll be back. So why should he want to kill anyone, even if he were capable of it? Nevertheless, if, he, if he's here, we have an obligation to inform the police. Yes. Well, now, that's the key word, isn't it, Mr. Norris? If. You showed the photograph to Mr. Pisa yourself. You saw his reaction. Yes, I did. Didn't I? That was very nicely executed. What? Well, how do I know you didn't just just plan this all out in advance? Now, why would I want to do a thing like that? Now, all my life, everyone has always thought they knew what was best for me. Every man I dated wanted to, to improve my mind. You know why I love Larry? Because at least he accepted me for who I am. Sometimes that's not enough. Even my closest friends never understood I was always having to, to justify and apologize. Well, I am tired of doing that. And I won't listen to you, a, a perfect stranger, stand there and presume to tell me my own mind. I want to go back to the inn. Oh, I haven't had anything to eat. Miss Stewart! Oh, oh Mr. Coons... 
You frightened me. That's obvious, all right. Well, why don't you think of Wicklow Manor? I don't think I'm any happier about us being here than you are. Good night, Mr. Coombe. Well, I've, I've got a note for you. Who is it from? Mr. Weller. I was on my way to put it under your door. Oh, he wants to see me. That's right, his room's down the hall. Number 11. Mr. Weller. Ah, come in, Miss Stewart. Close the door. Mr. Coombs gave me a note. Is something the matter? <laughs> He's a character, isn't he? Oh, he obviously despises every one of us. Well, at least you know where you stand with someone like that, don't you? What do you mean? You don't think a great deal of me, do you? Well, I've always admired your work as a director. But as a person? I don't think I've met you yet as a person. I see things that perhaps you wouldn't give me credit for noticing, Miss Stewart. Mr. Weller, I'm very tired. And, and I could see that you didn't think much of the way I reacted to the news of Bill's death. Well, Mr. Norris enlightened me. Norris? Mm -hmm. What did he say? You're just not the type given to displays of sentiment. That's true. I don't wear my heart on my sleeve. No, oh, excuse me. Would you care for a drink? Oh, no. No, thank you. I don't drink while I'm working. Yes. You have that reputation. What? Of turning into something of a cold fish when you're involved in a film. I have that reputation? You save all that famous Virginia Stewart appealing innocence for the cameras, don't you? <laughs> You're pretty cold-blooded, Miss Stewart. In fact, I'd say we're two fish from the same pond. I think we understand each other. And I think we'll get along just fine. Is that all? There's something else we have in common. What? We're both responsible for Bill's death. What? What? Me, because I chose Wicklow Manor, knowing full well the truth about the place, and you, because Bill was in love with you, wasn't he? You, you don't really believe that legend, do you? I'm a romantic at heart, Miss Stewart, much as that may surprise you. I believe in a great many things. Will you come with me to the tower? When? Now. <laughs> Two cold-blooded fish like us shouldn't be frightened, should we? Why? I have to, Miss Stewart. I have to find out for myself if there... if there really is a ghost there. If I really am partly to blame for Bill's death. I... I think you've had too much to drink. There's another reason, too. Well, what's that? I'm very attracted to you, Miss Stewart. I'd better go. No, Virginia, wait. Look, I, I'm a very lonely man. Good night, Mr. Weller. Just a moment. Oh, it's almost midnight, Inspector. What do you want? You uh, didn't hear anything? Well, I'm a very sound sleeper. Hear what? The Mandrake shriek. What? Mr. Jake Weller is dead. <gasps> he was found at the base of Wicklow Tower. No! I'm afraid I have to ask you to come down to police headquarters. Me? Why? Uh, Mr. Coombs says that you went to see Mr. Weller in his room earlier this evening. Yes? In the span of barely 24 hours, two men have died identical deaths. In both instances, you 
in the last place. You know. You see them alive. Someone once said that we are fascinated by the mystery of a detective story because we are all full of crime, only we don't dare. Could it be that we're fascinated by the ghost story for a similar reason? That no matter what the scientific bent of our minds in our inmost souls, we're all as full of superstition as our primitive ancestors. Of course, at this point, we still don't know which kind of story we're dealing with. Detective or ghost? We shall find out when I return shortly with our final act. Be kind to the people you meet on the way up, because you never know who you might meet on the way down. That's an old show business maxim. We have no way of knowing if Jake Weller's and William Boyer's conduct during their rise to fame was exemplary, but more to the point, we don't know who they met on the way down, or rather, who or what they encountered at Wicklow Tower that precipitated their untimely falls. Inspector Havisham has taken Virginia to police headquarters and has sent for Denton Norris. Inspector, I came as quickly as I could. Your man told me what happened. I'm sorry to have to arouse you at such an unseemly hour, Mr. Norris. Well, Virginia, what are you doing here? The inspector thinks I'm the murderess. I didn't say that, Miss Stewart. But you are the last person to see them alive, so far as we know. You saw Jake after I left you off? Well, he asked me to come to his room. He, he wanted to talk. About what? A number of things. I can't remember. He was drunk. Drunk? Well, j just a little, I think. Well, there's your explanation, Inspector. If Jake was drunk, he probably lost his balance and fell. Yeah, perhaps. But we aren't dealing with one murder. We're dealing with two. Miss Stewart, uh, forgive my having to ask this, but was Mr. Weller interested in you romantically? No, of course not. You're absolutely certain of that. Well, he did say he was lonely. I see. Oh, now, Inspector, you're not trying to manufacture another disillusioned lover for the tower's ghost, are you? Uh, legends do have a way of being self-fulfilling, Mr. Norris. Hmm? Especially if the person involved is susceptible. Virginia, forgive me, but I'm afraid the time has come. What for? I'm going to have to tell him. Oh, no, you're wrong. No, tell me what. I think we may know the man you're looking for. You don't know the man you saw was Larry? Larry? Oh, he's an uh, acquaintance of Miss Stewart's. I saw a man very much resembling him at the Quail and Raven pub at noon today. And uh, can you describe him to me? Virginia, is that photograph still in your purse? Oh, y yes. Uh, here, here it is, Inspector. Hmm. Uh, what motive could this person have for murdering the two men? Jealousy. Hmm. Miss Stewart, is that true? Larry? I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to think anymore. Well, I'll have my men familiarize themselves with this snapshot. If he's anywhere in the area, he'll be picked up soon enough. I suppose that's all for now. Though I would like both of you to keep yourselves available for further questioning. Uh, Virginia, I'll drive you back to the inn if you like. Thank you. Oh, uh, Inspector? Uh, yes, Miss Stewart? When you're finished with that photograph, uh, could I have it back? Well, I guess they'll have to cancel the film now. I don't care. I just want to get away from this place. I'm sorry, Virginia. I, I had to tell him. Oh, it's okay. You did what you thought was right. I couldn't bear to have you mad at me. If Larry is here, he could be questioned. And if he's innocent, he has nothing to fear. You are upset. Oh, well, of course I'm upset. To think the man I love might be capable of murder. Well, under the right circumstances, I think all of us are capable. Do you? Oh, yes. But if, 
But Larry did kill them because he was jealous. I, I don't understand it. What? Oh, I've spent as much time with you as anyone. If Larry is watching me, why hasn't he tried to kill you? Ah, I haven't gone to the tower. Still, it's almost enough to make one believe the legend. Oh, why? William and Mr. Weller both wanted something from me. But you don't. <laughs> Mr. Norris, I, I want to apologize for my outburst this afternoon. I had no right to lose my temper. It's all right. I should have been more... more tactful. You know, you know, your suspicions are very honest. You've been kind to me. I need that just now. Oh. What's the matter? Don, I meant to take that turn off we just passed. Why? To approach you in from the other direction. Well, I mean, this way we'll go right past Wicklow Manor, and I shouldn't think you'd want to see it now in the middle of the night. I'll just back up. No, no, don't. Look... You can see it from here. Now, Virginia, you're only going to scare yourself. Mr. Norris, I want to climb that tower. Oh, don't be silly. I, I couldn't get back to sleep now. Not after what's happened. Why? I can't stand this uncertainty. I think I'm being driven mad. If it is Larry, I want to know. There is one way we could find that out. How? If I went up that tower alone... No. I have a revolver back in my room. No, Mr. Norris, it's too dangerous. I, I wouldn't think of letting you risk that. Please. Now, you must get me back to the inn right away. All right. But I'll call on you first thing in the morning to make sure you're okay. No. Now, now you mustn't see me anymore. Why not? Look, if Larry is here, if he is watching me, he could draw the wrong conclusion. He might think you've taken a romantic interest in me as well. I couldn't ever forgive myself if anything should happen to you. Virginia... Now, please, now start the car. Don't you realize that your life is in danger? No, please, Virginia, I... I started to tell you yesterday that I was grateful for what you said about my script. I've, um... I've been going through a rather difficult period recently, a condition known to the outside world as writer's block. It's a crisis far more awful than... Than you might imagine. A fear that the very talent by which one makes his living might just simply have vanished. I'm sorry to hear that. But what does that have to do with me? <laughs> you see, from the moment we met, I've begun to feel better about myself. I can't explain why, except to say that I, I know it's a feeling necessary to my work. Oh, Mr. Norris, please stop. Every word you're saying could be putting your life in greater jeopardy. No, it's not, Virginia. What? You, you think I'm too old for you, don't you? That's the real problem, isn't it? Mr. Norris. But I'm not. I'm intelligent, I'm sophisticated, and... And, Virginia, I... I need you. Mr. Norris, please start the car. Where's my key? Hey, Miss Stewart, finally you're back. Thank you, Mr. Coombs. I, I must have left my outside key upstairs. I suppose you people will have to stop making that film now, won't you? Now that you lost your leading man and your director. Well, that should make you very happy, shouldn't it? Does indeed, Jim. I'm sorry if I woke you up. Oh, that's all right. I've been waiting for you. You have? You had a caller. A caller? At this hour? That's right. He came by to see you shortly after you left with the inspector. It was a man? <laughs> oh, yes. What was his name? Well, he wouldn't say, but he left a message. He said he wanted to speak to you, and that he would be waiting in the room at the top of Wicklow Tower. <laughs> Hello? Is uh, anyone here? Hello? Hi, sweetheart. <gasps> Who's that? Don't be afraid, Ginny. It's only me. Larry? Oh, Larry, 
It is you. Why, did you expect it to be someone else? No, it's just... Well, so it is true. You did follow me all the way from California. Well, don't let it go to your head, Jenny. I wasn't going to let you leave me like that. Since when did I ever let you have the last word? Oh, Larry. It's been so awful here. Hey, hey. Come here. Hey, you know what we're going to do as soon as you finish this picture? We are going to take off through Europe just like gypsies, huh? Just the two of us. What do you say to that, huh? Uh, Larry, I, I told you it was over. But why? Now, don't use that tone of voice on me. I'm... I mean it. Like you meant it all those other times? Hey, I don't blame you. It was my fault. I, I was behaving like a madman. I'd have left, too, but that's all over now. Is it, Larry? Well, for how long? I mean, we just go round in circles. We exhaust ourselves getting nowhere. But we live, don't we? I'll tell you what you want, sweetheart, and I'll tell you why you want it. You want a nice, stable, and predictable relationship so you can devote all your energies to your career. What do you mean? Because deep down, you don't like people. They frighten you. You prefer to deal with them as professionals, not as human beings. I, I, I don't think that's true. Of course it's true. You know it is. And that's what attracts you to me and repels you. Because I won't let you get away with that. I make you look me in the eye. Larry, why did you have to come here? Just tell me how much longer you'll be here so I can make our plans. Well, the film will probably be canceled. What? Or at least delayed. Why? Two people have been killed. Killed? <laughs> what happened? They fell to their deaths from this room, from those French windows over there. Oh, no wonder you're so scared. Larry... Why did you ask me to meet you here? <laughs> this place is supposed to be haunted, huh? You know about that? Sure, I've been here for three days. I got the whole story from a bartender in town. Oh, but why? It was a test. Two weeks ago, you swore you never wanted to see me again, yet now you're willing to come to me in a supposedly haunted tower at midnight. Larry, do, do you know anything about those murders? <laughs> of course not. No, I want the truth. Angel, why should I kill anyone? If I did, I'd have to go to jail. and Then we really would be separated. We're separated now, Larry. Say that again. What? Say that again. If you really mean that, repeat it. Uh, uh, don't look at me like that. Come on, Jenny. Let's, let's go down. Huh? Let's get out of here. You'll feel better once we're out of this room. I mean, if your film has been canceled, we can leave for Europe in the morning. No. No, we can't. Well, why not? Well, the police don't want me to leave yet. And, and they want to speak to you, too. To me? What for? Well, Mr. Norris, the screenwriter, saw you in a pub this afternoon. The police know I'm here? I gave them the photo you put in my suitcase. But, uh, but it'll just be a routine. That was foolish. I mean, don't you see what this means? They'll ask me to account for my movements, and how can I do that? Well, of course, they'll think I killed Boyer and Weller. How did you know who was killed? I didn't mention their names. Uh, look, don't start playing detective with me, sweetheart. We're getting out of here tonight. You did kill them, didn't you? Come on, let's go. No. Jenny. No, no, don't come any closer. You know that if I can't have you, then no one will. But I can't spend the rest of my life doing away with every man you give the green light to. What's that in your hand? Just a tape recorder. I'm afraid we're going to have to wake up the good inspector one more time. No. All right, Larry, hold it right there. What? Mr. Norris. I've got news for you, sir. The good inspector is already away. What? Insp Be careful. The good inspector is also armed. Inspector? How did you know that? Hmm. You have Mr. Norris to thank for saving your life, Miss Stewart. Mr. Norris? I went back to your inn, Virginia. Mr. Coombs told me about the message and said you'd come here, so I called the inspector at once. What made you go back? Well... As I was driving back to the village, I began to think about my outburst, and I I realized if my feelings for you could make me act foolishly, your feelings for Larry could do the same. And I had a feeling that the night was not over yet. Now it is. Yes. Now it is.
Denton Norris was a writer, and writers, like actors, rely on their powers of empathy to put them in touch with their fellow man, the better to create the characters they write about or portray. In this case, empathy was also responsible for saving Virginia Stewart's life. But what about her almost fatal attraction to Larry? A final word on that in a moment. What is it that sometimes attracts us to the sinister in people? Excitement? Danger? I'm not sure, but even so great a poet as John Milton, it is said, was irresistibly drawn to the character of Lucifer when he wrote Paradise Lost. Was Freud right then, that there is a bit of the outlaw in each of us? If so, it behooves us never to forget the ancient warning. Know thyself. Our cast included Ann Williams, Ian Martin, Paul Hecht, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... years ago, the ruling queen of England was Victoria. Now, more than a century later, her name is synonymous with the proper, the repressed, the prim, and to our technical age, the primitive. An old-fashioned era, we'd say today, where things didn't work too well. What worked exceedingly well, however, was English law enforcement. And what was new fashion then, and still is now, was the lady detective. Name, address, and occupation, please. John Hales. I live at Troitz Hill. I'm the butler to Dr. Craven. You knew old Sandy, the deceased? I did, Coroner, for many years. So you, as butler, had a long association with the murdered man, the caretaker? He was not the caretaker. He was the lodge keeper. And I can't say him being done away with is not a good thing. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Hales, do you understand you to say murder is a good thing? In some cases, coroner, I'd say yes. Our mystery drama, Murder at Troites Hill, was adapted from the story by C.L. Perkis, especially for the Mystery Theater, by G. Frederick Lewis, and stars Marion Haley. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Did we use the word old-fashioned to describe the Victorian era? True, many of the conveniences we take for granted today hadn't even been invented a century ago. The phonograph, the bicycle, electric lights, the motor car, all to come. The telephone had only just been patented. Nevertheless, in Victorian times, if you sent a telegram in London, it would be delivered in one hour. If you mailed a letter before lunch, the recipient might be reading it before dinner. And as for crime detection... Suppose we let Loveday Brook, London's first policewoman, paint the scene for us. It was a beautiful spring day. Although Mum and Dad had brought me up in London, and I was born and bred a city girl, I longed for country life and enjoyed every moment I could going out by train just to see grass and trees. This trip, however, was not for pleasure. A murder had been committed, and I had been detailed to assist Inspector Griffiths of the local Cumberland police, who was driving me in a dog cart to the scene of the crime. Towards you, ma'am. That's the name of the place. Is it far, Inspector? Yeah, we're almost there, Miss Book. Ah, uh, it is, Miss, isn't it? You're not married, are you, ma'am? Oh, 
I don't imagine any man in his right mind would like to be married to a policewoman. Well, I don't know. My wife seems to enjoy being married to me, and I'm a policeman. <laughs> so, marriage has no interest for you, Miss Brooke? You may call me Love Day, my given name. No, Inspector. My answer to your query would be, marriage is not for me at the moment. However, what does interest me is this case I've been assigned to. Ah, yes, murder. Now, there, the victim was an old man with no money to speak of, and so far as we know, no relatives. He was the caretaker of that mansion you see there, looming up ahead of us. That is Troitz Hill. That is quite an estate. Who is the owner? Uh, Dr. Hector Craven, a widower. And the murdered man's name? Henderson. Known hereabouts as old Sandy. What else can you tell me? Only this. Apparently no motive. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Chalk marks on the cottage floor here are, I presume, where you found the body. Mm. Looks as though the victim had fallen back inside from the window. Exactly. Must have been looking out into the garden and got bossed on the head. So we found him lying right there in his nightshirt. Blunt instrument? Mm, more like a hammer than a croquet mallet. Which you have not found? Not yet. What do these premises consist of, Inspector? Merely this living room, the tiny kitchen, the bath at the back of the cottage, and the bedroom. Nothing is being touched. <laughs> Come see. This is the bedroom. Gracious. It appears as though a hurricane had struck. Hmm. Well, we had no idea what to make of this, and I have not been able to make a thorough examination as yet. Ah, ah, ah. Good, lovely. You have your notebook out. An old habit to reinforce a rotten memory. Now, item one... The bedclothes rolled up and stuffed into the chimney. Item two, bedstead overturned. Item three, chair on top of table. Item four, fender and fire iron lying on washstand. Item five, clock upside down on mantel. Uh, have you had a look at the contents of the cupboard, Inspector? Only briefly. Mm, clothes all here. Money box doesn't appear to have been tampered with. Evidently, robbery was not a motive. Was the door unlocked when the body was discovered? Uh, the butler who discovered the deed told me it was. That would account for it. Account for what? The old man looks out the window, is hit on the head, falls back inside, and either the killer or somebody else enters and acts like a college boy on a rampage, turning the place topsy-turvy. You're of the opinion, then, that all this was some sort of prank? Well, look on the floor there, Inspector, near the door. The vases... The pipe rack, the pipes, the Chelsea and Staffordshire figurines are lined up on the floor as though they were marching out the door. Who would bother to play tricks with furniture, having just killed a man? A young lady, as I have said, a madman. There is an asylum not far from Troitz Hill. Where to now? The inquest. Having just come down from New Scotland Yard... And the kind of inquest performed, I was ill prepared for the, um, shall we say, informality of light doings in the town of Grenfell in Cumberland. Uh, Alexander Henderson, known to all and sundry as old Sandy, met his death at the hands of a person or persons unknown, so far as we know. We call upon Dr. Craven. Kindly be seated, Doctor. It's a sorry affair that brings me here today. Very well, indeed. Death is a sorry affair. Uh, do you know, or rather, should we say, <coughs> did you know old Sandy? Oh, yes, yes, very well, indeed. Uh, how long have you known the deceased? Uh, Twenty-five years. He was in my employ when my dear wife was still alive. Even before our boy Harry was born. And <clears throat> what was the last time you saw old Sandy alive, Hector? I'm not sure as to the hour, but it was the day that John found him. I mean, the next morning. Oh, terrible thing. First, my wife Flora passes on now. On Sandy, it's, it's too much to bear. Uh, uh, Hector, please. We don't believe justice will be served any more rapidly by subjecting you to any more questions at this time. Uh, thank you. Uh, you may be excused, and you can leave the inquest. Hey, John Hales. 
John Hales, will you kindly approach us? <coughs> you, uh, John Hales? Yes, sir. Yes, I am. Uh, well, uh, name, address, occupation, and, and so forth. John Hales, Troitz Hill. I'm butler to Dr. Craven. Yes, uh, you knew the deceased? I did. For many years. So, <coughs> you as butler had a long association with the caretaker of Troitz Hill, uh, old Sandy. He was not the caretaker. He was a lodge keeper. And if you ask me, he did roam all around the place. But then he was Dr. Craven's favorite. Uh, well, uh, do we gather you have reservations as to old Sandy's value? So he thought he was valuable. He threw his weight round and something chronic, lording it over us. The maids will tell you the same thing. So will cook. I'm almost sure that sometimes even the doctor took orders from old Sandy. No... I can't say his being done in is not a good thing. Uh, Mr. Mr. Hales, uh, do we understand you to say murder is a good thing? In some cases, yes. Old Sandy didn't know his place. The gardener's boy did all the chores, and him he'd loll about in the main house eating meals with the doctor, acting like he owned the place. <clears throat> Any uh, <coughs> concluding words, Mr. Hales? Yeah, just two. Good riddance. Uh, well, uh, you may return to your seat, John, but kindly remain at the inquest in case we should wish to put you to further questions. <laughs> uh, has Harry Craven arrived? Uh, yes, Inspector? Uh, uh, no, no, he is not here, but a note to you, Coroner, has arrived. It is a doctor's certificate. And may I present it? Uh, of course. <clears throat> As uh, to whom it may concern, Harry Craven has contracted typhoid fever and has been taken to Grenfell Hospital, Dr. James Dilbert. So, uh, the young man is not available. I don't believe it. Uh, what don't you believe? That Harry Craven has typhoid. Indeed. Well, why not? I don't think he wanted to appear at the inquest. He didn't have typhoid yesterday or the day before. Well, do you know Dr. Gilbert, who attests Harry Craven is in hospital? I don't have to know that, gentlemen, to know that Harry Craven is a thoroughly disreputable young man who might get anyone to sign anything. Uh, did you see Harry Craven the evening old Sandy was done in? Well, I'm not certain. No, we are not interested in uncertain evidence. What do you know? I know he has quarreled often with his father, Dr. Craven. I've been witness to that. Uh, can you tell us how young Craven got along with the deceased? He hated him. Indeed. Sandy never spared the rod with the boy when he was young, and I don't think Master Craven ever forgave him. Well, so it would appear that both yourself and Harry Craven did not care much for old Sandy. Huh? Sandy was not what you might call a lovable sort. The fact that a murdered man was not entirely popular is no novelty. If indeed old Sandy had been killed by someone he knew, it's more likely to have been done by an enemy than a friend. However, as Shakespeare has told us, murder, though it have no tongue, will speak. What it will tell us, we shall soon find out when I return shortly with Act Two. It was a new experience for Inspector Griffiths of the local Cumberland Constabulary to have an attractive female assisting him in the performance of his duty. A woman policeman was something of an experiment in Victorian times. But then, Loveday Brook had come highly recommended by Scotland Yard as both stubborn and dedicated, which was quite a recommendation, since that is what people said about Queen Victoria herself. Uh, I might have expected such a verdict. Your coroner had no evidence to the contrary, and no alternative. Murder by person or persons unknown. It's our duty to make that person or persons known. It has occurred to me, Loveday, we might learn a good deal more by conducting our investigation from the inside. You regard it as an inside job, do you, Inspector? I would say so. It so happens that Dr. Craven occasionally employs the solicitors, Messrs. Wells and Sugden, who it happens have from time to time assisted me in my police duties with information and the like. Uh, through them, I learned that the good doctor 
is anxious to secure an amanuensis. You mean a secretary? Hmm. I immediately offered your services, love that. Gracious, you don't let the grass grow under your feet, do you? But I said you were a friend, love that. A lady of impoverished means who would gladly undertake the duties for the munificent sum of a guinea a month. I think my shorthand is barely worth that much. The old doctor, being quite a skin friend, I understand, jumped at the offer and is anxious for you to be at Troitz Hill as soon as possible. Notebook and pencil in hand. Miss Loveday, Brook, is it? Welcome to Troitz Hill. I'm John Hales, the butler. Let me show you to your room. Thank you, John. This is quite a large establishment. Oh, yes. Too large for the few we have in help. Is it difficult to get groundsmen and maids and so forth this far from London? Not difficult, but costly. And Dr. Craven, now that he's retired, has practically no income to speak of to support the place. There you are, Miss Brooks. I hope you'll be comfortable. The windows give out into the garden. Do have a look. It's really a beautiful place. What a pity it's been allowed to get so run down. What is that darling little cottage at the end of the garden? Oh, well, that was occupied by a man who was supposed to be looking after the grounds. Of course, he never did. That wasn't a man who was... Oh, don't tell me. How horrid. I'm not one to speak ill of the dead, miss, but old Sandy will not be missed. A sad commentary on a man's life. Yes, it is that. But I cannot feel that charitable. Ah, let me say this, miss. Dr. Craven is the sort to have favorites. And this man, old Sandy, was one of his. Well, you seem to have borne it all. I had no choice. Do you suppose the old lodgekeeper had some hold over the doctor? I've often wondered about that myself. Of course, I was told he was economizing in order to send his good-for-nothing son through college. The doctor has a son. An only child. Harry. He's 22. The most ungrateful hell rake one could imagine. I gather you don't care much for him either. Even old Sandy didn't care for him. Uh, may I tell you something in confidence, miss? By all means. Young Harry had it in for old Sandy since he was a boy. And Sandy whipped him with a riding crop. The day before he was done in, while I was serving dinner, there was a most terrible scene. And I heard Harry actually threaten the old man's life. Gracious. Did you inform the police? I had half a mind to do so at the inquest. But the coroner was so unpleasant, I thought to myself, well, that's their job. If they're that good at it, let them find out for themselves. Ah, that would be Cook. I must go down to the kitchen and lend her a hand. Dinner in the dining hall at seven sharp. Just you alone, miss. What about the doctor? He only comes down for breakfast. He's too busy with something he's writing. The pleasure of meeting my new employer was to be deferred till morning. After a substantial meal in solitary splendor, I returned to my room, blew out the lamp and tried to sleep. The full moon shone in the window, and sleep did not come. So I dressed and decided to embark upon a little quiet investigation. Who is it? Who is that? Who is that? It's me, Miss. John Hales. Hmm. Isn't it a lovely night? So it is, Miss. Is there something I can do? Nothing at all, John. You may walk along a bit with me if you like. It wouldn't do for you to lose your way, especially inside that maze over there. Mm, I must explore it by daylight. What a clever way it's been tended. It must be centuries old. I expect it is, miss. Hello, what's this? Oh, someone's left a dark coat lying behind this bush. Ah, uh, I wouldn't look too closely if I were you. Good Lord. It's a dog. A dead dog. I'm afraid it's Captain Miss. Oh, what a beautiful black retriever. Did you know it was here, John? It belongs to the doctor. What a terrible thing to do. It's... It's... Oh, dear me. I think we should turn back, Miss. 
this dog has been clubbed to death. Michael. Oh, I shall have to inform the doctor in the morning. A blunt, heavy instrument had smashed in the dog's skull. I thought to myself, exactly the death that was dealt to the old lodgekeeper. The following morning, I went down to breakfast. And met Dr. Craven. Uh, good morning, Miss Brooke. It is uh, Miss Brooke, is it not? Yes, Dr. Craven. Good morning. I do apologize for not having been about yesterday to receive you, but uh, my wretched work usurps all my time. Uh, do make yourself at home. Uh, John, do bring in the eggs, will you? Uh, you do eat eggs, don't you? Certainly. Anything. Here are the eggs, Doctor. Yours also, Miss Brooke. No, fool. Put the stupid plates down and leave us. You're interrupting my train of thought. Now, work. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. As I was saying, only a man who has given his life to comparative philology, as I have for the past 30 years, can gauge the magnitude of the task that I've set myself to begin. Philology, as you know, is the study of languages, phonetics, anything to do with the sound of the human voice. I understand, Doctor. 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 Uh, miss, you'd better go on with your breakfast. What oh, doesn't he hear me? He's sitting there with his eyes closed. What is it? He will do that suddenly. He may sit there bolt upright like that for an hour. Lapses into silence, eyes closed. Doctor. Uh, shall I bring you some toast and coffee? Hadn't you better wake him? Doctor. Miss Brooke and I found Captain last night. Uh, what? Captain, sir. Your black retriever. Oh, poor Captain. Best dog I ever had. Uh, who are you, young lady? Uh, what are you doing here? Where, where, where's Harry? Where's my son, Harry? Don't you know me, Doctor? Oh, yes. Yes, I remember. You've come to assist, haven't you? That's right. Uh, now, Miss... Uh, Miss, um, oh, I've forgotten your name. Love Day Brooke. Is it now? Love Day. Oh, a lovely name. Remarkable. Uh, tell me, my dear, a little of what you know uh, of the elemental sounds of speech common to all languages. To how many would you reduce those sounds? To six, eight, nine? What progress are you making, Love Day, at Troitz Hill? Item one. A black retriever belonging to the doctor has met the same blood and death that did the human victim. Item two. The butler, John Hales, owed the victim over 100 pounds he had borrowed over the years. Uh-huh. How'd you find that out? The butler enjoys talking to the new secretary. Item three. The butler believes that son Harry Craven is not ill in hospital, but hiding somewhere He's right. Harry was never admitted to Grenfell Hospital. But that medical affidavit. Forged. I'd like to question the butler, Loudair, but not at Troitz Hill. I want you to find out for me where he goes on his day off. To friends, local pub, where? Do my best. Inspector, I shan't get another opportunity of coming here to report to you without arousing suspicion. Uh, how are the, uh, the mails? As rapid and prompt as they are in London. If you mail me a note in the morning, catching the noon post, it'll be delivered here to the constabulary mid-afternoon. Good enough. Mail service in Britain is so reliable, one tends rather to take it for granted. Oh, I say there, I haven't seen your face at the Fox announced for. You can eat part. Griffith, the name of the next township, Grenfell. Oh, Grenfell, eh? Oh, I don't get around there much. Yeah, here, find a bit of oh, maybe. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. You wouldn't happen to be Inspector Griffiths of the Grenfell Constabulary. The same. Oh, well, are you here on uh, business? Mm, well, I might say so. Our profession. Police business. I'm hoping to be John Hales. Do you know him? Well, that's the butler, Troy Hill. He drops by on his day off sometimes. Uh, what is it? Uh, I mean, why? The murder. 
The murder? About Sandy. How? Oh, yes. Murder. Is Hales a suspect? No more than anybody else. Is that a fact? No more than, shall we say, young Harry Craven. Harry Craven? Yes. Do you know him, McQueen? I, uh, well... Surely you must. Oh, yes, 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 sir. I was thinking of someone else. Yes, I know him. McQueen, what are you hiding? Well, nothing, sir. Something to do with John Hale? No, no, I assure you. Oh, all right. It's been playing on my mind ever since the night old Sandy was killed. You see, shortly after 11 o'clock, Harry Craven came to my house with something wrapped up in paper. It was a valuable piece of silver plate. A handsome ape man. Hey, excuse me, are you certain which night it was? Last Sunday? Yes, because a fox and hound were shot. I was at home. A valuable silver piece, yes. And? Well, uh, Harry said he, he wanted to go up to London, start out for himself, not depend on his father anymore, make a clean break. And would I loan him a hundred pounds on the big silver piece? I'll show it to you. I have it here, up the counter. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, hundred pounds? It's worth ten times, eh? I know that. But anyway, all I could do for him was ten thousand. Which you gave him in exchange? Only as a loan, mind you. At uh, what time Sunday night was it? Eleven o'clock. Oh, here comes the man you want to see. Hello, John. I have seen that a pair before... What's he doing here? Hey, John Hales. I am, sir. It belongs to Dr. Craven. We kept it on the sideboard. Uh, he wants to see you, John. Oh, yes. Yes, I thought I recognized you, sir, from the inquest. John Hales, I must caution you that any statements you now make, which you did not give in evidence at the inquest, will be regarded with some suspicion. Do you two gentlemen be good enough to accompany me back to the constabulary? I think we should have ourselves a little talk. As they say, the plot thickens. Murder complicated by theft, complicated by incriminations. It would appear that all those we have met have something to hide. Perhaps somewhere in this mass of evidence and accusations lies the truth. More when I return shortly with Act Three. Call them Bobbies, the London police, in honor of the man who founded the organization back in 1829, Sir Robert Peel. Sir Robert once said, murder cannot be hidden, nor the murderer. To a criminal, the world is made of glass, and peace officers must persevere and look until they see. But it's not enough to know to look. You have to know where. This exasperated policewoman loved a brook. Frankly, I was furious with myself. I knew the solution to the crime must lie right under my nose, but it eluded me. I reported to Dr. Craven the following morning, notebook and pen in hand. It's all here in my brain, but I can't put it into words. Shall I come back later, then? Uh, yes, later. Uh, yep. And the groom, that's all it. What did you say, Doctor? I, surprise. I, I, I couldn't have been more surprised. You were? I was mostly disappointed. All the work. I needed proof. Should I be writing this down? Yes, a good blow with a hammer. And it was done. But all for naught. Yes, you're right, Doctor. You are absolutely right. No. No, I'm wrong. Dead wrong. Sandy's dead and buried. They held an inquest on him. Did you know? Yes. And we all praised him as if he were a saint. Uh, who are you? Oh, yes. Love Day. My stenographer with a pretty name. Come back. Uh, come back at tea time and we shall continue this important work. Yeah. 
The old doctor didn't have all his wits about him. He was making himself almost believe it was he who killed old Sandy. Strange that no one warned me about him. My years of police training alerted me to danger. I went out into the garden and sat myself well inside the maze to write a note to Inspector Griffith. I wanted to catch the noon post. It was urgent. I heard voices. John. What? Who is it? It's me. Harry. Master Harry. What are you doing here? I've come back. Is it true about old Sandy? Don't you know? Yes, I was told. I had to come back. I was on my way to London and got as far as Scarborough, and I thought, no, I mustn't go away like this. Huh? Indeed? I, I don't remember if you were there, John, but I had ugly words with my father. It seems I've been quarreling with everyone these days. I've come back to apologize to him. And what about the silver epan, Master Harry? Oh, oh, you know about that. No, it, it was stupid. I don't know what came over me. I, I needed the money to start up with in London, so I took it. I thought, what's the difference? I shall inherit it all anyway. Now is when I need it. Oh, it was stupid. Uh, short-sighted. Uh, I've got to explain to Father. Oh, they're after me for the murder of old Sandy, but I don't care. Let them take me in. I must see Father and obtain his forgiveness. Why do you say that, Father? Surely I've grown up since those days. You haven't changed in 22 years, and you never will. Father, please, try to calm down. It's, it's not good for you. I came back here, didn't I? I've admitted I took the stupid piece of silver. It was foolish. It was thieving, dishonorable. No son of mine. Stop it, please, Father. I can't bear those platitudes. What do you mean, no son of yours? Perhaps if Mother was still alive... Oh, I... yes, of course. Blame it on the parents. Nothing to do with you. No, I wish you were alive also. But you, you must live your own life. That is what I am trying to do. Oh, I, I, I can't stand these arguments. Go away, Harry. I, I have work to do. Work? What work? Experiments that will never come to anything? Come to nothing, will they? Get out of here. Dr. Craven, Dr. Craven, please. Oh, Father, for, for God's sake, please, will you listen? All I'm asking for is forgiveness. Is he asking that much, Doctor? Couldn't you consider it? Never. Never, never. He, he's dishonored our family. Oh, oh, help, help me. Oh, good Lord. He's collapsed on the floor. Father, what is it? Dr. Craven, can you hear me? Harry, fetch some water. Water? I'm going to fetch a doctor. I had no idea he was really sick. I'll be back as soon as I can. Oh, oh, what is it? Oh, what am I doing lying here on the floor? Oh, it's lovely. Oh, what can you think of me? I must have slipped and fallen. Help me up. Yes. Would you? Ah, oh, yes. Over there, to my chair, behind the desk. How is that? Oh. You're oh. better now. I have a habit of doing that. Nodding off. Was I asleep long? You mean you don't remember your son was here? Oh, my head is clear now. Oh, so much better than this morning. Where is your notebook? <laughs> A good blow with a hammer, and the thing was done. Did you say hammer? Poor captain. Oh, splendid dog. Where are we? Where are we? Oh, yes, 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 I remember. It was the elemental sounds of speech that bothered me so that night. Uh, were you at Troitz Hill then, Miss Lovday? I had been trying all day to assimilate a dog's yelp of pain to a human groan. And I could not do it. Oh, the idea haunted me. If they were both elemental sounds, they must have something in common. But I could not find a link between them. Then it came to me. Would a well-trained dog, used to hearing and obeying the human voice like my captain, at the moment of death, would his yelp not contain something of a human death cry? I would put it to the test. Oh, believe me, if I could make such a conclusion in my treatise, such a fact would be worth a dozen dogs' lives. So, I went out. It was moonlight. Oh, but you, you know all about that, don't you? Yes. Poor Captain. Did he yelp or groan? He just gave one loud, long, hideous yelp. As if he'd been a common street mongrel, not a highly intelligent, well-trained dog. I was very disappointed. 
I might just as well not have done the experiment. All it did was to set that simpleton to opening his window and spying on me. Master, what are you doing there at this time of night? And that simpleton, did he yelp or groan when you dealt him his blow? What? Oh, Sandy? Um, did you say that you'd like to see the hammer? It's right here in my desk drawer. There it is. Oh, no. Don't stir yourself. Sit right there, young lady. I'll, I'll come around the desk to you. Uh, this is what we call a geological hammer. I'll show you what I mean, how it works. You give it a good swing around, and down it comes with a splendid crash. I shall do it, and we shall imagine the edge of my desk is a hit. Sergeant... Bring in the prisoner. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Hey, Inspector, will you listen to me? I, I tell you again, I I've just come from my father and he is very ill. Yes, the sergeant reported your statement to me. Unfortunately, Dr. Dilbert, whom you went to see, for what purpose we have to find out, didn't believe you. And that is why he sent his assistant out the back way to fetch the police. Look, can't we defer all the questions? I'll admit to anything, everything. Just get the doctor to go to Troy's Hill. My father is lying on the floor in a coma. Mm, so you said before, you do go on, don't you? Uh, excuse me for a moment. Yes? Oh, for me. Mm. Thank you, Sergeant. That's it, right, sir. I'll be with you in a moment. There's some correspondence just arrived. Uh, Heavens. Sergeant, bring round the horse cart. I must be off directly. <laughs> what about me, my father? You will remain in custody. It's for Dr. Craven. I shall be seeing him very shortly. I hope you get there in time. I certainly hope so myself. You know, dear Miss Loveday... Loveday uh... broke... Oh, yes, of course. I have been thinking... I wonder what sort of a sound you would make if I were to give you a little tap with this hammer just there on your lovely forehead. Elemental sound it would be, naturally. Wait a minute, Doctor. You haven't told me what sort of elemental sound old Sandy made when he fell. The simpleton fell back dead without a sound. It was all for nothing. No. No. Not for nothing, I do it again. And again. Like so. And so. Oh, oh the pity of it all was that he fell without a sound of any sort. It is only this moment occurred to me that a woman in her death agony would be very much more likely to give utterance to an elemental sound than a man. Oh, no, you don't! Now lie there quietly, Doctor. I'm sorry I had to knock you out. Made it to the station on time, lovely. I think that's your London train coming in. Of course, you were right all along, Inspector. I was. You said it was the work of a madman. Ah, oh, yes, yes. But I thought one who had got out, not one who should be on the way in. Oh, thank heaven as I got your note about suspecting Dr. Craven when I did. What did suggest to you the doctor's guilt? From the very beginning, the relations that existed between himself and a lodge keeper seemed to me to say that too much of fear on one side and power on the other. Had the doctor not done away with old Sandy when he did, it would have happened sooner or later. It was inevitable. Dr. Craven is two people, and one of them must be put out of harm's way. I shall certainly tell London what a pleasure it has been working with you here, Inspector Griffith. Now I would say it's goodbye. No, no, I would say it's au revoir. poor Dr. Craven in the asylum for the rest of his life. Oh, by the by, Inspector, do 
you thank your postman for his efficient and timely delivery of the mail? Certainly not, love, eh? That's his job. According to the records kept by those aficionados of crime saluting who keep such records, between 1860 and the turn of the century, no less than 20 different fictional lady detectives could be read about and whose adventures could be purchased in bookstalls everywhere. So Loveday Brook was not the first and certainly not the last. Why are lady detectives so very popular? I'll try and answer that when I return shortly. As I was saying, why has there always been such an interest in the ladies who fight crime? From Loveday Brook to Modesty Blaze. Back to Sir Robert Peel and that famous Englishman for a portrait in words. The intuitions of women are better and readier than those of men. Her quick decisions without conscious reasons are frequently far superior to a man's most careful deductions. Our cast included Marion Haley, Robert Dryden, Earl Hammond, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. What's your name? Baldy. Baldy? Yeah, for obviously. Well, now shall we begin? We already began. Now it's time for the end. The end? Oh. Oh. You've just been not, Mr. Miller. I, I see. You invest in a good silence, and it don't hardly make no sound at all. Listen. Ah, oh. that's right here. You just lean back like that. Oh, it's all right, little girl. Uh, this here gentleman's just tired, so he's having a little nap. That's all. Here. Here's 50 cents. Why don't you go and have a ride on the merry-go-round? Here's a teacher. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. This is the story of a celebrity. A celebrity is a celebrated person, someone distinguished, renowned, eminent, illustrious, famous in any way at all, though especially favorably. But it must be added, sometimes notorious in a not so favorable way. At any rate, a celebrity, whatever else, is never, never humble, obscure, or unknown. See that star, Silas? Ah. Uh. Which one? There are a lot of stars up there. Right under the Big Dipper. See? Ah, uh, not sure I do, Angela. Oh, well. Never mind. Why are you so interested in that particular star? Why wouldn't I be? That star is my mother. Our mystery drama, The Avocado Jungle was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Larry Haynes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. For untold centuries, mankind celebrated nature, its fruits, its seasons. Then came the celebration of the one great creator who made the earth, 
its fruits and its seasons, and man himself. Then as humankind developed or deteriorated, however you view it, man began to celebrate himself. And certain individuals achieved or had thrust upon them the power to inspire, not simply admiration and envy, but adoration and something approaching worship. Listen now to this story of a celebrated person. My name is Silas Love. I'm 51 years old. And up until last year, I'd led a fairly pleasant, but essentially uneventful life. I graduated from a good university, married a nice girl, raised a nice son, got a nice divorce. Where was I, having lived half a century? I sent my wife her alimony check every month, corresponded sporadically with my son, who lived 3,000 miles away, tried to fall in love with a few women and failed, belonged to a few clubs I hardly ever went to, saw a few people. It was all pleasant enough, I guess. But one thing I know it was. It was unexciting. Then for some reason, or no reason, I decided to go to my 25th class reunion, maybe to see how the other guys had made out and what they were doing. It was there I ran into Jerry Winkler. Silas! What? Well, Jerry Winkler. Uh, Silas Love. Love. Right. I love, of course. Slip my mind. Well, well, how the heck are you, Jerry? Well, great. You? Uh, great. Well, great to see you. Great to see you. You haven't changed much. Well, say now, you haven't changed. Well, I don't know. Listen, what are you doing these days? I'm a writer. A writer? Mm -hmm. Well, great. I, uh, I don't read too much, except in my own field, of course. Yeah, what, what is your field? Anthropology. Anthropology? Hey, that's great. You go around digging up things. Is that it? Egyptian tombs, stuff like that? Oh, you're thinking of archaeology. Anthropology is more the science of man, his, uh, social relations, his culture, through the ages. Oh, yes, of course. Well, I'm impressed. Tell me about yourself. What do you write? I'm sorry, I don't, uh, maybe I should know. No, 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 you wouldn't be interested in my stuff. Oh, come on, I'm interested in you. Well, uh, I published a couple of novels. Sensational. No, 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 not sensational. Neither one ever got to second printing. Well, even if one of them sold to moving pictures. What was the picture? Maybe I saw it. They never made it. Oh. No, Hollywood got me into the, uh, as told to racket, though. As told to? Yeah, you know, the life story of Joe Joblots as told to. As told to Silas Love. Right. I get it. I've seen him around. You make a living out of that? Yeah. You like it? No. It's all right. It's a living. Oh, no, it must be more than that. It's fascinating. Really fascinating. Yeah, I'll bet it is. Well, look, I'm going to Russia in a couple of months. Russia? No kidding. Tartar Republic. The southern Slavs of my special field. The Kazan. Tartars in particular. Well, now I really envy you. I, I've never been any place but Hawaii. Want to come along? What, to Russia? Well, why not? I'd like the company. Well... Gee, I don't know. I, I'd, I'd have to think about it. Wouldn't be for a couple of months. Well, it's a thought. Yeah. You, uh, you'd have to pay your own way. Yes, of course. Uh, listen, I have one of these books I'm supposed to do. I've actually been commissioned already. The Life of Joan Edmonds is Told To. Well, I could probably get all the telling to cleaned up in a couple of months. I might just take you up on your offer. Who's Joan Edmonds? You don't remember Joan Edmonds, the Joan Edmonds superstar when we were in college? Oh, that Joan Edmonds. Remember her? Gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, not a bad actress either, if I was any judge back then. Must be, uh, 60 or something by now? Yeah, thereabouts. Uh, she has a daughter, I think. Lives with her in a big old house about 40 miles north of the city. Uh, I'm driving up there next week, and if all goes well, you, uh, may just have bought yourself a traveling companion to Russia. The following week, I rented a car and drove to Joan Edmonds' house. It was big and white with green shutters, like dozens I passed on the way. But it was on a side road. There were big trees all around it and boxwood hedges and a natural swimming pool. Not Hollywood at all. And my hopes rose. There was a big brass knocker on the front door. Yes? Ah, uh, I'm Silas Love. I'm, uh, I'm supposed to do a book about Miss Edmonds. She's expecting me. She's not here right this minute. She had to drive somebody to the station. But she'll be back pretty soon. If you want to wait. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is it all right to come in? Uh, wait inside? Oh, of course. Certainly. Come in. Thank you. Do you want to come into the drawing room? 
Well, whatever you say. Right this way. Uh, I'm not disturbing you, am I? I wasn't doing anything. Oh. Wow, what a beautiful room. Yes, it's nice. I suppose I ought to introduce myself. Well, if you... I'm Angela. Angela? Angela Edmonds. Angela Ed... Oh. Oh, you're her daughter, yes. Yes, I, I heard she lived with her daughter. We don't look much alike. Well, I... I... She's so beautiful. Well, I wasn't thinking... And I'm so plain. No, I wouldn't say that. You don't have to. I've heard it all my life. Can I get you a cup of tea? Oh, uh, yes, yes. I'd love a cup of tea. Thank you very much. It'll only take a minute. Wow. I'd have drunk a cup of hemlock at that point. What do you say to a woman who says her mother's beautiful and she herself is plain? I suppose Angela Edmonds was about 35, but she could have been any age from 20 to 50. The body was young enough, I guess. It's hard to tell what it was beneath those shapeless clothes. The hair was dark, not thick, not thin, but straight. I think she must have cut it herself. The skin was smooth, but its color was a grayish yellow. And there were lines in the forehead and two deep clefts between the eyebrows. There was no resemblance whatsoever between her and the remembrance I had of the glorious Joan Edmonds, a mother. I couldn't find a lemon. Oh, that's all right. But there's milk and sugar. Well, that, that's... Uh... That's fine. I like it plain. You're not having any? I'll wait for Mother. Oh. Now, this is certainly a nice house. It's big, too. Have you and your mother lived here long? Ten years. Ever since Mother cast off Hollywood, she wanted to be near the theater. Oh, I see. Uh, has she, uh... Is she interested in doing a play? When she can find the right script. But they only send her trash. It's very discouraging. Yes, I can imagine. There was one she liked. We both liked it. But they couldn't raise the money. That's what they said. You didn't believe them? They could have raised the money on the strength of Mother's name alone. They were afraid of the play. Too avant-garde. Hmm, I see. Well, I certainly like this house. Would you like to see the rest of it? While we're waiting for Mother? Yes. Thank you. I'd like that a lot. I didn't really care at all about seeing the house. It was a very nice house, but I'd seen others just as nice. But conversation with Angela Edmonds was getting to be a little more than I could manage. So I gratefully followed her through all the first floor rooms, dining room, library, music room, even the butler's pantry in the kitchen. And then... Now I'll show you the rooms upstairs. All right, fine. Mother's room is the most beautiful one, of course. Oh, yes? Well, well, yes, of course, why not? But mine is very interesting. Yes, I'm sure. Would you like to see my room first? Well, whatever you say, anything at all. It's right here, at the head of the stairs. Mm-hmm. Shall we go in? After you, please. You go first. Well, all right. This, uh... This is your room? Yes, this is my room. Uh, your bedroom. I don't... I don't see any bed or... Or anything. All I, all, all I see is... Uh, what, what are they? Avocados. Avocado trees. This is my avocado jungle. Jungle was the word for it. The room must have been 20 feet square at the least. And there were, judging by the light... Windows on three sides. And later I was shown a narrow cot, a chest of drawers, and a straight chair hidden somewhere in the dense woodland of avocado trees. Some were mere saplings, only a foot or two high. Others were as tall as myself. And one, bursting with leaves, standing regally in the corner, touched with its tip the 12-foot ceiling. It's, uh... It's amazing. It's really amazing. Did, did you, uh... Raise all these, or did you buy them, or what? I raised them from seed. You know, you take the seed from a really ripe fruit, and you take a glass five inches high and four wooden toothpicks. Yes, I know. I know. Uh, my wife used to tooth that, but we never had any luck. Uh, Miss Edmonds, is, is this a... Uh... Well, obviously it is. I mean, it's a hobby of yours, isn't it? Lots of people raise avocados. It's fascinating. Yeah, but so many dozens. 
Once you get started, you can't stop. Well, uh, they're, they're beautiful, all of them. Uh, that one, the one in the corner, that must be 12 feet high. It's going to go right through the ceiling if you're not careful. That's a very special tree. I haven't decided what to do with it. I've thought and thought if I could take it back to California. I could plant it outdoors, but here... Well, you could, uh... Couldn't you um, cut off the top? I mean, that wouldn't hurt it, would it? Oh, no. Avocados take a lot of cutting back. Well, then, uh... It's well... my mother's plant. Your mother's? Oh, uh, you mean it belongs to your mother? Your mother raised it? In a way, she raised it. It grew from the earth she walked on. So you could say she raised it. Uh, I, I don't think I quite follow you. When we first came here, Mother and I went out for a walk. We walked across a meadow... It had been raining and the ground was soft and wherever we put our feet, we left marks, you know, footprints. Mm -hmm. Well, after Mother returned to the house, I went back to the meadow and there were Mother's footprints, quite plain and clear. And I took a trowel and I dug up the earth where she had stepped. And when I got home, I put it in a flower pot and planted my next avocado seed in it. And it grew and grew and... Bloomed and bloomed and never faltered or faded. And it never will. Because it grew from the earth she walked on. Though Angela Edmonds, in all probability, does not know it, her giant avocado tree is a midget. Avocados often grow to a height of 40 feet, but this happens out of doors in places like Mexico, Guatemala, or the West Indies, not inside a house 50 miles north of New York City. We'll return shortly with Act Two. There are those among us who seem to shine with a singular light. It used to be said that they possessed animal magnetism. Now we say they have charisma. Whatever it is, whatever it is called, those who are endowed with it are destined to attract and hold, at least for a time, a certain number of satellites who inexorably circle around them as the Earth revolves about the sun. Even as Angela told me the astonishing tale of the giant avocado tree, the one she had planted, and Earth dug up from footprints left by her mother, I heard the front door open and I a silent prayer of thanks that I didn't have to respond or even comment. I wasn't at all sure that Angela Edmonds was entirely sane. And then I heard from downstairs what I took to be her mother's voice. Angela, darling, I'm back. Where are you, love? Upstairs, mother. And did that man show up, that writer person? Yes, I'm here, Miss Edmonds. We'll come right down. No, no, don't do that. I'm coming out. Don't tell me, sorry. I wasn't here when you arrived. I... Had to take a house guest to the train. Yes, your daughter told me. Well, hello. Hello. I'm Silas Lott. Of course you are. And, of course, you're Joan Edmonds. Yes, I am. I mean, uh, you've hardly changed at all. I remember your pictures, all of them. And now, look, let's not talk about my old pictures. It's bad enough they dredged them up on television. Well, some of them were very good. Ah, <laughs> oh, damn few. Well, let's get to the interview, shall we? Yes, fine, fine. Shall we go into my bedroom? It's sunny there and comfortable. Yes, whatever you say. Since I'm going to tell you all my innermost secrets. <laughs> oh, uh, Angela, maybe Mr. Love would like a drink, would you, Mr. Love? Oh, uh, no, I don't think so. Well, I would. Bring up some white wine, sweetheart, and a bottle of seltzer. Come on, Mr. Love. Let's get started. Jerry, you wouldn't believe it. She's magnificent. How does she look? Oh, marvelous. But that's not the point. She's got to be 60 if she's a day. Well, when you're with her, you don't think about that. In the first place, she doesn't look it. She could be any age. When you're with her, you don't think about that, Jerry. She just sort of sweeps you up and carries you along. Probably has plenty of plastic surgery. No, 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 no. You don't get the idea. It's not her looks. Oh, well, yes, it is her looks. They're marvelous, but it's... It's something else, too. It's her, uh, Her enthusiasm, her friendliness. She's interested in everything. In you, you mean. Well, yes, in me, to a certain extent. I had to remember what I was there for. But then when she was uh, so interested in the whole process, how we were going to go about it. And I explained that I uh, brought along a tape recorder, but if she didn't want me to turn it on, I wouldn't. But she said, no, no, it was all right. She didn't mind. And it's a good thing, because I'd 
I want to tell you, I got so lost in what she was saying and the way she was saying it, I couldn't have remembered it all. She really looks good, does she? Terry, you keep dwelling on how she looks. Listen, suppose she's 60, 61, 62. She's, she's got a daughter, Angela. Say, Angela's in her 30s. Well, you, you could turn that around. Angela could be Joan's mother. She's docile and meek and timid and self-effacing. There's no youth there at all. The only time she lights up is when her mother's in the room. And then uh, she smiles. She talks a little. It's, uh, it's as though she lived in her mother's reflection and in the, in the light reflected back from her mother. Do you know what I mean? I don't think so. It's as though she didn't live or breathe or have any kind of life except what she gets from her mother or... or from her avocados. The what? Well, she has this sort of hobby. Maybe maybe it's her life's work, raising avocados. Her whole bedroom is filled with avocado plants in various stages of growth, and one of them... My Lord, you should see it. It reaches to the ceiling, and, and it's bursting with branches and leaves. It's the healthiest thing you ever saw, but... Even that giant avocado, even that, has something that connects it to her mother. How's that? Well, she told me about it. She's very proud of it. It seems she and her mother went walking one day shortly after they came east, and the ground was soft and wet, and Angela dug up the dirt where her mother had made footprints in the soil and planted the avocado pit in it. How's that? Say that again, will you? She dug up the earth from her mother's footprints and planted an avocado seed in it, and the darn thing has grown. A love spell. A what? It was a love spell to ensure her mother's love. Listen, among the southern Slavic people, a girl will take earth from her lover's footprint and plant a marigold in it. The marigold is believed never to fade, so the girl thinks her sweetheart's love will grow and bloom and never die. The love spell acts on the man through the earth he walked on. How, how do you know such things? It's my business to know them. It's part of being an anthropologist. Still want to come with me to Russia? I used to drive the 50 miles to Joan Edlin's house every day and back to New York in the evening. And she got into the habit of leaving the front door unlocked for me. It gave us both more freedom. If she was home, we'd start work almost immediately. If she wasn't, I'd play back the tapes from the preceding day and make notes. Now and then, when we worked late, I'd stay for dinner and once in a while, overnight. We were three-fourths of the way through the book when one morning I arrived at the house. Miss Edmonds? Joan? He's not here. Oh, is that you, Angela? I'm in mother's room. Okay, be right up. I guess I'm really early today. Mother said to tell you she'd be right back. Well, there's no hurry. I've got plenty to do. What's that thing? Oh, that's a tape recorder. You record everything she says? Well, I don't ever want to misquote it. Oh, I think I just heard her car drive up. Oh, fine, fine. Uh, what's that you've got there? This is lining for her bureau drawers. It's quilted. Oh, pretty color. You like pink? Yeah, sure. It's scented with lemon verbena. She's crazy about lemon verbena. Here. Smell. I do this every other month. So our lingerie and everything has a lovely scent. Maybe you've noticed. Well, I, uh... Charlotte? Uh, yes, upstairs. I saw your car. I'll be right there. I'd better leave. Yes, I guess we'll be getting to work. I can finish this later. After you've gone. Uh-huh. Charlie, what a gorgeous day. Hello, sweetheart. Mother. Darling, why don't you get out in this glorious sunshine? Take a walk. Play tennis. With who? Oh, somebody. Uh, take the car if you want to. Go for a drive someplace. Where to? Any place. Just get out in the fresh air. Silas and I have to work. Once this silly book is finished, I'll be able to take walks with you and play tennis and go for drives. But right now, well, you see how it is. Yes, I see. I'll be in my room if you need anything. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, what's the trouble? Can't you tell? Well, she's, uh... Very devoted to you. Too devoted. And you don't like it? Oh, I suppose I do. Be it ever so humble, there's no place like a pedestal. Isn't that the truth? Well, I've never been on a pedestal, so I wouldn't know. I was on one for a good many years. A national one. Even a worldwide one. Now the only person who looks up to me is my daughter. 
I'm not sure it's healthy. Neither am I. You don't think there's anything wrong with it, do you? Uh, wrong for a daughter to love her mother? No. Well, then. But for a daughter to worship her mother, I'm not so sure. Angela told me about the giant avocado tree. Huh? What did she tell you? That she planted it in dirt she dug up from your footprints. Lord, did she tell you about that? It's an amazing tree. Angela's very gifted with avocados. She should be. She spends all her time with them. Yes, her bedroom is an avocado jungle. I know, I know. What's that? What's, what's, what's that noise? Oh, I didn't hear anything. Well, I did. Don't you hear it? Angela! Where on earth are you going? Silas, come here. Ah, uh, what is it? Oh, help her. She'll hurt herself. I want you to have this here in your room. It's your oh, crazy girl. It's your avocado tree. And it's your very own All avocado. Right, let go, Angela. I've got it. Out of your mind trying to carry that huge thing. Now, where will I put it? In any place. By the east window. It needs this sign. Now, listen, young lady. You were very naughty to do this. But I wanted you to have it. Well, all right, now I've got it. But you don't have to take care of it. I'll do that. I'll water it and everything. You don't have to do I'm just happy you it. didn't fall down carrying that monstrous thing. <laughs> now, go and change your clothes. Take a bath and change your clothes. You're covered with dirt. I'll take care of it. You don't have to go on now. Go on. I'll, I'll, we'll see you at lunch. Water it every day. I promise. Good Lord. What in the world could have possessed that girl to carry that gigantic thing all the way from her room in here? What possesses her? Jealousy, do you think? What? What did you say? I said, do you think it could be jealousy? Jealous of whom? Jealous of what? Of you, me, of the time we spent together. No, no. Well, worshippers don't like to share their idols. They want exclusive rights. They want to belong to their gods, but in return they expect their gods to belong to them. She's not even my own child. What did you say? Forget it. Forget it. I I, I didn't didn't say anything. Yes, you did. Let's let's get to it. No, tell me what you said. I know what you said, but tell me again. You wouldn't put it in the book. Oh, God, you wouldn't do that. She doesn't even know doesn't know that uh, she's an adopted child? It was during the war. I was in England. The Blitz was on. I was near Coventry. I found this poor little waif. Just a baby. Her parents were killed. Well, you know what happened to Coventry. Everything was destroyed. All the records. I, I kept the child with me. And when I came back, I made up a story about marrying an RAF man. I... Silas, you won't print this. Now, why haven't you ever told I her? don't want her to know. But it's a lovely story. Why, why would she lie? I don't, I... But the truth is, I don't want anyone. People, uh, my public to know that I couldn't have a child. You know, the image, the image must be preserved. Uh, something like that. I've been married five times, and there were lovers. I wanted... A child. And I wanted that child to believe she was really mine. And everyone else should believe it, too. You won't put it in the book, Silas, will you? (sighs) Nothing, Joan, nothing. is going into that book that you don't want there. Thank you. Thank you, Silas. And you won't tell Angela? I won't tell her. If you did, she might kill me. Probably it's very exhilarating to see crowds of people gathered to catch a glimpse of you, to have them beg for your autograph, even to have them snatch greedily for bits of your clothing. Heady stuff, I imagine. But mustn't there be an undercurrent of uneasiness, a feeling that the outpouring of adoration is somehow, and in some way, false, that it could reverse itself at any moment and become hatred? We may find out when I return shortly with Act Three. Look at the people on the street. Look at the people in the stores. Look at the people on buses and trains. Look and wonder what secrets are locked within them. What fears bedevil them. What 
private concerns clot the blood behind those public faces. We return you now to the concluding act of The Avocado Jungle. The summer was ending. My sessions with Joan were nearly over. I was almost ready to start outlining the book. And ahead of me lay the exciting prospect of my trip to Russia with Jerry Winkler. I was hauling down my luggage going over my limited wardrobe when Jerry showed up. Hi. Hi. Come in. Get yourself a beer. Tell me, what do they wear in the Tartar Republic anyway? Got your visa? Well, there was a little fuss about it, but I got it. Uh, how's the book coming? Uh, as told to... Oh, uh... great. Great. I uh, sent the tapes off to Hilda Hutchnecker day before yesterday. Hilda's the little gem of a typist who transcribes from tapes at a dollar a page. But she's accurate and she's quick. I ought to have him back in a day or so. Then a couple of sessions with Joan Edmonds, let her read the transcript, show her my outline for the book, and I'm with you. You planning on doing some writing while we're in Russia? Oh, no, no, no. I won't put pen to paper. Just sort of kick it around in my head in off moments, if there are any off moments. Excuse me. Yeah, hello. Mr. Love, this is Hilda Hutchnick. Oh, yeah, Hilda. How's it coming? All right, but I thought I ought to tell you something. There's a gap in one of the tapes. A gap? How long a gap? Oh, eight, ten minutes about. I thought I ought to tell you. Oh, yeah, well, well, finish the stuff up, Hilda, and ship it over, will you? Maybe tomorrow. That's fine. Bye. Trouble? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. That was Hilda. She says there's a part of the tape missing. Hmm? Well, I, I could have left the thing running, I guess. I get careless sometimes. Well, I can check with Joan as soon as she gets out of the hospital. She says? Huh? Oh, no, no, not really. Some kind of a minor operation she had done. She'll be out in a day or so. Holy cow. What? You think of something? It's just possible. I wonder. Could be. What for Pete's sake? I can't tell you, Jerry. You look concerned. Is it serious that you're missing ten minutes? It's, it's the ten minutes I think it is. Hello? Uh, Hilda, this is Silas Love. Uh, tell me, what's the date on the tape with the ten-minute gap in it? Uh, just a sec. Uh, it's uh, August 28th. August 28th. Thanks, Hilda. I was right. About what? About the ten minutes that's missing. I know what we talked about on August 28th. Of course, it was the conversation about Angela that was missing. That had been erased in all probability. But who had erased it? Had Joan? Had she wanted to eradicate any evidence that Angela was not her own child? Evidence out of her own mouth? Or had Angela... A couple of days later, I got a call from Joan. She was out of the hospital and wanted to see me. Hi, Joan. Silas? Don't you look pretty? <laughs> Do I? I signed myself out of the hospital a day early. I wanted to come home. The doctor said to take it easy, drink plenty of fluids, and take aspirin. You know the usual advice. I think it was the painkiller they gave me after the operation that makes me so thirsty. Pour me another glass of water, will you, Silas? Oh, sure. Yes, I uh, brought the transcripts of the tapes with me. Oh, good. I'll read them. But not today. No, no, in no hurry at all. Want some more water? You mind? No, not at all. Just wait till you feel completely well, and then uh, you call me and I'll drive up and we'll go over them together. Here you are. Here's your water. Thanks. Maybe in a few days. Come in. I brought you some bottled water, Mother. Oh, darling, how sweet of you. It's better than water from the tap. Hello, Mr. Love. Hello, Angela. This water isn't carbonated, Mother. Sounds gas, as they say. I hope that's all right. Sounds gas is fine, darling. I don't really like the bubbles much. Do you want anything else? Another thing. How's, uh... How's your jungle, Angela? What? Your avocado jungle. How is it? All right. Thanks for asking. Well, if you don't need anything else, Mother... If I need anything, Mr. Love will get it for me. Are you staying for dinner, Mr. Love? I ought to tell the cook. No, no, I have to get back to New York. Oh. All right. Joan, uh, there's something I ought to tell you about the tapes. You may notice it in the transcripts, and I think you should know. Oh, not today, Silas. Let's not go into all that today, do you mind? No, no, I don't mind. Look, you, you really don't feel very well, do you? Well, all right. Let me, uh, pour me a glass of that bottle of water, will, will you, Silas? You sure? The doctor said... Yeah, okay. Okay. There you are. Joan, I've changed my mind on staying for dinner. Oh? All right. Tell Angela. I'm 
I'm sure there's plenty. Maybe we can ask the maid to serve your dinner and mine up here. And then we can talk, maybe. But not now. I'll sleep for a while. Later. Sure. Sure. Would you like me to close the shutters or anything? That would be nice. Joan? Mm-hmm? I'm not just staying for dinner. I'm staying overnight. Something that caught my eye as I went to the window to close the shutters. The giant avocado was standing straight and tall and proud, but two of its myriad leaves showed a brownish tinge at their tips. And wild, absurd thoughts raced through my head. I felt that I knew, but what, what did I know? What was struggling inside my brain trying to come clear? I'd stay in this house until it made its way out. And I did, for a week, spending my days with Joan in her room, and whenever she slept, which she did intermittently and often, I stealthily watered the giant avocado. Are you feeling better today? Much better. Would you like to go over the transcript? Yes, we could do that. Joan, there's something you should know before you read them. Uh, Toward the end, there's a part missing. Missing? What could be missing? Well, you see, these are transcripts of the tapes we made. Yes, I know that. And uh, there's a girl who transcribes my tapes for me, and, and, uh, well, she found a gap in one of them about ten minutes. Oh, well, we can reconstruct that between us, can't we? Surely we can remember what we said. Oh, yes, yes, we can do that. Well, then, what's the problem? What's your problem? No problem at all. Oh, I can certainly remember what I said. After all, it's my life we've been talking about. Well, uh, I don't think you want to reconstruct this ten minutes. Why not? Well, this ten minutes is from the tape of August the 28th. Yes, so? Do you remember what you told me that day? No, but it'll come to me. Of course it will. that was the day you told me about Angela. Angela? That you had adopted her. Oh, no. And that you uh, never told her she was adopted. But that that wasn't on the tape. That that wasn't supposed to go in the book. Did you erase it from the tape? I didn't even know it was on the tape. Why was it? How did it get there? Well, we must have left the recorder running by mistake. How could that happen? Does it worry you? Of course it worries me. Why? Well, because I... Joan, I am not going to put anything in that book that you don't want there. Now, what are you afraid of? That she... That Angela... That she played the tape. Is that it? Yes. And couldn't bear what she heard. Yes. And so she erased it. That must have been what happened, mustn't it? Yes, I think so. What am I going to do? Angela! What? what? You get out of here! You get out of here. Now, just a minute. Please, Angela. Oh, what do you think you're doing? The avocado tree. She's so clever. Sneaking in. Angela, don't do that. Silas, you're tearing it up. I don't stop her. Now, come on, Angela. Let's Sitting go. here and watering my avocado. Angela. Angela. What's she talking about? Let me have it, Angela. Let me... No! Oh, oh. oh. Why did you do that? What is it? Oh, darling, what is it? Oh, sweetheart, come here. Let me hold you. Tell me, what is it? What's happened? I had to do it. I had to. But why? Why? Because you don't love me. You don't love me. And you never have. Three weeks later, Jerry Winkler and I were on a plane bound for Russia. The book was all planned, and I'd have this vacation time to relax before I started in on the actual writing. I'd gone over the whole story of Joan Edmonds and her daughter with Jerry because, after all, if he hadn't told me about the love spell, I'd never have caught on to the whole thing. And Joan was drinking water constantly, glass after glass, couldn't get enough of it. As she said, the doctor had told her that it was probably the painkiller they'd given her in the hospital that made her so thirsty, but somehow it didn't sound right to me, Jerry. And then when I w- went to the window to close the shutters, I saw the giant avocado. The thirsty avocado. Yeah, well, just a few of its leaves were beginning to turn brown, but Angela never let anything like that happen. One of her avocado trees, never. And I began having this, this wild suspicion, wild, crazy, impossible... But I couldn't ignore it. The avocado is a tropical plant and can't live for long without water. She was killing the avocado. Just because she couldn't bring herself to kill her mother. That's about it. 
And you watered the avocado. Every day I was there. Saved its life. And thereby saved Joan. Well, all I can do is tell you what happened. You see, Joan began to feel better along with the avocado. And finally, I told her about the ten-minute gap in the tape, what it contained. And she was horrified, of course. And then Angela burst into the room, screaming for saving the avocado. Yes, she grabbed the tree and tried to pull it up by the roots. And when that didn't work, she kicked the pot it was in until it broke and spilled all over the floor. Then what? Well, I... I got out of the room. Joan was holding Angela in her arms. Angela was crying. Matter of fact, they both were. I got out. How are they making out now, do you know? Well, Joan called me just before we left New York. She says she told Angela all the details of the adoption. Angela admitted that she had erased the tape. Joan sounded quite satisfied with the way everything had turned out. They'll be okay, you think? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Matter of fact, I'm positive. What makes you say that? Well, now that everything's out in the open, no secrets, nothing held back. Joan says it's okay to go ahead and put the whole story in the book. Which is exactly what I'm going to do. variously contagious magic, sympathetic magic, or mimetic magic. The belief that whatever is done to a material object will in like manner affect the person with whom the object has been in contact, whether or not it ever was a part of that person's body. In other words, it says to us that things once in contact are always in contact. That is what it says. We can agree or we can disagree just as we choose. I'll be back shortly. Your lung association says smoke's not just your affair. That smoke screen that you pop around to loose non-smokers air. It's bad for kids and older folks with lungs not up to par. It's damaging for you, of course, but your smoke travels far. Association and you know that cigarettes are a breathing hazard. Smokers, please don't add that extra offense. Give us a break for life and breath. The belief in magic, sympathetic, contagious, mimetic, was badly shaken by the evolution of religion. Much later, the belief in religion was shaken by the development of modern science. Magic, religion, science. All three have had great power over the mind of man. But not one of them has been able to contain it completely. And perhaps that's just as well. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Lois Kitty, Terry Keene, and Howard Ross. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. And whenever Lou was in town, we were inseparable. Even during one of the worst blizzards in the history of Chicago, when Lou punched me in the mouth, saving my life at the same time that he risked his own. I was crazy to try to get to work, but I had a new account that I'd promised to work up, so... I fought my way to my car and was just about settled in the front seat when I saw Lou trudging towards me through the snow. At the same time, I heard a thump. I rolled the window down to try to see what had happened, and I heard Lou calling. Stay where you are, Jason. Don't move. You get your face back in there. Are you crazy, Lou? What's going on here? Let me get out of here. Sorry, buddy. That's an electric power cable across the back of your car. Now, sitting where you are, your face is in your house. Touch one foot on the ground, you'll be electrocuted. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Gambling fever... A disease that, in varying degrees, afflicts millions of Americans. In its milder form, where it's indulged in casually, it can be no more than a pastime. But the compulsive gambler finds himself on the road to perdition. An addicted gambler is doomed as surely as anyone addicted to drugs or alcohol. He will inevitably find himself face to face with disaster. Uh, you're late, Lou. I know, I know. I've been trying to raise the money. You ought to put that to music. That's the same song I've been hearing for the last week. Look, we've been doing business for years. I've always paid before, haven't I? That's like yesterday's news. Dead. That's what you'll be unless you come up with 11 big ones before next Tuesday. <laughs> drama, Met with the Angels, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Mason Adams. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Man is a social animal. Indeed, many sociologists believe that the company of his fellows is just as important to him as any of life's necessities. Of course, friendship between men has been celebrated in song and story ever since Damon and Pythias. Today's tale deals with a friendship that equaled, if it didn't exceed, the bond between that historic pair. Since this friendship carried beyond the grave... Ever since I could remember, Lou Marvin and I have been pals. From kindergarten through the University of Chicago. Although we chased different careers after we graduated, me to the advertising business, and Lou turning his charm and personal magnetism to selling, we kept in touch. And whenever Lou was in town, we were inseparable. Even during one of the worst blizzards in the history of Chicago, when Lou punched me in the mouth, saving my life, at the same time that he risked his own. I was crazy to try to get to work, but I had a new account that I'd promised to work up. So I fought my way to my car and was just about settled in the front seat when I saw Lou trudging towards me through the snow. At the same time, I heard a thump. I rolled the window down to try to see what had happened, and I heard Lou calling. Stay where you are, Jason. Don't move. And get your face back in there. Are you crazy, Lou? Come on, get in and I'll give you a lift to your friendly neighborhood bookmaker. I said sit. What's going on here? Let me get out and... Uh, Sorry, buddy. That's an electric power cable across the back of your car. Now, sitting where you are, your safe is in your house. Touch one foot on the ground, you'll be electrocuted. Wow. Could you have told me that before you hauled off and belted me? You already had your hand on the door latch. Yeah, but you touched me and you're okay. I made sure I just hit you, not the car. Wait, wait, wait a minute, you mean if, if, if you'd have brushed the car when you swung at me, you'd have been in fraud? You're crazy, Lou, you know that? I mean, why didn't uh, you... Look, you know my philosophy. Never ask why. Never look back. Now, I'll get a tree branch, get that power line off the car, and we'll find a poker game. Lou found the poker game. I went to work, despite Lou's beautifully persuasive sales pitch. Lou knew that I wasn't a gambler, but he liked to have me along when I could spare the time. I enjoyed watching, and I sometimes even made a small bet. I liked to think that I acted as a restraining influence, but I realized I was kidding myself. For example, one summer night, we went to the trial. The next race, Jason, the next race is going to be the biggie. We'll win back everything we lost. Right, Lou. I mean, isn't that the way it always goes? The next race, the next football game, the next fight. Have I ever steered you wrong? Often? Well, can't win them all, you know that. Oh, I know, Lou. I know. I, I, I just don't like to lose them all, and I think you lose more than you win. Oh, come on now. 
No analysis tonight. Look at this horse here. Look at this. Number six in the next race. Rainbow. Well, that's where they say the pot of gold is. Jason, 11 to 1. I said, I like you, Lou. You're a chalk player. Not when I'm out 600 bucks. Now, look at him. There he is out on the track now. The roan there. Now, isn't he beautiful? You know something, Lou? You have been reading racing forms since high school. Now, I don't pretend to know half as much as you, but look at this dope sheet on Rainbow. He leads all the way to the stretch, and then he quits and he finishes last. I saw that. That's the beauty of it. I figure they're setting him up for a killing. That's why he's 11 to 1. Now, come on. Let's get to the windows before we shut out. As usual, there was no standing up against Lou's enthusiasm. I bet $5 on Rainbow. Lou bet 100. Rainbow went out to a six-length leap with Lou screaming, What did I tell you? And then stopped as if he'd run into a brick wall. He finished last again. But what happened next? That's the part that you're not going to believe. There you are. Well, you were smart only to bet five. But this time, watch. Rainbow will do it. What? The race is over. One heat. They're going to run a second. I don't... I don't... You're, you're not going to... You're not going to bet him again. Jason, that's why you're a loser. You just don't understand. Now look at the tote board. Rainbow's up to 15 to 1. They're going to make a killing. Who, who's that? How do I know? The owners, the insiders. Oh, boy. You know, you know, Lou, for an intelligent guy, I, I really think you don't have all your money. You don't know anything about gambling. I know enough not to put my money on a horse running against the very same horses that just beat him by 20 lengths. Jason, now look. It costs money to run a horse in this race, doesn't it? I know about entry fees. Well, there you are. Why do you think the owners would put up this much money to enter him if they didn't think he could win? This is a put-up job. I can smell it. Okay, you have every right to call me the world's biggest idiot, but you've never heard Lou sell. His belief was so strong, and he had the ability to sweep away all logic and actually convince you that he was right. At any rate, I bet another five, and he put down his last hundred. And then we rushed back to the track to watch it and listen. And as they head into the stretch, it's Rainbow on top by two lengths. Then Mark Sun of Villafranche and Hesperus. Hesperus is moving on the outside. Mark Sun and Villafranche also moving up as Rainbow falters. It's Hesperus and Mark Sun. Hesperus and it's Mark Stein on the inside by a note. There'll be a photo. Well, Lou. Well, there you are. Well, I still have a small bankroll left. I think I'll find me a book again. I couldn't get sore at Lou. None of his friends could. I mean, if you liked him, and most people did, you put up with that fatal flaw in his character. However, I didn't hear from Lou for about a week after the incident at the racetrack, and I was concerned. I called and I left messages, but he didn't return the calls. So, one night I decided to stroll over to his apartment on Lakeshore Drive. I missed his unfailing cheerfulness, and I also wanted to tell him that I'd, I'd finally met a girl that I wanted to marry. I wanted them to meet because it was important that they be friends. As I approached the entrance to his apartment house... I was surprised to see Lou come out, escorted by two men. Lou! Hey, Lou, hold, hold up a minute. I didn't like the way the men kept Lou between them as they came to a stop. They were well-dressed, but something about them screamed hoodlum. Uh, wh where are you going, Lou? Did you forget our date? Oh, uh, yes, it, uh, it, it slipped my mind. It slipped your mind? You mean you forgot that I wanted to introduce you to Hillary? Jason, I'm sorry, uh... These gentlemen drove everything out of my mind. Yeah, but, Lou, the... Yeah, we, uh, we got important business together. You might almost say it's a matter of life and death. To Lou or to you? What's your name? Jason Clark. All right, Jason Clark. Your good friend here owes us 11 big ones, and we intend to get it. Now, how about it, Clark? Is this guy going to stand up for your wedding? Going to be your best man? Well, I, I sure hope so, if the girl will marry me. Fine. How about you standing up for him and guaranteeing we get our dough? <laughs> okay, I'll, uh... I'll guarantee you get your money. Now, there's a friend for you, Lou. You ought to be real proud. Yeah, uh, you understand, I I don't have that kind of money now, but... Sure, sure, we understand. 
We'll give you a week to get it together. You shouldn't have done that, Jason. I make my problems and I solve them. I couldn't let them kill you. Look, I'm no good to them dead. I'll admit I might have crawled away with some bruises and maybe a couple of broken ribs. You haven't got that kind of loop. I managed to oh, get you'll it do together. Nothing. Now, look, I'm going out on the road and, and sell some swimming pools. Six ought to do it. If I can't sell six pools in a week, I'll give up gambling. Lou did sell the pools. Seven, as a matter of fact. He didn't give up gambling, and he met Hillary Jones, by this time my fiancé. To my delight, they hit it off beautifully. Hillary disapproved of Lou's gambling, but she was not a managing woman, and she didn't attempt to reform him. Well, when Lou was in town, he was always welcome company, and we became a threesome until tragedy struck. Lou was killed in an automobile accident. I'd realized how large a part Lou had played in my life until he was gone. I asked Hillary to move up the date for our wedding, hoping that married life would help fill the void. Well, of course, dearest. We can get married tomorrow if you want. Did I ever tell you how much I love you? Uh, frequently. But I never get tired of hearing you say it. You're a remarkable woman. I, I, I know that you and your folks wanted a big wedding with all the trimmings. And yet you're willing to marry me tomorrow. I love you, Jason. You know, I wouldn't ask you to disappoint your folks and run off and get married, but it would be great if we could move the date up for a couple of weeks. No problem. Great. Let's celebrate. I tell you, I, I'll give you ten minutes to change, and we'll have dinner at the pump room. I have a very important question to ask you. Where is all the money coming from for this? Don't worry about it. We can afford it. Well, I know you do very well at the agency. But nowhere near well enough to be able to afford the luxuries you've lavished on me in the last few months. Best restaurants, the best seats, the best shows. You're objecting to the way I've been courting you? I love it. Where are you getting all the money? Oh, you'd be surprised. Darling, I think we're heading for our first quarrel. Why are you so secretive? What's going on? I'll tell you. But only upon two conditions. First, that you won't repeat it to a soul. And second, that you won't make fun of me. I promise. Okay. I've been gambling. Gambling? And winning. What's happening to you? You're not a gambler. You never were. Don't you remember the hours we spent talking about Lou? Trying to come up with some way of curing his gambling habit? Of course, Hillary. It's not, not really gambling. You're betting? Yeah. But I can't lose. I haven't lost a bet, not once. That's ridiculous. That's impossible. Not if you're getting tips from the right source. What source? Lou, of course. Lou tells me what to bet. And he's never been wrong. The late Harry Houdini swore to his friends that he would get in touch with them after his death. He even left very definite details as to how they would recognize his presence, even if he were unable to talk with them. So far, none of them has been contacted. Now we have Jason Clark, who says he's getting betting tips from his dead friend. Can this really be true? We'll find out shortly when I return with Act Two. many spiritualists who claim to have regular conversations with the dead, but most of them maintain they reach the spirit world only through their own very special contact on the other side. Jason Clark, however, has told his fiancé that he's in direct contact with his dead friend, Lou Marvin, who's giving him sure winners in sporting events. Jason, I know you believe that Lou has been giving you tips on betting. I'm trying to decide which worries me more. The fact that you're gambling or the fact that you actually think that Lou... Remember is... your promise. You swore that you wouldn't make fun of me. Darling, I'm not making fun. I'm just terribly worried. I know how close you and Lou were and how much his death affected you, but this is... Look, honey, please, relax. I'm not crazy. Now, just, just let me explain how it happened. But you can't. All right, go ahead. See, the first time I was reading a sporting page about the game between the Chicago Bears and the Giants. And suddenly, I heard Lou's voice, clearly, 
telling me to bet the Giants. Oh, you couldn't have. Right. I couldn't, and I didn't. I dismissed it as some sort of hallucination. But twice before the game, I heard him again. And it was just the way Lou used to talk. And I still didn't better do anything about it. And the Giants won. Oh, Jason, my love. That was just a coincidence. That's just what I thought until it happened again with a basketball game. So I made a small bet, and I won. And from then on, I've just listened to old Lou, and I haven't lost a single time. Darling, I'd like you to see a doctor. Yeah. He's a good friend well, Hillary, of mine. Hillary, please, be... please, Hillary, please. Just let me prove it to you. Wait, wait a minute. I'll go out to the lobby and I'll get a newspaper. You, you just wait. Okay, here's the paper. Now look. Here is the list of tonight's games. Now, you, you, you pick a game. Any game. No, I don't want anything to do with them. In other words, you have a closed mind. You love me, but you won't even let me prove to you that I'm not out of my skull, that this is really happening. All right. Here. I picked the game between the Chicago Bulls and the Los Angeles Lakers. Okay. Now, you me the paper. Tell her to pick another game, Jay. Well? Do you hear anything? Yep. Lou says you should pick another game. I didn't hear a thing. Yeah, I know, but that's what he said. All right. But I'm only going along with this nonsense because I love you. You just pick the game. It's getting late. All right. At Boston and Philadelphia. How long are you going to stare at that paper? Take the Celtics at six points. Where are you going? To phone in my bet. Lou told me to take the Celtics with six points. Well, do you believe me now? 100, 200, 300, 500 bucks. That's a Celtics loss. Yeah, but only by three points. And the spread was six, so I won. <laughs> now, do you believe me? I believe you won, but I don't believe... I refuse to believe that, that such a thing could happen. You don't believe in life after death? Maybe there is. But if there are such things as spirits, they don't go around giving people tips so, so that someone down here on Earth can win a lot of money. Come on, Hillary. You know what a great salesman Lou was. I mean, if anyone could sell the other world a bill of goods on gambling, Lou is the fellow who could. Jason, I don't know what's going on, but I want you to stop. Why? Because it's wrong. What's wrong about winning? I'm making legitimate bets, and I'm winning. I mean, it's the easiest money I ever made in my life. We can use it to build a wonderful life. Do you realize that the ceiling is absolutely unlimited? And what happens if Lou stops sending you tips? Simple. I don't bet. I'm not a gambler. I'm just a winner. A man who acts on heaven-sent information. And if I don't get the information, I'll quit. And what happens when you lose? Well, I don't even want to think about that. Not because of the money. I mean, there's no way I'd bet enough to lose at all. But if I lose, that'll mean that something is going on inside my head and I never was in touch with Lou at all. And how do you think I like living with that thought? You shouldn't consider it. The records show that I must be hearing from Lou that I'm, I'm betting only on sure things. But somehow, to me, that's even more frightening. Well, Jason, I don't want to go out for dinner tonight. What, what's the matter? Headache? No, I, I'm fine. I'd just rather you, you come over to my place because I have something to tell you that needs privacy. Okay. Did you get the flowers? Yes. Thank you. They're beautiful. What's all? Nothing else to say to us? I'll see you in an hour. Jason, before I say anything, I want you to know that's the most beautiful engagement ring I've ever seen. Well, at last. I was beginning to think that either you hadn't received it or you didn't like it. No woman could look at it and not like it. It's really exquisite and expensive. Obviously, you're still winning. <sighs> that's an understatement. My bookmaker is hinting that perhaps he'd rather have me go to Vegas to place my bet. I tell you, darling, we have got the world by the tail. Yes, I suppose that's one way of looking at it. Well, what's the matter? I, I thought you'd be happy about the ring. The trouble is that I'm beginning to believe you about Lou. Why should I make you unhappy? Because I don't want to believe in demonic possession. Demonic? What the deuce are you talking about? You know how we used to laugh and joke about all those books and films where some kind of devil entered the body of a perfectly normal person and took over? Well, what's that got to do with anything? Oh, I believe that somehow Lou has taken possession of your mind. 
Are you saying that you think Lou's a devil or some kind of an evil spirit? No, not at all. I just think that ever since this started, you've been acting and thinking like Lou rather than like Jason. Nonsense. You've quit your job with the ad agency, haven't you? You're you're exaggerating. I just took a leave of absence. Why? Well, there's not much point in my turning out advertising copy five days a week for less than I make on one bet. Oh, I wish you could hear yourself. It almost sounds as if Lou were talking. That's just what he'd say. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Of course. Why didn't I think of this before? You're jealous. You're jealous of Lou and... That's not true. That's not true at all. I thought Lou was a fine person and I enjoyed being with him, but but much as I liked Lou, I would never have thought of marrying him. I I can't believe what I'm hearing. I mean, look at me. I'm Jason. I am Jason Clark. You remember me? The guy who loves you and wants to do everything in the world for you. If you really mean that, then we have no problem. Of course I mean it. stop betting. Boy, oh boy. I really stepped into that one, didn't I? Well? Let me think about it for a minute. We'll think about it. I don't have to because I already know the answer. Uh, you're, 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 you're pushing me, Hillary, and I, I don't like to be pushed. Why don't you admit it? You're addicted exactly the way Lou was addicted. You can't stop, not even for me. Yeah, just see, that's not fair. I mean, Lou lost a lot of time. Sure, he won now and then, but he lost. I mean, if you want to say that I'm addicted, be honest. I'll admit that I'm addicted to winning. I'm sorry, Jason. Here, what's that? Your ring. I'm giving it back. I'm calling it quits. If I were a gambler, I might say I was cutting my losses because I know what you're doing is all wrong. I walked back to my place after Hillary had broken our engagement, feeling rotten. I had to face up to it. A lot of what Hillary had said was right. I just couldn't bear the thought of throwing away this golden opportunity. And I also had to admit that if I quit, it would probably break my link with Lou, and I didn't want to lose contact. I was feeling miserable when I opened the door to my apartment, and I froze. Seated there were the two men that I'd seen with Lou when he owed them $11,000. One of them spoke. Come on in, Clark, and close the door. You remember meeting us before with your friend Lou Marvin? I'm Mr. Smith. This fellow's Mr. Jones, my silent partner. How did you get in? Let's not waste time on unimportant matters. I don't remember the guy who said if you can't lick him, join him, but that's the way we feel. We want to go into business with you. Yeah, but I'm not in business. Wrong. Dead wrong. Now, you've been taking a lot of money, an awful lot of money away from our enterprise, and it shouldn't happen that way. Now, you know as well as we do, Clark, I don't figure. You mean I'm not supposed to win? Well, of course you're supposed to win some of the time. But even the luckiest gamblers we ever saw also lost some of the time. You're something else, Clark. You're the first guy we ever ran across who never loses. If you fellas are trying to tell me that you don't want my action, I'll go elsewhere. There ain't no elsewhere, Clark. You've become famous. Now, we're here to make you a straight business proposition. We understand you must have some kind of a system. And we want you to tell us about it so we can work it better. I don't have a system. Now, look, Clark, you've been doing great. I mean great. But with us, you'll do even better. We can put down bets that no one would take from you. So it makes sense to let us in on it. Look, I told you, I don't have a system. You're not dealing with children when you talk with me and Jonesy. Well, you want to make us believe you close your eyes, you stick a pin in the paper and come up with a winner? Of course I don't do anything like that. All right. So tell us, what do you do? This is ridiculous. Ain't it? You know, if anyone had ever told me I'd be sitting in a guy's apartment one night begging him to tell me how he picks winners, I'd have said he was bananas. But here we are, and we're asking you, and we're asking polite. Yeah, I understand that, but I have nothing to tell you. It's just that I get uh, a, 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 a feeling. Well, you're going to have to come up with something better. Maybe like uh, somebody on the inside is giving you information, and you're splitting with them. Is that the way you're working? Absolutely not. Okay, I'll buy that. Not because you tell us, but because we got connections, and we check them very carefully before we come here tonight. If there's anything I could do to help you, I would. You can. 
All you have to do is tell us how you figure the basketball games, the football games, the races. Just tell us. And we're in business. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm using the the, the rhythm system. Uh, you, you have heard of biorhythms and charts? Biorhythms? Yeah. Yeah. See? See, look. Here's what I do. I, I, I get the birth date of every player... And then I use my own system of determining the biorhythms of all the key players involved. And whichever team has the players, see, with the greatest number of high in all the three categories, which are emotional and physical and astrological, well, that gives me the clue as to how to bet. And I suppose you do the same thing with the horses. No, nah, that, that'd be silly with horses. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. My partner has a nasty temper. I don't like violence. But I can't blame him for punching you. So come up with some answers or Jones is going to get so mad. He might really hurt you. Legend has it that George Washington never told a lie. Now that's admirable. Sometimes it's impossible to make people believe you're telling the truth when you are indeed speaking the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That's the dilemma which confronts Jason Clark, and we'll be back to hear how he solves it shortly. Each of us has his dreams. To those dreamers who lament the fact that their castles in the air don't materialize, I say, beware. Many of those dreams are fulfilled only to turn into nightmares. And so it was with Jason Clark, who seemed to have a ghostly pipeline to betting on sporting events that was infallible. Indeed, Jason has never lost a bet. And now some very rough gentlemen are determined to find out how he does it. You feeling a little better, Clark? My nose has stopped bleeding. I guess I'm okay. Good. See, my partner here is an impatient man. I don't know how long I can hold him back. Look, you don't have to threaten me. There's just nothing I can tell you. There's nothing you believe. Try us. It, it's no use. It's hopeless. You're not going to come back with that, uh, that uh, what do you call that, biorhythm garbage, are you? No. All right, you seem to be learning. Now, we'll go along with something when we hear the truth. Okay, do you remember Lou Marvin? Sure. Swell guy. Now, you, you know that we were very close. Yeah, yeah. Look, that's ancient history. Marvin is dead. Yeah, and, and he, he see, he's been giving me... He's been giving me tips. Now, hold it, hold it, Jonesy. There'll be time enough for your act. First, I want to hear the rest of this fairy tale. Oh, gosh, I told you that you wouldn't believe now, me. I'm trying, Clark. If I hear you correctly, you're getting tips from Lou Marvin, who died almost a year ago. That's right. How do you get in touch? I don't. He does. See, I'll be, I'll be reading the sports news or listening to sports on the radio. Suddenly, I hear him tell me what team or what horse to bet. Mm-hmm. And I suppose you're the only one who could hear him, right? Now nah, you've got it. No. Nope. You got it. 48 hours to come up with the real dope or you're going to find yourself in a hospital. I didn't leave my apartment for two days. I didn't make a bet. I didn't even look at the sporting pages. I sat and I worried and thought and didn't come up with any answers. If Smith and Jones weren't willing to accept the truth, there was just no story I could make up that would hang together. I knew I'd have to go out sometime, and I wondered where they picked me up. Late the second night, my phone rang. Hello? This is Smith. Remember me? Yeah. Have you changed your mind? I can't. You've got to believe I told you the truth. Boy, I've met some stubborn guys in my time, but you take the cake. Now listen. Listen good, because you won't be hearing from me again. Yeah, you know how Jonesy feels about you. But he's not stubborn. When I showed him that if we damaged you, we might be killing a goose that laid the golden egg, he saw the logic of that right away. That makes sense. So you decided to leave me alone? That's right. But that girl you're going to marry, that Hillary Jones, that there's really a good-looking dame. Listen, if you touch her... Now you can I... stop us. 
Just tell us your system and nothing happens to her. But if you don't, when we get through with her, nobody would want to marry her. Take it over and call me tomorrow. You know the number. Although it was well past midnight, I called Hillary. I told her I had to see her. It was a matter of life and death. I think she was still too sleepy to understand what I was saying, but she agreed to allow me to come over. All right, Jason. Now that you've got me out of bed in the middle of the night, calm down, drink some coffee. Tell me what this is all about. Well, first, Hillary, I want to apologize. I take back everything I ever said to you. About what? About this betting. I was wrong and you were right. It's big trouble. And the thing I can never forgive myself for is that you're involved. I don't see how that's possible. Uh, darling, listen, start packing. You've got to go away. Will you please drink your coffee and make some sense? They're threatening you. That's why I called. Right after Smith hung up, we've, we've got to find some place where they can't find you. Listen, I know you're in some kind of panic and that you're worried about me. Why do I have to run away? Sorry, you're right again. You see, the fellas that I've been betting with came to see me. They thought that I had some kind of new foolproof system for picking winners. And they wanted to go into business with me. Of course, I told them I didn't have a system, and they didn't believe it. They threatened me. One of them took a punch at me. And finally, I told them the truth. Even about me? Right. Of course, they didn't believe that either. And that was two days ago. Well, they called me at night. They said they wouldn't hurt me since I'm the goose that lays the golden eggs. But if I didn't tell them, they were going to beat you up and scar you for life. That's why I'm here, and that's why you've got to get out of town now. Well, that's not the answer, Jason. I don't intend to run away. Believe me, Hillary, this isn't the time for heroics. No, not for panic either. Running away won't solve anything. Well, what will? Wait, I'm trying to see it their way. Now, remember when you first told me about Lou giving you tips? I didn't believe you. I can understand why they didn't believe it either. Now, suppose you prove it to them. How? The same way you proved it to me. You give them a, a demonstration. Well, I'm not sure that Lou would go for that. Why not? I know how he felt about these guys. He hated them. And he's sure to know that they're with me, just waiting to cash in. But if he knows all that, he must know the spot you're in. Yeah, I suppose he does. But don't you think Lou is too good a friend of yours to let you down? He got you into this. Now, give him a chance to get you out. We talked about it for the rest of the night. But I really knew deep down that it was the only sensible suggestion. Now it is up to me to persuade Smith and Jones to come to a demonstration. The next day, I called the number that Smith had given me. Hello? It's Jason Clark. Listen, I'm going to give you a demonstration. I'm going to show you just how I work it. Why don't you just write it out for us? Or is it too complicated? It's very simple. But the only way that I'm going to get you to, to, well, to see how it works is to watch me in action. I don't like the way you talk. You're not going to be stupid enough to try to pull another fast one, eh? How can I? You're going to be right with me. You're going to see me and hear me, and then... All right. Be at the Regal Hotel, room 915 at 4.30 this afternoon. That's too late. I want to be with you in time for the afternoon races. Okay. Then make it 12.30. Yeah, and have a daily racing form there, will you? How about a crystal ball? No, thanks. I'm bringing my own. All the way to the hotel... I was forcing my brain to send messages to Lou. They all added up to the same thing. A plea to him not to let me down. I got there on the dot, and the big gorilla called Jonesy let me in and hung a do not disturb sign outside, and then carefully locked and bolted the door. We sent down for some food. Help yourself. No, oh, thanks. All right, Jonesy, give him a racing form. Let's watch him work. Well, what are you doing? Working. We ain't hearing nothing. I'm going to give you the name of a horse to bet. What race? I don't know yet. I don't believe this guy, John. Look, I can't concentrate if you keep on talking. That's too bad, because I ain't going to shut up. You know, dummy, you know what we want. We ain't looking for tips. We want to know how you do it. I'm going to show you. Now, shut up. You're going to tell him. I already told you. Lou Marvin gives me the name of a horse. I have to wait until I hear from him. Jonesy, maybe you better pay a call on the young lady. Oh, now, wait a No, no, wait a minute. You've got to give me the chance to prove to you that I'm telling the truth. Look, Lou Marvin's dead. Now, you tell me that somehow he gives you a tip on a team or a horse. Right, he talks to me. Look, how much have I won over the last four months? You must have an approximate idea. Not approximate. We have it right to the penny. You're in a list for 78 big ones. 
$78,000. Okay, I have most of it. Not all, but I can get the difference. And I'll show you how much I believe in what I'm saying. I will bet the whole bundle, if you guys can get it down, 78000 Does that sound as if I'm making up a story? Uh, Jonesy, here's a guy with a lot of moxie. He sure backs up his fairy tales. All right, I'll go along with you, Clark. Go back to studying your form. <laughs> through the first three races, reading the names of horses to myself, and looking at their past performances, and nothing. I could feel the growing skepticism of the two men in the room. Come on, Lou, come on. You don't come up with a horse soon, Jonesy and me are going to get a little angry. Sunset star in the six. That's your horse, Jason. I've got it. Sunset star in the six. You can bet $78,000. Jones left to go into another room, and Smith and I sat and looked at each other. Jones returned and nodded that the bet was down, and we sat and waited with the radio on, waited for the start of the sixth race. When the DJ said, and now for the call at sixth race to take you trackside, there was enough electricity in that room to have lighted the whole hotel. They're off on the inside. Prize Folly, closely followed by Joey's boy, a link. And then Sunset Star with Kendo, Victor X, and Generalissimo all punched in the middle of the track. Around the clubhouse turn is Joey's boy ranging up alongside Price Polly, a length and a half, and Sunset Star, Generalissimo two lengths back along the rail, and Victor X and Kendo. Along the back track, Sunset Star is making his move between horses. And now it's Sunset Star, Joey's boy, and Price Polly neck and neck with Generalissimo closing in the center of the track. And now, down the stretch to the finish, it's Sunset Star and neck over Joey's boy and Price Polly. It's Sunset Star and Joey's boy and rising up alongside Generalissimo. It's Sunset Star and Generalissimo. Sunset Star and Generalissimo. And it's Generalissimo the winner. Sunset Star second, and a photo between Joey's boy and Price Polly for show money. Okay, Clark. You showed us how it works. No. No, what happened? How could you do this to me? Look, you don't have to put on that Marvin act for us. We figured it right. You didn't have a system. You just got hot and ran the luckiest streak I've ever seen. Yeah, but the 78000 that Joey's back. You don't think we'd have laid 78000 on a tip from a ghost, do you? We still got all our marbles. Now we got our money back. That's okay. You want my advice? Just don't make any more bets. When I got back to Hillary's apartment, she took one look at my face and she threw her arms around me joyfully. Oh, darling, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. You're glad? You're glad? You're happy I've lost all the money on me? I don't care about the money. I can see from your face you're out of trouble. And that's all that matters. I promise not to make another bet. Oh, that's marvelous. I've got you back again. Well, you never lost me. But there's one thing that really bugs me and will as long as I live. I know I really heard Lou's voice. But I suppose you did. Why should that bother you? I'll never know. Was he really getting advance information? Or was he just riding a lucky streak? You've overlooked another possibility, darling. What's that? That Lou is truly a wonderful friend who saw what was happening... And wanted you and me to live happily and safely ever after. Of course, there are some questions to which there are no answers. And I'm sorry that I can't choose for you between the three alternatives and tell you which one is true. There are always skeptics, and they will say that Jason Clark only imagined he heard the voice of his friend. I'll be back with another interesting question shortly.
question that intrigues me about today's tale of friendship and the compulsive gambler is if indeed Lou Marvin was really sending messages from the spirit world to his friend and getting a vicarious pleasure from making bets through Jason, what happened to Lou when he could no longer gamble? Did heaven or Lou make some other arrangement? cast included Mason Adams, Marion Selby, Mandel Kramer. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. We'll just let you cool off in this cell for a bit, Mr. Leach. Sheriff, I am legally entitled to make a phone call. Mm-hmm. Go right ahead. If you can find a phone in here. I want an explanation, Sheriff. I want an explanation of what is going on. Doesn't everybody? I am legally entitled to hear the charges against me. You had your chance to leave peaceably, boy. You know, you're not going to get away with this. I, I, I am a reporter, Sheriff. I am here on assignment if I'm not back in Dallas in three days, my boss is going to start making inquiries. Well, he can go right ahead and do that. He won't find a single person in this town who will admit that you was ever here. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Most of us move through familiar surroundings each day. Our lives involve a certain amount of routine. We see the same faces and hear the same voices. But there are lines of work that require daily confrontations with the new and the unknown. Such a job is journalism. It's said that a reporter never covers the same story twice. There are some stories he might wish he never covered once. I think you're just imagining things, Mr. Leach. If that's so, then why am I in jail? How should I know? I was only doing my job. I'm sorry about it. Darrell, no one knows I'm here. You're the only one who can help me. I'm sorry, Mr. Leach, but I've got my job, too. Our mystery drama, The Grandee of Terra Loco, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Percy Granger and stars Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. In journalism, truth is held up as a standard. But truth is a slippery word. Presumably, all reporters try to be truthful in everything they write. But the word itself is often taken for granted, unless the story is unusually controversial. Mm -hmm. Covering a social tea or a local fundraising drive, for example, reporters are likely to think of themselves striving more for accuracy than truth. What is the difference? We could say accuracy means getting the facts straight, but truth means getting the facts 
We are in the newsroom of a paper in a large Texas city. Rich. Hey, Richie. Come here. Uh, yes, Mr. Hankey. Shut the door behind you. Yes, sir. Bridget tells me you're on to a hot story. Well, sir, I, um... And you want permission to go to Ryland, Texas to cover it? Mm, yes, sir. Now, first of all, where is Ryland? Well, it's in the western part of the state, uh, about five miles from the Mexican border. Uh-huh. What is it, another smuggling story? <laughs> no, no. Uh, the mayor of Ryland, a man named Elisha Stevens, just died. He was assassinated? Uh, no, no. He seems to have died of natural causes. Well, so what's the angle? Well, apparently he cut quite a figure. He ruled the community virtually unchallenged for over 40 years. Oh, now I get it. We're talking about graft here, political corruption. No, we're talking about a man who knew everyone in town by his first name. Mm, he knew everyone in town by his first name. Richie, so far you're not making me want to rush out and buy a newspaper. Oh, look, I'm tired of covering nothing but murder trials and rising taxes. I... I want to do a feature article on this man. I, I I think it's time we paid tribute to an honest politician. The last of a vanishing breed, the the local folk hero. An elder statesman in small-town America. Elder statesman, small-town USA. Not bad. Still not page one, but it's not classified as either. Look, just, just give me... Just give me three days to go out there and I'll prove to you news doesn't have to be bad to be interesting. I'll bet. How long did you say this guy Stevens was the local kingpin? Forty years. I have yet to hear of anyone who can survive in public life that long without getting some mud on his boots. Well, who knows? It, it may start a trend. No. Now, I bet you at dinner at the Cattlemen's Club, the guy was a tarnished angel just like all the rest of them. Come in. Uh, hi. Uh, are you um, uh, Mr. Fred Perkins? Oh, that's right. Oh, uh, you're the new mayor of Ryland? Well, I'm a city manager. I'm just filling in here till new elections are organized. That year, our former mayor died rather well, unexpected last week. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, that's why I'm here. Oh? I uh, wanted to speak with you about him. I gather he was a very popular man. Yeah, that's right, Mr. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Mr. My uh, name is Richard Leach. All right. Well, uh, Elisha Stevens was beloved by every person in his town. May I uh, ask what your interest is? Uh, I'm with the Dallas Sentinel. You, you are a reporter? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, I'm planning to do a story, uh, an in-depth profile on Mr. Stevens' life. Ah, well, I'd certainly be glad to help you out if I can. Thanks. Uh, you mind if I uh, turn on my tape recorder? Oh, no, 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 not, not at all. Oh, hip self. Thank you. They, they do make some people nervous. <laughs> well, you know, you'll find uh, Ryland a real friendly place. You know, I'll start off by telling you as a matter of local pride that uh, we are the home of the world's largest tumbleweed. Yes, I... <laughs> I noticed that in the town square. Yeah. Now, uh, about uh, about Mr. Stevens... Well, Elisha Stevens, Mr. Leach, was Ryland. Now, most Texans, you know, dream of building empires, but Elisha dreamed of building a community. Now, this county was desert when he and Lucy arrived in 1925. Terra Loco, they called it. It's a crazy lad, that's what that means. Because so many folks went mad from the heat and lack of water. Now, Elisha set out to change all that. Now, he built an agricultural station that reclaimed half the county from the desert. Now, he is responsible for the finest public school system in West Texas. Why, why the story goes, he's even the one who roped that big tumbleweed out in the town square. You know, someone once called him Grandi a Terra Loco. One name stuck ever since. Hmm. Uh, what would you say was his single most important contribution? A personal example he set by his strength of character. He entered public life as a reform candidate, didn't he? In 1936, ran for county judge. <laughs> Boy, we was having real border problems then. Smuggling was real bad. You know, local officials was involved, and organized crime had their eyes on making Ryland a major crossing for all kinds of things. But, you know, Lasha put... Put on the robe, and, well, he put a stop to that. I mean, now, real quick. Uh, is Mrs. Stevens still alive? Oh, yeah. Man. Where does she live? Huh? Oh, well, uh, hey, listen, I, 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 I wouldn't go to see if I was you. Oh? Why not? Well, 
Well, I just wouldn't think she'd want to be disturbed right now. You know, you know how it is. Mm. Now, how did Stevens die? Hmm? I beg your pardon? Uh, how, how did how did he die? Huh? Oh, oh yeah, uh, it was coronary. A uh, heart attack? Yeah, 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 yeah. In layman's terms, that, that'd be what happened. It wasn't expected. Well, why do you say that? Well, I'm just repeating what you said a few moments ago, that his death was, was sudden. Oh, well, I see. Well, yes. Uh, yes did well. Stevens have a record of a heart condition? No, 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 no. Oh, of course, he he worked hard right up to including the day it happened. Uh, in fact, you know, he died right in this chair where I am sitting. Was an autopsy performed? Mm, no, I don't know. Well, who was the attending physician? Uh, Dr. Jonas Green. Uh-huh. And and uh, who discovered the body? I did. Oh. And from here he was taken to the Memorial Hospital? Hmm. Hey, you turned off the tape machine. Something wrong? No, I just... Could you give me directions to the hospital? Well, what, what's, what's the matter? Mr. Perkins, is, is, is there any possibility in your mind of, of foul play? Oh, Oh, that's ridiculous. I'd like to double-check the medical report on his death. Well, you have her own car? Oh, yeah, sure. Mm. All right, then. And you go right back up Sims Avenue here to Main Street. Yeah. yeah. Then you turn left and go on straight about half a mile. Uh-huh. Uh, the hospital's right there. You can't miss it. Jeez. I'm out in the country. Got over two miles, no sign of a hospital anywhere. Oh, oh, good. There's someone. Uh, hey, uh, uh, excuse me. Yeah? Uh, I, I, I'm looking for Memorial Hospital. Well, mister, I hope it ain't an emergency because you're going plumb in the wrong direction. Hospital's back that way nearly three miles. I, c- I could have sworn he told me to turn left. Well, Thanks. Thanks very much. Memorial Hospital. Yeah, uh, Dr. Banfield is in consultation, Mr. Slocum. Now, I'll have him call you. No, Mrs. Slocum, I wouldn't worry. It's probably just your highs again. Hey, goodbye. Uh, ex- excuse me. Yes? Uh, I'd like to speak to Dr. Jonas Green. Yes, he- what is your name? Uh, Richard Leach. Oh, I'm sorry, but Dr. Green's on vacation. I beg your pardon? He's on vacation. He won't be back for three weeks. Huh. Well, perhaps there's someone else I could speak to. I, I'm a reporter with the Dallas Sentinel. I'm doing a feature article on the life of Elisha Stevens. Yes? Well, I, I, I'd like some information. I'm sorry, but all our files are private. Oh, yes, I, I, I understand that, of course. But uh, isn't there anyone I, I could uh, talk to who was on duty at the time Mr. Stevens' body was brought in? No. No? I don't know, sir. You'll have to excuse me. I'm quite busy. I spoke with the undertaker who prepared Mr. Stevens' body for burial, uh, Mr. Oh, Terry Vernon? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, sir? Could c- come back. Oh, dear. It's it switchboard. He just left. I think he's going over to Terry Vernon's place. Well, hello, Mr. Leach. Mr. Perkins. Hey, you're right. We have met again. Huh. Well, according to the phone book, this is a Mr. Vernon's address. Yeah, well, it is. Oh, I, I'm afraid you just missed him. Uh-huh. Uh, where is he? He's gone on vacation. I see. Uh, along with Dr. Green. Well, now that is possible. They both like to fish. You know, Mr. Perkins, hmm? I, I have a feeling you're lying. <laughs> well, it's a free country, son. What are you doing here? They're man in the store. Yeah, I don't believe you. Now, look, we are a small town, Mr. Leach. Now, we try to help each other out. Now, what can I do for you? You have a body you won't bury? Why did you give me the wrong directions to the hospital? Well, I told you to go down Sims and turn right on Main Street, didn't I? Uh, no, no, you, you said turn left. Turn left? Yeah. Oh, well, well, maybe I did. Or, or, or maybe there's something wrong with your hearing. Now, I can assure you there is nothing wrong with the way I hear. Well, then, good. 
because then there'll be no mistake when I tell you to forget this story you wanted to write on Elisha Stevens. What? That's right, Mr. Leach. Forget it. And leave Rylan now for good. Every young reporter dreams of the big scoop, the big story that will bump the planned headlines off the front page. Many reporters willingly take assignments they know might involve danger. But what about the reporter who goes out to cover a harmless story only to discover there is far more there than meets the eye? I shall return shortly with Act Two. All the news that's fit to print is a motto any newspaper would agree with. But sometimes those they write about might take exception. Beneath the respectful calm of a small town in mourning for its leading citizen, darker currents are beginning to surface. Elisha Stevens, the departed mayor, was ostensibly liked by one and all, but was there an unknown skeleton in his closet? Or is it the townspeople themselves who have something to hide? Our correspondent has been told in no uncertain terms to leave at once. Now... If you were an enterprising and curious young reporter, what would you do? Yes? Uh, Mrs. Stevens? Yes? Hi, my name is Richard Leach. I'm a reporter with the Dallas Sentinel. Why, how do you do? Well, frankly, I'm not sure. I, I came out here to do an article on your late husband. You travel all this way? Yeah. Wow, how nice. Oh, please, do come in. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. We, uh, we can sit here in the front parlor. Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, I'm sure this is a difficult time for you. Yes. Yes, it is, but I don't mind. Oh, Elijah would be so surprised to think someone from a big city like Dallas wanted to do a story on him. Well, evidently, so are some other people. Oh? I seem to be encountering some opposition. Oh? Not to mention some downright hostility. Why, that's most surprising. But why? I don't know, ma'am. I went to see the acting mayor, Fred Perkins. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I don't wish to alarm you unduly, Mrs. Stevens, but Mr. Perkins was clearly disturbed when I told him the purpose of my visit. And he seemed particularly reluctant to discuss the details of your husband's death. Oh, Fred Perkins loved Elisha like his own father, Mr. Leach. Well, I should think that naturally he'd be reluctant to want to talk about his passing. Oh, uh, w would you like some... Elderberry wine. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I could understand that, Mrs. Stevens, but... I mean, would this reluctance extend to lying to me? You mean telling an untruth? And physically threatening me? Oh, my. I, mean, I asked Mr. Perkins for a direction to your local hospital. I, I, I wanted to speak with the attending physician at the time of your husband's death. Oh, yes, that would be Jonas Green. He's a very nice man. Yeah, Perkins deliberately misled me. And by the time I finally did reach the hospital, I, I was stonewalled by a nurse who, <laughs> who sounded very much like she'd been coached on what to say. And what did she say? She gave me a song and dance about Dr. Green being on vacation. Oh, but I, I believe he is. Is the undertaker on vacation, too? You mean Terry Vernon? Well, I don't know about uh, that. I went to Vernon's from the hospital and I never got past the front door. I was met on the porch by Mr. Perkins, who was obviously tipped off by the nurse, who was obviously coached by Mr. Perkins. He made it quite clear that he wanted me to drop the story on your husband and get out of town. Oh, my, that doesn't sound like Fred at all. He's such a nice man. Mrs. Steele, are, are, tell me, are you satisfied that your husband's death was a natural one? What? Why, yes. I mean, Ryland is only five miles from the border. There must be highly vested interests with good reason to want a man like your husband out of the way. But who? Yes, who indeed. 
So far, I've got an acting mayor, a nurse, a doctor, and an undertaker as prime candidates. Oh, alas, I hadn't an enemy in this town. Uh, perhaps. What started out as a feature story in his honor is running up against something that's taking on all the symptoms of a cover-up. Oh, well, what you told me is distressing, Mr. Leach. And I can understand how you feel. But all I can say is... To the best of my knowledge, your suspicions are groundless. I came here for a very special reason, Mrs. Stevens. Your husband represents something decent in political life. He, he was an inspiration. Something we're very much in need of at the moment. <laughs> Elisha was by no means impossibly perfect. Now, do you intend to go ahead with your article? I wonder who that could be. Uh, just, just a moment, just a moment, Mrs. Stevens. But before you answer that, just, just let me have a look out the window. Well, well what do you see? Uh huh. There's a police car in the driveway. Why, it's Joe Pickard's car. He's our sheriff. I wonder what he could want. Yeah, and there's Fred Perkins with him. I'm sorry, Mr. Leach. I'm going to have to answer the door. No, no, wait, no, wait, wait, Mrs. Stevens. Look, I, I, I don't know what's going on, but I got a very strong suspicion. They're here to get me. Oh, now, Mr. Leach, I'm sure you're oh, wrong. Will, will you do something for me? Here, uh, this, this is the phone number of my editor in Dallas. Uh, his name is Ed Hankey. Now, if anything happens to me, I want you to call uh, him. Mr. Leach. Mr. Stevens. Joe Baker. Please, Mrs. Stevens, I'm beginning to think you may be the only person in this town I can trust. Well, uh, yeah, all, all right. I'll just hide this slip of paper where they won't find it. Now, now, now are you ready? Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Why, why, Sheriff, I, how are you? I'm sorry to disturb you, Miss Stevens. And Fred. <laughs> oh, what a surprise. Now, yeah, well, I'm looking for a young fellow by the name of Richard Leach. Well, he is here. Would you like to come on in? Yeah, well, and uh, actually, we'd just as soon speak with him out here on the porch. Is something the matter? Nothing you need to be concerned about, Miss Stevens. I just happened to notice that the inspection sticker on his car is expired. Well, that's not true, Sheriff. You, Mr. Richard Leach? Uh, that's him. If we could just have a word with you outside. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, Mrs. Stevens. Uh, I'll be right back. Uh, of, of course. Well, now, young fella, Mr. Perkins here says he asked you to leave town. Is that right? I am here to write an article on the late Elisha Stevens, Sheriff. That doesn't answer my question. Okay, yes, he did. But there's no law I know of. Mr. Leach, you're looking at the law. The law in Ryland, anyway. Miss Perkins asked you to leave. I'm ordering you to. Sure, sure. I'll be only too glad to go, Sheriff. After I've got my story. Then I've got no choice but to put you under arrest. What? <laughs> what? What? For? Let's go, Mr. Leach. Oh, you, you, you're, you're in cahoots with the rest of them, eh? Uh, just just what is it you're covering up, Sheriff? Huh? Mr. Perkins? Do you intend to come under your own state? I want to know how and why Elisha Stevens really died. Okay, Fred. What? Oh. Let's, let's get him away from here, quick! We'll just... Let you cool off in this cell for a bit, Mr. Leach. Sir, I am legally entitled to make a phone call. Mm -hmm. Go right ahead, if you can find a phone in here. I want an explanation, Sheriff. I want an explanation of what is going on. Doesn't everybody? I am legally entitled to hear the charges against me. You had your chance to leave peaceably, boy. You know, you're not going to get away with this. I, I, I am a reporter, Sheriff. I am here on assignment. If I'm not back in Dallas in three days, my boss is going to start making inquiries. Well, he can go right ahead and do that. He won't find a single person in this town who will admit that you was ever here. Yeah, here you go, fella. It's time for supper. Well, I, 
Just slide it to you under the bars here. Thanks. Well, I'm afraid it's only Franks and Beans. Sorry, I, I can only cook what they give me money for. Yeah. You the jailer? Yeah, that's right. My name is Daryl. How long are you in here for? I don't know. Well, what did you do? I don't know that either. Do you? Huh? Mm. No, nobody ever tells me nothing. <laughs> my, my name is Richard Leach. Uh, has, has there been any activity on my behalf? Leach. Mm, not that I've overheard. You, you haven't heard? And no phone calls? No no inquiries? No, no, no. And you're the only a prisoner. There hasn't been a peep all day. Uh, I hope Mrs. Stevens made that call. Mm. He, you're a friend of Mrs. Stevens? Yeah. Oh, I, I think Mrs. Stevens is just about the greatest lady in the world. I'm a friend of hers, too. You are? Mm-hmm. I do things for her she wouldn't think of entrusted to nobody else. I take care of that lawn of theirs, and I do all the fix-it work on their house. Darrell, hmm? Darrell, would you, would you do me a favor? Oh. Would you... Would you go over to Mrs. Stevens' house and tell her that oh. I am here? Oh, no, I, I couldn't do that. Sheriff Pickard wouldn't like it. Please, Darrell, she, she may not realize that I've been arrested. Well, if you was really a friend of hers, well, what, what are you doing here in the jail? Well, that's just it. See, there's been a mistake. Oh. Well, I'd like to, Mr. Leach, but if Mrs. Stevens was to come over here and raise Cain... Well, I'd lose my job. Uh, Darrell, Darrell, hmm? uh, you, you, you don't understand. Hmm. Mrs. Stevens is in danger. Danger? Yeah. From who? I I am a newspaper reporter. I came out here to do a story on her husband. And somebody doesn't want that story told. Oh, master, you're imagining things. The story of Elisha Stevens ought to be in the school books. He looked out after the poorer people in this town like they was his own brother. Saw to it, no one went hungry, and if necessary, out of his own pocket, too. Was he wealthy? Oh, sure. He owns that farmland between here and the Mexican border. I see. So you're saying somebody don't want this story told? It, it just don't make sense. Obviously. Then why am I in jail? Oh. Well, you'd be surprised how many prisoners ask the same thing. They all swear up and down. <laughs> They're innocent. Uh, Darrell. Uh, Darrell, wait. Darrell. Nobody knows I'm here. <laughs> about what you said, that she might be in danger. I figured I just owed her too much to take that chance. You know, job or no job. You told her I was here. Damn. Uh, what did she say? Well, you were right. Sheriff Peckard had told her you had just decided to leave town. She had no idea you was in jail. Uh, and? And she told me to tell you not to worry about a thing. She still had that phone number you give her, and she was going to call your boss in Dallas first thing this morning. Those were her exact words? Yes, sir. She told me to tell you that she'd take care of everything. Now, Mr. Peckard. What are you doing? Huh? Oh, oh, I was just bringing the prisoner his breakfast. Where'd you go last night after you got off work? Oh, I went home. Now, Darrell, you're not telling me the truth. <laughs> no, sir. It's true. I know you're lying, Darrell, because I got a witness. And she can dispute every word you're saying. Mrs. Stevens. Richard Leach, I am shocked. Shame on you for trying to smuggle illegal messages out from the Ryland City Jail. <laughs> a caution in the Old Testament amongst Solomon's Proverbs, which Richard Leach would have done well to heed. 
It warns the wise man to beware to whom he speaks, for his words are like a weapon. And any weapon in the hands of the wrong person can be deadly. I shall return shortly with our third act. Whatever kind of shirt you're into, get into an arrow. Hey, Jim, that's a fantastic wool shirt. Oh, thanks, it's uh, an arrow. An arrow? Hmm. Whatever kind of shirt you want, arrow's got it. I love that turtleneck Hank's wearing. I bought it for him. It's an arrow. Whatever kind of shirt you're into, when it comes to shirts, things are changing, but men are still changing into Arrow. Arrow gives you every style and all the confidence you expect from an Arrow. That shirt looks great with your suit. Sure, it's an Arrow. Whatever kind of shirt you're into, get into an Arrow. Whatever kind of shirt you want, Arrow's got it. Arrow makes all kinds of shirts for all kinds of men. That's why we're known as America's shirt maker. We were speaking of truth, which unfortunately seems to be in very short supply around the town of Rylan at the moment. We know that the ways of a small and isolated community can sometimes seem strange to the outsider. But consider the extremity of Richard Leach's plight. In jail, for reasons unknown, unable to call for help, and unable to find a single sympathetic ear. Mrs. Stevens. Sheriff, here's that piece of paper I told you about. The one on which Mr. Leach wrote the phone number he wanted me to call. Oh, well, thank you, Miss Stevens. I'm sorry you had to get involved in this at all. Oh, I don't mind. You have an unpleasant job, and I wouldn't want to make it any harder. Mrs. Stevens, did the sheriff force you to do this? Not at all. I'm here of my own free will. I have a right to know the charges against me. And I have a right to make a phone call. Mrs. Stevens, both of these things have been denied me. What? Is this true? Yeah. Why, of course it isn't. Mr. Leach, you know that's a downright lie. What? You know we let you make not one but two phone calls. And the charges against you have been clearly stated. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Mrs. Stevens, the sheriff isn't telling you the truth. I haven't been allowed to call anyone. Nobody knows I'm here. Look, you must help me. There's a conspiracy here that involves a great number of people in this town. Something is being hidden. And, and if you don't help me, I... I I'm, I'm afraid. Mrs. Stevens, I... I'm afraid. Uh, young man, I do have a certain amount of influence, that is true. And I trust a small measure of respect. It would be both foolish and wrong of me to presume upon either by telling Mr. Pickard here how to do his job. You're, you're, you're all in this together, aren't you? Good day, Mr. Leach. And may God bless you. Well, now, Mr. Leach, if you have no more tricks up your sleeve, I think we can get on to the next order of business. What's that? Darrell. Uh, yes, sir? Go across the street and fetch Fred Perkins here, will you? Packard? Darrell said to come on over. I think the coast is all clear now. Miss Stevens is gone. You mean... You, you mean she she's not involved in this? No, 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 not at all. <laughs> Look, I, I... I just don't understand what's happening. I mean, it's... This is like a night a nightmare. But, gee, for all I know, I, I did make two phone calls. Now, Mr. Leach, just calm down. All right, all right, just do it. Just, just do whatever you're going to do to me. And let's get it over with. I... Hey, Pickard, didn't you tell him anything? <laughs> Oh, I waited for you. You wait. Mr. Leach, I am sorry. Now, I know we've gone about this all wrong, and it, it's just that when you coming out here just took us by surprise. What? what? 
Well, what Fred is trying to say is we've been a little rough on you, and we want to apologize. Well, wait, wait, wait. What, 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 are, you, what are you doing? No, get, get away. Stay, stay away from me. Mr. Lee, no. you're free to go. Uh, 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 I'm free? That's right. What's the trick? Now, there is no trick, son. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm, so, I'm sorry, fellas. <laughs> No, I'm not going to make it that easy for you. Yeah, yeah, prisoner shot while trying to escape. Here's your billfold and your car keys no. and everything else we took off your downstairs. No, 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 I... Go ahead, go ahead, take them. It's all right. Now, listen, we just had to keep you here until we found out whether or not you'd aroused Mrs. Stevens' suspicions when you went by her place yesterday. I... I don't get it. Yeah, well... Elisha Stevens didn't die of a heart attack, son. He took his own life. He committed suicide? That's correct. And that's your conspiracy, Mr. Leach. That's what me and Fred and the folks at the hospital and Terry Vernon and every other citizen in this town is conspiring to keep secret from Miss Stevens. Yeah, unfortunately, no one thought to tell Daryl. No, oh, well, that, that was a close call when you persuaded him to go see her. It was fortunate she came to see us. You see, the fellow you picked to be your messenger, well, <clears throat> Daryl's not all there, if you know what I mean. Anyway, anyway, I apologize for the crude way I handled the whole affair. <laughs> Look, are you two under the assumption that I am buying all this? What? I mean, you think I believe what you're telling me? Well, it's the truth. Now, listen. You have seen Mrs. Stevens. She is no longer a strong person. Now, protecting her from the truth about her husband's death is, well, let's just say it's something we want to do for her. And for him, too. His memory. How he died wasn't an honest reflection of his life. But why would the legendary grandee of Terra Loco want to take his own life? The way you've talked about him, he sounds too good to be true. No, no, not you have got to understand, son, that Elisha served this town selflessly and tirelessly for 40 years. And he was never, I mean, never anything less than shrewd and honest. Well, maybe it was our fault. You know, we got so used to having him in the mayor's chair, we, we just didn't want to let him go. He was 81 years old two years ago when election time came around. He wanted to retire, but with just the thought of it sent folks into kind of a panic. Maybe it wasn't a healthy situation, but that's how it was. So you're protecting yourselves, too, with all of this? Yeah, I suppose we are. You still haven't told me why he killed himself. Well, he had allowed himself to be swindled. It was all in a note he left. Was it a large sum? Well, for these parts, yeah. I think the worst of it for him, though, was that it was public money. Municipal funds. How did he kill himself? He took an overdose of the various medications he was on. How was he swindled? Uh, well, and apparently some fella impersonating a Texas Ranger came into his office. He, he claimed he was trailing some art smugglers and needed instant cash to make a purchase so he could arrest them in the act. And Elisha personally took him to the bank. Sam Merrill, the teller, he told us Elisha wouldn't even let him check the Ranger's credentials. He just give this boy what he needs. That's the way Elisha did things. He took a man at his word. Yeah. And naturally, the man didn't return. No. And this is what Stephen's suicide note said, and and you believed it. Well, of course we believed it. I mean, that is the most fantastic story I've ever heard. Well, I'd say Stevens was in cahoots with this guy, and, and, and the fellow double-crossed him. Oh, no, I, I don't think so, Mr. Leach. Elisha never would have done anything like that. Well, in any case, I've never met the person yet who, if given a choice... Wouldn't prefer to be known as a villain rather than a sucker. No, I, I don't think Elisha would have made up that story. But how could, how could any man in possession of his senses fall? Oh, I see. Elisha's only sin was struggling to keep up appearances. 
It's not a very pretty thought, the spectacle of that old man being conned by a charlatan. In the old days, there wasn't a shrewder customer around than Elisha. No one ever put a thing over on him. Well, sure isn't the story I expected to get when I came here. You, uh, you ain't planning to print this now, are you? Oh, yeah, of course I am. Well, then you missed the point, son. We don't want it printed. Think of Mrs. Steve. But I, I, I don't owe anyone in this town a thing, at least of all her. And she walked out of here content to leave me in this cell to rot. You ain't out of here yet, boy. Are you threatening me now? I'll thrash you within an inch of your life before I let you humiliate Miss Stevens or the town of Riley. Now, 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 now. Hold off, Packard. Now, you're just going to make it worse. Sooner or later, someone be bound to find out anyway, so let him go. Let him print the story. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. That's exactly what I intend to do. <laughs> I'm out of this town, the better I'm going to feel. Mr. Leach. Mr. Stevens. I've been waiting out here to speak to you. Well, you could have been waiting a long time, couldn't you? Oh, I knew they'd let you go. I'm sorry about how I had to act in there. But if they suspected I knew the truth, they might have taken it out on you. The... The tr- You mean you know? How Elisha died? Oh, Yes. But that's supposed to be Ryland's big state secret. Uh, how do you know? The day he died, I stopped by his office. There's a back door, a private entrance I often used. No one saw me. He was lying there, his head on the desk. I thought he was asleep. Then I saw the note. And you read it? All I could think of was... What a silly, silly, sad way for it to end. But you didn't tell anyone. I I wanted to be alone for a while. Then, when Fred Perkins and Dr. Green came by with the story of the heart attack, I realized what they were up to. So I just kept my mouth shut. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Mrs. Stevens. I mean, if you know the truth anyway, there's no reason the story can't be printed in its entirety, including this final chapter. Oh, no. No, you mustn't. That's what I've been waiting here to make sure you understood. It means so much for these people to feel they are protecting me. You mustn't take that away from them. Oh, oh, oh. you don't know the newspaper business, Mrs. Stevens. The story is sensational. I mean, an entire town conspiring to shield an old woman from the truth about her husband's death? Yes, and by printing it, you destroy it. But so what? I, I mean, I've been beat up and, and terrorized for 24 hours by, by a lot of ignorant country people. I... I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Stevens. I, I didn't mean that. Excuse me. Well, goodbye then. You're wrong about one thing, though. Oh? I do know the newspaper business. Elisha and I founded the Culpeper County Courier together back in 1928. Now, you've heard a lot of facts about Elisha's life. But maybe you've wondered what it was about the man himself that made him the kind of person people are willing to go to such lengths for. Yeah? Let me tell you a little story. In 1929, there was a sensational murder. A wife killed her husband. Now, Elisha could have gained national recognition by publishing the story. And not only that, but the father of the murderess was a bitter enemy of Elisha's. And this was a chance to publicly humiliate him. But Elisha voluntarily withheld the story until after the trial, to avoid prejudicing the jurors. And then he published it. Well, I thought he was going to. But he looked at me and said, the trial's over. What's the point of publishing it now? If the girl's father was his enemy. Well, that's what my reaction, too. 
Elisha shook his head and said, Lucy, I hate that fella because he's a crook, he's a coward, and he's an atheist. But not because his daughter killed her husband. Was the man grateful? No. He's the one that gave Elisha the nickname the Grandee of Terra Loco. He meant it as an insult. But it stuck as a title. Richie, you're back. Good morning, Mr. Hanky. Come on in, come on in. So, uh, how was the, the name of that place? Rylan? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, uh... Got a better story than I expected. Oh. Did your homespun hero turn out to have feet of clay after all? Uh, Mr. Hankey, I don't know if you're going to believe this. It's, uh... It's really pretty amazing. Well, I'm waiting. Did you know that Rylan is the home of the world's largest tumbleweed? We're familiar with the phrase... It will all work out in the end. There are times, however, when we might wonder plaintively why just once things couldn't work out before the end. But then, who's to say when the end is? Does it ever really come for anything or anyone as long as memory keeps them alive? I shall be back shortly with a final word. Hi, Pat Summerall. True Value Hardware Stores are offering their fall shopper circular you can't do without because it's full of values you'll probably be needing soon for do-it-yourself projects. Like the Stanley Surfform Plane. It can give you a smooth finish on wood, plastic, tile, or soft metal. And the handle is shaped to give you a comfortable grip for sure even control. The Stanley Regular Cut Surfform Plane is $4.75 in the fall shopper circular from True Value Hardware Stores. And for just $4.99... You can invest in a tool you'll find hundreds of uses for. The USM Electric Glue Gun dispenses hot melted glue that bonds in 60 seconds without clamping or waiting. See the Stanley Surform Plane and the USM Electric Glue Gun and the Fall Shopper Circular from participating True Value Hardware Stores and Home Center. True Value Hardware is more than just a name. It's a way of doing business that feels true. Elisha Stevens served his community selflessly for 40 years, but at the end made a single mistake. Was he then a tarnished angel? A cynic might say yes, but it was H.L. Mencken who pointed out that a cynic is a man who, when he smells flowers, looks around for a coffin. I'll leave the decision up to you. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Robert Dryden, Joan Shea, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. A formal announcement is expected tomorrow as the Pentagon makes plans to close some military bases and eliminate several thousand civilian jobs to save money. Good evening, this is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS Radio Network. CBS News Pentagon correspondent Ike Pappas reports the Defense Department sources say bases in some 20 states may be eliminated and at least 18,000 military and civilian jobs could be affected. Pappas says the Army wants to close two basic training centers, Fort Dix, New Jersey, and
in Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Several Air Force and Navy installations may also be shut down. United Press International reports that 85 bases in all would be shut down in a move to save up to $336 million a year. Congressional opposition could be formidable. Senator John Tower of Texas, the ranking Republican on the Senate Armed Services Committee, said the Carter administration continues to whittle away at our national security. Tower termed the military installation cutback plans short-sighted and irrational. More news in a moment. There's something you should know about pain. Muscle tension causes most headache pain. Inflammation often comes with body pain, such as muscle strain, backache, or if your doctor diagnoses tendinitis, inflammatory neuritis. Get Anison. Anison relieves headache pain, but more, Anison also reduces inflammation while it relieves body pain. For muscle tension headache or painful body ache, get Anison. Anison reduces inflammation while it relieves pain fast. Use only as directed. Hemorrhoids are nothing to be embarrassed about. Sixty million Americans sometimes suffer the pain and itch. And two of every three sufferers use Preparation H. In many cases, doctor-tested Preparation H gives prompt temporary relief from occasional pain and itch of hemorrhoidal tissues. Actually helps shrink swelling of tissues due to inflammation. If you suffer occasional hemorrhoidal symptoms, get Preparation H. Helps shrink swelling as it relieves pain and itch. Use only as directed. A House Armed Services panel has issued a review of President Carter's decision to pull American troops out of Korea. The investigation subcommittee says Korea is the most volatile and explosive place in Asia, and a basic American military force should be kept there until North and South Korea sign a peace treaty. Subcommittee Chairman Samuel Stratton, Democrat of New York, says the presence of American forces in Korea is a restraining influence. North Koreans uh, probably militarily would have no trouble... Uh, running over the South Koreans and uh, taking Seoul within a relatively short time. But they are reluctant to have to move over United States troops. And so we felt those troops should uh, remain in Korea, a basic force, and that would be roughly, I think, about uh, the two brigades that would remain after the first 6,000 were removed should remain there until real peace came in Korea. By a vote of 65 to 22, the Senate has gone on record in favor of delaying for three months President Carter's proposed $25 billion tax cut. The vote on the tax recommendation came as the lawmakers continued to write a preliminary federal budget. Despite today's action, one Democratic senator, Wendell Anderson of Minnesota, said the president's tax cut plan still has a good chance in the upper chamber. I think it's going to pass on the Senate side. We're talking about... Uh... $25 billion, 17 of that would go to uh, individuals, the rest for uh, corporations. I think that uh, most senators feel the Social Security tax increase of last uh, December was a, uh, a big mistake, and this uh, tax reduction would in large measure uh, take some of the onus off of that. At today's news conference, President Carter said he does not intend to delay or scale down his tax cut request. Officials in Rome tonight issued arrest warrants for the suspected kidnappers of former Italian Premier Aldo Moro. Still no word on Moro's fate, and the government continues to refuse to free 13 Red Brigade terrorists in exchange for the ex-Premier's life. Italian President Giovanni Leone said today his country faces a wicked and bloody danger from the Red Brigades. Now this. The best interviews come out of the deepest research. Learn a lot about the person you're talking to. CBS News correspondent Mike Wallace, famous for his candid interviews on Mike Wallace at Large on CBS Radio. Recently, we talked to Mike, along with some of our other air personalities, and learned some interesting things about them all. Mike, for instance, didn't set out to be a journalist. I was going to be an English teacher. While Sports Times' Brent Musburger always knew that sports was it for him, nothing else really has been on my mind since I was six years old. Today in business, specialist Ray Brady started this way. I always liked to write, and I got involved with doing local radio, and it just grew on me, the whole business. I liked it more and more. Wallace, Musburger, Brady. Hear them and other afternoon and evening broadcasters like Walter Cronkite and Douglas Edwards, Monday through Friday on most of these CBS radio network stations. They're worth your time.
Labor Secretary Marshall had his turn today as a congressional panel continued hearings into labor racketeering. In yesterday's testimony, federal strike force officers accused the Labor Department of doing little or nothing about the influence of organized crime in unions. But Marshall says he is taking the problem seriously. He says the agents may have been exaggerating the extent of the problem, and he says he's setting up a new special office of investigations. This is Doug Poling, CBS News. You walk with your dog and you can be totally and utterly alone. If you want to talk to yourself, you can talk to yourself. I like sports because to me, sports is uncomplicated. I think what I do best as a sports announcer is just understanding what's going on. Kind of a sixth sense about where to go, what to ask when you're out on an interview. I guess I could call it a feel for sports. If I didn't think I was the best, then I shouldn't be in this business. Wayne is back. Sportscaster for News Watch 7. The News People. I'm Harlan Falk, Chief Barker for the Variety Club of Nebraska, Kent Number 16. On April 28th, 29th, and 30th, volunteers throughout the community will be asking people to give what they can to help local kids. It's a Variety Club annual tag day with all funds raised to support the programs of the University of Nebraska Meyer Children's Rehabilitation Institute right here in Omaha. This tag day, won't you please give what you can? Because kids right here need help right now. It's 9.07, time for the CBS Radio Mystery Theater. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. It stretches from the North Pole in the Arctic, passing a thousand miles west of the Hawaiian Islands, all the way to Antarctica and the South Pole. It girdles half the globe vertically, but it is horizontally that its magic exists. It is the 180th line of longitude called the International Date Line, and its magic is this. Cross it going west and you lose a day out of your life. But pass it traveling eastward, and you gain that day. An incredible gift of time. Just think about it for a little while. Mr. Catlett, which life are you living now? Come on, let's not hack around. I want to sleep. But not that long last sleep. I have two to go before that. One? What? One life, Steve Catlett. You sacrificed the other for the child you gave no chance to live. Our mystery drama, International Dateline, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Michael Tolan. It is sponsored in part by ARM. Allergy Relief Medicine, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The Electra's all washed and loaded, and you're on your way. You figured 300 miles the first day, but with all of Electra's luxury and room, you're out 400 miles before you know it. Not only that, but the EPA mileage estimates are 22 highway, 15 city, and 18 combined. That's with the standard 5.7 liter engine and automatic transmission. Of course, your mileage will vary depending on how and where you drive, your car's condition, and how it's equipped. And EPA estimates are lower in California. But it's nice to know that a car with as much prestige and elegance as Electra can also be efficient. Buick Electra, a car that can actually make you look forward to a long trip. Pretty sure you will have found you The amazing things you Electra models are equipped with GM-built engines supplied by various divisions. See your dealer for details. It happens somewhere every day. A blazing house and a fireman kneeling beside an overcome child. Come on, kid. Live. When the eyes flutter open, when the breath finally comes easy and regular, only then can the fireman relax and maybe take a little pride and pleasure from the special gift he's been given. It's a learned gift with a big name, mouth-to-mouth resuscitation, 
and it can literally bring people back from death. He's going to make it. Whenever you wonder where Red Cross money goes, think of this. Part of your money goes to train people in all walks of life to do what needs to be done when the chips are really down. Maybe you'll never need to be brought back to life with mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. Then again, maybe you will. Red Cross is counting on you to help. If you're young enough, I suppose a gift of one whole day, 24 hours, is a small thing. If you're old enough, it is a thing beyond price. Even if you're just sort of middling, it is a donation from the gods that boggles the imagination to conceive what it might mean and how it might be used. This is how one man was able to use it. His name is Steve Catlett. But for many reasons, everyone knows him as Cat. This story begins 35 years ago in a world gone mad, where most people in the Western Hemisphere measured their life expectancy in days or hours as death rained from the sky. What's the good word, Alfie? Not so good, Captain. The waste gunners took one bed in the chest. Half the tail section's gone and little bloater with it. Bomb bay doors won't close. What about the landing gear? Oh, the jerry's fixed that on us all right. We'll never get it down. The bombs all gone away? Oh, yes. We left our calling card. We, uh, we're going to make it home? We'll give it the old college try. Yeah, she flies like lead. I can hardly keep her trim. We'll be over the channel in a couple of minutes. Before we get there, you, Walter Guinness, Morton, whoever's left, better hit the silk. And end up a ruddy P.O.W.? Not likely. Not while it's still around. Well, it's either that or take a bath in the channel. I'll get you as near as old blighty as I can. What happens to you? I ditch her. I think I can answer for the rest of the chaps, Captain. We'll take our chances with you. I wouldn't give you odds. I would. They don't call you cat for nothing, do they? I could be stretching my luck this time. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Yank. Since you boys took over the Air Force, we British types have been running a little pool, see? We think that you always luck out. You have as many lives as your name. We figure you're right now with six down and three to go. What's that? It's the port engine. I'll have to feather her. Alfie, get on back there and strip her. Roger. Get all the weight overboard you can. Armaments, ammunition, the works. And do. And bring it in, cat. We're all riding on your luck. All my life I've been lucky. Well, lucky enough to know that it doesn't hurt to give the little lady a helping hand as much as you can. Like when Professor Samuels caught me cheating in the college boards. <laughs> it didn't hurt to know that he'd been fooling around with Linny Strom in the senior class. I would have gone on to college with a straight B average, too, if it hadn't been for the draft. I, uh, I lucked out there, too, because I happened to know old Horace Pool on the draft board was also running a betting pool on the side. During my senior year, I shaved points for him on the basketball games. As playmaker, that was a cinch. So he steered me out of the infantry or Marines or any of the tough services and into the Air Force. I had it all figured to fly a desk for the duration. But that's one time my luck deserted me. Cat, Alfie on the pipe. Do you read me? I read you. How are you doing? We've got everything on the board. We can pull loose. Feel any lighter? Well, we're still losing altitude. I want you to get rid of this radio and bail out. Where are we? Over the channel. Captain, the crew wants to stick with you and try to make it across. Not a chance. We're sinking like a stone. I want you all overboard while there's enough altitude to open your chutes. We'd rather stick with you. Bail out. That's an order. Well, why don't you go with us? And leave an uncontrolled B-17 wandering around? My place is with the plane. I just wish I had your guts. God bless you, Skipper. Over and out. We were wallowing unsteadily. I could almost feel each member of the crew as he jumped. But just as I'd hoped, that nearly thousand pounds of human cargo lightened the plane enough to give me a chance to make land. Just another case of giving Lady Luck a boost. I didn't envy the poor chumps I dumped, but my skin was more important than theirs. Now I could concentrate on getting it back in one piece. One in short tower. One in short tower. Emergency. Emergency one. This is little friend, Blue One. Do you read me? Do you read me? Over. Acknowledge. I'm feathering one engine. Tail section half gone. I am somewhere southeast of you. Altitude 5,000 and sinking fast. Can you get a fix on me? Impossible to see anything. 
Heavy overcast below. Losing altitude fast. How about if I hold the button down on radio and leave it open to... Hey, hold it a minute. Cloud break. Huh. Yes, I'm over land. I... Holy Toledo, I'm right on top of you. Hold your hats and stand by. I remember the plane landing and then shearing sideways before I had time to cut the engines. I could feel her want a nose flip and was fighting desperately to keep my control. I remember slithering sideways straight for the control tower and resting her somehow out of the skid. And then she was tipping forward. There was a tremendous ripping crash. Excuse me, nurse. Yes? Uh, Flight Lieutenant Alfred Patterson. I've got a chit here for medics says I can say hello to my pilot, uh, Captain Steve Catlett. How do you now, Flight Lieutenant? Your buddy, Steve Catlett, isn't saying hello to anyone. What do you mean? He had a pretty stiff crash landing about six weeks ago, bringing in a B-17. He's been in a coma ever since. Oh, yes, I know. I was his co-pilot. Oh. If he hadn't made me and the rest bail out, we'd be... Lying where he is now. Could, could I say a word to him? You can try, Lieutenant. Oh, excuse me, Lieutenant. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you can reach him. For a long time, I seemed to be circling around a deep, deep bowl that disappeared into complete darkness in the center of the earth. Round and down I went in a spiral in the dark until there was no light and no feeling. No smell, no taste, just nothingness. Except for the voice. You ready to come to me, Steve Catlett? No. Why not? Because I haven't lived out my life yet. Which life? My time here. You really believe that superstition of yours, Mr. Cat? Why shouldn't I? Everyone else believes it. Do they? Yes. So must you by now. What? You've come for me before. When I had the scarlet fever. Yes, I could have welcomed you then. When a girl tried to kick my hat off when I was six and she swung too high on the swing and the bolt fractured my skull. Yes, I was ready to welcome you then. When the boy fired the air rifle at me and just missed my eye. I should have insisted then. That was before. Before what? Before you changed. Before you began to stretch your luck. Before you finally committed yourself to my care. No. No, you don't own me. Not yet. You prefer to think so. Very well. I'll let you run your leash a little longer. If the conceit pleases you, you have two lives left to your name, Mr. Cat. Guard them carefully if you wish to stay away from me. Now there was a soft light luminous behind the blackness. On a cushion of air, I was being carried slowly upwards. And the beginnings of all my senses, except sight and voice, were returning. I was conscious of voices talking about me far away. He's quite a guy, isn't he? Salt of the earth. Mm. They don't come any better. I know I won't see his like again. Oh, don't say that. Why not? It sounds like an epitaph. Oh, Lord knows I didn't mean it that way. The last thing I'd want to see old Cat do is cash in his chips. Anyway, as me and the boys figured it, it ain't time yet. He still has two lives to go. What does that mean? Steve Catford, he's, he, he's like a cat, you know? Always manages to land on his feet. You know how pursuit pilots keep a score of all the jerrys they've shot down? Yes. Well... With Cat here, counting childhood accidents and all the rest through the Blitz, we made a joke that up to this last one, he's used up six lives. Oh, this one here would be the seventh. So he still has two to go. You think you'll come out of it? Oh, I do. It ain't his number yet. Why? You and the docs think he won't? Oh, I can't answer for the doctors. Only for myself. I don't think. I know he will. Oh, how? Because I want it so much. 
because I've prayed for it so much. <laughs> Ridiculous, isn't it? A man I've never really talked to. A man I don't even know. No, that, that isn't true. I've bathed him. I've shaved him. I've trimmed his hair. Held him in my arms. There's something between us. A, a bond that can never be broken. Well, not from my side, anyway. And I hope someday from his. He'd be a fool if he didn't grab it like a lifeline. <laughs> Any man would be lucky to have a woman like you, Lieutenant, uh, uh, what's your name? Elisa Wright. Oh, my upfront moniker's Alfred, uh, or Alfie for short. I'm pleased to know you, Elisa. Thank you, Alfie. Uh, oh, hey, uh, hey, it's him, the cat, he moved. Look, he's trying to open his eyes. He's coming around. Is there anything I can do? Yes, yes, get to the nurse's station and tell them to alert Dr. Sterrett and get him here fast. Roger! Uh, Oh, get, get the doctor. Yes, sir. Oh, well... Oh, yes. Where? Yes, darling, it's all right. Yeah. It's going to be all right. Come alive again. Suddenly, the darkness was being stripped away, veil by veil. The dark smoke lifting and the beginnings of light seeping in behind my closed eyelids. Don't try oh. to look at oh. Don't be afraid. It's all right. It's all right. You're home safe. At last I had the courage to open my eyes. And her face swam into view. Hey. Oh. It's something to wake up to. Where... Where the devil have I been? Oh, that doesn't matter. Just glad to see you back. Oh, who are you? Lieutenant Wright, your nurse. Oh, too right. Oh, very right. I'm, uh... Captain Steve Catlett, USAF. Yeah, that's that's my name. Am I... Am I back in the land of the living, or... Or is this heaven? You're back. Either way you figure it. Well, I could settle for either with you around. You, uh, you got a first name, Lieutenant Wright? Yes, Lisa. Mine's Cat. Short for lucky. <laughs> Looks like I haven't broken my streak. You brought your plane home safe? And some of the crew... No, I wasn't thinking of that. I was thinking about you. Oh. Well, somewhere along the line, I thought it was the end. And now it looks like a great new beginning. The luck still holds. <laughs> Of course, the essential thing about luck is that it's a one-way street. A pleasant and rewarding ride for the lucky, but there has to be the other side of it. The unlucky who come to the street from the wrong side and are never allowed to traverse it. What's ahead for Cat and Lisa? I'll tell you when I return shortly with Act Two. Life is for living, and Visa is there. Tokyo, Paris, Yugoslavia, the coast of Monaco, Copenhagen, Barcelona, Mexico, Alaska, Geneva, the Blue Mountain of Bay, Scotland, Ireland, Lisbon, London, the Blue Mountain of USA, Florida, Athens, Nicaragua, Hong Kong, Jamaica, Osaka, Granada, Oh, San Juan, Gibraltar, Milano, Jamaica, Lugano, is the most widely recognized card in the world. Visa, we're keeping up with you. If you're in business, I'd like a moment of your time. Being in business, you know how competitive your industry is. You know that to keep your share of the marketplace and to build and grow on that base, you must not let down, not for a moment. In the area of getting your message before the public, you know a wise advertising investment can help your efforts. The new KOO stations, AM and FM, now broadcast the features and programs that are reaching the people you want to reach. 
The prestige of CBS. Top sports and personalities with believability. Combined with a realistic and efficient rate structure. Well, it could mean one of the most effective and productive media purchases you've ever been involved with. For more information on how we could work together, for your continued growth and success, make note to contact Denny Christensen, General Sales Manager for KOOO AM and FM. We're here not only to entertain and inform, but also to help. Contact us during regular business hours. Once Steve Catlett returned to consciousness, his recovery was breathtakingly fast. So, it must be admitted, was his relationship with his nurse, Lisa Wright. Within a week after he had come out of coma, he was ambulant. Still, with the history of deep concussion, his doctors felt he should not yet be alone. A situation which was most welcome to him and Lisa. Ah, to be in England now that June is here. <laughs> You're misquoting Browning. He said April. He was in Italy busy hanky-panking with Elizabeth Barrett. I'm here now, and this is my month. What, what's the name of this little uh, slice of paradise? Upper Whittlecombe on Tansby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is there a lower Whittlecombe? I suppose, but that's for the hoi polloi. Oh, certainly. What we have here is much too good for the lower classes. With, uh, with one exception. Oh, what's that? When do we make it absolutely perfect? What does that mean? Oh, you know, Lisa. When do you move in with me? I may be sharing my furlough with your sick leave just to make sure you take care of yourself. But as a nurse. Nurse companion? Well, of course. When we dreamed up this little excursion, I, uh, I thought of you more as a companion. I hope I am. I try to be. Well, the days are not so bad, but the, uh, the nights are lonely. I'm right in the next room at your beck and call. Oh, no, not quite. Why not the same room? Two can live as cheap as one. Maybe the important word there is cheap. I know all supposed to be fair in love and war, but it doesn't work that way for me. I am the original old-fashioned girl. <laughs> you ever get me, it's going to be for good. I don't know how anyone so luscious can be so forbidding. I thought you loved me. I do love you. With all my heart, my soul. But unless you love me back as deeply and as strongly, you won't want to give yourself to me as completely as I would to you. And you shouldn't, unless you're sure. Once we're committed, I'll never let you go. And that's what I'm supposed to be scared of? Mm-hmm, that's right. A fate worse than death. Dear Lord, I hope it would never seem to be. <laughs> it won't. Hey, come on, Lisa, laugh. It's a pretty bright occasion. I'm, uh, I'm proposing. And for once, it's legal, moral, and binding. We'll be married as soon as the law allows. Oh, Cat, my darling. But in the meantime. Oh, there doesn't have to be any meantime. I've already spoken with the vicar. He's been waiting for my call for the last two days. I had no notion for being married, but I sure had one big king-size yen for Lisa Wright. So what the heck, if it pleased her? With a war looking like it would last forever, nobody figured to live long enough so it would come back to haunt us. Did I know that two days later it would be D-Day? And for the first time it began to look like there was an end of the tunnel somewheres. That meant I wanted no part of getting shot at again. So I wangled a desk job in London. Lisa's hospital was there, too, so we found a little flat and started to play at housekeeping. It was all right for a few months. And then I began to get the heebie-jeebies. Hey, Lisa, baby. What do you say? You want to go pup trotting? Oh, have a heart, Cat. I just came off a four-day shift. So it'll do you good to cut up a little. Cat? What? I don't feel very much like cutting up. Oh, what's the matter? Well, couldn't I just be tired? Oh, sure. Oh, you hate to be cooped up, don't you? No, I just thought it might be fun to cut up a few capers. Let me beg off, huh? It, it isn't just for myself. Wait, well, you're not sick or anything. Oh, I'm not sick. But I sure am anything. What do you mean? <laughs> you want to give me your hand? Oh, sure, but what do you... Quiet, quiet. 
This is a new experience for you. Come on, put it on my tummy. That's not so new. This is something else. Well, what do you feel? Hmm, nice. Putting a little weight, baby, but, uh... Surprise? You, you've got to be kidding. How's that for kicks? You've got to be kidding. You mean that... The age-old question? The same old answer? How are you going to like being a father? Oh, I made all the right noises. I hope Lisa didn't guess. But, I mean, this wasn't my bag at all. I was really locked in now. The anchor stuck fast. And as the war started to open up and horizons got brighter... I began to search around in my mind for the easiest way out from under. And that's when I met Stan Newcomb. Hey, this is really a jumping joint. Man, you got to know it. Hey, listen, boy, I got a couple of super gals lined up. You want to cut out? <laughs> You're talking to a married man. Well, what do you figure me for? But I ain't seen an old woman in two years. <laughs> you, you know how it is. Well, my wife is pregnant. It's kind of near her time. I, uh... I ought to be around. Why don't you give her a buzz and tell her things came up? What things? Well, like, uh, like, uh, like this. Now, are you happy in your spot? What spot? I mean in the armed forces. Now you bring it up, no. The way things are going, the heat is on to get all us pilots back up in the air again. And me, I've had that. Well, how'd you like to jump with me to the Pacific? <laughs> this war here is hot enough for me. I don't know. I uh, want to get tangled with the Japanese. Oh, 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 oh. This is no combat, friend. This is easy bucket. M-A-T-S. Military Air Transport Service. What's the poop? Well, you're based in Manila, Clark Field. You fly out transport from Manila to Guam, or Honolulu, maybe the States. A melt run. Best way I can think of to run out points and get separated. Hey, I like what you're saying, pal. Can you, uh... You help me get posted there? Could be. We could uh, talk about it later. But how about the girls I got on the line? How about them? Hello? Are you there? It's Cat, honey. How are you? I'm fine. Cooking up a storm for you. Uh, honey, I'm uh, I'm going to bomb out on you. Oh, no. Why? I can't tell you on the phone. Uh, new order's being cut. Uh, don't, uh, don't count on me tonight. But I'm due back on duty tomorrow morning. Ah, well, Operation Follow-Up, that's a service. Okay. Ah, there's a war on. We take it as it comes. The only thing is... Uh, hun, uh, hun, forgive me, but I gotta cut out now. Oh, sure. Okay, maybe it was just the wrong time. Could I know that? I mean, she wasn't due for a month... How could I know Lisa would go into labor that particular night? Or that the baby would be born dead? It was a boy. If only... Darling, where were you? The army says, jump, what are you going to do? What turned up so suddenly that was so important? Well, we can talk about that when you're feeling better. There's only one thing that can make me feel better, Cat. What? I want to get out of here and go home. So we can start another one to take his place. That really tore it for me. The last thing I ever wanted in my life was to be tied down. A wife was bad enough, but a kid. I figured I had a lucky escape. And now Lisa wanted to pin me down again. Well, it was time to get out from under. I went hunting Stan Newcomb. And by the time Lisa came home from hospital, I was all set. All the way to Manila? He's there? For what? You've done your tour? Couldn't you have ducked out? <laughs> Tell it to the brass. They didn't think so. What am I going to do without you? It isn't forever, Lisa. Well, maybe I can get transferred to the Pacific. Look, wait, why don't we just sweat it out? The war's got to end sometime. Meantime, my orders are cut, and I have to pull out. Is that what you really want, Cat? Oh, why would I want that? Oh, you better not. I warned you. You bought me for the duration. And that doesn't mean the war. It means all the way. I'll be waiting, Cat. However long it is. I'll be waiting. Okay, Lisa, so you'll be waiting. But I'm not ready to be tied down. You cramp my style. I should have the guts to tell you straight out, but... 
Somehow I'm not built that way. Two hours out of Hawaii, and we just crossed the International Dateline, Cat. How does it feel to jump straight from today right into tomorrow? <laughs> Great, Stan. Just my speed. I left all my worries behind me. Oh, I'm so relaxed, I think I'll hit the sack. Yeah, me too, buddy. See you in the Philippines. Yeah. <laughs> Man, this is the life. But which life, Steve? Do you know... You again. What do you want? Just the answer to a simple question. Which life are you living now, Mr. Cat? Oh, come on. Let's not hack around. I want to sleep. But not that long, last sleep. I have two to go before that. One. What? One, Steve Catlett. You sacrificed the other for the child. You gave no chance to live. But that wasn't my fault. If you had been there, you could have brought Lisa to the hospital in time. How do you know? It's my business to know such things and to teach you to believe them. Who are you? Who are you? The answer to that question lies in your heart. Huh? Uh, did you say something, kid? Uh, no, no, I... I just had a bad dream, that's all. Bad dream? Possibly. A man with as few ethics as Steve Catlett could well be prone to them. But what is the voice that speaks to him? His better self? Conscience? Remorse? Does it come from beyond him or from his inner soul? And can it help him spend his last life in a better fashion than his others? I shall return shortly with Act Three. We're going to stick our neck out and tell you something. It's hard to mix with Arrow. Arrow shirts. And the reason is so simple. America shirt maker is Arrow shirt. America's shirt maker has done it again with what is probably the best shirt collar ever made. Arrow's patented custom collar, and only Arrow's got it. It's a whole inch wider at the bottom than the top, just like your neck is. It's adjustable by a full half inch, and it's got a special notch so the neckband doesn't show over your top. America shirt maker is Arrow shirt. See why we're sticking our neck out. Stick your neck into an Arrow custom collar. America shirt maker is Arrow shirt. If we're not already your shirt maker, we ought to be. I'm excited about my life. I'm not wandering around. I'm really determined now. That's Kelly Blixton. She might still be working as a waitress if she hadn't gone to technical school. Instead, she's working as an electrician. I started my involvement in the electrical field approximately three years ago. And in retrospect, I was very confused about a lot of things at that time. I didn't feel very good about myself. I hadn't done anything. Now, after the number of years and the amount of study and the amount of work that I have put in and the discipline, it's not that I feel I have achieved something. I know I have achieved something. I really like who I am a lot. If you think technical school might be what you're looking for, write Careers, Box 111, Washington, D.C., 20044. We'll send you a free record brochure that could change your whole life. A public service of this station, the U.S. Offices of Education, and the Advertising Council. Whatever voices or doubts or shadows haunt Steve Catlett's dreams, they failed to cramp his style once he reached Manila. Manila was a town in a mad whirl of euphoria. MacArthur's return, the ousting of the Japanese, the return of freedom to the island, set the town on fire, and these beautiful people gave themselves wholeheartedly to their deliverance. Oh, man, this is one jumping town. <laughs> you can say that again, Stan. 
and the women. <laughs> you know something funny? I just thought of it. You know from where we are sitting right now, they're standing upside down. Who, who's standing upside down? Peace and Claire, our wife. So what's so funny about that? Oh, come on. Don't you get it? How could they know what we're doing if they're looking the wrong way? <laughs> I sure hope you're right. Of course I am. The thing to do, boy, is stay out of involvement. Safety in numbers. For a couple of months, it was a great life. The girls were plentiful, and the rum cost about 30 cents a fifth. Flight duty was a breeze. We climbed to altitude, set her on automatic, and take turns sleeping off the high living. Oh, yes, we had it made all right. That is, until I met Porita. Have, uh, have another drink, baby? No, thank you. Captain Catlett. And the name is not Baby. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't believe I caught it when we were introduced. I am Purita Ilisorio. Miss Ilisorio. Oh, well, that's a relief. Is it? From what I know of your reputation, would it make so much difference if I were married? Well, of course. Aren't you? Me? Oh, free, white, and unencumbered. Then don't let me cramp your style. Look, why, why don't we take a walk outside and... Find out what you meant by that remark. I could use some air, but that doesn't mean my explanation will bring you much pleasure. I'll uh, take my chances. Purita, or Puring, which was her nickname, was a knockout. She glowed with some inner fire. Her skin was light, burnished copper. Her eyes, brown liquid, shot with flecks of gold. And she moved as sleekly and gracefully as a cat. Uh, one thing she had in common with Lisa, she was untouchable unless... So I, uh, I mumbled the right words and made the promises, pleading delay only until I could get the permission of my commanding officer to marry. Which, of course, I never intended to do. But the deception worked. And Puring and I took up housekeeping without benefit of clergy in her apartment in Ermita, downtown Manila. This run is getting to be Dozeville. How's about a few minutes of light chit chat? Oh, what's to talk about? Well, like, for example, uh, there's a new dame in town, White Russian. And whoo-hoo, has she got a sister? Hey, come on, Stan. You know I don't make that kind of scene anymore. Too occupied with Purita, huh? Well, yeah, if you have to know. That's a pretty cozy little setup you have there, pal. Just a word of the wise. I'd think twice about getting too cozy with a little illusorio dame. She comes with quite a Filipino family with a lot of clout. You ask him for trouble. Did I ask you for any advice? Now button up and let me get some sleep. <laughs> Pleasant dreams. I hope. It's a bad habit. I don't dream. But that statement was to come back to haunt me. Because a few weeks later, on a long haul to Honolulu, I was rocked to discover my wife was not as far away as I thought she was. Even before I landed, ground control had told me that Lisa was in the islands and waiting for me at the Kamalama Hotel. Darling, 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 we're back together again. Oh, it's, it's great, oh. Lisa, super, but but how in I the world... I just couldn't be away from you any longer, so I came running. But but how did you manage darling. to wangle... Hey, you're, you're in cities, you... You mean that... Darling, the war's almost at an end. My enlistment was up. I grabbed at the chance to get out. But... But your, your career, you... Career? Oh, you think I wanted to be a nurse? That was my conscience working. Now I'm concentrating on something nearer to home. Us. I... I don't quite follow. As soon as I can get clearance, I'm coming to Manila so we can start being man and wife again. <clears throat> that really jolted me. I was going to have to do something about Purring, and fast. All the way back on our return to Manila, I was trying to figure it out. No, 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 wait a minute. I, hey, uh, hey, hey, Ken, wake what? up, man, wake up. I uh, thought you didn't dream. Hey, what... What happened? <laughs> you were talking in your sleep. What did I say? Hey, nothing your Uncle Stan don't know. So your wife is moving back in on you, huh? You had yourself set up so pretty on each side of the international day climb. It's the two worlds. Looks like now you're going to have to settle for one. Yeah. 
but which? Well, that shouldn't be too hard. Two readers from another culture, another background. In any way, she can't support you in the same kind of style as a Lisa Wright. What does that mean? Don't you know who Lisa is? Her family, I mean? There's been a war on, remember? I never had a chance to meet them. Lisa never said much about them. I guess she figured she didn't have to. Not about George Llewellyn Wright. You ever heard her name? Well, I know her father's name is George and that... Hey. hey. Wait a minute. You mean the steel man? White tools? The aircraft factory? Yeah, that's Papa. A billionaire at least once. Okay, Cat. Now can you make up your mind which way you're gonna jump? There wasn't any doubt which way, but how. And then my old luck came back. They dropped the bomb. Japan surrendered aboard the USS Missouri, and suddenly discharges were a dime a dozen. It was easy to persuade Lisa to forget Manila, since I'd be home. The only problem was Purring, who kept making more and more noises about marriage. Still, it looked as if I might get away with it. Till one evening at dinner time. I was scheduled out on a run that night at midnight when she dropped our own private bomb. Hi, Perrine, honey. Oh, I'm glad you got home. I, I just got orders to pull out again tonight. You are not going anywhere tonight. Hey, hey, baby. These are orders in the army. You got to obey Liar. orders. Sheet. You, you poison tongue. Hey, what? What's gotten into you? You have taken me, shamed me. And used me. And I was fool enough to listen to your promises. Puring, puring, I love you. Soon we will marry. As soon as the commanding officer gives permission. That's Air Force regulation. You gotta How wait for that. How could he give you permission when you know, he knows, that you are already married? You have a wife. You cannot marry me. You liar. You... If I can't have you, no one can. I kill myself for how you have shamed me. But first, first, I kill you. Hey, Puri. Puri, put I the bullet down. I kill you, you nothing. Here, I'll, I'll take I, that knife. I got your heart now, out. watch it. Give it to me. No. Now, no, let's get rid of it. Oh. Then... Kill you with my hands. I have a heart. I have no heart anymore. <laughs> and you will not leave. I will scream the town down before you do. You're crazy. Because you made me so. Hey, for God's oh, sakes, be quiet. I'll never be quiet. Not as long Shut as... Shut up. Never. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Purine. I didn't mean to... Purine. Oh, no. She's dead. It happened so fast I couldn't believe it. She was so little. Her neck... It had just snapped under my hands. At first I was paralyzed. It took three or four drinks before my mind started to move. And then I knew what I had to do. I wrapped her in a blanket, waited for dusk, carried her to my jeep... On the way to the field, I sidetracked to a deserted bridge and dropped her in the Pasig River. The tide was going out. With any luck, she'd be carried out to Manila Bay in the China Sea. And then I headed for what I'd made up my mind would be my last flight out of Manila. Hey, Cat, what, what's the matter with you? Your jump is your name. I, uh, I don't feel so hot. Maybe I'm coming down with something. Yeah, well, maybe you better let me take the first leg to Guam. You sleep it off. I wouldn't have believed it. I did sleep. Like I'd been knocked out. Then at Guam, Stan conked out while I took over. And now, wide awake, the horror of it was back with me. What to do? What to do? If only... If only I could go back. If only today had never been. And then suddenly, gazing blankly at the instrument board in a sort of blinding flash, I saw we were just about to cross the international dateline. Day. If only there really was a gift of time that would... What? What would you do with it, Cat? It's you again. It's me always. What would you do with the day, Cat? I, uh... 
I wouldn't kill her. I, I'd find some other way. And what would you give if you had the chance? Anything. Anything. Then go see if you can find the way. There was a blinding flash of light. And then darkness. And then morning. And waking up and repeating the day as if in a dream. I saw Porine off to work. We said the same words. I reported to the base. Got my orders to fly out at 2400 that night. I saw the same people. Ate the same food. And at last it was evening and I was waiting for Purine to come home. Hi, Purine, honey. I'm, uh, I'm glad you got home. I don't believe it. What, what do you mean? I just came from your commanding officer. I know the truth, Kat. I know you are married. I, uh, I was going to tell you. Were you? Well, it doesn't matter. What are you going to do about it? What are you afraid of? That I will tell your wife, ruin her life, that you have mine? I'm... I'm begging you, Puring. It... It would kill me, sir. You have nothing to worry about. I don't want her blood on my hands. I leave it to yours. You will go back to her? Yes. She would be better off without you. But that is her business. I was a fool to give myself to you. You are not worth it. I come of an old and proud race. And I had no right to pollute my bloodlines. Now get out of my sight. What? What are you going to do? That is none of your business. Oh, well, don't worry. I will never trouble you again. You mean I'm free? Now, once again, I'm sitting at the controls of the plane, crossing the international dateline, and listening to the voice. So we are back where we were. Yes, but I fixed it. Seemed to me the girl fixed it. Well, what's the difference? She's gone. I'm free. You are free from her, but not from me. I'm grounding you for good, Mr. Pilot. It's last. But you can't. Why not? I still have one life left. Oh, you did have one life left. But when you went back, you made an exchange, or rather, took someone else's instead. Purine? Purine. But, but I didn't kill her. No, she killed herself. Jumped from a bridge over the Pasig River to float out on the tide to Manila Bay and the China Sea. But that wasn't my fault. Of course it was your fault. Come along. Don't waste any time anymore. But, but Lisa, Lisa needs me. The girl who just died answered that. Your wife is a million times better off without someone like you. Oh, no. No, you, you can't. You can't have it your way for once and for all. So cross the international date line and move into tomorrow, Cat. Too bad, isn't it, that that's the end. There aren't any more tomorrows. Or you. Anymore. It was a small squib in the papers. A Matz plane bound for Hawaii was lost in the vicinity of the international dateline. The pilot, Captain Stephen Catlett, was presumed lost with the plane. By some miraculous chance, the co-pilot, Lieutenant Stanley Newcomb, fell clear during the wild descent and was able to make a parachute landing. He was picked up in good condition by a passing destroyer. Lieutenant Newcomb was unable to account for the accident. He was asleep while the plane was under automatic control, and Captain Catlett was in full command. I'll be back shortly. Matus Rosé and White Matus. Two wines you can count on. You can't rely on the weather. Or the latest Wall Street trends. And it isn't easy to find a wine that'll please you and your friends. But there's two wines you can count on. Two wines that always belong. Try the two today, quite a rosé. Because with the two, you can't go wrong. 
The imported Matus wines, rosé and white. They're wines you can count on. Because when you see Matus on the label, you know you just can't go wrong. Yeah, there's two wines you can count on. Two wines you can count on. Two wines that always belong. Hey, hey. Buy Matus today. White or rosé. Because with Matus you can't go wrong. Imported by Dreyfus Ashby and Company, New York, New York. Hey, hey, hey. Matus today. Last night, you went to sleep in your own bed. You woke up in hay fever country. Don't give up. Arm yourself with ARM. ARM Allergy Relief Medicine delivers full antihistamine relief for dripping, itching, and sneezing, plus a decongestant for freer breathing, clearer sinuses, more total relief. Arm yourself with ARM. ARM. Take ARM when needed, only as directed. The glittering condominium stands in the path of disaster. Time is running out for the people in the condominium. There's a hurricane watch along the coastal areas. Gale force winds expected to reach up to 70 miles per hour. They say a big one is coming up, but it's supposed to pass out to sea. Soon all the land swindles, payoffs, and broken marriages won't matter. Help me! I can't hold on! In John D. McDonald's condominium, people lose more than their investment. Condominium is now a faucet paperback, and it'll blow you away. Read Condominium. I don't imagine any of us could have any pity for a man as self-serving as Steve Catlett or spare many regrets that he was prodigal enough to waste nine lives. But I do wonder how many of us would like to cross that international date line and get the gift of a day to mend things we may have done, which we wish we never had. Perhaps we'll never cross it. Or perhaps if we do, and we are not offered a second chance, we can comfort ourselves that our sins must have been pretty small. Our cast included Michael Tolan, E.V. Juster, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine. Mrs. E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Your car won't start. You're stranded with a mechanical breakdown, or your car truck is off the road and you need help. Well, you've got it. Anytime, day or night, the number is 345-8248, 345-8248, and help is on the way. Dale Service Center with 10 black and white tow trucks can provide emergency service for even the largest vehicle on the road. And Dale's mechanics will find the cause of your problem and fix it fast. Dale's at 32nd and Arbor is a Nebraska safety inspection station, too. With U-Haul trucks and trailers and hail horse trailers for sale or rent, 345-8248, the 24-hour Dale Service Center number. This year, K Triple O will provide you with exclusive coverage of the Triple Crown of Racing. And our coverage begins with a run for the roses, the Kentucky Derby, on Saturday, May 6th. Join Wynn Elliott and Kay Wood Ludford of CBS for all the pre race pageantry and the call of the race. Our coverage begins at 425 on Saturday, the 6th. The 104th Run for the Roses, exclusively on K Triple O AM and FM. Another reason to listen. CBS Radio News is next. This is K O O O F M, Omaha, Nebraska. Ask a more good radio for more people. CBS News talks into the birding of strike three hours from now against Northwest Airlines have broken down. Good evening. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS Radio Network. The 1,500 pilots at Northwest are threatening to walk out. A report from Rich Holter of station WCCO, Minneapolis. Each side is blaming the other for breaking off the talks. And pilot spokesman Gene Cragness sees little chance of averting the strike. Well, I would think at this point in time, uh, in light of the statement made by Northwest this afternoon, and again with the uh, short time remaining until this uh, deadline of midnight, uh, the strike is becoming ever more uh, a certainty. 
Cragness said little progress has been made in a week of negotiations under supervision of a federal mediator. He said open issues include wages, working conditions, pensions, and insurance. The company says it will have no statement on airline operations until after the midnight strike deadline. Northwest serves 46 U.S. cities, Canada, and the Orient. Rich Holter for CBS News, Minneapolis. More news in a moment. I guess I'm lucky. My family's always been healthy. Oh, a touch of constipation now and then, but we've got x lax for that. Today, more American families trust x lax than any other brand. When you need a laxative, you can count on x lax for relief in the morning. For occasional use, only as directed. Why x lax My family trusts it. That's why. Now, for itching, Bicozine brings you a powerful anti-itch drug without a doctor's prescription. Use only as directed. For itching skin tissues, get Bicozine cream. Just in time for Mother's Day, the first Litton factory-authorized sale ever. With big savings on full-featured, family-sized Litton models 460 or 445 microwave ovens. And a microwave cooking school bonus just for buying. Now until May 27th. So come on in. Taste a demonstration. Check our sale prices and take home the Litton value of the year. See your participating Litton dealer and see how Litton is changing the way America cooks. Leaders of a move to put the question of recalling Cleveland Mayor Dennis Kucinich on the ballot appear to have enough signatures to do it. They've charged Kucinich with being inept, citing, among other things, his recent firing of the city's police chief. Lisa Meyer of Station WJW has a report. The recall committee has about 1,500 signatures over the 37,000 required by the city charter. Not as many as committee chairman Albert Ballou would have liked to have, but enough to complete the first step in the recall process. The recallers, however, will continue to gather signatures for at least the next 20 days, this to ensure the issue slot on the June ballot. Cleveland Council members, most of them withholding their public support from the recall, say that even if the effort fails to remove Mayor Kucinich from office, it will have accomplished one important thing, letting the mayor know that there is dissatisfaction with the current performance of his administration. Lisa Meyer for CBS News in Cleveland. President Carter today sent to Congress his proposal for the sale of jet fighter planes to three Middle East nations, backing down somewhat on his insistence it be considered as a package. Supporters of Israel have been concerned Mr. Carter wants to link the sale of planes to that country with sales to Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Secretary of State Vance made it clear the administration still wants the planes to go to the two Arab states. These transactions will enhance the confidence in and friendship toward the United States on the part of each of these two countries with which we share vital mutual interests. But the president's wording of the proposal was somewhat conciliatory, saying the sales should be approved on their individual merits. Federal safety officials say it may be several weeks before they know what caused a scaffolding to collapse at a water tower under construction in West Virginia yesterday. The accident claimed the lives of 51 men. A series of funerals for the victims beginning tomorrow may last until next Tuesday. President Carter will visit Panama June 16th and 17th to put the finishing touches on the Panama Canal treaties. Mr. Carter and Panama's General Omar Torrios will sign a protocol agreement and exchange documents providing for the formal transfer of the waterway to Panama at the end of the year 1999. The Commerce Department reported today that oil imports account for about 75% of the nation's trade deficit. Now this. It takes more than good paint to get a good-looking paint job. Hi, Pat Summerall to suggest you visit your nearby True Value hardware store and see their complete selection of quality painting accessories that can help you get professional-looking results at a fraction of professional costs. True Value hardware stores feature a wide assortment of dependable name-brand painting supplies, including their own exclusive line of True Test paint roller frames and covers, brushes, painting pad kits, and more to help make your work easier, help you finish faster, and give you better-looking results. Plus, they offer a selection of tuck masking tape in various widths to help you protect the trim or walls while you paint. And for those finishing touches, see their full line of caulks, stains, finishes, and cleaners. From start to finish, you'll find the painting supplies you need to get a good-looking paint job from participating True Value hardware stores. And when you go in, don't forget to tell them that Pat Summerall sent you. 
Despite problems over the supply and the prices of fresh vegetables, there's an indication conditions could go the other way. The problem has been too much rain in California, which has soaked the fields and made it impossible to follow normal planting schedules. But a spokesman for the California Agriculture Department said today growers will keep on planting, and that could even lead to an oversupply, in which case prices would go down. Currently, though, they are very high, and there have been some predictions lettuce could go to more than a dollar a head. This is Doug Poling, CBS News. Your car won't start. You're stranded with a mechanical breakdown, or your car truck is off the road and you need help. Well, you've got it. Anytime, day or night, the number is 345-8248. 345-8248, and help is on the way. Dale Service Center with 10 black and white tow trucks can provide emergency service for even the largest vehicle on the road. And Dale's mechanics will find the cause of your problem and fix it fast. Dale's at 32nd and Arbor is a Nebraska safety inspection station, too. With U-Haul trucks and trailers and hail horse trailers for sale or rent. 345-8248. The 24-hour Dale Service Center number. This is Larry Holland. Omaha has a new late-night meeting place. It's 104 and a half on the FM dial right here at KOOO FM. We talk about issues of current concern. We question a variety of guests. But the best part of it all is that you can join the action simply by calling the Speak Out number. Join us from midnight to 6 a.m. every morning for Speak Out with Larry Holland. Another the reason CBS to listen. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Happy to have you with me. It gets lonely in here sometimes when it's dark and quiet, and there's no one for company except the strange and brooding spirits. But we're not staying here for long. We're on our way to Connecticut to visit a little house on an out-of-the-way dirt road called Chimney Pot Lane. If you're interested in country property, you might be interested in it. But then again, you may not. You see, the house is vacant. Not because nobody wants to buy it. The owner is afraid to sell it. There isn't a real estate agent in the county who touched that house, including me. But it's so perfect for us. No, Mrs. Sage, the house on Chimney Pot Lane can never be lived in again. Uh, now you're going to say it, it's haunted. That would be nothing, Mr. Sage, compared to whatever evil is in that house. <laughs> mystery drama, The House on Chimney Pot Lane, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Bob Juran and stars Marion Seldes. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Now, if you order a new mid-size two-door or four-door Buick Century Custom with an available 3.8-liter V6 engine, chrome-plated wheels, 5545 seats, AM-FM radio, sport mirrors, electric digital clock, and an exterior molding package, we'll add power steering and power brakes at no extra charge. It's the deal of the century. Buick Century models are equipped with GM-built engines supplied by various divisions. See your Buick dealer for details. When I go shopping, there's no doubt my Master Charge card carries clout. When you carry Master Charge, you carry clout. Master Charge is the number one card used by more people in more places to buy more things than any other card in the world. That's clout. When you carry Master Charge, you carry clout. Don't miss out. Carry clout. What does the Salvation Army mean to you? A hot cup of coffee, a freshly baked donut, a place for down-and-out men to be rehabilitated, a house of worship? The Salvation Army is all of these things and more. Did you know that the Salvation Army operates a nationwide missing persons bureau that tries to locate long-lost friends and relatives? And to keep up with the times, the Salvation Army has programs in many major cities to treat the problem of drug abuse. But that's not all. The Salvation Army is on the scene, offering assistance whenever a disaster such as a flood, blizzard, or fire strikes. And the Army provides services to our armed forces, 
as well as our nation's senior citizens, homeless children, unwed mothers, and released prisoners. The list goes on and on. The Salvation Army meets the needs of many people in this complex society. And it is working daily to expand their network of services. The Salvation Army cares. I'd like you to meet two friends of mine, Jim and Marion Sage. They're a playwriting team who have just had a hit play open on Broadway. They've been writing for years, living frugally in a small apartment in Greenwich Village. And at last, they've hit the big time, as the saying goes. Their new financial security is making a dream come true. The dream of a house of their own in the country where they could enjoy life while they continued to write their plays. And that's what led them to Connecticut and the house on Chimney Pot Lane. I'm Mrs. Green. Can I help you? Uh, yes. You seem to be the only real estate agent in town, and uh, we're interested in knowing something about a house. Uh, sit down, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jim Sage, my wife, Marion. How do you do? Hello. We are the only realtors in this village, and we do have a lot of beautiful listings. We're interested in one particular house. We passed it this afternoon, peeped in the windows. It seemed to be empty, and we wondered if it's for sale and... If you might have a key. We usually have our sign out in front of the houses for sale. Did you see it? Oh, no, there there was no sign. Uh, do you remember where it was? Oh, yes. It was the end of a narrow road called Chimney Pot Lane. Chimney Pot Lane? That house? Yes. Uh, we fell in love with it, and we, we were hoping... Uh, that, that house it... definitely isn't for sale. Oh, dear. Why is it vacant, then? The owner closed it up and moved to Florida. Well, I thought houses were at a premium around here. The house on Chimney Pot Lane can never be lived in again. Oh, and now you're going to say that it's haunted. We're not generally given to superstition here, Mr. Sage, but things happened in that house that no one can turn their back on. Like what? We don't talk about it anymore, but... Uh, please. Well, there was nothing wrong until five years ago when a group of cultists moved into the house... No one knows what kind of things they were up to, but they left, and then things started. What kind of things? Well, the next family that owned it disappeared entirely. Just like that. I mean, water still in the tub, breakfast things on the table. Never heard from again. And, uh, there was more? The next owner just abandoned it. Wouldn't tell anybody what happened. And finally, Ed Hagen, who owns it now, tried to burn it down and, uh... Well, that was the capper. Capper? Now, the place wouldn't burn. Fire started in the kitchen. Burned for almost an hour before the fire department was notified. And no more damage than one kitchen wall. That house is bewitched. Can you give us the address of this Mr. Hagen? He won't sell. Well, we'd at least like to ask. Very well. But you're wasting your time. believe what she said? Well, what happened may be true, but I don't think it's evil spirits. Uh, this is some explanation that no one wanted to look for. Uh, want to swing by and take another look? Oh, I'd love to. Hey, Marion. Hey, uh, come around here. What is it? Look, the uh, boards are loose on this window. I didn't notice it before. You want to go in? You think we should? Well, so Mr. Hagen's in Florida. We've got to see the inside if we're serious about buying. Let's go. Good. And I'm just sort of come off easy. There. There you go. And I'll give you a hand up. It's not high. There. That's easy. Well, here. Here I come. We're in a, a pantry. Hmm. Yeah, lights, lights kind of dim. Come on. Hey. Here's the kitchen. Ah, oh, that's where the fire was, huh? It was strange, wasn't it? I mean, that the whole house didn't burn? Well, I, st I still don't think black magic had anything to do with it. <gasps> Look how charming. A sunken living room. Hey, with a fireplace. Hmm. Paneling's in good condition, too. And a den, Jim. Look over here. Uh, yeah. Might make a good workroom for us. Oh, 
Isn't it perfect? And a fireplace in here, too. Oh, I'm falling more in love with it every minute. Hey, check that circular staircase, huh? I can't imagine a better place for us, Jim. Well, let's see if we can get in touch with Mr. Hagen. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm ready to take it, evil spirits and all. And maybe we'll even write a play about it. Uh, look, let's get back to the city. I'll try to call Mr. Hagen tonight. Uh, okay. Yeah, thanks very much, Mr. Hagen. Uh, we'll have our attorney handle things. Thanks. Bye. It's ours? Well, that was Hagen's son. Old Mr. Hagen died last year. His son's only too glad to get rid of the house. How long will it take? A couple of weeks, maybe. Uh, I'll get Fred to handle the details. Oh, I hope we're in by Christmas. I'm going to ask Georgia to give us some advice on the decorating. Broadway's number one set designer ought to have some good ideas for a country house with a resident evil spirit. beautiful, George. Oh, it is. I've got a dozen ideas already. I would suggest cutting through the pantry and combining it with the kitchen. Uh, take a look at the den, George. You know, we want something dramatic in there. Okay. Oh, isn't this cozy fireplace bay window? Well, we're thinking of some sort of bold wallpaper. You see, that one wall is so... Uh, kind of... Unbroken, mm -hmm. yeah. Something dramatic. Hey! Hmm? I've got it. How about a photo mural? Mm, not a bad idea. Got something in mind? I do. You want a little flair. I think I've got just the thing. What? A jungle scene complete with lion, birds, ferns, vines. <laughs> that sounds exciting. Do you know the photographer <laughs> Elliot Mann? Uh, no, no. Well, he's an old friend from college. He's been in Africa and took some incredible shots. One would make a terrific mural for that wall. Well, let's take a look. I'll borrow some slides from Elliot. I think it might be perfect. It would certainly be unique. <laughs> It's really sensational, George. Oh, I'm glad you like it. I was having some doubts that it might be too overpowering. Oh, no, I love it. It makes the whole room seem larger. Yeah, it's like having an indoor garden, you know, with all those vines and ferns. And that lion on the rock. And the tropical birds. Oh, it's so dramatic. <laughs> I can't wait for the housewarming to see people's reactions. Oh, by the way, I'm bringing Elliot to the party. He's anxious to know how the mural turned out. Great. It'll be nice to meet him. Uh, it's a week from Saturday, you know. You two have certainly done wonders in the month and a half you've been in here. With your help. Well, the place was in pretty good shape. <laughs> you haven't met up with any of those celebrated evil spirits, have you? No, not a one. The house is as normal as we are. <laughs> you know, where there is something evil or psychic or whatever, you can usually sense it. We haven't felt anything but happiness in all the weeks we've been living here. I'll get it. Georgia, oh, come in. Oh, it's starting to snow. The forecast said snow and freezing rain. Wow. Oh. Uh, Marion, this is Elliot Mann. Uh, hi. Nice to be here. I'm delighted you could come. And we love your photograph. Oh. I guess you know that. Well, I'm happy it worked out so well. Come on in. Meet everybody. Mm. And we'll show you how the wall looks. That is impressive. <laughs> the tail's held up beautifully in the blow-up. Yeah, yeah the, the feeling of realism is incredible. Everybody's talking about it. Well, I'll never forget shooting that photo. <laughs> the stupid lion attacked us a second after I snapped. Chased our car for almost a mile before he gave up. Well, you have to expect those things when you gallop around Africa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the animals weren't as dangerous as the natives. They were a wicked bunch in that part of the bush. They're headhunters, primitive, superstitious, and utterly ruthless. I'll stay in the good old USA, thanks. They refuse to be photographed, if anyone's foolish enough to get close enough to try. Why? Well, it's a common belief among many primitive people that the camera captures their soul. They're deadly afraid of cameras. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Needless to say, you didn't get any shot. Oh, not of the headhunters. It wasn't worth the risk. Hold on a minute. Hmm? I think you might be mistaken, Elliot. Hmm? What do you mean? Uh, I've never noticed it before. We've had the mural up for two weeks, but I just didn't see it till now. Look, through the leaves down in this corner, it's the face of a man. Let me see that. Oh, it's a face, all right. You probably didn't know he was there when you took the picture. Well, he couldn't have been. There wasn't a native for ten miles around. 
Anyway, I would have seen it on the slide. Well, maybe the blow up brought it out. It's just a trick of the lighting. You're right, Marion. It does resemble one of the Bushmen. When you stand back, it looks like a face. It's just the pattern of the leaves and ferns. There's no real face there. Oh, yes. I see it now. It looks like the real thing to me. Well, you probably can find lots of images in those leaves. The dappled sunlight does it. Well, looking for things in the mural will give Jim and me something to do when we hit those writing blocks. Uh, Marion, some of the gang started to leave, and they're worried about getting back to the city in the storm. It's turning to sleep. Look at it out there. Yes, I'm glad you invited me to stay the night. Well, I'd better start back, too. I'm leaving for Wyoming in the morning. Oh, it's a shame to wind things up so soon. I wish we could put everybody up. You better not wait any longer, Elliot. It turned to sleet, all right. It's a fairyland. Everything is ice. The sun on those trees. It's fantastic. And we're without a phone. The branches are down all over the place. I'm, I'm going into town. Oh, the joys of winter in suburbia. <laughs> I hope the crowd made it back safe last night. Well, I'm sure they did. I'll be back as soon as I can. I've got to get the phone company out here, and then I'm going to get a haircut. I'll see you later. God carefully, dear. Let's take our coffee into the den, Georgia. Okay. I'll start the fire. There's some embers left from last night. Oh, it really is beautiful out there. The scene through the bay window almost looks like a painting itself. Georgia. What? Look over here. The face I saw in the leaves last night. Hey. Where is it? But that's what I mean. It's gone. <laughs> Morning, ma'am. Your phone company. Yes, come in. I saw you working on the wires. That was fast. Hey, well, I was in the area when I got the call. Weather like this keeps us busy. Oh, I can imagine. Well, I've got to check the instrument now. Of course, this way. Phone's in the den. Would you like some coffee? No, no, no. Thanks very much. i got to get going when I check you out. Okay. The phone's right in there. Thank you. And if you change your mind about the coffee, just say so. It's already made. All right, thank you. Let's see here. My, uh... uh operator, this is Maxwell checking, uh, 0419. Right, right, okay. Uh, let me get that down. 41 Chestnut Court. Okay, I'll head there next. Right. Mm-hmm. What the... What, what is this? No! Get back! Get, get back! Goodbye! No! Did you hear what I think I heard in Jim and Marion's den? Perhaps we were mistaken. What really happened, of course, was that the phone man turned around and saw... Well, come to think of it, what did he see? Perhaps we'll find out about that and more about this house on Chimney Pot Lane when I return shortly with Act Two. Spend some time reading True Value Hardware Store's spring and summer catalog before you spend money on outdoor projects. Hi, Pat Summerall to tell you that you'll find hundreds of values for your lawn and garden, like True Test Sun and Light Shade Grass Seed. Use it to start a new lawn or patch up bare spots in a thin one. A three-pound box is just four seventy-seven. Or keep your lawn healthy with True Test Supreme Lawn Food. The long-lasting nitrogens are released slowly, so your lawn grows green and thick. A 20-pound bag is just four ninety nine. True Value Hardware Store's spring and summer catalog also offers values on aero storage buildings, so you can store things outdoors and out of the way. All feature weather-tight, water-resistant construction. And the doors can be padlocked, so you can safely store your lawn and garden supplies, tools, bicycles, and toys. See these values and more in the spring and summer catalog and at participating True Value hardware stores and home centers. More than just a name, it's their way of doing business. If you're into tennis, softball, baseball, soccer, jogging, skateboarding, swimming, golfing, racquetball, or volleyball, just to name a few, get into DaCosta Sporting Goods and let the folks there help you select the equipment and clothing you need to enjoy your sport this spring. DaCosta Sporting Goods at 85th and L Street in Omaha. Open till 6 p.m. weekdays, Thursday till 8. The difference is in the 
The cost of sporting goods, 85th and L. This year, K Triple O will provide you with exclusive coverage of the Triple Crown of Racing, and our coverage begins with a run for the roses, the Kentucky Derby, on Saturday, May 6th. Join Win Elliott and Kaywood Ledford of CBS for all the pre-race pageantry and the call of the race. Our coverage begins at 425 on Saturday the 6th. The 104th Run for the Roses exclusively on K Triple O AM and FM. Another reason to listen. I'm happy you've returned. You see, as your host, I have to be here. And after what I heard a few moments ago, I just as soon not be here alone. Thanks for your company. I suppose you heard it too, that ominous growl right in the middle of a pleasant Connecticut home. And it certainly gave our telephone repairman a turn. He couldn't believe his ears or his eyes. But then, here on Mystery Theater, lots of things happen that are hard to believe. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? Hello? Yes? Oh, yes, he was here. Just a minute. Yes, his truck's still in the driveway. So he must have gone outside again. All right, I'll have him call right in. What's that all about? Phone company. They want to talk to the repairman. Did you see him go out? No. I left him in here checking the phone. That was at least half an hour ago. That's right. We've been talking in the kitchen. Jim came home. We wouldn't leave without his truck. Wouldn't think so. He must be outside. I'll look. I'll come with you. Jim, did you see anything of the repair man when you came in? No. No, his truck's out there. I don't know where he is. Well, come on. We'll have a look. Telephone? A uh, phone man? Are you out there? Hello? He would have answered. I just don't know where he went. I'll call him back and tell him. I thought he might be in the basement, but uh, he isn't. That's strange. He, he, he's not here, but where would he go without his truck? It's been two hours, and the truck's still there. Oh, there's a car pulling in the driveway. It's a police car. What in the world? It must have something to do with the repair there. Jim, the police are here. Yeah, I see. There's someone with them. You better go out, Jim. They're looking at the truck. Well, that other man must be from the phone company. Hello, officer. Mr. Sage? Uh, yes? I'd like to talk with you for a minute. Well, of course. Come on in. This way, officer. Uh, this is my wife, Mrs. Sage, and a friend, Miss Kane. Well, how do you do? I'm Officer Rich. Is the repairman still missing? Uh, that's right, Mrs. Sage. I'm sorry to have to bother you like this, but I have to ask some questions. <laughs> I, I really don't know what to tell you. When was the last time you saw Bob Maxwell? When I showed him into the den. Hmm. He'd been outside, and he came in to check the phone, and I left him alone. And then Miss Kane and I had our coffee in the kitchen. That's right. And you were here, Mr. Sage? No, no, I was in town getting a haircut. Uh-huh. So the last person to see Maxwell was you, Mrs. Sage, hmm? Yes. Uh, may I see the den, please? Sure, sure, right this way. It's uh, right off the living room. Thank you. Uh, the operator says Maxwell checked in with her at 9.42. She gave him instructions for his next stop. And that's the last anyone heard from him. Or I take it so. But I left him right here. Oh, in the... wow. <laughs> That's some wall. <laughs> yeah, a friend of Miss Kane's took that photograph and we oh. had it specially made to fit the wall. And uh, neither of you heard or saw Maxwell go out? No, but we were in the kitchen. I mean, he could have left without us knowing it. Well, I don't know what else to ask. We don't suspect foul play, obviously, Mr. Sage. But uh, this house, well... It has had a reputation. Oh, we've been here two months and haven't had one single strange thing happen. Until now. Oh, now, look. Don't tell me you think that anything... Well, I don't know what to think, Mr. Sage. 
wouldn't be the first time someone disappeared from this house without a trace. <sighs> yeah, so they say. I have to admit superstition has no place in a police investigation, except that this man isn't around, and his truck is. And my wife was the last to see him. Exactly. Well, we're as baffled as you are, officer. Well, I'll make my report, and we'll see where we go from there. The phone company's taking the truck back. Oh, and Mr. Sage, if anything... Out of the ordinary should happen. Something that would give us any kind of clue. You'll let us know immediately. Hmm? Of course. Put another log on the fire while you're up, Jim, will you? Uh, right, and uh, I'll freshen the drinks. Oh, this is so warm and cozy. I wish I didn't have to go back to the city tomorrow. You're welcome to stay as long as you want. You know that, Georgia. Oh, I know, and I appreciate it, Marion. Oh, here you go, Marion. Ah, uh, Georgia. Thank you. Well, it's been quite a weekend between last night's party and uh, today's little episode. It's so curious about that man from the phone company to disappear like that. Well, he certainly didn't meet with any foul play here. Marion. What? Marion, I've been looking at the mural. It, it, it seemed to me the, the lion had his mouth open like he was snarling. Yes, I think so. Yeah, well, look at it now. The mouth's closed. And his head is raised as though he were sniffing the air. I, I could swear the lion looks different now than he did when the picture went up. Well, maybe it looks different. We don't remember. But it can't be different. <laughs> Listen, when I get back to the city tomorrow, I'll look at Elliot's original slide. Yeah, yeah that's an idea. Well, that ought to settle it. Fascinating the way the firelight makes the foliage seem almost to sway. Mm, hypnotizing. Yeah, that's probably why we think we see things that aren't there. Like the man's face I saw last night. It was gone this morning in the daylight. Yeah, well, <clears throat> you know, there's more in that picture than meets the eye. Looks like we'll have no end of fun with it. I'm back. Uh, George, is train coming on time? On the nose. And while I'm making coffee, uh, let's get started on that fourth scene today. Oh, I was hoping to. I'll be in the den and bring in some donuts. They're in the bread box. What in the world was he doing over there in his bare feet? Oh, well. The place needs a good going over after that party. I'll clean up tomorrow. Yeah, I was thinking we ought to open scene four in the hospital waiting room rather than Millie's apartment. Jim, you shouldn't walk around these cold floors in your bare feet. What are you talking about? Your footprints on the floor over by the wall. I... I wasn't in here in bare feet. Well, those are wet footprints, aren't they? Where? I don't see him. They were right there a second ago. Damp footprints across the rug. A man's bare foot. Well, it couldn't have been. I haven't been in here at all since you drove Georgia down the station. Much the less than my bare feet. Well, it wasn't my imagination. Well, I didn't say it was. But the prints weren't mine. Listen, well, so I think maybe we've let the tales about this house get the best of us. You know, last night, I thought I was seeing things with the lion. You thought you saw a man's face. And now you think you saw wet footprints. Now, the lion couldn't change, huh? We're just reading things into it. Come on, let's get to work. Hello? Marion, it's Georgia. Hi, Georgia. Listen, I've meant to call you for days, but I've been up to my ears in work. I went over to Elliot's and looked at the slide. Oh, yes, we were wondering about that. Must have been the firelight. The slide's the same as the wall. The lion has his head in the air and his mouth is closed. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. <laughs> it hasn't changed. Isn't that funny? We should have thought that it was different. How are things with the house? Did that telephone man ever turn up? No, not that we know of. We haven't heard. By the way, Georgia, could you come up this weekend? Jim's going to Philadelphia to doctor a new tryout. I'd love the company. Sure, I'd love it. I need a break. <gasps> Georgia? Hold on a minute, will you? Sure. Yes, it is. Georgia? Yeah, what's up? The face is back in the mural. What? I've been staring at the wall while we've been talking. It's there. The whole outline of a bushy head and face through the ferns. 
like the one I saw at the party. Elliot said that was a trick of the lighting. But remember the day after the party, it was gone. You didn't see it again, you mean? Yes. That's what I mean. See you Friday. I'll be up in the afternoon. Who's on the phone? It's Georgia. I'll call and let you know the train. Good, I'll meet you. And Marion, relax. <laughs> I will. Bye, Georgia. Good idea to have her up here for the weekend. I'll be back late Sunday afternoon. I... I hope. Georgia says that the lion in the photo slide is the same as the wall. There's no difference. Uh, well, I was expecting that. Yeah, we're letting our imaginations run away with us. Delicious, Georgia. Let's have some brandy by the fire. Oh, you don't have to twist my arm for that. Oh, probably Jim. He said he'd call when he got to Philadelphia. Oh, he made good time. Well, bring the coffee into the den. The brandy's in the liquor cabinet. I'll be right in. Say hi to Jim for me. Hello? Hi, honey. Huh. I thought it would be you. <laughs> How are things with you? Just finished dinner. Everything is all right, isn't it? Of course. Well, I'm glad George is there. See you Sunday. We'll be here. Bye, darling. I put on a fresh pot of coffee. It'll be ready in a while. Now, how about that brandy, hmm? Oh, yes. It's in the lower cabinet and the glasses are there, too. Oh, well, let me get them. Nothing like a swirl of brandy. Well, now, where in the world did this come from? What is it? It's a feather. A blue feather. <laughs> I don't have anything with feathers. Where was it? On the floor. I picked it up right here. Exactly under that bird in the mural. Why, why, what do you mean? There has never been a feather in this house. I can't stand them. You think that... Oh, Marianne, it can't be. Look at the bird. Look. That feather is from that bird in the picture. Oh, now, Marion, come on. You've got me doing it. I, I could swear I saw those ferns move. Where? Over there in the right hand corner. What is happening? Crazy, you do. Fear drunk. Yes. We've got to get out of this house. I don't know what it is, but we've got to get out. I knew there was something about that picture. Come on, Georgia. Hurry. Marion. Marion, what? It's moving. Oh, the lion is coming into this house. Run, Georgia. Run. big cat is out of the bag. Now we know that all those things Marion was seeing, the face of the man, the different face on the lion, and most recently the feather, weren't figments of hers or anyone's imagination. Something strange is happening in this house on Chimney Pot Lane, and I'll join you there shortly in Act Three. Representative, any old worn out lipstick, you'll get a new full size Avon lipstick for just 35 cents. It's a 225 value. We're out to put Avon on everybody's lips. You give me lips with smiles so fun and so many shades so fresh, so young and you give me spring and style. Oh, Avon, you make me smile. Limited time offer. Your Avon representative has details. If you're in business, I'd like a moment of your time. Being in business, you know how competitive your industry is. You know that to keep your share of the marketplace and to build and grow on that base, you must not let down, not for a moment. In the area of getting your message before the public, you know a wise advertising investment can help your efforts. The new KOO stations, AM and FM, now broadcast the features and programs that are reaching the people you want to reach. The prestige of CBS. Top sports and personalities with believability. Combined with a realistic and efficient rate structure. 
Well, it could mean one of the most effective and productive media purchases you've ever been involved with. For more information on how we could work together for your continued growth and success, make note to contact Denny Christensen, General Sales Manager for KOO AM and FM. We're here not only to entertain and inform, but also to help. Contact us during regular business hours. I told you I'd meet you back at the house on Chimney Park Lane, but I'm afraid that's not where we're going now as we begin Act Three. Did I say a moment ago that something strange was happening in Marion Sage's den? Strange? It's downright terrifying. Run, Georgia! Run! It's attacking! <laughs> this way, run! It's going to kill us! What is happening, Marion? What is it? I don't know. We're surrounded by the jungle. Oh, keep going. Oh, dear heaven, what's happening to us? So slippery, I... Oh, Georgia! I tripped on that vine. Let me help you. So it's all right. He's turned back. He, he, he's not following us anymore. Where are we? Where's your house? I don't know any more than you know, Georgia. We're in the jungle, but how or why? One minute we were looking at the wall, and then here we are. This has got to be some kind of hallucination. This is not happening to us. The time you tripped over is real enough. Your ankle is bleeding. I hadn't even noticed. You said you're right about moving. It's so dense. Which way do we go, and where? I... I can't move another step. I'm scared to death. I want to lie down and go to sleep and wake up from this nightmare. There seems to be a path leading off that way. We have got to keep moving, Marion. Come on. George, is that smoke? Yes, it is. Up ahead. The path. Well, I never thought about it. What? This path. Has to be made by someone or or something coming and going. See what you mean. Try not to make a sound. Come into the top of a hill. Shh. Stay back a bit, Georgia. Look down there. It's a, a village. We're on the road into town. Look at those people. It's just like the man I saw in the, the picture. Look at the top of those poles. Are they? Let's go. Come on, back down the path before they see us. How far do you think we've come from the village? I haven't the slightest idea. It's so hot. Humid. I can hardly breathe. We're going to have to find some kind of shelter. I think it gets so dark. Yes, and there's no telling what comes out at night in this place. Georgia? Huh? Listen. Sounds like water. It is. Up ahead, a waterfall. Well, at least maybe we could get cooled off. Oh, it should be fresh for drinking. Oh. Oh. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Now, don't get too close. Those rapids are full of rocks. Marion? Look over there. On the other side. What do you see? It looks like a cave just under the bank. Yes, I see it. It might be a safe place for the night. Here we are, down on the rock. Yeah, I'm okay. It seems to be a, a good-sized opening. So dark in there. Maybe there... Maybe there's something in there. Oh, wait. My cigarette lighter in the pocket of my slacks. At least we'll know what we're getting into. Not bad at all. It's like a large room. Someone's had a fire in here, too. We're not the first tenants, Georgia. There's some kind of animal lying over there in that corner. Huh? We better get out of here fast. It's not moving. George, go in 
any closer. What's the matter with you? Marion. Look. Look. The telephone repairman. What? Get back. Get back. I got a stick. You? Here. Women. Two women. You're the... You're the phone man, Mr. Maxwell. Holy... This gets worse all the time. You're the lady with the crazy wall. Yes, the same thing happened to you. <laughs> what happened to me? I was fixing the phone and all of a sudden a lion leaped out at me and I've been roaming around in the jungle. I, I just don't know how many days. That's what happened to us. You've been here a whole week. <laughs> Is that how long? I've been hiding from animals and headhunters and eating berries. There's no telling how long we'll all be here. Is there any way back? We hope so. But we just don't know where to look. Every part of the jungle looks like every other part. Uh, not so. I, I've been here longer than you. Now, there are certain spots uh, that are really different. In what way? Well, I've come on places where the foliage looks almost fake. Now, now there's one spot where they, they, there are more birds. Now, they, they all seem to gather together. I saw this bird sitting up in a tree... And all of a sudden, it, it flicks its tail, you know? And a big feather flies out. And right before my eyes, it, it disappeared. It just disappeared into thin air. The feather? Was it blue? Well, uh, it could have been. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it was. And I know where it landed. Can you find this place where the birds gather? That may be our way back. Uh, I think so. It's uh, downstream away. What do you mean, Georgia? The blue feather we found on the floor of the den. It must have come from that bird. We were standing inches away from you, Mr. Maxwell, and neither of us knew it. I, I don't know what you're talking about, ma'am. No, you couldn't. But if we can find those birds, we might be close to getting out of this... this whatever it is. Well, it's too dark to try now. But uh, we could in the morning. We must in the morning. Is it much further to where the birds are? Uh, you see that clump of tall trees in the distance? Well, it was just to the right of them that I saw the birds. And uh, down below was where the ferns and things looked different. Do we have to go that far? I'm exhausted. What's that large, dark area up ahead? Uh, that beats me. In. Must be a bog or something. You know, it looks to me as though it's moving. It does. It's sort of rippling. Uh, it might be quicksand. I, I don't remember seeing it before. It must stretch for miles. Can we get across it? Uh, it depends on what it is. I think it's... It's moving toward us. Look. It's spreading like a big oil slick. It's moving, and it is headed toward us. I'm darn if I can tell what it is. Oh, we, we better turn back. We're too late. Oh, good Lord. They're ants. Millions oh. of ants. <laughs> run. Run this way. They're all around us. Take your legs. Run back. Oh, my God. Keep moving. Oh, Get them off, and don't Get do any off. good. Get them off. Get, get away, you devil! Get you. My hair! Come on, man! One chance! Get to the river! Run! Hello? Jim? Who's there? Uh, Elliot Mann. Oh, hi. Hey, what are you doing outside? Hi. I just drove up. Uh, Georgia told me she was spending the weekend. I wanted another look at that mural. <laughs> no one answers. I guess the girls are out. Uh, probably antique hunting. They said they were doing that today. Come on in. Uh, huh. Door's open. Not like Marion to leave without locking the front door. Well, I got back a day early. Say, it's strange. Hmm? All the lights are on. It's, it's, it's only only one o'clock. Yeah, it looks like they were having a party. Uh, coffee and brandy. Elliot. Elliot, something's wrong. Hmm? Marion would never leave the den like this. Hey, that's... That's curious. A blue feather. Where did that come from? It was on the floor here. Marion doesn't have any feathers. This is from a tropical bird. I want to know where Marion and Georgia are. We're, we're all 
almost to the river. I don't think... I don't think I can go another step. Oh, no, you can. Help. Oh, come oh, on. Come on. Come on. We're ahead of the devils. It's just a few more yards. That's it. Into the water. Oh, oh. Oh. Oh, we're safe from them now. It's not far to the other side. Just follow me. Here, 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 I'll help you out. Here. I'm out, I'm out. Thanks. Oh, any idea where we are? No, not anymore. I, I'm going to take a look over the top of the bank. I'm so tired, George. I think I've got it. No, no, you're not. We're going to get out of this. We don't know where to go. We don't know what to do. All this wandering around and being chased for nothing. Valiant. Look, through the ferns. Was that a man crouching? Yes. It's one of the head hunters. Well, there's nothing familiar on top of... Look over there. There's a head hunter looking at us through the ferns. Oh. What do we do? Stay still. He's alone. There he goes. He's running away. Yes, he's probably gone for help. We'd better get out of here before they get back. They know this place better than we do. We'll never escape them. Look, I don't want to end up on one of those poles. I wonder if we have any choice. Elliot, hmm? look. Look there. In the lower left-hand corner of the wall. What? A face. I swear. It's a woman's face. Where? Through the ferns. But... It's gone. It was the perfect outline of a woman's face. They're on their way. They'll probably try to circle around us and cut us off. They'll find us. They'll kill us. We have got to keep going. We can't. We can't get away from them. We can't. Up ahead. Look. The birds. That's the spot I told you about. We might find we might a way. Oh. I spear. I'm hit. No, oh. help me. He's hurt. Oh. Past those trees. Past the trees. Uh. There it is. Lord, uh. Arian, help me. We've got to help uh. again. The uh. house, the den is right through those uh. trees. Oh, yes, you're right. We found the way. Help me drag Maxwell. Take his arm. Hurry. Please, we found it. Lord, uh. help us get there. Uh. Please help us. Uh. Jim. Jim. Yes, Marion. It's, it's coming through. We're here. Oh, help him, help him. It's the phone man. A spear in his back. Go after us. The headhunters stop them. Do something. There's one thing that might stop them. My camera's in the car. I'll be right back. They're deathly afraid of this. I captured more than their souls when I took that picture two years ago. I'm going back. All right, you devils. I got your souls once before. I'll get them again. They're... They're disappearing. Look. The whole photo mural just going. It's fading away every time you shoot. I... I don't believe my eyes. I don't believe it. The wall is white. There's not a trace of the mural left. No one could explain what had happened. Had Elliot captured not only the souls of the natives, but the very soul of the jungle itself? Had the supposed bewitchment of the house brought it to life? Who can say? The mural is gone now, and so are Jim and Marion Sage. They put the house up for sale and bought a townhouse in the city. The last I heard, they still hadn't found a buyer. We're going to stick our neck out and tell you something. It's hard to miss with Arrow. Arrow shirts. And the reason is so simple. America shirt maker is Arrow. America's shirt maker has done it again with what is probably the best shirt collar ever made. 
Arrow's patented custom collar. And only Arrow's got it. It's a whole inch wider at the bottom than the top, just like your neck is. It's adjustable by a full half inch, and it's got a special notch so the neckband doesn't show over your top. America Shirt Maker is Arrow's shirt. See why we're sticking our neck out. Stick your neck into an Arrow custom collar. America Shirt Maker is Arrow's shirt. If we're not already your shirt maker, we ought to be. Maybe you've got a neighbor who just bought a new Electra, and he's gotten so smug and self-satisfied lately, you can't stand it. So look at it this way. If you had just gotten a car with all the luxury and prestige of Electra, and a trim European-like design that makes it easier than you might imagine to park and maneuver in city traffic, wouldn't you be a little insufferable for a while? We thought so. The new Electra, at your Buick dealers now. A little science, a little furniture, a little science. The glittering condominium stands in the path of disaster. Time is running out for the people in the condominium. There's a hurricane watch along the coastal areas. Gale force winds expected to reach up to 70 miles per hour. They say a big one is coming up, but it's supposed to pass out to sea. Soon all the land swindles, payoffs, and broken marriages won't matter. Help me. I can't help on. In John D. McDonald's condominium, people lose more than their investment. Condominium is now a faucet paperback, and it will blow you away. Read Condominium. I happened by the house on Chimney Pot Lane a few weeks ago and peered through the windows. Curious. There was a pantry where I thought Jim and Marion had put in a breakfast nook, and one wall in the kitchen looked burned by a fire long ago. Well, perhaps they'll find a buyer soon. Any takers? Our cast included Marion Seldes, Terry Keene, Earl Hammond, and Sam Gray. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. brings you the important news, plus the best in special features. Join him on News Watch 7. News people, in touch with people, watching our world for you. News people, on News Watch 7, people in touch with you. This is Larry Holland. Omaha has a new late night meeting place. It's 104 and a half on the FM dial, right here at KOOO FM. We talk about issues of current concern, we question a variety of guests, but the best part of it all is that you can join the action simply by calling the Speak Out number. Join us from midnight to 6 a.m. every morning for Speak Out with Larry Holland. Another reason to listen. CBS Radio News is next. This is KOOO FM, Omaha, Nebraska. More good radio for more people. Central Standard Time is now 10 p.m. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall inviting you to share another adventure in the macabre. All great writers, at one time or another, have written a mystery story. The unknown and the unexplained are intriguing. Their world limitless. We are more aware of that now because of ESP and psychokinesis. The effect of thought on material objects lends credence to many an old wives' tale. Henry James anticipated one of them in 1892 in his story, Sir Edmund Orme. 
Our adaptation of this classic begins in Boston, but it was in a church on Martha's Vineyard that Mrs. Marsden first spoke openly to David Delano. You saw him? Yes, Mrs. Marsden. He, he came into the pew and sat next to Charlotte. And then he walked to the center aisle of the church and walked away from the pulpit and out. Ah, no one else paid him any attention. Because no one else could see him, Mr. Delano. I beg your pardon. But you will see him again. Because you're in love with my daughter. <laughs> mystery drama, Edmund Orme, was adapted especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Lamont Johnson. Some persons, they are intelligent and sound of mind, believe that a guilty past pursues a person until the offense has been exercised. This is a deeper problem than conscience can solve. You may regret something, and you may make amends for it, and then perhaps your conscience is clear. But what if you have done something unforgivable? What if the person you have harmed is dead? Is it in his power to make you suffer because you can never make amends? It was a warm Sunday afternoon in mid-October in 1890. Most of the strollers had left the Boston Common to go home for tea when Mrs. Marsden said... Really, Charlotte, I'm all right. A bit tired, nothing more. But, Mother, you have that pain. Walk on with Mr. Clement. Mr. Delano will sit with me on the bench. We'll follow shortly. You don't mind, Mr. Delano? Certainly not. You won't be long, Mother. Five minutes, no more. All right. Do watch over Mother, Mr. Delano. You and Charlotte have an unusually close relationship, Mrs. Martin. Well, I'm devoted to her, of course. And she is vain about your appearance. I, I would be, too. You're a beautiful woman. <laughs> Thank you. An unusual young lady. We are both a little strange. <laughs> have you recovered? Oh, yes. Yes, yes it's left me. The, uh, the fluttering. Heart? Oh, no. Oh, glad to hear that. Well, Charlotte has set the young men of Boston on their ears. Are you in one of the uh, professions, Mr. Domino? No, I'm a shipping broker. My friend John Clement is an attorney. Will you stay in Boston through the fall, Mrs. Martin? Oh, for a few weeks more, perhaps, with a side trip to Martha's Vineyard. Our friends, the Tompkins, have asked us for a weekend before we return home to Providence. Of course, you'll stay for the Elliott's Ball. Oh, Charlotte is looking forward to it. Oh, it's a grand occasion. You and Charlotte will make it something special. May I call on you in, in Providence sometime? If business brings you our way, of course. I'll be pleased to see you again. And Charlotte? Of course. But you'd know that better than I, Mr. Delano. I, I really don't. She's a bit of a coquette, you know. Don't say that, please. I don't like the word, Mr. Delano. It's cheapening. Oh, I didn't mean it in a disparaging way. Forgive me, please. Granted. As you must know, a coquette deliberately attracts men, but without affection. That's why they're always punished. Punished? May I ask how you know that, Mrs. Martin? I... I was a bad girl myself. And... You were punished. I carry it through life. You are badly infected, David, my friend. You love Charlotte, of course. Or is it the mother who is attracted to you? No, but... Uh, I must say that for a woman in her 50s, Mrs. Marston is remarkably attractive. She favors you, David. You're a lucky man. I'm not so sure. I'd be. They're rich. Mrs. Marsden's a widow. And Charlotte is her only child. Boston society's beautiful darling. Mm. She is beautiful, isn't she? Striking me so. Almost a copy of her mother. Except for Charlotte's eyes. 
cornflower blue and sparkling. Well, what's the next step, David? Have you asked Mrs. Marsden for her daughter's hand? No, I've been on the verge of speaking to her, but I've held back. There's something strange about them that's mysterious. Mrs. Marsden said as much herself, and I have no way of, of knowing how Charlotte feels toward me. Ask her. I almost did. Day before yesterday. The butler admitted me to tea. In the distance, someone was playing the piano. Good afternoon, Charlotte. Good afternoon. The mother will be in directly. Please sit down. Will you have tea? Well, I'll wait for your money. She is an accomplished pianist. Yes, mother plays well. After one of her so-called flutters, music transports her. Oh, that was last Sunday. You were very kind to sit with her, David. Thank you for your attention. My affection for both of you is genuine and deep, if I may say so. You have. What are these flutters, do you know? Oh, they're not physically caused. Mother's in good health. Then how do you explain them? I can't, and Mother won't talk about them. She has one every so often, and turns pale and her eyes cloud over. Then it's gone. Sometimes it's months between them. May I say what must be obvious to you, Charlotte? I... I'd rather you didn't. Well, perhaps it is presumptuous, Hello, but... Mr. Delano. How very nice that you could stop by. Thank you for the invitation. Shall I pour, Mother? Yes, if you please. <sighs> oh, do sit down, Mr. Delano. Such a civilized custom afternoon tea and cake. Well, have you been having a good visit? Very. And I enjoyed listening to you play the piano. It gives me a great deal of pleasure. I should be lost without music. May I serve you, Mrs. Martin? Oh, not quite yet, thank you. May I ask when you're leaving for the vineyard? This weekend, isn't it, Mother? Ah, uh, we'll miss you. Do you know the vineyard, Mr. Delano? Quite well. Yes, John Clemens' parents have a home there. I have been their guest on occasions. Wouldn't it be jolly if Mr. Clemens and you Mother. could... Perhaps you're right, Charlotte. <laughs> well, it's a good idea all the same, unless it... Uh... Would offend you, Miss Martin? Certainly not. What you do is hardly my concern. And Mr. Clements is amusing. Now, Mother, will you have the tea? Well, if you please. Oh, let me, let me serve you, Mrs. Martin. Thank you. There you are. Mother, hey, what in the world is the matter with you? You really should have a steadier hand, Mr. Delano. Oh, let me pick up the pieces. Your film is ruined, Mother. I'll ring for Stephen. And so you never had a chance to pop the question. At the moment I was about to, Mrs. Marsden entered the room, and and there was the matter of the dropped teacup. An accident. I can't explain it. I I have a very steady hand. I I offered cup and saucer to Mrs. Marsden. She took it and and let it go. Hmm. What distracted her? Nothing. She simply dropped it. And she didn't move. Even with hot tea splashed on her dress? She didn't move. Her face was ashen. Her eyes were glazed over. She had the same look as she had last Sunday when she asked me to sit with her on the bench. Do you remember? Hmm. How strange. Is Mrs. Marsden all right in the head? Well, maybe not. There, There is something else about that tea incident that I forgot to mention. Oh? After Mrs. Marsden said I should have a steadier hand, there was a look in her eyes that... Deep beneath that glazed, staring look that seemed to say, Make believe it was you who dropped the cup. Make believe it was you. The weather holds Indian summer, clean ocean air. Ah, beautiful indeed. We should have a grand weekend with the Tompkins. I look forward to seeing some of my Providence friends. No regrets about what you may be leaving behind? We're returning to Boston, aren't we? Mm -hmm. For another week. Then we go home. After the Elliott's ball. Are you looking forward to it, Charlotte? Oh, yes. I've heard it's a grand affair. David Delano is in love with you, my dear. Do you return that love? You were rude to him at tea, you know. 
I'll apologize. Please do. You and I are very compatible, Mother. But, well, I don't like to be pushed. I'm not pushing you, Matthew. It is your happiness that I want to protect. Do you love David Delano? I... I don't know. You must know. Why do you speak so harshly? Because you must know that you do or do not love him. You have to know. If you have any doubt, reject him. If you don't, it may be too late. I don't understand you. He will become so possessed of his love for you that he will never let it go. But, Mother, that would hardly be my concern. You're mistaken. He would haunt you the rest of the days of your life. Mother. I'm telling you because I know. What a pleasant surprise. So you took my suggestion. I agreed to it after John Clements insisted on the last visit to the vineyard. And, of course, he's encouraged because Charlotte finds him amusing. He's a fine young man, but Charlotte's affections by Elfrey. If they do, I'm unaware of it. You see. I know. Has she said as much? No. But I know. May I ask how you know? First, Forgive me for blaming you for dropping the teacup. I dropped it, as you know. For a moment, I... I lost control of myself. That does not happen infrequently, does it, Mrs. Marston? I'm referring to those nasty flutters of yours. Oh, they're real enough. At any rate, I was rude to you, but... Sometime, I think you'll understand. And make allowances for me. You more and more mysterious. I have a deep presentiment about you, Mr. Delano. I don't want you to become nervous. All I'm nervous about is Charlotte's feelings toward me. Oh, that will come clear. I have seen its manifestation. I beg your pardon? There is a mystic initiation in store for you, Mr. Delano. And what in the world might that be? When it happens, do not become extravagantly nervous. Charlotte must never know. Know what? A horror. That you and I alone will share. And there, briefly, we leave David Delano aboard the ferry for Martha's Vineyard, trying his best to make heads or tails out of Mrs. Marsden's strange remarks. Everyone has presentiments, I'm sure, and usually they can be explained away as natural worry. Will you have a safe trip? Will a junior automobile driver drive with caution? That kind of thing. But manifestation means something seen. And what is mystic initiation? We'll learn more when I return with that too. <laughs> Our mystery tale is a famous story written by Henry James, a great novelist, known for his realistic psychological penetration and analysis. It is evident that James was interested in penetrating the unusual characters of a mother and daughter, both beautiful, proud, and protective of each other. Behind their striking appearance lies the mystery which we are unraveling. We're in Martha's Vineyard. It is night. And John Clements and David Delano are standing on the boat for I tell you, David, Mrs. Marvin's a bit off her rocker. She must be. I thought so, too, but... Except for this preoccupation of her, she is sane and intelligent. She's well-educated and, uh, from what I've been able to learn, highly respected. It's beyond me. She said that she and you would alone share a horror. What do you do? Wait for some horror to present itself? I don't take it seriously, but it worries me for Charlotte's sake. And she doesn't know about it, and, and, and she's not to. You understand? Of course. Oh, she loves you, David. She's afraid of you. Afraid? Oh, how can she be? Afraid of her own feelings. She's had many attachments, I'm sure, but I think her feelings for you are much deeper. Oh, I've about given up. No, I wish I was back in Boston. Don't 
to share. And don't forget the party tomorrow night at the Tompkins. Church in the morning. Everyone will attend. We'll walk on the beach. Take a sail if you care to. And then we'll go to the party. I have no appetite for that, John. Yeah, the party, I mean. Use the occasion to state your position. Speak to the perverse Miss Charlotte. Find out where you stand. And if she says no? Bow, say thank you, and goodbye. Then back to Boston we go. You're free. And you'll be free from that horror you're supposed to share with Mrs. Marsden. Nonsense, of course. I wonder... I wonder if there is something to what Mrs. Marsden said. separated from mother who went on ahead with Mr. and Mrs. Tompkins and some of the other house guests. Where's John? He met an acquaintance. He's sitting with him. You don't mind my sitting here, do you? Of course not. I haven't seen you since we arrived. I haven't wanted to intrude. But John knows the Tompkins. All the same. I, I don't like to be dragged along like somebody just washed ashore. What a peculiar thing to say. Is it? My presence seems to make you uncomfortable. I want to apologize for being rude last week at tea. I didn't mean that what you do does not concern me. Uh, that, that makes me feel better. You are a friend, David. And I take an interest in my friend. I'm overwhelmed with such warmth. Here's a prayer book if that's what you're looking for. Oh, thank you. Hand it to him. I'll, I'll share yours. What? Hand him the prayer book. Him? What are you talking about? Oh, my God. You saw him, David? Distinctly, Mrs. Marston, but I don't know what I saw. He sat down next to Charlotte in the pew, and I asked her to offer him my prayer book. She looked as if she thought it was crazy. You saw him all the time? Yes. And when I looked around, Charlotte saw you standing up and said something's happened to Mother. You wore the same expression I saw when you had kind of sit on the bench in the common and, and again just before you dropped the teacup. Now you know. I know nothing. What I saw was a handsome young gentleman, his hands crossed on his cane, dressed in fine old-fashioned clothes. I was surprised when he left the pew. No one else saw him. What? To you and to me. Not to anyone else. To them, he was invisible. You must not tell anyone. Is... Is this the horror that you said you and I would share? Yes. You're the only person in the world who could see him. And you, Mrs. Marsden? Oh, me, of course. What does it mean? It's my curse. Charlotte's the life of the party. I should have known. This is not the place or the time to declare myself. She'll quiet down. But for all those young men dancing attendance, I think not. If it won't offend you, John, I think I'll slip out and walk by the shore. As you please. But I think you're making a mistake. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Marsden. Good evening. Uh, may I speak with you alone, Mr. Delano? Excuse me, David. Think over what I said. Yes, Mrs. Martin. May I ask you a question? If I may ask you one. Oh, we'll have to come to that, I suppose. We will. For a reason that isn't even vaguely clear to me, Mrs. Martin, I've been caught up in a series of incidents which I find puzzling and disturbing. Why me? And who is the phantom? I have no better word to describe him. He's invisible to everyone except you and me. May I ask my question? What is it? Are you in love with my daughter? Almost everyone is, Mrs. Martin. No, please, you don't be flippant. I know the answer, of course. Well, then why ask the question? But how you can know escapes me. Am I, am I transparent? You saw him. Ah. Are the gentlemen in the pew in the church... Did you feel it was inevitable that you should see him? 
to use extreme words. I knew you'd see him as soon as you should really be in love with Charlotte. I have no idea what you're talking about. It was a test. A test? You see him again. I have no objection, but I shall take more interest in him if you tell me who he is. I'll tell you. If you'll tell me what you said to Charlotte in church. I said nothing that was the least out of the way. Are you very sure? I don't know what made me keep quiet. Well, that was quite enough for him. It isn't what you say that makes the difference. It's what you feel. That's what he goes by. And who is this mysterious he? You must tell me. His name is... Edmund Orme. I never heard of him. Oh, it is unlikely that you should have. He was dead before you were born. Mother! He's by her side. By Charlotte's side. Don't look at him. Don't notice him. Never. What plot are the two of you hatching? Uh, I... I've been asking your mother for your hand. Oh, Indeed. And has she given it? She was just going to when you appeared. Do you like Mr. Delano, Charlotte? It's difficult to say before him, isn't it? Why are you staring at us? What on earth is the matter with you? You both such odd expressions on your faces. One would think you'd seen a ghost. Uh, go, go tell the uh, tell the others I'll be along soon. And you? Are you coming, Mr. Delano? I'll be waiting inside, Mother. I feel faint. Now, you know my life. This is a dream. Oh, a grotesque joke. The man sat next to her in church, and when she walked over to us just now, he was at her side, and she didn't see him. Who is Edmund Orme? A man I wronged long ago. He's very young. He was born before I was. And he's dead. He appears in order to punish you, Mrs. Martin. Oh, I'm beyond that. No, oh, he's intent upon my daughter. The sins of the mother? Is that it? Please, I want to understand. How can you when I myself don't really understand? Well, what harm can he do? No physical harm, surely. He absorbs my attention and reminds me of a past I cannot escape. My senses become numbed. I appear to others as distracted or unbalanced. It is a life of torture. And because I love Charlotte, I now share the presence of Edmund Orm. Yes. I still don't really understand any of this, Mrs. Martin. You love Charlotte. Edmund Orm appears to me in Charlotte's presence to punish me for the past. He appears to you as a warning. A warning of what? The fate that befell him and which might befall you. I'd hardly call you a sparkling guest, David. You've been out here a good part of the time. The party is breaking up. I'm sorry, John. You're a picture of despondency. As your co-conspirator, can you tell me what Mrs. Marsden said that has so depressed you? I will later. I'll go say my goodnight. Follow along. Don't stay out here too much longer. Good night, Charles. Good night, Charles. See you on the ferry tomorrow. Oh, now, where did I leave my shawl? Caesar's ghost. Oh, I thought you'd left, David. John said you might be on the beach. I was about to go when your mother came over to me and we got to talking. Sit down, Charlotte. Have you seen my shawl? I, I left... I will worry about that after you've heard what I have to say to you. My, this is a different David Delano. An imperial arbitrary one. Can I guess what you have to say? Your mother offered me your hand. So you said. You know how I feel, but... Uh, it would be unforgivable to approach you with, <laughs> without your mother's permission. That's old-fashioned, David. Perhaps it is, but it's also good manners. Women are not chattel. They may have been once, but not in this age. My mother gave my hand to you. Did your mother give yours to me? She would, if that were custom. I love you, Charlotte. Will you be... Oh, 
What? What on earth is the matter with you? Why are you staring over my shoulder? Have you gone mad? Oh, my dear Charlotte. It's twice now that you look as if you've seen a ghost. And there was your strange behavior in church when you asked me to pass a prayer book to an empty space. You'll excuse me, David. Charlotte, I... I can't explain. Even if you could, I'd not be interested. My hand is my own to give, and I won't give it to you. The fact is, I don't want to see you ever you, again. You, you don't understand. Tell him. Tell him to leave. He's mad. David. David, what happened? He appeared. I had determined to speak to Charlotte and ask her to be my wife before I could say the words. He materialized behind her. I, I was startled. You didn't explain what you'd seen. No, but... This is horrible. You wronged Edmund Orme. I didn't. I, I don't even know who he is. Why should he interfere with my happiness? You don't see? If you will excuse me, madam, I'm damned if I do. Why should I be made miserable, more miserable than I am? I don't know. I can only surmise. Your love for Charlotte is genuine. It's futile. Edmund Orme is protecting her. Is he indeed? From what? Deceptive love. What in heaven's name does that mean? He was deceived. By you? Yes. I killed him. There is considerable evidence, a lot of it recent, that puzzles the so-called pure scientists who heretofore have dismissed the occult with a smile of disbelief. Writers have always been intrigued by the possibility that there is truth in everything, from legend to healing by the laying on of hands. The evidence is there. What we are listening to, then, may be very real. Consider that when I return shortly with Act Three. become involved with a specter, a visible disembodied spirit who appears only to Mrs. Ann Marsden and young David Delano. Henry James spun the story before the turn of the century, not only to entertain, but to make a point. The point remains obscure to Mr. Delano. All he knows is that the specter of Edmund Orme continues to stand between him and his love for Mrs. Marsden's daughter. Mrs. Marsden suspects the point. She is being punished through her innocent daughter. It is after breakfast in John Clement's house on Martha's Vineyard. Could it have been an hallucination? Call it what you will, John. You've had an extraordinary experience. You do believe what I told you. Oh, yes. I'd like to disbelieve all of it. Mm, so should I. This Edmund Orme appears only to Mrs. Marsden and to you when Charlotte is present? That's right. I've given you the instances... Then I'd stay away from her. That's what I've decided to do. At least for several months. Mother and daughter will be back in Providence within a week. I can't really understand any part of this, John. Can you? Perhaps. Mrs. Marsden told you she'd killed the man. That may be an exaggeration. Whatever she did to him, his shade won't let her forget the wrong done to him. We know that. Go on. Charlotte is a beautiful and intelligent young woman. We also know that. You come along and love her deeply. Edmund Orme appears. And when he does, his presence makes you appear to be an imbecile. How could Charlotte take you seriously when, as you are about to propose, you glaze over and lose your wits? She couldn't. Very well. Maybe that's Edmund Orme's point. To punish Mrs. Marsden, Orme will never permit Charlotte to marry anyone. If that's true, Mrs. Marsden will continue to deteriorate. I see that. Yes. Yeah. If you were a mother with a rich and beautiful daughter, can you imagine how tortured you would be if she never married? But she can marry almost anyone she chooses, John. That makes it worse. Don't you see? At the point that someone is about to pop the question, the specter appears to the man, and he goes to pieces. That's utterly mad. That's the best that I can do. Oh, forgive me. Now, why don't you ask Mrs. Marsden if my theory holds water? She hasn't been very open with you. Except that... You, too, have seen the specter. I'd nominate her for an asylum. How unfair all this is to me and to Charlotte. Uh, assuming she returns my feelings. And you don't know that, do you? I feel it. Well, let's pack up and head for the ferry. 
It's a fine, crisp day, and the ocean breeze may clear your mind. I'm, I'm packed. I, I have a few minutes. I'll, I'll walk over to the Tompkins and confront Mrs. Marston. I intend to know the full story about Edmund Dorn, or I'll turn my back on both the mother and the daughter. To answer your first question, yes. Others who have been in love with Charlotte may have seen him, but they have not loved her as you love her. Did they speak to you about the specter? Oh, no. No, but they turned away from us. I won't do that, Mrs. Marston. Bless you for that, David. It must have been agonizing for you. And puzzling and hurtful to Charlotte. She told me that you were on the verge of proposing when... when you began to act very strangely. Have I any hope with her? Any chance? That you may have is what I long for. What I pray for. Thank you. I believe it will all pass. If she only loves you. It will all pass. I mean, we shall be rid of him. That we will never see him again. If Charlotte loves me, I don't care how often I see him. You take it better than I could. You said you killed him. I want the story, Mrs. Marston. I have a right to know. I broke his heart and... And he took his life. He loved you deeply. We were to be married. The engagement had been arranged by my mother and older sister. Edmund Orme was a fine man. He loved me. At the last moment, I realized that I didn't love him. You jilted him? Yes. I fell in love with Major Marsden. And five years later, I married him. Five years? Oh, they were years of torment. I was responsible for the death of Edmund Orme. It was after my husband, the Major, died that I began to see him. Go on. Edmund Orm always appeared with Charlotte. It began seven years ago. Sometimes weeks, and then months would go by before he'd materialize. You are being made to pay for the suffering you inflicted on Edmund Orm. And, and Charlotte? My guess is that because you trifled with his affections, he expects your daughter might behave the same way. He, he watches her so that she might suffer if she should do any go wrong. You should tell Charlotte. Oh, I am too ashamed to... You have no other recourse, Mrs. Marson. By shielding her, you're cutting her off from a natural life. Charlotte has done no wrong. She might. Now, that's the point that the specter makes. He'll disappear only. When Charlotte is honestly in love with someone. Until then, she will be suspect. This is an ugly thing that hangs over the three of us. We have to remove it somehow. I received your note, David. You have news? Good news, I think. Read Mrs. Marsden's letter. It's brief and to the point. Hmm. Yesterday, I spoke to Charlotte about you, and tears came to her eyes. He was there, of course, but I didn't look at him, and I didn't get into a flutter. She loves you, David, I am certain. You and only you. I'm arranging a small party for the weekend, and you and your friend, Mr. Clements, are invited. There is no need to acknowledge this note. I will expect both of you, and I hope that you will pay the visit. Why me? So that if I'm disappointed, I won't throw myself into Narragansett Bay. <laughs> well, let's do it. Thank you. You were right, you know. About my theory? To a point. Your point about retributive justice is closer to the mark. Edmund Orme won't permit Charlotte to marry without love. If she does, she will be punished as her mother has been for all these years. Well, I'll, I'll make the train arrangements. I look forward to our adventure. I look forward to seeing Charlotte, but I dread seeing him again. I'm afraid of that specter, John. Because he's both jury and judge. He holds the fate of three of us in his hands. I'm so very glad the two of you could come. You look wonderfully well, Mrs. Marsden. What a splendid house you have. It's charming. Thank you. 
I haven't told Charlotte that you were coming, but she'll be delighted, I know. I'll drift in and say hello. Well, Mrs. Martin. I brought up the subject a few days ago. We were alone, as we usually are in the daytime. I asked her about you, David. The subject is painful to me, Mother. If you'd rather not discuss it... There's nothing to discuss. We said goodbye. He was a summer friend. No more than that? Are you disappointed in me, Mother? Oh, no. No concerned is the word I'd use. Since we came home, you've been moody. And that's not like you. I have no direction. I just go through the motions of living. And in your mind? Memories, of course. I almost died when he said you'd given him my hand. Well, that's such a silly expression. Oh, I think so, too. It only means that I approved of him as being worthy of you. He is that, I'm sure. And quite handsome. He loves you, Charlotte. He's never said so. I think he's about to, and he goes all funny. How do you feel about him? Oh, I don't want to talk about him anymore, Mother. I really don't. I no longer have any doubts about her feelings toward me, Mrs. Marsden. I'll speak to her tonight. He'll appear. You know that. David. My darling Charlotte. You're, you're what? I've been in love with you since we first met, and now I know that you love me, and that is all that matters in the whole world. You do return my love, don't you? Hush. Someone's watching us from the corner of the room. See him? The one in the evening dress? Oh, I don't like the way he looks at me, David. David, come with me. It's Mrs. Morrison. The doctor can't explain it. I can. It was that man we saw last night. The one in the old-fashioned evening dress. He, he caused Mother to collapse? I won't explain now, my dear, but the, the figure we saw has been terrifying your mother for many years. He's been the cause of her sudden and mysterious seizures. But, but why? Without your mother's permission, I, I hesitate to tell you. Love me as I love you and all will be well. Oh, you're being terribly mysterious, David. I've been out of my mind with worry about her and about you. Who? Who is the man? Mother. Mother, who is the man in the strange evening dress? So you saw him, Charlotte. Last night, at the very moment you fainted away at the piano. And just after you admitted to David that you loved him. You do. Don't you, Charlotte? It's all that I wish. Yes, Mother. I could love no other. <sighs> then I'm content. I am really very ill, you know. I have been for a long time. But the doctor said... Darling, it's nothing about which a doctor can do anything. Later, David will explain. Profit by what he tells you. And you will be safe. David, I don't know what she's talking about. It's about something that happened a very long time ago. It's a terrifying story of revenge, and it arises from the grave. David! David! Oh, you devil! David! Oh, David! It's gone. Oh, the way it's gone, oh, David, it's such a terrible. Hold me tight. Mrs. Martin. She's dead. Oh, that. Dead. And the spirit of Edmund Dorn has been exorcised. The story of an apparition, of a specter, a story of literal bedevilment. A happy ending was too much to be expected. The writer's point is that deception of feeling in a relationship is sinful. Mrs. Marsden freed her daughter at the cost of her own life. That is why I implied earlier, and you may know this yourself, that an unforgivable offense may haunt you throughout your life. I'll return shortly. Part 
punishment comes in many forms. You may be fined or imprisoned, even lose your life. Those are the punishments of the everyday world. And then there is the punishment of conscience. Beyond even that, we may consider punishment inflicted by an agency that is, by definition, unreal. Whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad. Mrs. Marsden was driven close to the edge by the specter of Edmund Orme and died to exorcise his spirit. Our cast included Lamont Johnson, Mary Jane Higby, Jada Rowland, and Gordon Gould. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.